Uh, good morning, sergeants. Please start your recordings. PC recording has started. PC started. So recording started. Thank you, sergeants. Good morning. Welcome to New York City Council's remote committee hearing on finance. Everyone, please turn on your video at this time. Make sure all your audio devices are silenced when you are speaking so it doesn't interrupt your testimony. All written testimony can be submitted to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you. Chair Drum, we are ready to begin. Okay, thank you, Sergeant Perez, and thank you to all the sergeants for all the work that you do for us all the time. Thank you again very, very much. Good morning and welcome to the City Council's 10th and final day of the hearings on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 22. My name is Daniel Drum and I chair the Finance Committee. Today we will hear from the public. I am joined today by my colleagues, Council Members Dar uh, Adams, Dara Diaz, Brooks Powers, Matteo Powers, and Grudenchik. And Lewis. Before we begin, and Moya. Before we begin with public testimony, I want to say thank you to all the members of the public who are taking time out of their schedules to testify on the fiscal 22 executive budget. We value what each of you has to say. So please know that even if we don't directly respond to your testimony at today's hearing, we hear you and your testimony is making a difference. With nearly 300 people registered to testify today, it is only in the interest of time that we cannot respond individually. As a reminder, each of you will have two minutes to deliver your testimony, and we, and we request that out of respect of the hundreds of other people who are waiting to speak, that you please stay within your allotted time. At the end of your testimony, you will be removed from the Zoom meeting, and you may continue to watch the hearing via live stream for the duration of the meeting at council.nyc.gov slash live stream. With that said, I will now turn it over to the committee council to call up the first panel. Thank you, Chair Drum. Uh, my name is Rebecca Chasen, and I am counsel to the New York City's uh, Council's Committee on Finance. Panelists, as a reminder, you will be on mute until it is time for you to testify, at which time your name will be called and you will be unmuted by the Zoom host. If you mute yourself after you have been unmuted, you will need to be unmuted again by the host. Please wait for the sergeant at arms to tell you when your time begins. The sergeant will let you know when your time is up as well. As a reminder, as the chair just said, you have two minutes for your testimony. And also as the chair mentioned, after your panel has finished testifying, you'll be removed from the Zoom meeting by the host, but you may continue to watch the hearing live at council.nyc.gov slash live stream. So we will now hear um, from one moment. Senator, uh, New York Sen State Senator Robert Jackson, followed by Henry Garrido. Time starts now. Senator Jackson is not present yet. Can you hear me? Yep, he's there. Okay, so yes. I'd like to start. So good morning, Chair Drum, members of the City Council. I'm Robert Jackson, representing the 31st Senatorial District in Manhattan former member of this body, chair of the education committee and co-chair of the Black, Latino and Asian caucus and, and part of the negotiating team. And I thank you for dedication to this process. And as a parent activist, I was the lead plaintiff in the campaign for fiscal equity lawsuit. And after 28 years, we finally receiving full funding for New York public schools with $4.2 billion phased in over three years from the state of New York along with federal stimulus money of 4.8 billion from the American Rescue Plan, New York City finally had the funds to provide our children 
with the opportunity for a sound basic education and beyond that. And now we have to figure it out. And so Danny, uh, you and your team from the finance uh, 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 committee, uh, my team has been focusing on questions engaging education activists citywide. And there are several student needs parents have identified. A clear and benefit during the pandemic was small class sizes, and we must continue that. Um, but New York City finally has the fund to provide our children with the education they rightfully deserve. Now, I say to you, the contract for excellence, look at that with respect to all of the things that we need. We need nurses, we need social workers, we need psychologists, we need wraparound services for all of the children. Individual support remains crucial, especially so many children have lost relatives and family as a result of COVID-19. Well, we need to have student, uh, we need a targeted one-on-one -on -one small group intervention for literacy, university early dyslexia screening, English language learners, those with intellectual and development delayed required dedicated services. In essence, Danny, you know what they need. You are educated yourself. You are a leader in our city council. So before the pandemic, and now with all of the monies that we have, we must do Time expired. And Danny, I ask you if I can have uh, 30 seconds more. Of course, Senator. Thank you. So obviously you're dealing with the executive budget right now. And I depend, I and the parents depend on you and the city council to keep the mayor and uh, the chancellor in check in fulfilling the needs of our children uh, in the entire city. Now, as you know, we heard all yesterday morning that we're going to in-person learning. And now we have to work together and understanding that there needs to be flexibility. But the most important thing, Danny, I ask you and your colleagues in the city council, hold the mayor, hold the chancellor, and hold the administration accountable to make sure every child gets a good education. And I thank you for giving me the extra time. Thank you, Senator Jackson. And I have to say, you are a hero of mine. Uh, you were the one who fought for and walked to Albany, not once, but twice, uh, to get those CFE funds that we so desperately needed. And so it's our job now. And with your help with the legislation that you're proposing in Albany as well, um, you know, that we make sure that this funding goes where it will help the students the most. I have made it very well known that reducing class size is a top priority as a former New York City public school teacher. I know uh, the impact that class size reduction will have on teaching and learning. And I admire the work that you've done in the past as the chair of the education committee. So I just want to assure you that I'm working very hard toward that goal. And I thank you for coming in and for giving testimony today. It's very meaningful and I appreciate it very much. And I'll, I'll send in my formal written statement to you and the city council. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Jackson. You're welcome. Thank you. We'll now hear from Henry Garrido fo followed by Michael Mulgrew. Time starts now. Good morning, and Mr. Chair. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Henry Garrido. I'm the executive director of District Council 37 in New York City, the largest municipal union in New York, representing 150,000 members and approximately 150,000 retirees. I appear before you today virtually, and thank you for the opportunity uh, to testify today. Uh, District Council 37 represents the workers with uh, spent the last year calling essential. Uh, our school uh, lunch workers uh, work throughout the holidays to continue to deliver foods for families in need, not just children, but families. Our EMTs race to every part of the city to deliver people to care. Our health and hospital workers, social workers, uh, individual workers help countless families that were grieving throughout this pandemic. For the most part, they have reported the work as normal as every day uh, of this pandemic without question or complaint. They've been the heroes who have kept the city running. Even though this fiscal year outlook is much better for FY22, uh, the executive budget compared to the preliminary budget, there still remain some areas that need to be addressed um, in our opinion. Uh, I'd like to specifically focus on five, er five areas of critical importance for DC 37 and for the overall recovery of the city of New York. Number one, the uh, city's public hospitals. Number two, the libraries. Number three, the cultural institutions. 
Number four, year round childcare for families and number five, our parks. I'll begin with health and hospital. Uh, no hospital system has shouldered more of the burden throughout this pandemic than the health and hospitals. Our public uh, sector health professionals have given all that they have to, to treat New Yorkers and keep our healthcare system afloat. Thanks, Bob. Mr. Chair, can I have uh, at yes, least of course. two minutes? Please. Just I'll summarize very quickly. Um, this year's state budget uh, represents already a 1% cut for Medicaid. Um, this could, you know, severely uh, hurt our safety net uh, providers disproportionately uh, because they serve lower income communities more reliant on Medicaid. We already have seen 70% of the patients on Medicaid or insured be treated by the Health and Hospital Corporation. Um, and we have seen with our own eyes what happens when we defund the safety net of public hospitals. I want to additionally talk a little bit about what's happening with the, the assessors in the city of New York who can traditionally bring in revenue, um, the, who have been cut traditionally. I'd like to bring that to your attention. And just to summarize, I wanna speak very strongly about parks and libraries. Um, particularly libraries, as you know, have now become centers where, uh, not only centers where people can get vaccinated and tested, but also centers that uh, a lot of the children will go to access uh, internet, as we saw, we saw lines of children standing outside public libraries in order to capture the WAF 5 so that they can do the homework. In a city as rich as New York, that is unconscionable, and we should be addressing that. So the proposals to create libraries as hubs for many governments is something that should be and should be funded and, and looked into. And lastly, I want to talk about parks uh, and uh, child care. Um, we are in full support of the mayor's 3K for all for seats, but let's not call it 3K for all because it's not. It doesn't fund pre-K for some communities of color and areas that should be looked into it. It is an expansion and we are supporting of it, but we believe it should be continued, especially for early childhood education. And so that we're asking for the council to invest $45 million to ensure a full uh, child care. And lastly, the parts who have been decimated uh, throughout this pandemic and need to be funded as more New Yorkers begin to come back into an open area. We expect this summer to be a record summer of people coming into our parks. We are looking for the council to um, fund 100 CPWs, uh, 50 gardeners, and to fund uh, more PEP offices as we've seen crime rise in the parks and elsewhere. Mr. Chairman, I will submit my written testimony for the record but I thank you for the opportunity for speaking with you today. You're on mute, Mr. Chair. Pardon. Thank you, sir. <laughs> thank you, President Garrido. Uh, we recognize the issues that you have raised, working on many of them at the current moment. Uh, others have come in and uh, provided some uh, testimony to us as well uh, in the past. And <laughs> particularly don't like the dance that we have to always go through around our parks workers and other workers as well. So hopefully before adoption, we will get all of this settled and uh, you know we'll come to a, a good con conclusion. So thank you for coming in and giving testimony, President Garrido. Thank you, sir. We will now hear from Michael Mulgrew, followed by Mark Canizzaro. Time starts now. Uh, first, I want to thank Jim and Drum and everybody at City Council for all your partnering uh, that we've done, especially during this pandemic, and what we need to do to move forward. I'm going to try to be as quick as possible. Look, right now, it really comes down to what do our kids need to move forward? And in order to do that, we have to be smart and actually make it about what our kids need. I was horrified last week when I heard the Department of Ed testify in front of you that they want to spend a half a billion dollars to test children. When we have a proposal on the table that says, we, what we actually need are intervention teams for every 250 to 300 students in New York City, an intervention team made up of a social worker, a guidance counselor, an academic intervention specialist, and a psychologist to actually do one-on-one -on -one analysis of each and every student of New York City, not going out and doing an RFP on some test from a private company and then coming back with an analysis that really doesn't make sense to us. So that's why we need city council to really stand strong here. 
The other things, some of the things we've already started working on with your help and support, we, we're making available to every graduating senior a one-on-one -on -one college and career counseling center with an expert. We are moving forward with training all the teachers uh, and we've already trained over 5,000. Training all teachers are making it available so that they recognize the signs of an emotional, uh, social and emotional distress or complete trauma. We need them to recognize that in our students as well as in themselves because these are the folks who are gonna be doing the work. But when we do recognize it in a student, we need to make sure we have a place to put that student. We cannot go through four to five months of paperwork trying to get them the proper support that they need, which is probably gonna be a clinician at that point. And to Rob, Senator Jackson's point, we really need to start planning on how to learn. And we know smaller class sizes makes a big difference. We have seen it during this pandemic. But the city never has a plan. So what we're recommending is taking the 100 EDS schools in New York City and right now I'm telling excited. the Department of Education, if I could have a moment more, I would appreciate that. And of course. Thank you. And telling the Department of Education, ordering the Department of Education to say these 100 EDS schools need to lower their class sizes this year and let's come up with a plan so that all schools can start lowering their class size. So again, when we're trying to decide what we need from this budget, we need to be smart. What do our kids need? What do our parents need to help our children? And what do the people at the school need to meet this great challenge on, on doing all of the harm in this pandemic? And we're going to invite all of city council to work with us starting this evening on the Our Kids Need uh, campaign because that's what's gonna make a difference. Not hiring more consultants so that we can make press have press conferences and say we're doing something that really isn't gonna make a difference. And I thank you for all your support and all of the work that we've done on behalf of the children of New York City. Thank you, President Mulgrew. Uh, you know that I was a uh, proud New York City public school teacher and UFT chapter leader for many years. So I'm very aware of the issues that you have raised. Uh, you know, the testing piece deeply concerns me. I remember when I went through education classes at City College, they told us to put away the record cards and make your own individual decisions and observations and assessments of students, uh, not based on what other people thought, but your own individual observations. And uh, to bring back this testing issue at the cost that they want to pay, the money that they would put into that is money that could be used to meet the objectives that you have spoken about, particularly class size reduction. So I look forward to uh, continuing to work with you as we move toward adoption to meet many of the goals that you have uh, mentioned here in your testimony today. Thank you for coming in and I deeply appreciate all of your support. Thank you so much. We'll now hear from Mark Canizaro, followed by Daniel Clay. Time starts now. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, uh, Chairman Drum and, and Traeger for your uh, hard work and, and to all the council members. Uh, before I even begin, I, I just want to say thanks because last time uh, I testified a few months back, I was asking you to make sure that budgets, budgets were held harmless uh, for deficit rollover next year. And I was asking to make sure that we received 100% fair student funding for our schools. Um, and both of those things have been accomplished in addition to the fact that you always fund our Executive Leadership Institute and, and have committed to doing so again. So that gives me great hope going into next school year. Um, I'm certainly on board with the class size reduction piece, but I do caution everyone that we do not use the fair student funding 100% uh, fair student funding as, um, as a reason or, or as funds to reduce class size because those funds, that formula is based on full class size as of today. If we're going to reduce class size further, we may need additional uh, targeted funds in order to do so. Um, I also thank the council for uh, the mayor's, their the response to the, the executive's budget uh, and asking for $21 million for our early childhood educators. All we hear about is the mayor's plan and, and the, 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 signature, the signature plan that the mayor has um, re, for early childhood education and pre-K and 3K. Well, we have our early childhood educators who are doing everything that our school leaders are doing for the Department of Education, but they happen to work in CBOs. They happen to be minority, majority woman and majority minority uh, employees and they are funded at about 50% or they're paid at about 50% of what their colleagues in the Department of Education make. That $21 million um, response to the mayor's uh, budget 
uh, was, is great and it would be greatly appreciated if you can continue to push for that so that we can finally get them on a path to pay parity. Um, and then finally, I would just like to say that uh, we're all excited about all of our students returning to in-person learning in September, but there is one, one thing that everyone needs to know. Uh, Chair, if I could just have 30 more seconds, yes. I'd appreciate it. Yes. Thank you. One thing everyone really needs to know is the current social distancing guidelines will not allow for 100% of students to be in schools in most cases. Now, we're all banking on the fact that these guidelines will be further reduced and the restrictions will be lifted. And the only reason I'm mentioning it here is because when I read quotes in the newspaper coming out of City Hall and the Department of Education that we're going to follow current distancing guidelines and have 100% of the students in, in school, I see this being a setup for principals being the ones to ask families or to tell families that no, in the current situation, they can't all fit. So we need to be honest with our families and let them know. Some schools may be able to do it, but there'll be many, many schools that won't. And again, I'm encouraged and I'm confident that these guidelines will change as time goes on, but everyone should know where we stand now. Thank you all so much. Thank you, President Canizara, and uh, thank all the principals who have done such a tremendous job uh, being there on the front line over this whole last 15 months or so of the pandemic. And I agree totally with uh, what you have uh, brought up as issues that remain. And you're right, I don't think that we should be relying on 100% fair student funding to reduce class size, uh, particularly because many principals may want to use that to hire people, but also other principals may want to use it for other things in their schools. So what I've done with the DOE was when they came in for questioning was to say, there's no way we will know exactly, I don't think, um, how many uh, uh, principals have used it for, uh, for uh, additional teachers in their school before we come to adoption. So we actually really do need, uh, I propose at least, at least $250 million for class size reduction. Um, but, uh, and this finally, let me say, as a former member of your union and a daycare center director, I know firsthand the issue that you're talking about with the directors and with the staff and the daycare centers. Um, and actually it's one of the reasons why I went to the Board of Education was because I could make more money as a Board of Education teacher than I could as a daycare center director. So uh, that is something that we will continue to fight for and I've been proud to fight for it in the past. And I know that uh, Council Member Helen Rosenthal has a question. Sure. Time starts now. Thank you so much. Um, Chair Drum, I'm just gonna double down on, you, you took all the words out of my mouth. Um, Mark, you're a phenomenal leader for these principals. They're so lucky to have you. You hit the nail on the head on all the important remaining issues. Uh, frankly, Chair Traeger uh, has, has uh, reiterated your point about fair student funding not necessarily paying to reduce class size. That's a fiction. And in addition to that, when we uh, spoke about it with the DOE and with the SCA, we very clearly made the point that if you're serious about reducing class size, then you have to get more space in our schools or build more schools. We're um, not being honest when we talk about um, smaller class size if it doesn't come along with uh, more physical space. And I agree with you, the burden ends up falling on our principals and that's not right. Also, I agree with you 100% that we, uh, we've created a two-tier system of, um, of, of early childhood care and it's irresponsible of city government anywhere to do that. Um, and we will fight hard to make sure that um, the early childhood centers that are not affiliated with schools are fully funded in the same way that our schools, we work hard to make sure they're fully funded and that the teachers and the administrators are paid um, fairly. It's a union contract. So I just wanted to double down on what you've said and let you know that it helps us. You're coming here today helps us remember to double down on these issues and you have my word that I'll be as a member of BNT along with Chair Drum and Chair Traeger fighting very hard for these issues. Thank you. 
Your support is much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Before we move on, I want to say that we've been joined by Council Member Amphrey Samuel, and I believe that there are uh, at least Council Member Gredentia has a question. Time starts now. I just I just want to join with um, uh, Chair Drum and Chair Rosenthal and um, and and make that point again about um, if you're going to reduce class sizes, you need the space to do it. And you know, I have uh, visited every single one of my schools multiple times. And it's just not possible in many of our schools to reduce class sizes. So um, we have to be very, very smart about how we go about this. And I, I also would not want to see uh, any of the monies that have been put out for fair student funding to be diverted in such a way. If the city is serious about reducing class sizes where we can, um, there must be more funds allocated to that. The principals, we have fought for uh, as long as I've been in the council um, to make sure that there was fair student funding at 100% for every school. And we're not going to allow for diversion of those monies. So thank you, uh, President Canizero and President Mulgrew, uh, for being here today. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now go back to committee council. We'll now hear from Daniel Clay, followed by Devin Gilliams. Time starts now. Hi there, everybody. Uh, my name is Daniel Clay. I am local president of 1507, that's the Gardeners Union of DC 37. And Gardner here in Prospect Park, where I'm talking, uh, from where I'm speaking to you. And I'm out in the field right now, working with, with some of my favorite people, our, our, our regular volunteers. Um, these guys are monstrous. And what we're doing is taking care of the woodlands. We're weeding and cleaning the woodlands so that they don't become a crazy, weedy, viney, thorny, poison filled with poison ivy, just disaster. So, that, so instead they can become good, healthy woodlands. And so like I always say, you think of us gardeners as, uh, you know, happy folks planting a couple of flowers and sprinkling some water on them. But no, 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 like I always say, we've got so much work to do. But please, please, I, I, I urge the, the city council and the mayor to do the right thing, baseline the workers, restore the budget, do, do, the, the, do more, do the best you can so that everybody in New York City can enjoy the uh, benefits. Oh, yeah. I yield the rest of my time. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Thank you very much. We'll now hear from Devin Gilliams, followed by Dilsey Ben. Good morning. I'm Todd's now. Good morning, Council Member Drum and committee members. My name is Devin Gilliams, and I am here today as a representative of Doctors' Council SCIU. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Doctors Council SEIU, a united voice for doctors, our patients in the community we serve. We are a union representing thousands of doctors in employed practice in New York City, New York State, and other cities and states. We believe in quality, affordable, and safe healthcare as a basic human right and social good achieved and accessible by all. Our members put their lives on the line during COVID-19 pandemic and continue to do so, often leaving their families behind to care for the most vulnerable and sick patients and to manage and respond to this disease. While we realize that New York State and New York City may face budget issues in the future due to the enduring economic flood of the COVID-19 pandemic, laying off workers or demanding concessions will not serve the problem. The city budget problems will need to be addressed, but not on the backs of those who work for the city and those who have given and continue to give so much to deal with the coronavirus pandemic. Our, on vaccinations, we must continue and increase our efforts, especially working to understand and address how communities of color have been historically affected by institutional racism and how this can result in distrust of vaccination efforts. We must ensure culturally competent care. We must ensure that the communities of colors that were disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 receive the resources and care needed. We must act quickly and decisively to reverse the long trend of austerity, which has affected the strength and eth efficacy of our healthcare system. And this means working to address the harmful practice of hospital closures and consolidation, which has led to the creation of healthcare deserts in low income communities of color. As we move forward through the pandemic, we must be mindful of and fund new or emerging pathways to administer care or amplify and enlarge existing ones, including telehealth. We must continue and increase funding H&H &H and the mayoral agencies to enable the retention of doctors and the recruitment of new doctors. We need to fund mental health services for healthcare workers who worked during the COVID-19 pandemic. It's important for us- Time expired. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I want to say we've been joined by Council Member Yala as well. And Council, would you please call the next, next witness? We'll now hear from Dilsey Ben, followed by Donald Nesbitt. 
Time starts now. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Yes. Yes, we hear you. Okay, good morning, Chairperson Drummond Rosenthal and the fellow city council members. Thank you for providing me with the opportunity to testify. My name is Dilsey Ben. I'm the president of Local 1505, representing over a thousand um, city park workers referred to as CPWs, primarily in New York City in the Parks and Recreation Department. My members work in all five boroughs, conducting maintenance and operations in all city parks. Once again, I want to thank Speaker City Council the Speaker of the City Council and the Mayor for a baseline of 100 CPWs in fiscal year 20 was, was, was fought for for five years. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic, the Parks Department reduced um, the budget by 84 million in fiscal year 21. It was the second largest agency cut in the city budget. This came at a time where attendance at parks was un unpredictable. Okay, this year, the help of the federal funding and the Parks Department announced that they are in the process of hiring of the full amount of seasonal staff maintenance cleaners, as well as adding 2,500 city cleanup corp corps uh, members to work in parks. While this is good news, the executive budget does not address the restoration of the 10 million for additional um, the additional 100 city park workers and 50 gardeners in the city parks department budget that was added in fiscal year 20, but not baseline. As the city starts to reopen, and the mayor's um, announcement of all the openings of the beaches and pools for the summer, these workers are needed more than ever. We saw that what happened last year when um, there wasn't enough staff to care for the, and maintain parks, pools, and beaches. These areas were dirty, filled with garbage, and continued to, that it continued to accumulate. Despite council members organizing cleanups in their areas with volunteers, but there's nothing like dedicated park workers. Furthermore, due to the shortage of workers, Many parks, bathrooms were closed. Um, parks were closed since there wasn't enough staff to clean and, and clean expired. the bathroom. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll now hear from Donald Nesbitt, followed by James Davis. Time starts now. Good morning. I, good morning, Chairman uh, Drum and distinguished members of the City Council. Uh, finance committee. I'm Donald Nesbitt, executive vice president for Local 372. Uh, we have 24,000 members in schools. Uh, it may be a little noisy in the background, but I decided this morning that it was important to testify with the members who are actually doing some work. So it's not noisy because they want to be noisy, but they're still um, servicing the public and the students that are in our schools. Um, the thousands of workers that Local 372 represents perform essential support work to 1.2 million public school children of New York City uh, and, and help them in um, getting learning ready. Our school crossing guards who remain essential throughout the COVID-19 pandemic make sure that children cross safely um, and um, adults cross safely uh, during the mornings and afternoon commutes. Our school lunch workers unload, prepare, and serve food each day, including during the summer, and continue to feed both students and members of the community on an essential basis throughout this time in crisis. Our substance abuse prevention and intervention specialists work with students and mental health um, are needed more than ever to prevent uh, substance abuse, gun violence, uh, and uh, bullying and gang prevention and mediation. I want to thank and commend the mayor and the city council for recognizing the importance of and the importance of investing in New York City public schools and employees. The future that our education provides for a child is more of the most important obligations we must fulfill. I also want to commend the city for its leadership in prioritizing the health and safety of over 1 million students and tens of thousands of teachers and support staff throughout, this, throughout the schools since the onset of, COVID, of the COVID-19 pandemic over a year ago. It is important for us here today to applaud essential workers, um, including those represented by Local 372, through the school system, and though the school system is largely, was largely closed, many of 9,000 school lunch employees and 2,600. Time expired. I'll summarize, Mr. Chair, if that's okay. Yes. Uh, 2,600 workers, uh, school lunch employees, and school crossing guards remained on the job throughout this pandemic. I applaud the council for um, looking into the public health um, crisis that we have in our uh, school kitchens uh, with ventilation and air conditioning and the response from the council um, to 
provide 69 million in fiscal year 2022 in the city budget towards the DOE's capital plan. Um, our students are facing mental health crisis, and I want to point out that the SAP is already prepared for the social emotional um, component and in looking into uh, what the children need forward, um, moving forward. And so we we want to ask the council um, if they can match the two million dollars allocated for SAP is, um that the state of um, legislature has done. Uh, parent coordinators have also navigated this crisis for families um, and our community titles in um, assisting parents who have language barriers uh, with paperwork um, and different things that they need to go to certain agencies throughout this crisis and are certainly needed. Um, we, we deal with a public health homeless crisis and local 372 members while working and servicing uh, members and uh, community members and children um, also experience this homelessness. So to address this homeless crisis among our working members, Local 372 respectfully requests that the city council and the mayor raise our members' wages um, in addition to looking into hazard pay for those who were essential so that they can afford to stay in their homes and put food on their own tables to ensure our members have adequate job and income protections. Um, and on, at this critical time, school support staff are critical in this function in school system. They create space every day where teachers can teach and students can learn. Local 372 workers will provide these essential services to, public, to the public school system. Um, in closing, I'll just extend my gratitude to the members of the council for their support for all of our titles. We recognize that it is not enough resources to address every worthy or righteous cause. Um, and ser for service throughout the city. I um, mean, there are some tough decisions to be made over the next couple of years, but we thank you for your support. And on behalf of the 24,000 members of Local 372, uh, I wanna thank you for this opportunity to testify before you at the council. Thank you, Donald, and thank you for uh, being in a school. It's really important that you're actually there. Uh, thank you, workers, please, for the frontline uh, service that, that they provided New Yorkers during the um, pandemic. Uh, especially providing food. I uh, saw them uh, at a number of the schools uh, handing out food and they were kind and receptive and really did a fantastic job uh, as do all of your members. So thank you for coming in and giving testimony. Very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Councilmember Dorma Diaz has a question. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Drum. No, it's, it's not a question. Just want to say thank you to Donald Desmond and the 24,000 that you're, you know, that you're representing today. It was definitely an honor and a pleasure to work with you in getting the food out and the meals and for you yourself going out the extra mile and making sure that the meals were delivered. Just want to thank you again publicly for your service and that of your staff. And I know it was hot and, you know, intense conditions. And again, I can't thank you enough for, for making it happen. Thank you, Donald. Thank you, Council Member, for all you do. Thank you. Let's go to our next witness, Council. We'll now hear from James Davis, followed by Jim Hamlin McLeod. Time starts now. Good morning. Thank you, Chairperson Drum and Finance Committee members. My name is James Davis. I'm a faculty member at Brooklyn College and the president elect of the Professional Staff Congress, the union that represents 30,000 faculty and staff in the CUNY system. Appreciate the opportunity to speak with you for a minute this morning about. Uh, the needs that CUNY has as you negotiate the final city budget. Um, in a moment, um, I think my colleague, uh, outgoing president Barbara Bowen will speak to you about attempting to restore the cuts um, right now on the table are approximately $67 million in cuts to CUNY. Um, and we're really seeking a restoration of those cuts, but I wanna focus on a couple of areas of investment um, above and beyond the cuts that we believe would really go a long way to uh, making CUNY um, be central to the recovery of the city. Um, three areas in particular. One is that we're really seeking support um, from the city for revenue to offset the tuition losses that our community colleges are currently suffering. Community college enrollment has declined, but it will recover. And it's really critical that in addition to the support uh, from the state that the city uh, also do its part in helping the community colleges to rebound. So we're seeking approximately $40 million um, to, to help from the city um, so that those hardest hit students can come back uh, from the pandemic. The other two areas we're seeking uh, additional funding, uh, $20.4 million, has to do with mental health counseling 
and uh, academic advisement. Currently, CUNY students um, do not have access at nearly the um, professionally recommended rates of mental health counselors or academic advisors. Um, so these are the areas that we really seek the, um, the committee's assistance in negotiating with the executive. Um, we feel that any recovery for the city has to go through CUNY and that we serve the hardest hit communities during the pandemic. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Did you say Barbara was going to join us or? I believe she is. Okay, thank you, uh, President Davis or President-elect Davis. Appreciate you coming in. Thank you. We'll now hear from Jim Hamlin McLeod, followed by Valentin Colon. Time starts now. Mr. Hamlin McLeod. I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry, I have my unmute, I'm sorry. Okay. Good morning, Chair, Committee Chair, and good morning, uh, Committee members. This testimony is on behalf of Local 1549, President Eddie Rodriguez, and the 14,000 members and taxpayers of New York City Clerical Ministry of Employees, Local 1549. Our members are the frontline workers and the nearly every city agency, 311, New York City Police Department, New York Health and Hospital, and Metro Plus. Our members primarily are women of color who live, work, shop, and vote in every community in the city. And Local 1549 Zeg Board and its 14,000 members and I are asking once again for the, the Council Finance Committee to take a leadership role, cost efficient, responsible action to save the city. We have been asking far too long for the city to monitor the agency's spending and hiring its, of its civilian employees in HRA, Health and Hospital, and 311 NYPD. The uniform agencies like NYPD, Corrections, Sanitation have been asking for more money for additional personnel, but they still have uniform personnel doing administrative work, local 1549, latest figures, factory and our collective bargaining raise, but not those of uniform personnel. And the NYPD alone shows a conservative saving of roughly $30 million recurring yearly. We have asked for an audit of these agencies' personnel, personnel and their assignments. This will save the agency, city, and taxpayers millions of dollars each year. The cost of a uniform member is two to three times the clerical worker, such as a police administrative aide or a clerical associate. The savings could be allocated to other city projects like housing, homelessness, childcare, and the environment. With more than half of the city council seats up for grabs, a mayor election and a borough president uh, position, change is coming, but today's committee council members can start to move in the right directions. The coronavirus pandemic hit the city hard. It put us in a huge deficit. Thanks to President Biden and the Congress passing the Recovery Act bill, helping states and cities and families across the country. Since the city has received the stimulus funding, it is perfect time to invest in the savings that will begin to accrue immediately. It is time to help our diverse population in need of hiring professional services interpreters instead of council roles in the latest response to the city administrator proposed budget for increasing privatization of interpreter function. I'm sorry, Chair, can I get a uh, moment, a second? Yes, please. Okay, I'll wrap it up. We have an issue with 311 call volume has gone up in the last year, many due to the pandemic. The need for more calls sent to representatives. The agency has spent money on the outside help last year just to keep up with the call volume. The local asked the committee to fund the agency for hiring more CCRs to stop unnecessary outsourced spending. The local and I also asked for the city to put money into the budget for interpreters. The agencies are wasting money, more money outside the party, um, parties to do this to interpreters. The city has a civil service title to do interpreting. The titles are not high paying jobs and they promote growth for the city and a needed income, okay? Uh, we ask the city council to make sure essential workers pay is done fairly. We ask that you support and see that New York City correction, uh, correction, sanitation, civilization, and administrative functions are placed employees on the job they were hired to do. We ask that they look into the uh, the premium pay as well that was allocated for uh, the states. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. We'll now hear from Valentin Colon, followed by Marlena Giga. Time starts now. Good morning, Chairman Dan Abram and fellow committee members. My name is Valentin Colon. 
I am the president of the New York Public Library Guild Local 1930. And I want to thank you for giving me an opportunity to testify on behalf of all the patrons and employees of the Brooklyn Public Library, the New York Public Library and the Queens Public Library. Uh, I'm here to speak on behalf of my colleagues, uh, the president of the Brooklyn Public Library Guild Local 1482, the New York Public Library Quasi Public Employees Local 374 and Queens Public Library Guild 1321. The four of us once again, join our collaborative forces to come together to testify on the importance of an open library that is clean, secure, and fully staffed. We're here to say thank you to each and every city council member who has taken steps to protect and fight for library funding. You have been the guiding light for our communities that want and need us. It is your vision that has seen us through many rough and rocky waters. During this terrible time of the pandemic, our members demonstrated their resiliency to face the challenges that befell us and to not only create but enhance in-person and remote library services for all. Our members, the frontline workers that our communities come in contact with day in and day out, find themselves struggling to maintain library services as more and more of their fellow workers leave the system. And with the mayor's proposed budget cuts, the remaining staff will need to reassess what can actually be done and what needs to be shelved. Right now, the three library systems do have enough staff to, do not, excuse me, do not have enough staff to open six days a week. During the pandemic, many public service work staff, librarians, clerks, and custodians either retired, found other work, or left for other reasons. The three libraries have graciously turned over several branches to the city so that we can play our part in fighting this pandemic. We do not know what Chairman uh, Drum, if I Finish could. Up, yes. Thank you. We do know that the impact of this pandemic will have, we do not know, I'm sorry, what the impact of this pandemic will have on the future of the libraries and the services we provide. Some things will be the same, some will be different. However, when we open all 213 branches, adult learning and tech centers for our new normal operation, our customers will expect to have their library and in-person service open six days per week. Uh, I will say that at New York Public Library, when the pandemic subsides and we return to fuller service with increased hours, programs, events, and library services, this will be an expense of, at the expense of the staff. Over the last couple budget battles, uh, Local 1930 has continued to lose members. Local 1930 has lost over 50 positions and as well as never getting an additional 100 positions that were promised to it uh, several years ago. Uh, management will tell you that circulation and programming numbers are up. This has all happened at the expense of staff not being able to take a real vacation. Um, my members for many years now have had to cancel or just not take vacation due to staffing shortages. And these shortages have at times affected branch operations, which require branch being closed, alternately, New York Time, uh, New York Public Library has had to offer overtime just to keep a branch open. Security at our neighborhood branches has always been a major issue for all stakeholders. And given the current environment, we unfortunately find ourselves in, security is of even greater importance. I will say that I was recently informed that for the Staten Island branches, we may be losing all the security guards at the branches when we reopen. And at other locations, it has at time been inadequate that, and that will continue. Uh, the concerns expressed at New York Public are the concerns shared by Queens and Brooklyn Union members. Lack of staff, security, schedule change, juggling too many programs and services are affecting each and every library employee. Uh, I will say I recently celebrated 40 years of service with the library and 12 years of service as president of Local 1930 and can speak to the decline in staffing and the impact that these shortages have created. The mayor's proposed cut will devastate library services and harm our communities, especially now when our neighbors need us to bridge the digital educational and social divide enhanced and made start by the pandemic. These can you wrap up for us? Yes. These proposed budget cuts will continue to have a lasting impact on our neighborhood libraries and the communities that call their libraries their second home. 
This will be the last time that I will have the privilege of testifying before this distinguished committee. And it is my sincere hope that your voice will once again resonate as our champions, that your wisdom will prevail and that your will will once again see the three libraries through yet another funding crisis. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Colon. We'll now hear from Marlena Giga, followed by Joe Puglio. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Marlena Giga, and I'm a Parks Department employee for 20 years and a union rep. And I want to say that now more than ever, uh, parks personnel is needed. Uh, people are going to be utilizing the parks this summer now more than ever. Uh, people are enjoying the outdoor space. We need to keep the park safe. We need more PEP offices. We need to keep it clean. We need more APSW maintenance workers and CSAs. CSAs are the backbone of the city, especially in the height of the season during the summer. And we just applaud the work that the Parks Department employees do. And please keep the funding so we can keep New York safe and keep the parks clean. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from Joe Puglio, followed by Barbara Bowen. Time starts now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, City Council. Uh, I just want to touch upon what Giga had said. Last year, for the first time uh, during the pandemic, this local, uh, for 25 years, I should say, had layoffs. We laid off last year urban park rangers at a time where we needed it most. We had 180 lines that we lost. Um, through last year's budget, we would like these lines restored. Okay, these are PEP officers, these are urban park rangers. Uh, these were all the essential workers that were needed during this time. Uh, these rangers that were laid off, about 50 of them, were doing pop-up sessions during the pandemic. They were assisting children on how to use masks uh, for COVID. And they were like, oh, a lot of these people had come from out of New York City. These were newly planted people that unfortunately had to go back home to their previous states uh, while providing this essential service. The parks were, were in horrendous conditions during the pandemic. More and more people used the parks than ever before in our history. And uh, to have these workers uh, let go, the city seasonal aides, the um, urban park rangers, the CPW, the assistant, um, Park service workers, all of these people that were in our parks, you know, that were doing the essential work were uh, cut back. So we like to see all these people restored. We like to see that the money earmarked, that we don't have to do this dance every year. We like to see them um, reinstated so that our, our people feel safe in our city and, and that, um, you know, we provide, we provide uh, full-time real jobs. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now hear from Barbara Bowen, followed by Bob Gormley. Time starts now. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much, Chair Drum. Thank you, members of the council. Thanks, and other members of the public. It's good to be in this uh, in this with you, all of us together. Um, you heard from my colleague, James Davis, who will soon be taking the role of PSC president about what is needed in addition in the CUNY budget, but I want to talk about what has been cut. It is absolutely the wrong way to go in this crisis to keep in the cuts that the mayor has proposed in the executive budget. The preliminary budget from the mayor had $77 million in cuts, largely to the CUNY community colleges. Thanks to the work of the council already, 10 million of that money has been put back for the ASAP program, but 67 million in cuts remains. This is totally the wrong approach. The city got federal money so that the budget could be stable, and yet there's a cut proposed here for CUNY. Um, that, that money will mean fewer positions, fewer people in classrooms, fewer mental health counselors. The nationally recommended standard for, national, for uh, mental health counselors is one to 1,000. At CUNY, it's one to 2,700 students. That's unconscionable in this crisis. The CUNY students suffered deeply in this crisis. Our students are 80% people of color. Most of them are from families whose incomes are under $30,000 a year. Their communities were devastated. To cut further in this moment 
is completely the wrong approach. Uh, it, it is the opposite of reimagining the city or doing the kind of radical reinvestment that goes against systemic racism that our mayor has called for and that the council has stood up for. We've heard the argument that there's federal money coming into CUNY, but that's not enough. This money needs to be baselined and we cannot start from behind. So I call on you in my final week as PSC president, where uh, this will be my last budget that I fight for, but not my last as a rank and file member, make sure that this budget doesn't start with Expired. cuts to me and our students. Thank you all so much. Uh, thank you, President Bowen. Um, we hear you and I can assure you that I'll be fighting for uh, the 66 million that you uh, mentioned. Uh, we're glad that the ASAP program uh, will be restored. That is very important and it's been a very successful program as well. Uh, but I also wanna personally thank you for your service. You have been dedicated, honest, you know, a strong fighter for your members. And I deeply appreciate the relationship that we've had over the years ever since I was elected to the city council. So thank you very much. Good luck and um, hang in there. We're, thank you. We, I'll be back in the We don't wanna lose you. We don't thank wanna you. lose you. I'll be in the classroom. Don't worry. All right, okay. <laughs> thank Good. you so much. Danny. Good. We'll now hear from Bob Gormley, followed by Jesse Bodine. Time starts now. Sir, you're still on mute. Can you accept the unmute request? Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, good morning, Chairperson Drum and other council members. My name is Bob Gormley. I'm the district manager of Community Board 2 in Manhattan. I've already submitted my full testimony, so I'll just read the final two paragraphs. On December 21st, 2020, all the community boards in New York City received an email from the Office of Management and Budget directing us to reduce our fiscal year 2021 budgets by uh, over $3,600 and our fiscal year 2022 budgets by over $8,000. This directive was dri driven by, quote, budget challenges the city faces due to COVID-19. I was able to specify the fiscal year 2021 cuts from our OTPS budget while gratefully knowing that we still had $5,500 from discretionary funds provided by council members Chin and Kalos that would get us through the remainder of the year. However, I explained to OMB that our fiscal 22 OTPS budget was only about 71, was actually $7,181, which would leave us almost $1,000 short of the requested budget cut. Put another way, the fiscal 2022 cut would eliminate our entire OTPS budget, meaning that we would have no city money to pay our cleaning person who comes in once every two weeks, make our quarterly copy machine payments, purchase paper, paper clips or staples, or the various other items necessary to run an office. We recognize that despite guarded optimism regarding the city's economy, we have a long way to go before we are out of the woods. However, as the city's economy slowly rebounds and, and funds from the Recovery Act passed in Washington help make the city's economy more stable, we are hopeful that the city council will see the wisdom of restoring all or at least part of the pre-pandemic community board budgets. The money invested in community boards is a minuscule portion of the city budget and gives tremendous bang for the buck. We are a good investment. This committee, Speaker Johnson and the entire city council has always recognized the value of community boards and historically has rescinded most of the budget cuts proposed by the executive branch. We need your support, thank you. Thank you very much and uh, very well said. And I look forward to uh, supporting that issue uh, as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from Jesse Bodine, followed by Susan Stetzer. Time starts now. Good morning, Chair Drum and fellow council members on the Committee of Finance. Um, my name is Jesse Bodine, and I have the privilege to be the district manager of Manhattan Community Board 4, representing West Chelsea, Hudson Yards, Clinton, and Hell's Kitchen. The last time I provided testimony before this body, I was advocating for the continuation of the council's dedicated increase to the community board budgets. We are certainly in a different time and place. With no consultation and very little notice, the community boards were uh, told to cut uh, approximately $12,000 out of their fiscal year 21 uh, budget. And apparently these cuts will remain for fiscal year 22. As some of you know from your personal experiences on community boards, that we are responsible for meeting our city, char our city charter mandates, adhering to all open meeting laws and providing city agencies and elected officials like yourselves with thoughtful and re uh, effective re recommendations. And we do all of this with an OTPS budget that hasn't had a consistent baseline increase in 
decades. The impact of COVID-19 pandemic has brought uh, a lot, I'm sorry, <laughs> has brought a lot of changes to community board operations. It has clarified our strengths and our weaknesses. But that is what has not changed is our dedication to providing the community re, communities we represent with a transparent and authentic access to public process. All right, hold on one second. Uh, with a matter of week, with a, in a matter of weeks of the city shutting down, we trained our staff and our members and shifted to a completely virtual format. Virtual meetings have allowed us to reach more people than ever before but to sustain this operation will require resources. Without city council restoring the cuts to our budget, we will essentially be ignoring the benefits of virtual meetings have had on the public process. While I can only speak for my board, the demand of a hybrid virtual in-person public meeting process is a reality and that has, and that has, and that has an, orga an organization that will need to be, uh, respond to. For these reasons, I urge the committee to recognize the cost effectiveness of restoring the budget cuts to community boards and to, and to pre-COVID-19 levels. And I thank you today for your time and attention. Thank you. We'll now hear from Susan Stetzer, followed by Jessica Guzman Mejia. Thank you, for, thank you for this opportunity to testify for community board budgets. I'm submitting more detailed testimony, but we'll summarize here. Those of us who have been district managers for a long time have been through programs to eliminate the gap and we know how to share the pain. That is not the case now. We were informed last December our budgets would be cut. This went from $8,000 to $11,000, which left some of us in the red and the cuts had to be spread out over more than one year, which is unheard of. My board has survived the current year only because of city council discretionary funds. We were told cuts might not occur for FY22. It depended on federal funds. We did get federal funds, agencies received funding, and the executive budget response for community boards was, and I quote, in FY22, the community board budget is maintained. I still don't understand this. Um, we called OMB and found the budgets had not been maintained and our council office um, confirmed this. This seems to be more about how community boards are valued rather than about relatively small amount of funding. We maintain that community boards are the biggest bang for the buck in New York. Each board has 50 members working without pay as part-time civil servants. The ability of 59 boards to perform their char charter mandated responsibilities must be supported by funding salary and operations. Boards partner with city agencies, making each more effective. This has been crucial during the pandemic when we worked with local nonprofits, elected officials, agencies to deliver food, PPE, and now testing and vaccines to those in need. The ability for community boards to outreach to our communities is more important than ever. We have many new programs, open restaurants, open streets, open culture, that have confusing and conflicting regulations especially when with overlapping agencies such as DOT and right. the State Liquor Authority. Community boards bridge the gap with information to businesses and residents and provide feedback to our agencies. Our virtual meetings have allowed us to reach more people than ever, and we cannot meet demands for service delivery assistance and facilitating community input without maintaining our funding. We should be receiving additional funding. Our district service cabinet meetings held monthly have never been more crucial. At these meetings, we work collaboratively to try and understand and resolve new issues that have never been experienced before. Community boards urge city council to support restoration of our full budgets so we can continue our work with our residents, our businesses, our elected officials and city agencies to fulfill our indispensable and charter mandated responsibilities. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from Jessica Guzman Mejia, followed by Michelle Demott. Time starts now. Thank you, Council Member and Committee Chair Drum and other committee members for taking the time to listen to the to the testimony drafted by Hispanic Federation. I am here today to advocate for Latinos across New York City. As the City Council builds the 21-22 budget to aid New York City's post-pandemic recovery, we urge you to prioritize funding to boost the economic health and educational livelihood of the Latino community. It is essential 
to the city's revival. We are grateful to the city council for their commitment to funding the Communities of Color Nonprofit Stabilization Fund. Our network of 100 plus Latino community-based organizations are the frontline service providers for neighborhoods and communities throughout the city. We thank the city council for their continued support of community-based organizations and trusting us to continue facilitating nonprofit capacity building. As the city begins planning for economic recovery, city council should prioritize investments that expand the long-term economic prospects of Latinos and immigrant workers. The following workforce programs must be funded. The bridge program for workforce development at 850K, the digital inclusion and literacy initiative at 2 million, the job training and placement initiative at 5.7 million. These funds will help bridge and, and will bridge the digital divide and elevate economic livelihood of Latinos and minorities. In terms of health, we want to make sure that the New York City must continue to fund the vaccine for all campaign. Um, it has been great in terms of pushing to broadcast the effectiveness and safety of vaccines to combat mistrust and hesitancy in the Latino community. The Immigrant Health Initiative must continue at an appropriation of $2 million to address the growing health disparities among immigrants resulting from the pandemic. Immigrants serve as the backbone to the city's economy. We wanna make sure the city council should maintain funding for immigration legal services, including 28.4 million allocated right. last year for CUNY Citizenship Now, the New York Immigrant Family Unity Project and Immigrant Opportunities Initiative. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you for coming in and giving testimony. Well, We've now been joined by Councilmember Van Bramer. And we'll now hear from Michelle DeMott, followed by Nicole McVinwa. Good morning, Chair. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Good morning, Chair Drum and distinguished members of the City Council. I'm Michelle Zamat, and I'm the Chief of Staff to Mitchell Nedburn, President and CEO of Samaritan Daytop Village. I first want to thank you for your continued support during these challenging times. Samaritan Daytop Village is a nationally recognized human services organization that provides comprehensive services to more than 33,000 people each year through a network of over 60 facilities, primarily located in the five boroughs of New York City. We depend on funding from the City Council to continue to safely provide these services to New Yorkers in need. The critical importance of mental health and substance use services has never been clearer than at this moment. It goes without saying that the pandemic is not only a physical health crisis, but a behavioral health crisis. New York City faces an unprecedented, unprecedented rise in the demand for behavioral health services. The clients that we serve are the most vulnerable New Yorkers, many of whom are low to no income with complex medical and behavioral health needs. The physical and emotional isolation as a result of the pandemic has manifested into new and increased feelings of anxiety, restlessness, and stress, which can be triggers for those with behavioral health and substance use disorders. As a result of the increased need for our services, our organization has submitted requests to the City Council for continued funding as well as for one new initiative. Being mindful of the City's finances, Samaritan has restricted our ask to the most needed services areas, which has been exacerbated by the pandemic. Samaritan is requesting a total of $640,000 to expand and support the wide ranging services we offer to women, children, families, veterans, and seniors aging adults. Our request includes funding to expand a pilot for an after school zone, which is critically needed to address educational barriers that disproportionately affect homeless children, employment readiness and training for veterans, trauma informed services for veterans brought on by the pandemic, health education and promotion workshops to help combat the opioid epidemic, which has been overshadowed by the pandemic and support wellness activities for seniors and aging adults. Samaritan Daytop Village is grateful for your consideration. Time expired. This request, I thank you on behalf of Samaritan for allowing me to testify today. Thank you, Michelle, for coming in and uh, I'm working on, on your requests. Thank you. We will now hear from Nicole McVinwa, followed by Jessica Sinke. Starting time. Good morning, Chair Drum and members of the committee. My name is Nicole McVinnie and I am the Director of Policy at Urban Pathways. Urban Pathways is a nonprofit homeless services and supportive housing provider. And last year we served over 3,900 New Yorkers in need. Throughout the pandemic, our doors have never closed and our services have never stopped. At great risk to their own health and that of their families, our frontline staff continue to come to work to ensure the well-being of our clients and residents. 
Despite this commitment in the face of a global pandemic, our staff receives poverty wages under our city contracts. Our contracts only pay 85 to 87 cents for every dollar of the actual cost to run our programs. And it is difficult to ensure our staff receives the pay they deserve. This leads to high staff turnover and we are currently facing a critical staffing shortage at our organization. We simply cannot run our services without our committed workforce and our well-funded city contracts. After the city council demanded the indirect cost rate funding uh, in the FY22 preliminary budget response, Mayor de Blasio announced the addition of $57 million to restore the FY21 cut and to baseline the full 91 million to uh, sustain the program for future years as part of his FY22 executive budget. We thank you for championing this issue and we must ensure that this funding makes it into the final adopted budget. However, the need to, for the FY22 budget to invest in essential human services workforce remains. We also need the restoration of the cost of living adjustment on the personnel service lines of all human services contracts at the rate of 3% at a cost of $48 million for FY22. And we also need a plan for the administration to promote wage equity in the public sector by correcting the pay disparities the human services workforce experiences as outlined in the city council's FY22 preliminary budget response. If this year's budget is truly going to reflect an equitable recovery for the city, it must address the inadequate wages and underfunding of the human services workforce, 82% of whom, whom are people of color expired. and 82% of whom are women. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. We will now hear from Jessica Sinke, followed by MJ Akma. Starting time. Good morning, council members and Chair Drom. Thank you for hearing testimony today. My name is Jessica Sinke, and I'm a policy analyst at FPWA. We are an anti-poverty and policy organization with a membership of 170 community and faith-based human services organizations in New York. While the executive budget makes important strides in the journey to full recovery, there are still several initiatives that need more support. For example, expanding access to childcare and youth programming resources for families who need it the most. We echo the call for $45 million to create 3K truly for all families. Additionally, the new Summer Rising program is set to launch in a matter of weeks, asks more of community-based organizations than ever before without providing the proper supports or adequate funding. The sector is thrilled to see such expansion and is honored to be a part of it. But without these resources, the program may not be successful and CBOs are fearful that they will be blamed. We encourage the city to invest an additional $45 million in funding for 3K for All and to increase the rates for community-based Summer Rising providers to reflect the true costs of the program. We also urge the city to invest in services for older adults. Currently, the DIPTA budget needs an additional $16.6 .6 million in funding in order to meet the increased need for home delivered and culturally competent meals. Lastly, we support a 3% cost of living adjustment for human services workers. Withholding the COLA is an ineffective way to reduce costs to balance the budget, since approximately 60% of those working in New York's nonprofit human services sector are utilizing or have a family member utilizing some form of public assistance benefits, such as Medicaid or food stamps. Keeping wages this low only increases the need for and costs of these public assistance programs. That's why we're requesting $48 million for a 3% COLA for human services workers. These measures will ensure that all New Yorkers have better access to dignity, opportunity, and upward mobility. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify, and we look forward to working closely with you to ensure that New Yorkers receive the supports they need in order to thrive. Thank you. We will now hear from MJ Akma, followed by Juan Pinzon. Good morning. My Starting time. Good morning, my name is MJ Okuma with the Human Services Council, a membership organization representing over 170 New York um, human services nonprofits. I wanted to start off by thanking the City Council for demanding that funding for the indirect cost rate initiative was restored. It was only after the Council included this investment in your budget response that Mayor de Blasio announced the reversal of fiscal year 21 ICR cuts and higher baseline funding to, funding to sustain the program and prevent future cuts. We look forward with standing united with the council and the administration on this issue to ensure that it makes it into the adopted budget. Unfortunately, as you know so well, cuts to indirect funding are not the only crisis facing the our city's human services sector. The need for the fiscal year 22 budget to invest in the essential human services workforce remains. 
The council's budget response also included a call for 48 million to restore the COLA on the personnel service line of all human services contracts at a rate of 3% and a plan to create and fund wage equity for human services workers. It is important that these investments make it into the adopted budget. When the city drastically underfunds human services contracts, it is being dependent on low wage workers to fill in those gaps. This dangerous pattern has resulted in the average annual income of 32,700 for human services workers in New York City. It is shameful that New York City's human services workforce, where 82% women and 80% people of color are one of our city's lowest paid workforces. While COVID-19 didn't create the crisis facing these workers, it did exasperate it. Going forward, New York City must invest in these essential workers. This means including $48 million to restore the COLA that expired last year during the height of the pandemic and creating a plan to fund wage equity for human services workers so they are finally paid fairly under city contracts. We look forward to continue advocating together on these vital fiscal year 22 investments. Thank you so much for your support and opportunity to testify. I will also be submitting written testimony for the record. Thank you, MJ, and it's been a pleasure to work with you and uh, continue to work with you as we move forward. Thank you again. Same. Thank you so much. We will now hear from Juan Pinzon, followed by Christy Peel. Starting time. Good morning, Chair Drum. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Uh, my name is Juan Pinzon. I'm the Director of Health Campaigns and Government Engagement at the Community Service Society. Our health programs, as you said, just remind you help New Yorkers enroll into health insurance coverage through the marketplace and also access the healthcare system through our Life Answer Helpline and also through a par partnership with more than 50 community-based organizations throughout the state. Uh, annually, we serve approximately 300,000 New Yorkers, saving them over $60 million in healthcare costs. Um, today, I'm testifying to our to urge the city council to increase funding for the New York City Managed Care Consumer Assistance Program, which as you know, is part of the Access Health NYC initiative. Um, despite the financial hardships uh, the city has faced in this past year, uh, I think that this, this is exactly the right time to invest in programs, invest in programs like MACAP and Access Health. We need a program like MACAP and Access Health uh, to address the health inequities exposed by the pandemic to help New Yorkers deal with rising healthcare prices and the complex healthcare system that creates uh, additional barriers to care. Uh, MACAP helps people understand the insurance, resolve their health insurance problems, get the medical services that they need, uh, access affordable care for those who are uninsured, and also uh, address the social determinants of health. Uh, we also serve as a trusted advocate that provides reliable information to marginalized communities of color about COVID-19 vaccine distribution, safety, and effectiveness. Uh, we also need an expanded version of MACAP because there are thousands of New Yorkers who need our help this year, navigating and accessing enhanced uh, financial assistance uh, available to purchase um, uh, ACA coverage to the marketplace and co cover a premium support available under the new Federal American Rescue Plan Act. MACAP can make a significant difference because of our community-based approach that provides culturally and linguistically competence uh, services to people. Uh, we have 12 community uh, CB, uh, CBOs that provide services Time across the five boroughs. And, you know, what we're asking basically is to restore the 50% cut that was cut for Access Health and increase MACAP's allocation from four twenty-five to $750,000 in a, uh, fiscal year 2022. This is a time when the city should uh, leverage every dollar available to the Federal Ameri American Rescue Plan to strengthen programs that directly help low-income immigrant New Yorkers and communities of color who have been disproportionately, disproportionately affected by the pandemic. Thank you so much for the opportunity to provide this testimony today. Thank you. We will now hear from Christy Peel, followed by John Baker. Thank you, Chair Drum, so Speaker. Uh, thank you, Chair Drum, uh, Speaker Johnson, Finance Committee members uh, for uh, the opportunity to testify today. Uh, the center promotes and protects affordable homeownership in New York so that middle and working class families are able to live in strong, thriving communities. Affordable, affordable homeownership is a crucial component of New York City's vibrant and diverse neighborhoods. In the neighborhoods where the Center for New York City Neighborhoods works, affordable homeownership means families can build equity while also benefiting from stable housing costs in a city of rapidly increasing rents. We all know the effects of COVID-19 uh, on our 
black and brown communities across the city. We're concerned there's even more economic pain to come with a eviction and foreclosure moratoria set to expire. Our experience has shown that foreclosure prevention is the best way to help families to keep their homes and their equity. Uh, with our network of housing counseling and legal services organizations, we've assisted over 250,000 homeowners since our founding in partnership with the council back in 2008. We're desperate to avoid some of the tragedies that we saw after the financial crisis of 2008, and we've recently seen that the number of Black homeowners in Queens <laughs> declined by over 22,000 between 2007 and 2017. Right now, Brooklyn, Queens, and the Bronx all have significantly higher levels of mortgage distress than the rest of New York State. Uh, the numbers, uh, the specific numbers are in our written testimony, but I just wanted to highlight that the Bronx alone has nearly double the rate of mortgage distress as the rest of the country. And when forbearances or, or mortgage holidays and the federal and state foreclosure moratoria end, a huge number of New York City homeowners will face foreclosure. COVID-19 and the resulting job losses and medical bills have left thousands of our neighbors in precarious financial situations. In this, uh, in this year of recovery, we are requesting that the center, uh, that the center and the city council uh, work to identify over $8 million in uh, city council initiative and discretionary funding to support comprehensive set services. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify and your ongoing partnership and support. Thank you. We will now hear from John Baker, followed by Jorge Velez. Uh, starting time. Good morning. I'm also from the Center for New York City Neighborhoods. Uh, and I'd like to take just one second to, uh, to add to what Christy uh, just spoke about. Um, our foreclosure prevention funding is especially important this year because uh, not only are we worried about the many homeowners coming out of foreclosure moratoria uh, and, uh, and uh, forbearance, but um, our work will help these struggling homeowners avoid foreclosure, help them ac access federal aid as it comes in. And most of all, we wanna work with mortgage servicers to come to equitable solutions to keep these family in their homes. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity and I yield the rest of my time. Thank you very much. We will now hear from Jorge Velez, followed by Carlin Cowan. Starting time. Jorge Velez, can you accept the unmute request? Okay, we'll circle back and uh, next we will hear from Carlin Cowan. Starting time. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, Chair Drum and the members of the City Council for holding this hearing today and for the opportunity to testify. My name is Carlin Cowan, my pronouns are they, them, and I'm the Chief Policy and Public Affairs Officer of CPC, the Chinese American Planning Council. CPC is the nation's largest Asian American social services agency serving 60,000 Asian American immigrant and low income New Yorkers throughout all five boroughs each year. As I'm sure you will hear across the testimonies today, our social services agencies have been hard hit by the COVID-19 pandemic uh, after decades of systematic disinvestment leading up to that, and we are all struggling to recover. That's why I'm here before you today and you'll hear from my other colleagues throughout the day about our specific programs and the community needs that we have been seeing, which make the funding for those programs incredibly urgent. Everything from our community members facing eviction, struggling with job loss and unemployment, 70% of our community members have lost jobs and incomes over the last year and need a new variety of services from eviction prevention to unemployment support, navigating remote school and more. At the same time, our human services organizations continue to struggle to make ends meet. We have seen really important strides forward through efforts like restoring the indirect funding, continuing to, uh, to restore funding for social services, but we need to see a much deeper investment. At the same time, we have not seen meaningful reductions to the NYPD budget in a way that reduces the policing of communities of color, immigrants, and low-income communities. We will continue to urge the city council to invest in our communities instead of 
investing in policing them. We need to be funding community-based services. We need to be funding our communities of color, our low-income communities, and our immigrant communities, both through community-based organizations doing the work on the ground and by providing a robust social safety net, housing, uh, employment and unemployment support, and more. We urge the council to continue prioritizing for these community-based organizations, boost funding for social safety net programs, which you will hear about from my other colleagues. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, Carlin. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Okay, and we'll now hear from Jorge Velez, followed by Zeneb Tawil. Um, good morning. Starting time. Good morning. Uh, my name is George Velez. Uh, I am a custodial staff and a century worker for the Queens Division of the Chinese American Planning Council, which is also known as CPC. I have been in this role since November of 2020. As a custodial staff, I maintain the hygiene and safety of our Queens Community Center, a 10-story building located in Flushing, Queens, that once saw a thousand community members daily. Before this, I was a program participant or student at CPC's Hotel Hospitality Careers Training Program, which is based in the same community center and trains individuals to work in the hotel hospitality industry. Through these experience, through these various experiences, I see firsthand the way that essential workers like myself have uh, to respond to the many changing demands of the pandemic to keep our facilities, staff, and community members safe and healthy. For example, I've created a cleaning schedule to send size elevator buttons, elevator core buttons, doorknobs, and main entrance door and glass. Uh, I also sanitize the sink, kitchen, and counter and microwave area more frequently. Uh, we've also had to close up the fountains on every office floor. Uh, I am one of uh, hundreds of staff at CPC and one of thousands of staffs across the human services industry who is working tirelessly to keep serving New Yorkers who are hardest hit by the pandemic. As you make your considerations regarding the city's budget for the next fiscal year, I urge you to preserve existing funding to support essential human services staff like me and my colleagues so that we may continue to help underserved families. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Zainab Tawil, followed by Joy Luang Faxe. Start in time. Hi, Chairman Jerome, members of the Committee on Finance. I wanna thank you for the opportunity to testify before you here today. My name is Zainab Tawil and I'm the mental health caseworker at the Arab American Association of New York. 2020 and 2021 have been some of the most challenging years which our organizations and organizations across the city have experienced. The political, economic, and social upheavals of the last year have taken a heavy toll on the communities we serve and such our resources are spread thinner than ever before. At the same time, service cuts necessitated by, la necessitated by last year's city budget have severely impacted our ability to provide the services we do for thousands of in-need families across New York City. Even as the direct threat of COVID is lessening, the need of the Arab and Pan-Asian community in New York is still incredibly high. Families are still out of work, students are still isolated from resources, and there's no end in sight to the wave of anti-Asian and anti-Arab bias crimes in our city. Organizations like AAA and Y need resources if we're going to provide the services our communities need to make it through the continuing crisis and ensuring that the upcoming budget for next year accommodates these services and can change countless lives. Over the past year, we've seen at least a 20% increase in demand for mental health services across the Pan-Asian American community due to COVID-19, an alarming uptake in DV's cases and a surge in anti-Asian violence, violence that continues unabated. This during a time when our community-based organizations experienced city funding cuts from 15 to 30% for the fiscal year. The cultural competency that organizations like mine provide to our clients is a critical factor. While obviously the stigma surrounding mental health care is a huge barrier to members of the community, the importance of culturally sensitive program programming extends far beyond that. We serve hundreds of women who come to us looking to build their English language skills, but for who cultural reasons may not continue to learn if classes aren't offered in a culturally sensitive environment. Our youth programs serve a demographic facing a unique set of challenges and issues due to COVID-19 and our country's political climate that requires special attention and advocacy has come to hurdles when working with legislators and a public that often cannot see beyond the hijab. 
I'm on my last paragraph, so it'll be like 10 seconds. Time expired. To the city's credit, there have been public commitments to providing these services, but because of last year's highly restrictive budget, much of the mental health and community outreach programs proposed are still underfunded and incomprehensive. Furthermore, city-funded programs like Thrive NYC do very little to address these issues of cultural competency, and rather than supporting CBOs doing the actual work, the city is funding new programs that simply do not meet the marks for ours and other Asian communities. Nonprofits need support to address the immediate crisis and build long-term community resilience. Programs like Hope Against Hate co campaign created by the Asian American Federation need to be a priority for the city's budget, not an afterthought. Unless action is taken by the city to fund organizations doing the actual work on the ground and to protect our communities, we risk these stressors becoming, causing long-term damage. Thank you for your time. What did you say was the um, tab on that? Excuse me, repeat your question. What did you say was the, the amount of money that you were requesting? Um, Asian American Federation will speak on it more if you're specifically talking about the Hope Against Hate campaign. Yes. Okay, thank you. Of course. We will now hear from Joy Long Faxe, followed by Olivia Duong. Good morning, my name is Joy Long Faxe. Good morning, my name is Joy Long, Assistant Executive Director for Behavioral Health Services at Hamilton Madison House, or HMH. First, I would like to thank the City Council Committee on Finance for this important hearing on the fiscal year 2000, um, 2022 executive budget. HMH is a multifaceted community service organization operating in Chinatown on the Lower East Side, however, provides services citywide. We have an early childhood program, senior services and behavioral health. HMH specializes in providing behavioral health services to all communities. However, we're the largest outpatient behavioral health provider for the Asian, Asian community on the East Coast. Currently, we operate five mental health clinics, a post program and a supportive housing program for adults coping with severe mental illness. Our staff are all bilingual and languages spoken, them, spoken among them are Chinese, Korean, Japanese, Cambodian, and Vietnamese. The large majority of these are we serve are first generation immigrants of low income status and mainly are receiving therapy for the first time. Consistently, they share that their mental health symptoms relating to difficulties with employment, finances, housing, immigration status, and health. In the past year, we have seen drastic increase of high-risk clients seeking mental health due to the effects of COVID and the anxieties and fears associated with the anti-Asian hate. The recent report released by Stop A AAPI Hate re revealed nearly 38 100 incidents were reported over the course of roughly a year during the pandemic, and we believe this is a tiny fraction of the total. HMH has seen an increase of individuals seeking support and mental health services by 10% in the last three months and 25% among the pan um, since the pandemic. They express fears of being attacked, increased anxiety and depressions as common reported issues. For all those reasons, we believe it's imperative that City Council makes it a priority to fund initiatives and work with community organizations and mental health providers to tackle anti-Asian violence and further expand mental health services. We will be, we need funding for the Hope Against Hate campaign for a minimum amount of 10 million and a new initiative funding so that the nonprofits who are leading the work such as and providing direct services can get the funding they need. We are strongly urging the Committee of Finance to not forget about us and address these growing issues and allocate the appropriate funding to increase mental health resources in the Asian community. Thank you. We will now hear from Olivia Duong, followed by Anya Mukherjee uh, Connolly. Starting time. Hello and good morning, Chairperson uh, Drom and fellow council members. I believe this may be the first testimony that uh, an NYPD scientist will give, so I thank you for the opportunity. My name is Olivia Duong and I am president of Local 3778 DC 37, representing 300 civilian NYPD professional titles such as criminalists, city research scientists, architects and engineers. I'm here to highlight the hard work of NYPD civilians and to voice our support to further civilianize the department. The criminalists of the police laboratory are forensic scientists who analyze different types of evidence involved in an alleged crime, such as controlled substances, latent fingerprints, and firearms. Our job is to remain objective, impartial, and unbiased while conducting analysis using accredited scientific methods. 
Criminalists testify in court as expert witnesses to the results of our analysis. Our testimony educates juries to make informed and fair verdicts. Throughout the pandemic, criminalists were deemed essential workers for a critical role in public safety, and we answered the call. With the scrutiny of the NYPD's budget, what our members have experienced is that the civilian units are the first areas in which the budget is cut. We are in agreement with the Finance Committee that more oversight is needed in exactly where and how money is spent within the department. Civilians can play a larger role in support roles for policing. I would like to point out a few examples of some areas where there could be cost savings in the NYPD. For one, the firearms analysis section of the lab, which is currently a hybrid uniform civilian section, it is typical for many detectives to leave the lab when they are called in for detail, which leaves the laboratory short staffed for our own essential work. Having more civilians in this unit would be an added advantage to the city without compromising the quality of forensic work. Another area looking uh, worth looking into for further civilianization is the uh, Chairman, if I may continue yeah, for 30 please. more seconds. Yes, please. Thank you. Another area worth looking into is the evidence control section of the police laboratory, which is responsible for 24 seven intake security and storage of forensic evidence. The section is traditionally staffed by 100% uniform members. Um, due to the recent massive retirements by these officers, um, criminalists have stepped up to the plate and filled in these positions for over half a year. It's evident that these roles do not require someone with extensive police training and can be filled by civilians. Uh, in addition, there are many sections within the PD that carry out solely administrative duties, and the majority of these units are supervised by uniform members. We have civilian city research scientists working alongside sergeants and lieutenants in strategic research units that analyze and evaluate department policies, programs, and resources. Um, the scientists have advanced degrees in physical and social science, sciences, but are supervised and evaluated by uniform members. So we also believe that having civilians in higher positions within the police department will help to lead to meaningful changes to police policies, um, which reflect what the civilian public wants to see. In summary, there are more areas where we can further civilianize the NYPD and the union applauds the city council for pushing the initiative. I do not believe that the public wants a reduction in forensic science or less internal oversight of the NYPD. Uh, we understand the city will be facing difficult economic times ahead, but without stringent oversight, the budget will inevitably be balanced on the backs of the civilian workforce. Mr. Sherman, I will submit my written testimony for the record and I thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you also submit your uh, written testimony to me at drum, D-R-O-M-M, -M, at council.nyc.gov? Certainly. Thank you so much. I'd like to review it. Thank you. And I know that Councilmember Adams uh, has a question. Thank you for the suggestions as well. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, Olivia, I, I just want to thank you so much uh, for your testimony this morning and I just, I'm giving you a virtual high five. You know, I chair the Committee on Public Safety. I would appreciate very much your testimony as well. Um, you can email it to A.E. Adams at council. Um, and I would appreciate it. This has been something that I've been thinking about for quite a while now, uh, as far as civilianization of the NYPD and everything that you said is so very valuable, pardon the pun, but I think that it will indeed um, help to uh, put budgetary items as far as NYPD is concerned into their proper place and proper perspective. So I just wanted to say thank you so much for your testimony. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I will. Thank do. you. Thank you. Will, yes, we will now hear from Anya Mukherjee Connolly, followed by the Queensboro president, Donovan Richards. Time starts now. Thank you. My name is Anya Mukherjee Connolly, and I'm the Associate Director of Policy at the Brooklyn Defender Services. Thank you to the City Council Committee on Finance and Chair Drum for this opportunity to testify about our work and the importance of funding for indigent defense providers in New York City. BDS provides multidisciplinary and people-centered criminal, family, and immigration defense, as well as civil legal services, social work support, and advocacy to nearly 30,000 people and their families in Brooklyn every year. 
Our criminal and family defense is funded by MOCJ, but unfortunately these contracts do not fund the entirety of our programs or our unique wraparound services. While we, while we rely on this funding, the mayor's office has created extraordinary challenges that have resulted in the city owing BDS in excess of $12 million, mostly because of delays in contracts that go back years at this point. We respectfully request that the city council continue to insist that the city fully fund criminal and family defense, and that the council hold the mayor's office accountable for moving our contracts through the process in an expeditious manner. On the city council side of the budget, we are extremely grateful for the expense support that the speaker and the council have shown defender organizations across the city. This council has been responsible for legislating and funding groundbreaking programs that meet the needs of communities that are highly surveilled but do not or but are not reached by other service providers. These essential programs include the New York Immigrant Family Unity Project, which ensures universal representation to immigrant New Yorkers facing deportation through the NIFIP initiative. We have requested 16 million for this initiative to be shared equally amongst the providers. The Right to Family Advocacy Project, which provides advocacy to parents and caregivers being investigated by the Administration for Children's Services through the Family Advocacy and Guardianship Support Initiative. And we've requested 750,000 for this initiative. Time expired. If I just may uh, briefly state that both of these programs were first in the nation are being replicated in other parts of the country and it's something New York City should be very proud of. Um, finally, we're requesting immigrant opportunity initiative funding for our immigrant community action pr project as well as alternatives to incarceration and Dove funding for our comprehensive services. Thank you to the Committee on Finance for time to testify today and for your ongoing support um, of BDS. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now hear from the Queensborough President Donovan Richards, followed by Amber Khan. Time thank you. Now. Thank you, and thank you to the members of the Finance Committee, and great to see you, Chair Drum. And I don't have to say, I miss all of y'all down at the Council to the Sergeants. How y'all doing? Sorry, I didn't get to say goodbye, but I'm here. Uh, but good morning, everybody. Good morning, Chair Drum and members of the Finance Committee. Uh, this certainly feels like a homecoming for me. It's great to see you all again. For the purposes of the record, my name is Donovan Richards, and I have the honor of serving now as the president of the Great Borough of Queens. Queens is proudly the most diverse county in New York City, and thus we have many diverse needs within our borough. Each community represents a unique constituency and requires tailored programming, which my office hopes to accommodate moving forward. Therefore, I'm respectfully requesting additional funding be allocated towards the office of the Queensborough president. My, does it feel different to be on this side, begging for more money from my colleagues when I was just on the other side, like last year sometime. <laughs> Unlike at the city council, borough presidents are not allotted a certain amount of discretionary funds for organizations. Instead, borough presidents can choose to award expense funding to CBOs from our own agency's budget. I'm requesting additional funds be allocated to the borough president's office so that I can award more funding to deserving organizations in Queens. As you know, Queens was hit hard by the pandemic and local nonprofits were and continue to be the lifeblood that kept many underserved communities afloat. I am eternally grateful for the work that these nonprofits have done and with the right resources, they can do more. That's why I'm here to do anything I can to help these organizations get more resources to continue their important work. In addition, I'm respectfully requesting that the borough president's discretionary funding restoration initiative be restored. Last year, I was a member of the city council and can, per and can personally attest to last year's budget challenges. This allocation That's supported right. senior services with items such as meals, case management, home care, senior transportation, and more. Queens historically received almost 325 k to designate the senior service groups in Queens. And in fiscal year 2021, these funds were completely decimated. Seniors had an especially tough time throughout the pandemic and most are wholly dependent on the services provided by these senior groups. In conclusion, I would also be remiss if I did not mention other priorities, such as reinvesting in our CUNYs, health services, cultural initiatives like CASA, immigrant service initi initiatives such as CUNY Citizenship Now, youth initiatives like SYEP and food programs such as food pantries, which are all important and serve the borough of Queens. 
I understand the infinite asks that come to each of you and the finite number of dollars we have to allocate. I thank you for hearing me out and for taking this request under consideration. And once again, wanna thank you all for your partnership already uh, and what we're achieving uh, across Queens as we build uh, more just Queens coming out of this pandemic. So great to see you all. Thank you, Danny. And thank you to the Sergeant at Arms for being so kind to me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Borough President. <clears throat> it was great to see you last night at our Queens LGBTQ Pride event. Thank you for showing up and for being so inclusive of our community. And uh, I know and you know uh, that Queens has not gotten its fair share of tax dollars. And that's something that we're going to continue to fight for as we move forward toward allocation, toward adoption uh, in, the, in the budget process. So uh, thank you for coming in and for giving your testimony. Much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you so much, Danny. Thank you. Thank you for your support and thank you to the delegation, the best delegation in the Council of Queens delegation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we've also been joined by Council Members Gibson and Menchaca. And we will now hear from Amber Khan, followed by Emerald Broody Stewart. Time starts now. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you to the chairperson and the committee for the opportunity to present testimony today regarding the budget. And I'm going to speak specifically about the need to wholly transform how New York City responds to mental health crises. We urge you and the city council to authorize the mayor's allocation of $112 million and create a non-police response to mental health crises. My name is Amber Khan and I'm the director of the health justice program at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest or NOPI. NOPI is an active member of Correct Crisis Intervention Today, New York City, or CCIT NYC. We're a coalition of more than 80 mental health advocacy and other community organizations. CCIT NYC applauds the proposed allocation of this money to fund a citywide mental health crisis response system. However, at the same time, the city council must ensure that individuals who experience a mental health crisis receive appropriate services, which will de escalate the crisis and ensure their well being and the well being of all other New Yorkers. Only those who are trained in de-escalation practices should respond to mental health crisis, and the most appropriate individuals to respond are peers, those with lived mental health experience and healthcare providers. Police who are trained to uphold law and order are not suited to deal with individuals experiencing mental health crises, and New York's history of police killing individuals who are experiencing crises is a sad testament to that. In the last five years in New York City alone, Police have killed 18 individuals when responding to their crises. Eliminating the police as mental health crisis responders has been shown not only to save lives, but to result in quicker recovery from crises, greater connections with long-term healthcare services and other community resources, and averting future crises. CCIT NYC has developed a proposal in consultation with affected communities and modeled on the cahoots or crisis assistance Time helping expired. out on the streets. Thank you, if I may just finish briefly. Uh, the program is based in Eugene, Oregon. And a critical note is that the cahoots program has successfully operated for over 30 years without any major injuries to respondents or responders, let alone deaths. And it's also being adopted around the country. The main hallmarks quickly of this proposal are that police are removed as responders, calls are routed to a number other than 911, which is actually in line with one of the city council's proposed laws. And the response teams include trained peers and emergency medical technicians. Response teams are employed and dispatched by culturally competent community organizations. And there's an oversight board and that response times are comparable to those of other emergencies. Again, I wanna thank you for this opportunity to speak today and I urge the New York City Council to take immediate action to fund non-police responses to mental health crises to protect the estimated 20% of re residents who are likely to experience a mental health disorder in any given year. Thank you again. Thank you. Uh, we will now hear from Emerald Broody Stewart followed by Terry Lawson. Time starts now. Hello, my name is Emerald Broody Stewart, and I'm the senior staff attorney in the Access to Education Project at Staten Island Legal Services, which is part of Legal Services NYC. We provide free legal representation to low-income New York City residents. 
Um, I thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Over the last year, our education practice has focused on ensuring our clients are connected to remote learning and to their special education services. The written testimony I will submit will provide details on some of the cases LSNYC has handled during the COVID. The pandemic has hit students in vulnerable populations significantly hard. These students include those with disabilities, those in families where English is not their first language, and those in homes where technology uh, is not available. Our recommendations on the New York City budget center around these communities and are rooted in equity. We recommend that the budget expand assistance to students with disabilities and other students who've fallen behind grade level to receive compensatory educational services, such as tutoring. Um, it should also expand assistance to students who've experienced trauma and will need social emotional the pandemic has highlighted the need to invest in a whole school approach that is centered on healing. LSNYC wants to expand our advocacy on healing-centered schools for the many students coming back who have suffered trauma in the past year due to the pandemic and its many stressors. We also want the budget to expand assistance to students and parents who do not speak English as their first language and also expand uh, assistance to students and resources for schools to prevent the school to prison pipeline. We currently represent a student inappropriately handcuffed in school prior to the pandemic. We want such practices to end. Uh, and lastly, expand Time expired. resources. Uh, let me just uh, finish for a second. Um, expand resources to eliminate the technological divide. Even when students are back in the classroom, this inequity cannot continue. As statistics show that the lack of devices and Wi-Fi have led to unequal academic achievement for low-income students even prior to the pandemic. Uh, LS1YC is working hard on these issues, and we ask that you provide $500,000 in the budget to support our Access to Education project, which will deliver legal services designed to help children so that they're not further hurt by this pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Terry Lawson, followed by Dariel Infante. Time starts now. Good morning. My name is Terry Lawson, I'm, and I'm the executive director of Unlocal, a community-centered nonprofit organization that provides direct community education, outreach, and legal representation to New York City's undocumented immigrant communities. I'm also the co-founder and steering committee member of the Bronx Immigration Partnership. I'm here today to ask the City Council to expand funding for immigration legal services, community education, outreach, and organizing. Unlocal provides free, high-quality legal services for New York's most vulnerable immigrants, many of whom are essential workers, who are seeking employment authorization, asylum, DACA, SIG, lawful permanent residency, and much more. Last year, our legal team handled 1,000 cases for people across New York City and in parts of Long Island and upstate. Our Queer Immigrant Justice Project works with LGBTQ plus immigrants who are seeking asylum, and the director of that project was just named one of the best LGBTQ plus lawyers under 40 by the National LGBT Bar Association. Unlocal is also part of the Rapid Response Legal Collaborative, along with Make the Road New York and NILAG, and the lawyers, paralegal, and social worker who serve on our Rapid Response team have been fighting tirelessly during this pandemic to stop deportations and get people out of detention. Our rapid response work shows just how entangled ICE and law enforcement are and continue to be, despite the efforts of advocates and community members to explain to our city lawmakers how local policing feeds the deportation pipeline. We've been raising the alarm about the dangers and continued harms of city officials collaborating with ICE by telling the story of one of our clients, Javier Castillo Maradiaga, a 27-year-old Bronx man who came here when he, when he was seven, was turned over to ICE by the city and after tireless community organizing and legal strategizing was finally released from ICE custody in March. Over the past year, our education and outreach team has been busier than ever partnering with 140 community-based organizations and schools throughout the city, hosting monthly partner calls on rapidly changing law and policy, conducting 68 community events, 47 of which were virtual and has reached 8,000 attendees and posting online resources and topics ranging from the Fund for Excluded Workers, DACA, the New York State Dream Act, and more. 
We recognize that only by providing accurate, up-to-date information are we able to counteract the predatory practices of those taking advantage of the confusion and anti-immigrant rhetoric pervading our culture. Under the new administration, laws and policies continue to change at a dizzying pace, and we keep the public informed. In an era where the Biden administration continues to detain and deport people, Unlocal calls on the city council to expand funding for immigration, legal services, and community education, and specifically asks for the city council to enhance funding for the Immigration Opportunities Initiative to allow additional legal services providers like Unlocal to partner with the city council going forward. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, before we move on to the next panelist, I just want to remind everyone and to advise everyone who may have just joined us that um, you will be on mute until it is time for you to testify, at which, name, at which time your name will be called and you will be unmuted by the Zoom host. Um, please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to tell you when your time begins, um, and then they will let you know when your time is up and everybody has two minutes um, for their testimony. Um, and after you have finished testifying, you'll be removed from the Zoom meeting, but you can continue to watch the hearing live at council.nyc.gov slash live stream. And we will now hear from Daryl Infante, followed by Jocelyn Palafox Diaz. Time starts now. Thank you. Um, my name is Daryl Infante, and I'm a youth leader with Future of Tomorrow and Urban Youth Collaborative. I am 17 years old and I am NYC student attending multicultural high school. As a youth leader, I take responsibility in advocating for the rights and safety of other students. Last week, the NYPD deputy chief of the school safety division stated that their agency has lost 554 school police positions over the course of the pandemic. Today, I am here to demand that the New York City Council will not hire to replace these positions and instead reinvest the 50 million in student support staff and programs. I want police free schools and investment in guidance counselors, nurses, restorative justice programming and school infrastructure. As an immigrant student in NYC, I attend a public school where my peers and myself will greatly benefit from the reinvestment of $50 million into our school and co-located campus over the next course of the next school year. As students, we are going to return to campuses where our peers, teachers, and faculty are gravely traumatized by the COVID, social unrest, and the increased awareness of police brutality against black and brown immigrants community. Cops in our schools criminalize students along racial lines at disproportionate rates with zero consequences. More schools with black and brown students have an increased police presence in, in our environment. The last thing I and the other 1 million plus students in attending New York City public schools need are more police officers and, system, and systems that continue to see, to see us as targets and criminals unworthy of simply existing. And NYC public schools this decrease in Time office down is only the start of our campaign and force to abolish the school to prison pipeline and achieve police free schools. But as the city council approaches budget as an abode for the 2022 budget, we urge you to push for police free schools throughout not rehiring the 554 lost school safety agents and reinvesting 50 million back into our youth. Thank you so much. We will now hear from Joyce and Palafax Diaz, followed by Juan Torres. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Jocelyn Palafax Diaz. I live in Sun Island. I'm in the 11th grade and I'm a youth leader at Maker New York and Urban Youth Collaborative. I'm here today testifying because for years, NYC youth have called for police free schools and the divestment of school safety division's entire $450 million budget and to relocate that money into guidance counselors, social workers, and restorative justice practices. It is a slap in the face to learn from previous hearings that the city keeps planning to spend millions of millions of more dollars to hire new school cops. My sophomore year was a roller coaster with the pandemic. My school, like the rest of the public schools, were not prepared to deal with the situation. In the mix of the confusion, my teachers, instead of asking us how we were feeling, were giving us a bunch of work while we were trying to also figure out technology. 
I, as many other students, were not informed by any staff about emotional support to deal with my stress from the pandemic. I became aware that there is a lack of funding for social, emotional, and mental health support for students. My school is a community school. This is important to me because community schools are more important than ever in providing the support students and families need as we return. This is where the, the city should be fun, fun, fully invest resources, not on policing. What does it say to me and the other students about where the city is investing the money? Policing me, or, policing me or supporting me to succeed. At the Public Safety Committee budget hearing on May 11th, the NYPD Deputy Chief of School Safety Division stated that 454 uh, school police have been have left the department since January of 2021, equal to nearly $50 million worth of salary funding. We have to stop spending money on policing schools. Hiring new school safety agents is not what young people like myself want. For years, we have been extremely vocal about removing all police from schools. We have been demanding to relocate all that funding from policing students to social, emotional, and mental health support. This $50 million presents a perfect opportunity for the city council to invest significant funds in the services that and staff that will actually create safety Hi, on the path to succeed. I am a couple of months away from my senior year after this stressful sophomore and junior year, and I would love to be welcomed to my last high school year with more resources for students and no police. Now more than ever, we need everyone to listen and stand by us. Our demands are clear, and that means that the city making this commitment do not hire more school police and use the $50 million to instead invest in an equitable future for all New York City youth. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Diaz, for coming in. And I just want to assure you that I'm fighting for additional resources for social emotional learning and for support for students, particularly behind this pandemic. So thank you very much. We will now hear from Juan Torres, followed by Maria Bautista. Time starts now. Hello, everyone. My name is Juan Torres. I am a youth leader at Sisters and Brothers United and the Urban Youth Collaborative. I live in Council District 15 in the Bronx. I am an eighth grader at Jonas Brunk Academy. As someone who attends a school that does not have metal detectors and which has a lot less police presence than the surrounding schools in the Fordham area, I know it is not hard to achieve school environments free from police. It is not hard to create schools that see students and their lived experiences with compassion and a real investment in their healing and the need for growth as opposed to seeing them as criminals. Today, I'm here to urge the city council to make it your priority this year to completely divest from police and policing practices in, in school. In the past, the council has pushed back against this ask from black and brown young people like myself because black and brown women would be out of jobs. However, this year, the council has the opportunity to make an obvious decision to cut $50 million from the school safety division these funds would have been used to replace 554 school police in our schools. What I call on the council to do is reinvest these funds and to hire more social workers, guidance counselors, and mental health workers in our schools who are from our community. Many of you on this council will no longer be in the seats next year. I call on you to leave a legacy behind that reimagines safety cultivated by young people's vision for police-free schools. In order for us to to the students to be supported, we need you all to vote for a budget that moves in the right direction. Before I close, I want to turn all the Bronx elected official council members, Ayala, Cabrera, Gibson, Diaz Sr., Riley, Feliz, Dinowitz, Jonash, and Salamanca. It is beyond important that you all vote for a budget that will transform our schools into a truly safety and supportive spaces that goes hand in hand with the need to transform our communities in the Bronx. Real safety means the capability to walk the hallways without feeling antagonized and constantly constantly anxious by the presence of cops. It is vital for schools to have counselors who possess proper training in de-escalating problems and social workers with the capacity to support students and their families. We cannot allow the Bronx to continue to be in a cycle of disinvestment. The Bronx burned in the 70s. Time expired. We are still feeling the effects. You can push for a budget that truly invests in our vision. Cut $50 million from the school safety division. Invest those funds in schools in the Bronx because we deserve better. Because it's whose Bronx? Our Bronx. The Bronx gets things done, so we hope you get this done. Thank you. Thank you very much, and also thank you for coming in. And uh, we are fighting, I am fighting for um, more, more uh, funding for restorative practices. I think that's very important, and thank you for mentioning that in your testimony. We will now hear from Maria Bautista, followed by Kayana Bernard. Time starts now. 
Hi all, my name is Maria Bautista, Campaign Director at the Alliance for Quality Education and a member of New Yorkers for Racially Just Public Schools. I'm really excited to be here and give testimony today because we finally have the resources to begin the process of addressing deep and systemic inequities in our public school system. And it's critical that we get this right. Organizationally, AQE has been fighting for the full financing of our schools for 21 years. Before the pandemic, we called out the lack of resources plaguing our schools. And during the uh, pandemic, the lack of equity became painfully undeniable. Our children have been carrying the weight of immoral budgets for decades. And after this tremendous win at the state and federal level, we organized a series of accountability events to hear from stakeholders what was needed to begin to address these inequities. We held town halls, two town halls, a roundtable conversation, and surveyed over a thousand parents. We hold deep that those closest to the problems have all the solutions. And P10 is a reflection of the brilliant folks who contributed to this work and the final document that summarizes these demands. We organize our demands um, in a series of buckets that include tech and infrastructure, school climate, um, culturally responsive education, to name a few. One of the most pressing concerns that surfaced in all of our conversations was the immediate need to reduce class size. Um, and this feels especially important during the ongoing pandemic. Participants also shared that social emotional supports for students and culturally responsive education are critical to reopening. Equity and equitable distribution of resources was also key in all of our conversations. It's critical to center students whose needs have been ignored and neglected. This includes our special needs students, English language learners, students in foster care, and those experiencing homelessness. Um, we lay out how to support all of these students in our demands. Lastly, we urge New York City to center um, the budget in racial justice and address basic rights. We're calling for a full removal of police in our schools and instead a true investment in restorative justice programs and social emotional support. Every school must have a permanent nurse and librarians. Um, these are all mandated in state Time law. Expired. And yet New York City is in violation. Just a few more, um, just one more thing to close up. AQE has submitted all of these collective demands as part of our testimony and will continue to advocate with our allies and partners so we can finally have a budget that meets the needs of our students and school communities and really appreciate the allyship um, and, and your work on this council member drum. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Maria, and I want to say what a pleasure it's been to work with you and everyone at AQE on these issues. I look forward to continuing that. Uh, it's uh, sad it's my last uh, budget hearing, uh, uh, but I have truly enjoyed uh, working with you. Uh, thank you for coming in and giving testimony. We will now hear from Kayana Bernard, followed by Alejandra Teresa Vasquez Bauer. Time starts now. I'm sorry, can you hear me now? It wasn't letting me unmute. Yes, we can hear you now, Ms. Bernard. Please, okay, please be sorry. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Kiana Bernard. I am 16 years old and a youth leader from Make the Road New York. Makaya Brandt, age 16, Adam Toledo, age 13, Dante Wright, age 20, who was recently murdered by police, and Anthony Thomas Jr., age 17, who was recently murdered by police in his school bathrooms. These four people were youth just like me with so much life ahead of them. The police target, harass, and brutalize Black people in our communities. Imagine how I feel when the first thing I see when I get to my school building are NYPD school safety agents. Then I join a line of students wasting valuable time that could be spent in the classroom waiting to go through a metal detector. Instead of enhancing our education, school police and metal detectors create an unwelcoming environment. I have been late to many classes and missed out on information and announcements because I'm waiting in line to go through scanners. The last thing I see when I leave my school are police officers. I feel angry and disappointed that this is my everyday experience and that students are constantly policed and black and brown youth are pushed into the school to prison pipeline. We've heard from previous testimonies at the New York City budget hearing that they are currently 554 vacant school cop position. This equates to $50 million. These positions should stay that way. They should be eliminated. Instead of wasting money on school cops and policing, the money should be invested in students' future. In a survey of New York City students done by the Center for Popular Democracy and Urban Youth Collaborative, 
81% of students say they saw police in their schools every day, yet only 7% said they had daily interactions with a guidance counselor, social worker, or school nurse. That is not right. I'm asking you, no, I am demanding you divest from school cops and invest in mine and my peers' future. Start today by committing to no new hires for the school safety division, but don't start there. We should disband the school safety division and invest $450 million used to police Time black expired. and brown young people and to more guidance counselors, student success centers, and restorative justice services. Police don't make school safe. Well-resourced communities do. There is still time to change direction. Use this budget to begin the transformational change us youth need and rightfully deserve. Do not hire new school police and use the 50 million to instead invest in an equitable future for all NYC youth. Thank you. Thank you again, Ms. Bernard. It's particularly important that we hear from youth who are directly impacted by the policies of the Department of Education and the NYPD. I appreciate your testimony very much and look forward to continuing to work with you and the other youth groups as well. Uh, thank you again for coming in. We will now hear from Alejandra Teresa Vasquez Bauer, followed by Chrissy Word. Time starts now. Good afternoon, and thank you for having me. My name is Alejandra Vasquez Bauer, and I represent the New Yorkers for Racially Just Public Schools Steering Committee and the New York Immigration Coalition. We are here to demand a transformational budget that meets the needs of our most systemically excluded and under-resourced students, including immigrant students, students with disabilities, students in temporary housing and foster care, and students in racially and economically marginalized communities. The city has a critical opportunity with this budget to transform the damaging status quo of traditional education funding practices. Over a dozen community organizations and hundreds of parents in the RJPS coalition informed our consolidated New York City education budget demands. To highlight a few, we demand that the city invest $559 million for supportive schools by expanding community schools and eliminating school policing allocates $1 billion for culturally responsive schools, including funding for ethnic studies curricula, and allocates $1 billion for inclusive schools, which includes $350 million over three years for ELLs and immigrant families, and $500,000 for data disaggregation. Ensuring ELLs and immigrant families, students with disabilities, and other historically marginalized populations are centered and prioritized in education policy is a pivotal tenant of the RJPS platform. Therefore, the RJPS inclusive schools budget demands include $350 million investment to address immigrant students and families unique needs as they've historically and consistently been neglected. In order to ensure our immigrant students and families finally have what they need to thrive, we demand that the city urgently develops and implements a plan for catching up ELLs, ELLs with disabilities, and students with limited English proficient parents. Offers $60 million grants over three years to community-based organizations well positioned to support ELLs and immigrant families. Fully funds and implements the NYIC Education Collaborative's communication plan. According to 2020 data, ELLs continue to have the highest dropout rate of 23% of any subgroup in New York City. Time expired. It is time to transform our schools and end dysfunctional dynamics for immigrant children and families. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Can I ask you? What did you say about disaggregated data? I, I missed that. All right, sorry, the mute, the mute was taking a second. Um, thank you, Chair John, for your question. We were asking for $500,000 for data disaggregation, which is a part of our inclusive schools budget. The total inclusive schools budget we're asking for is $1 billion, including funding for ELLs and immigrant families and data disaggregation. Can you just explain to me what you mean by data disaggregation? Yes, of course. Data disaggregation is really important because when you collect data about students of color and you keep it really general, we don't know the exact needs that are needed for specific students. So for example, if you collect information about Hispanic students or about Asian students, and we don't break it down, disaggregate by um, country of origin or by specific communities, then we don't actually have, we're not able to allocate the right resources to the right communities that have those specific needs. So we're asking for $500,000 to disaggregate the data so that we know exactly how to target the funding to meet the needs of the specific communities that are at risk. 
Good. I, I'm glad to hear this. I've been fighting for LGBT uh, data collection, which um, I passed a law on, and still we haven't gotten a satisfactory response from the Department of Education. So I hope that in your campaign also, you'll include LGBT uh, data collection and that we can also identify who are the LGBT students, of course, voluntarily. I don't want anyone to be outed or anything like that. But um, I think that data is very, very important to know the needs. We also passed legislation in the city council to break down the Asian subgroups, uh, which has also been very difficult to get the administration to enforce. We passed the law on it and mixed, mixed race groups. So mm -hmm. I'm glad to hear that was in your testimony. And I fully understand why it's so very important. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. We will now hear from Chrissy Word, followed by Jody Dresner Alperin. Time starts now. Hi, this is Chrissy Word. I'm Director of Education at City Parks Foundation. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I am uh, a veteran educator in New York City, working with um, public school students, um, both uh, in a formal aspect in my career, starting out as a public school teacher, and um, for the past 18 years as an educator in the nonprofit sector. Um, at City Parks Foundation, I work with a number of um, public schools, and also I have a son in public school who is 12 years old. I am... Um, wanted to uh, testify today to encourage the council to please dedicate as much funding as possible to the public school system to um, do a number of things. One, reduce class sizes. As a veteran educator who has been inside the classroom and also interacted with youth of all ages in Ms. Ward? It appears that we've lost connection with Ms. Ward. We'll circle back and move forward to the next one. Who is Jody Dresner Alperin? Time starts now. Hi, my name is Jody Dresner Alperin. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to address the committee today. Um, I sit on the advisory committee of New York City Opt Out. I'm the parent of two New York City public school students, and I'm here today in support of the work of AQE. I want to urge the council to adopt a budget that centers equity in education and listens to the voices of students, the very sto stakeholders for whom the system is built. To make our classrooms truly inclusive and equitable, I ask that you find, fund citywide restorative justice in the amount of $225 million. Please direct this funding towards the hiring of restorative justice coordinators in every middle and high school, ongoing training for all school staff that uses an anti-racist approach, enables it to be school-led pass-through funding to community partners to support implementation and learning. As we move to this restorative justice environment, it is imperative that we eliminate school policing, as we have heard by so many uh, passionate students here today, by disbanding the school safety division, eliminating the youth coordination officer provision, pr position, and fully divesting from metal detection equipment and camera surveillance technology. Instead, please earmark $177 million to expand access to social and emotional supports that our students are telling us clearly and unequivocally are what they need rather than policing. For fiscal year 22, we must fund the hiring of new social workers and school counselors to continue working to a ratio of one to 150 for all schools and one to 50 for high need schools over the next five years, prioritizing the hiring of those people from brown and black communities. Additionally, as we start to imagine a post COVID school system, it is imperative that we have smaller class sizes so that teachers can truly build meaningful relationships with each and every student. So there can really be trauma-informed instruction and it can be effectively delivered. Please fund $250 million to reduce class size, centering the needs in schools with the students most impacted by our current crises. I urge you to support- I'm expired. Of AQE and the New Yorkers for Racially Just Public Schools in this budget, and thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for the work you've done in Opt Out. I'm a big supporter. 
I've held a number of press conferences on it as well. And yes. uh, really do not like to see standardized tests in addition to everything else that you said. So thank uh, we, you. And we are big, thank you for your support. We are, we've been appreciative of your support over the years. And as you know, as we come back into school buildings, it's gonna be a continued fight to give our kids what they really need and not to have money go towards funding that testing machine. So we're grateful for your support over the years. Thank you, thank you. We will now hear from Paula and Lucas Healy, followed by Caveras and Gupta. Time starts now. Hi, if it's okay, Lucas is going to speak first and then I'll do my testimony after. Is that all right? Yes, that's right. Right. Thank you. That's fine. Uh, okay. My name is Lucas Healy and I'm a D75 student. I'm here today to ask you to please make sure students like me with learning challenges, please be supported by funding more specialized programs like AIMS, ACES, ASD, Horizon, and NEXT programs, along with funding. And so there, there will be D75 programs for not only K to five, but that's for middle school and high school. And in every district, I also asked, asked that we need, that we hired more councilmen, counselors, social workers, nurses, and related service is providers, especially bilingual providers and stop putting millions of dollars into high, st high, high stakes testing. These tests aren't help teachers are supporting a teacher support students who are struggling and only shining light, light on on how students like me don't fit into a DOE box and therefore are not worth educating. Students with IEP needs have more vo have voices to who and we want you to hire us. I mean, uh, we want you to hear us. Us, please fully fund special education. We are worth worth the attention and and investment. Thank you. Wow, you certainly are worth the attention and the investment. And, and I think that your testimony was fantastic. And I don't know, Lucas, if you know, but I used to be a fourth grade teacher. What grade are you in? Can't hear you. We're in meeting right now. Well, 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 I'm going into high school and I'm eighth grade. So you're in eighth grade going into high school. And you can come on and Zoom and read like that. Boy, it took me until I was 35 years old to be able to stand up and speak that well in public. So congratulations to you and thank you so much. That is so meaningful and I'm very grateful for your testimony. Is that your mother? Yes, is your, is your mother uh, helping you? That's great. And mom, did you want to speak also? Yes, I have plenty of testimony as well. Sure. Thank you, sir. Oh, thank you. That was fantastic. Time starts now. Uh, thank you for the time. My name is Paula Healy, and I am a member of the Citywide Council on Special Education, along with a steering member for uh, Press NYC, that stands for Parents for Responsive, Equitable, Safe Schools. 
Um, I'm, I want to applaud um, all the speakers that came before me, um, Maria Batista from AQE, um, Michael Mulgrew from the UFT, Mark, uh, um, Mark from uh, the CSA, and, and all the wonderful youth speakers. Um, our, our Citywide Council on Special Education actually released a letter of budget recommendations um, earlier this month, which we did send to uh, City Council, and I will attach to my testimony. Um, but to highlight some of the things that we were recommending um, was also pay parity for our um, special education pre-K um, teachers who are in uh, 4410 schools and 836 schools, um, along with making sure that the expansion of 3K also includes special education supports as related service providers, and that we do not see another 2000 seat deficit like we did during COVID. I also want to um, amplify the uh, the use, the, the need for a citywide literacy curriculum, um, because if our children are learning to read in prison and not in our schools, what does that say about us as a society? Um, we also ask that a sustainable childcare option be put into place. Learning Bridges was poorly executed. It did not deliver on the 100,000 seats that were promised by the mayor, and it was grossly overspent in terms of budget. We encourage the city council to use the powers within your oversight budget to make sure going forward with the foundation fund that's coming to our schools that the DOE does not squander it and use it for uh, misuse it as they did with running bridges or the misuse of OPT, um, Office of uh, People Transportation that has already spent $1.4 billion on buses this year when they're only servicing just a portion of our students. Time expired. Uh, can I just have two two more seconds? Yes. To finish yes. Up? Thank you. Um, I also wanted to amplify that with the mayor's reopening plan that he announced yesterday that is no longer providing a remote option for parents, you are shutting the door on education for those who are medically fragile and for families who just cannot have another option other than uh, a remote option. The COVID vaccine only protects from the virus. It does not erase a heart condition or leukemia. And we cannot afford to lose potentially thousands of families to charters or to leave New York altogether in search of a safer educational option. Um, organizations such as Press NYC and AQE and CEJ have options already in place that we can suggest to the DOE in terms of a sustainable, equitable, centralized remote option so that we don't neglect these families and lose more families. And I also encourage that please center trauma-centered um, uh, trainings for all staff not just guidance counselors and um, social workers, as my son had asked for in his testimony, because um, recently we had a 10-year-old boy from Haiti die because of violence that was executed upon him. And um, he was uh, a subject of bullying um, in the school that was left unaddressed when there was only a small portion of children in person. So what chance do our children have if we all have to go back in September and trauma-centered supports are not there and cyberbullying and, and actual bullying is not being recognized? You know, respect for all should not just be words on a poster in a hallway. It needs to be implemented safely. Our schools need to be held accountable and we do not want any more deaths of our children because these things were not recognized. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Ms. Healy, uh, for coming in and for allowing your son also to speak. It's really very, very moving testimony to hear him. Uh, and also um, all of the issues that you brought up. You know, I came out as an openly gay teacher in 1992, uh, specifically to address the issue of bullying, particularly of LGBT students at that time, but really for all students as well, or anybody who's different uh, and, and suffers discrimination at the hands of other folks, especially in our school system. So this is very meaningful testimony. And I'm very, very appreciative of you coming in. Thank you so much. And um, we're going to fight as we move forward for the issues that, uh, that you brought up here today. You and Lucas. Thank you, Lucas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. We really appreciate it. You've been an amazing ally in all of these initiatives. And we know that even though this may be your last um, budget hearing, we're, we're going to see you in the streets marching with us as we have been all these years. So we appreciate That's you. That's right. Purpose. I came from the streets and I'll return to the streets. Yep, yes, thank right. you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much for that. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Kaveris and Gupta, followed by Matthew Melendez. Time starts now. 
Uh, good afternoon. My name is Kaveri Sengupta. I am the Education Policy Coordinator at the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families, or CACF. Thank you so much to Chair Drum and the members for the, of the Committee on Finance for giving us this opportunity to testify. CACF is the nation's only pan-Asian children and families advocacy organization. We lead the fight for improved and equitable policies, systems, funding, and services. Asian American students comprise 16.2% of the New York City student population. They attend over 95% of our public schools, make up almost one in four English language learners, and over 15,000 have an IEP. Many attend overcrowded and underfunded schools, and the majority of Asian American students in New York City have stayed in remote learning. Many parents were married fearful of sending their children back. Language barriers and lack of visibility in our curriculum and data collection endure. We can begin to address these issues by targeting funding for these specific needs. We're pleased to see many important investments in the executive budget, um, but still there are necessary pieces that are left out. So as steering committee members for New Yorkers for Racially Just Public Schools, we would like to emphasize some RJPS demands that will benefit Asian American students immensely and by extension all students and we're hoping that uh, city council will fight for these priorities. So first off, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the data disaggregation point share that works. Um, so at least $500,000 for DOE to really fund um, proper data collection and data disaggregation into students' ethnic groups to identify those and address those inequities across groups. Um, as you know, for Asian students, this ultimately works to fight the model minority myth. And, and despite the passage of LL-126, um, thank you so much for championing that legislation a few years ago. Um, as you know, Asian American students really remain uh, lumped together and averaged out in all consequential DOE data, which erases their rich diversity and renders the challenges of many pockets of the community invisible, especially those most marginalized. So we're calling for this funding to change internal data collection processes in the DOE, um, for stakeholder engagement on how best to collect data, collecting data at multiple enrollment points, um, for internal rollout and training for staff, as well as public service announcement series um, to explain those changes being collected to families. Um, we are also calling for $1 billion for culturally responsive sustaining education. Time expired. Sorry, if I could just quickly wrap up. Yes, of course. Thank you. Um, to educate and honor all communities, especially the contributions of Asian Americans who have been overwhelmingly invisible in our curricula. Um, 177 million to expand access to social and emotional supports. Uh, this is something that our parents and families have really been bringing up as, as concerns for their children and they want to see mental and emotional health really directly addressed in their school buildings. Um, and finally, 350 million over three years to support English language learners and immigrant families with targeted support. Um, finally, I just quickly wanted to mention that CACF's budget equity campaign, 15% and growing, we are calling for the inclusion uh, in the adopted budget of a new $4 million citywide initiative to support culturally uh, competent, linguistically appropriate direct service programs uh, by Asian-led and serving community-based organizations called Recovery and Healing for Asian American New Yorkers. Um, some of my colleagues will be speaking about that uh, in a couple of panels, but I wanted to make sure to highlight it as a priority for us. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Kaveria. It's been such a pleasure to be able to work with CACF over the years, um, starting from my um, introduction, I guess, with ASAP back when I was first elected to the city council and Mitch was running the program at the time. Uh, so that's been great. Um, I just want to go to the data desegregation again. Sure. Did you say 100,000 or 500,000? 500,000. 500,000. Okay. Yes. And also, can you get me more information? Um, just forward that to me on that, how you see that working because I think that's so really important and I'm really glad to hear you're advocating for that because it's um, desperately needed and has not really been implemented in the way that we had hoped it would be. Absolutely. So thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, I will, I will email it directly to okay, you. Okay, thanks. thanks. Yeah. We will now hear from Matthew, Matthew Melendez followed by Kaliri C. Salas Ramirez. Time starts now. Um, hello everyone, my name is Matthew. I'm a youth leader at System of this United and the Urban Youth Collaborative. I live in Council District 8 in the Bronx and I'm in seventh grade. I attend James Kiernan Junior High School. My vision for this school, for, uh, for schools in the Bronx, is for schools to feel safe. That means completely remove costs in schools and implementing more support for students. Students should be focused on the academic success of students as well as the social and emotional well-being in and outside of schools. Today is May 25th, which is the one year anniversary of George Floyd's murder in Minneapolis. One year ago, we saw the city rise, the cities rise across the countries, in particular New York City. We took over the streets, calling for you all, our, um, wait a second. our city officials to defund police Last year, I asked you all to divest $1 billion from the NYPD. 
Those of you are on this call, gaslighted us. Not only was the $1 billion not cut, we were delivered a decision for school police to be trans, um, transferred from the NYPD to the DOE instead, which therefore was still, which there was still a strong uh, opposition to this plan. I changed the supervision does I change the supervision does not change the fact that these cops are in our school still. Co uh, cops who do not make me feel secure nor safe in my schools, in my neighborhood, nor in my neighborhood. I feel, for, I've seen from personal experience how they treat me and my peers on my way to school, in front of my school, and in the entries and also in the hallways. As a student in a music class, I have to bring a guitar home to practice. And there was this one incident when I went to uh, school and a uh, couple SSAs said that they would not let me inside unless they checked my bag or my guitar case and my guitar case for a gun. I got scared. Time I, expired. I wanted to cry as they accused me as an 11 year old at the time being harshly judged at the door, being treated like a criminal. Seeing them all over my school just reminds me when I used to visit my family member at Rikers. They, the con constant surveillance, the pat downs at the door, the bag searches. I felt it felt exactly the same as going to class, school. Today, I call on you all to do what is right and pass the budget that will make me, that will make real investment in students like me. I call on you to invest the uh, meaningful restorative justice in schools. We need $118.53 million to adequate fund RJ and 500 high schools this year. We call for adequate funding for social workers and guidance counselors. We need $162 million to, be, to begin hiring workers at, um, wait, workers at a ratio of one guidance counselor per 150 students in most schools and one guidance counselor per 50 students in, high, in schools for high need schools. We also call for funding of mental health uh, continuum for New York City to invest to invest fifteen million dollars for those for those thorough support and services. Lastly, we call on you to completely divest from school policing in schools. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthew. What grade did you say you were in? I'm in seventh grade. Wow, so you're well on your way to uh, being successful and uh, really incredible that you would come in and give testimony even being in seventh grade. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. We will now hear from Kaliri Salas Ramirez followed by Leonie Hampson. Time starts now. Good morning, Chair Drum. Um, my name is Kaliri Salas. I am the president of CEC4, but I'm here as part of the steering committees for Racially Just Public Schools, New York City Opt Out, Black Lives Matter at Schools, um, as well as Press NYC, Parents for Responsive, Equitable, Safe Schools. I think you've heard from a lot of youth and us parents and teachers of the things that we should not be investing in. We should not be investing in more police in our schools. We should not be investing $500 million on testing. But there are so many things that we do need to invest in. In terms of academics and pedagogical practices, we want you to invest in culturally responsive practices, at least $1 billion to provide the appropriate training for educators um, and for our staff in order to support all children. We want you to also support authentic assessment in our schools, something that we've kind of forgotten. You yourself stated at City College, where I actually work, um, these are the things that we talk about. How do we really assess children and how do we move them along, knowing where they are and knowing who they are. And so with that, we also have to support language justice and support for our immigrant families, as well as our English language learners. We have to support structured literacy and screening for our dyslexic students that are not served within our public education system. And there are bills out in the assembly. Um, Joanne Simon is a strong advocate as well as Brad Hoyleman. And so we need to elevate those and move those forward in public education. Healing centered schools are important. Trauma responsive practices, social workers, counselors, 
two RJ practitioners in every school as well as social emotional learning and we have to be really concerned about prepackaged social emotional learning curriculum and also integrate anti racist practices in that. But we don't want to forget that we're still in the middle of a pandemic and we still need to uphold safety, there are 500 slots for registered nurses in our schools, we need time to expired. Okay, I'll finish in one second. We need to have schools that provide wraparound services. So our school nurses will be the ones that are responsible for maybe rapid testing for COVID, um, providing appropriate PPE in our schools, and also vaccine delivery. We need to support our school communities in understanding juvenile diabetes, food allergies, asthma, and in the case of Romy, how to detect head concussions and other consequences of different adverse interactions between children. This can only be provided with health professionals and we must have nurses in our schools. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, these are all things that I've been fighting for and we'll continue to fight for as we go through this process. And, you know, hopefully we'll come out better off than uh, we've seen uh, in the proposed budget. Uh, and I look forward to continuing to work. Yes. <laughs> Let us know. We'll show up wherever you need us. <laughs> that growth or adoption. Yes. Thank you. I know you will. I know you will. Thank you. We will now hear from Leonie Hameson, followed by Heather Clark Mackin. Time starts now. Hello, uh, uh, Council Member Drum. I just wanted to thank you tremendously for your, your advocacy, your leadership for better schools, and especially for the $250 million to be spent on lowering class size next year. My name is Lainey Hameson. I'm Executive Director of Class Size Matters. New York City children have needed smaller classes for more than a generation, but they will need them more than next year than ever before. And now we have the resources to pay for this. It is the perfect opportunity to do this. Last Saturday, we held a parent action conference sponsored with co-sponsored with New York City Kids Pack and Teens Take Charge, focused on how the additional funds should be spent. We also had an online survey asking respondents to rank their priorities among 14 choices. The overwhelming consensus was that class size reduction was the top need for our children, especially now. Smaller classes have also been the top priority of New York City's parents with children in grades K through 12 when asked what change they would most like to see in their schools since the DOE began administering parent surveys in 2007. Since our schools are finally due to receive their, uh, their total foundation funds as a result of the CFE case, it's only right that some of these funds spent specifically on hiring additional teachers to lower class size, which was a key issue in the CFE lawsuit and the judge's decision that New York City children were denied their, their constitutional right to a sound basic education. And yet since that decision was delivered, class sizes have gone up and not down. I really want to um, second the opinion and this testimony of Mark Conazaro, the president of the CSA, that this uh, funding stream be separate from fair student funding or else we will never see the results that we need. First, the fair student funding formula is designed to incentivize principals to overcrowd their schools and classrooms, since it is linked to how many school students are enrolled in the school. If the funds are simply injected- Time expired. So I just want to have a, have a specific um, proposal that there be reporting requirements along with this $250 million so that we see which additional teachers have been hired in which schools to lower class sizes in specific um, grades and subjects. And I think this could go along with the class size reporting that's due every year on November 15th. Again, I want to thank you for your leadership. I am so sad that you are leaving the council in January, but I know that you will be fighting with us, as Paulette said, every single day for better schools. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lanny. Thank you so much for your kind words. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's been a pleasure to work with you over these last 12 years. I've always admired and looked up to you. Uh, and the work that Class Size Matters does, uh, you really get it. And you know, I always say, why doesn't the DOE try the one thing that they never really tried that we know that works, which is to reduce class size. If you want to get better results, that what's, that's what you do. They do know that in terms of special education, if you wanna work with special education students, the way to get to them is to have smaller class sizes. So if it works there, it works in other places as well. I'm gonna to continue to fight to get that 250 million. 
Uh, and I look forward to having you as an ally in that battle moving forward. Thank you so much for everything. Thank Very you. much appreciated. Thank, Thank you. you so much. We will now hear from Heather Clark Mackin, followed by Natasha Capers. Time starts now. Hello, my name is Heather Clark Mackin. I'd like to say good afternoon and thank you to Council Member, Council Chair Drum, and everyone else, all the members who are here. Um, so um, I'm representing organizations AQE and Arise Coalition. I'm a parent disability active um, advocate and also a black neurodiverse mo uh, mother and early childhood special educator. And I work in early intervention. And um, to the matter of class size, I just wanna take an aside and say, when talking about class size, I wanna talk about inclusivity because it's not enough in terms of talking about special education students. We really need to have trained special educators who know how to work with neurodiverse children and children with disabilities in the right appropriate way and know how to um, work in an inclusive manner. So one of the things that I really wanna focus on is divesting all of the money that's going to safety police officers in the class in, in schools, take that money away from the NYPD budget and to standardized testing and put that to really making 3K for all and 4K for all and making it to uh, include our special education students, our preschoolers with disabilities who have been completely ignored for the past few years. We know that at least 20% of our preschoolers have disabilities and they have not been included in this discussion. So considering that the majority of our students with disabilities go to schools in their neighborhoods, I would like to see that the 3K for all and the 4K for all have inclusive collaborative team teaching classrooms. In addition, I would like to see that in, in our black, brown immigrant neighborhoods that we open up specialized pre ks for students, pre preschoolers with severe disabilities who have to go to schools like stepping stones or other district 75 preschool centers. I wanna see those in high marginalized neighborhoods so that parents don't have to take their children to all over the city. Just let me continue my thought for one more second. Additionally, we have a lot of parents who are traveling all around the city to go to speech therapists, occupational therapists, physical therapists, counselors. All of these specialized therapists should be in the pre pre -cent preschool centers. And so that all of these services are located within the preschool so it really is a 3k for all or a 4k for all which currently they're not so that's another thing that you know the money should be right there the center should be right there for those students so that's something that um, i'm going to include in a letter to you so i would like to just like make that one of the key things that's not been in the discussion when the mayor talks about 3k for all 4k for all it's completely ignored our students our preschoolers with disabilities Absolutely, and, and I think that as a former educator, um, what I've learned is that intervention at an early age, the earlier you get it, the better off that student is. So making that investment in uh, early childhood um, pre uh, special education um, pays off in the long run, and uh, it's well worth it for the city to invest in that type of um, program. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Natasha Capers, followed by Inshira Dewars. Time starts now. Hello, I am Natasha Capers, director of the New York City Coalition for Educational Justice and a steering member of New Yorkers for Racially Just Public Schools, as well as a public school parent. 85% of New York City public school students are Black, Latinx, or Asian, yet the curriculum used in our schools do not reflect them in the books they read or the information they learn. New York City has put zero dollars into, into the education budget for culturally responsive and sustaining education. Yet everyone talks about how it is a priority, but where? The mayor plans to expand pre-K, but hasn't announced shifts in the curriculum, which has nearly zero representation of people or characters or authors of color. For example, of the 121 authors in the mayor's 3K curriculum, only one is Latinx and three are Black. Of the 42 authors in the mayor's pre-K for all curriculum, there are zero Black, zero Native American, and zero Middle Eastern authors. There are only one Latinx and one Asian author. The other 40 are white. 
Recently, the chancellor and mayor announced changes from the change from Columbus Day to Indigenous People Day slash Italian American Heritage Day. But once again, there's been nothing said about what the shifts to curriculum will be about who Columbus truly was or the lies that are taught to our children annually about him. Juneteenth has also been announced as a holiday, although students will not get that off for several years, but nothing has been announced about what will be taught in classrooms about the significance of Juneteenth or what it even is. It is time that everyone puts their rhetoric where their mouths, stop putting their rhetoric in their mouths and start putting the money to invest in this. It is time to invest the $1 billion into the education budget for culturally responsive and sustainable education. Time expired. Thank you. Hi, Natasha. It's Danny. Can you see me? Yes, I can see you. I can hear you. Okay, good. Um, what, what, when you say there has been no culture, no money for culture responsive education, I thought originally we had funding in there due to your advocacy. Has it been taken out now? When we looked at the budget and when we asked the Department of Education this and the chancellor this question directly, no one could give a single dollar amount for how much they are putting into the budget for culturally responsive education or where that money is living. There's speculation that it is living between um, teaching and learning and that $500 million for um, learning recovery, but there is not anything specifically earmarked for culturally responsive education or for new curriculum to go along with it. Okay, that's really, really, really upsetting. I know that we've been in this battle with them for years and uh, this is a step backward um, and we're gonna have to work on that. Um, you know, I just, it's, it's mind boggling. Uh, your numbers and your statistics and your, the, the books and the authors and it, it's really um, not a good thing. So um, I'm gonna check it out. And I know, I think I have a meeting with you coming up soon. Um, so we'll, 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 we'll figure out a strategy there as well. So- I'm here for it. And, and finally, may I say one other thing? I love that oh. hair. <laughs> I love <Yeah>. that hair. <laughs> it's perfect. <laughs> perfect for the moment. <laughs> Thank you, Natasha. Thank you. Chair Jeremy, we have a question from Councilmember Adams. Sure. Time starts now. Good afternoon. <laughs> Natasha, I had to co-sign uh, uh, with Councilmember uh, Drum, our Chair Drum. Um, I will be at the uh, budget negotiating table once again this year, and this is my issue. Um, the lack of curriculum for Black and Brown children in our schools is, is, is unbelievable. Um, I've also brought it up to Chancellor Porter as well. So I just want to let you know that, um, that we will continue. Um, this fight. It seems that uh, we're getting a lot of lip service all the time, but I do have hope and just know that you've got another fighter at that table looking for the curriculum that our children deserve and hopefully will finally, finally get. So thank you, Natasha, for all of your work. If you need me, just holla. I'm going to holla. Thank you. We'll be having a Juneteenth action. You are always invited and it's going to be amazing. And so thank, thank you for your advocacy and your work. All right. Next, we'll hear from Insure DeWars, followed by Grisel Cardona. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Insura DeWars. I'm a mother to three public school children. I am here on first and foremost on behalf of them, but also in allyship with the Coalition for Educational Justice and also the Alliance for Quality Education. I am here, I'm gonna backpack off from Natasha for the importance of culturally responsive, sustaining education and how we know representation matters. Um, my children are biracial and they have 
fought to see themselves in the curriculum. I am a teacher and an educator. Um, I think that I've, because of my background, been able to help the curriculum that they lack in school at home. And I have found myself going to several bookstores trying to get all the books that they can see themselves inside of. And in addition, see other people and trying to help them be empathetic uh, children and also um, learning about others. Uh, we all know, and I, I appreciate your um, support for co uh, culturally responsive education, but we know that the DOE is um, maybe on board and maybe not. Um, we don't know where the funding is and we want it fully funded. Um, we know how representation, how important it is. Um, I enjoyed hearing you speak on your uh, thinking uh, anti-bullying is important. And we also know that, you know, some people who are bullied are uh, underrepresented uh, populations. And imagine if you put in the curriculum uh, how we learn about immigrant families, immigrant children, I'm expired. Uh, Asian American children, black children, children with disabilities, um, children who don't speak English as their first language. Imagine the empathy that all of our children will get through that curriculum. And the last thing I'll say is we, you know, we all grew up with all this African American history and Asian American history, but we just know that it's one American history. We need to put all of those things together and we want the Department of Education to fund what we know is important and our children all need throughout this school district, this city. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming in. I really appreciate it. Next, we'll hear from Grisel Cardona, followed by Akrita Kanam. Time starts now. Hi, everyone, um, and thank you, um, Council Member Drum, um, for having and hosting this. Um, so I'm a public school mom of three children, all with IEPs. I am a part of the Parent Action Committee, as well as a parent leader with um, the Coalition for Educational Justice. Um, so I'm asking that we, and to back up what Natasha said, um, to invest a billion into the budget for culturally responsive sustaining education, um, you know, for children to see themselves in the curriculum, to, to have the re to have resources, it, it's so much needed. Um, you know, in one part of, of the borough, they'll have all the resources and the other part of the borough, we don't have this, you know, any resources at all. And we have to figure out how to get them. Um, you know, we have a, a, a leader that wants to make it happen. Let's just give her the tools and the resources and the funding to make it possible now. Um, and uh, DOE has eliminated uh, Columbus Day, but it's not shown any evidence that they're making any significant shifts to curriculum to teach that period of history in a way that history uh, historically accurate and provide accurate representation of the indigenous people um, past and present. So I'm asking that um, that we really invest in culturally responsive sustaining education. Our children need it. Uh, now more than ever, I know the teachers talk and say, yeah, we're doing it, but uh, we're not seeing it. So um, please, 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 let's just make sure that we provide the necessary resources so that we can move forward, especially with ethnic studies and civics. Thank you so much. Yeah, I really agree with that. And I also think that um, implicit bias training has to go hand in hand with it as well. So thank you for coming in and giving testimony. Appreciate it. Thank you. We will now hear from Akira Kanal, followed by Daya Bausin Sen. Time starts now. Sorry, I was having a hard time unmuting. Uh, thank you, Chair Drum and other members of the Finance Committee. I'm here representing Adhikar today. Adhikar is an immigrant women-led organization based in Woodside, 
as the only social justice organization serving and mobilizing the Nepali speaking community. Um, we serve an estimated 10,000 members yearly, often referred to as our community's uh, 911 and 311 line. Most of our members are nail salon workers, domestic workers, taxi drivers, and work in other informal sectors. They largely live in Queens and Brooklyn, and many are women identifying on temporary visas or undocumented and have literacy. Too often their struggles are rendered invisible, making our members extremely vulnerable to exploitation and structural violence. Our community has been directly and deeply impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. As the cases began to surge in uh, New York City last March, thousands of community members reached out and we quickly rallied to direct, uh, direct relief services and workforce support along with advocacy. Um, to address de uh, the devastating levels of unemployment and uh, job scarcity, we, we work to develop members' digital literacy skills to participate in workforce development trainings. Additionally, we've been active on the, on the temporary protected status campaign since Adhikar fought and won TPS um, for Nepal in 2015. Depending on the outcome of the ongoing litigation and potential redesignation, we anticipate a substantial demand in services and plan to host large-scale legal clinics to serve Nepali TPS holders. For more than 15 years, we've provided critical direct support and created pathways for our community members to be seen and heard in New York City, and yet minimal funding has been provided by city to support our work. To meet the demands of our growing community and provide services to help them become tomorrow's citizens, we're requesting $200,000 in uh, FY22 city discretionary funding to support our direct services work, including our workforce development training, legal services, adult literacy classes, and our COVID-19 response work. Together, we invite you to uh, you all to support the development of a new community of leaders who push boundaries within the family, their, uh, their places of work and within and outside the halls of government for the betterment and upliftment of uh, immigrant workers and communities. We have submitted a longer written testimony that we invite you to read to learn uh, to learn more in depth about this important issue. And I thank you for your time and your consideration today. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's always been a pleasure to work with Addie Carr, and thank you for the work that you do for the community. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next, we'll hear from Dia Basu Sen, followed by Eric Agarijo. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chair Drum and committee members for this opportunity to testify. My name is Dia Basu Sen, Executive Director of SUPNA NYC the only CBO in the Bronx that provides services to the pan-South Asian community in Bangla, Hindi, and Urdu. Throughout the pandemic, APA CBOs have been filling the gap between community needs and city services and outreach. We have been doing essential frontline work, distributing groceries and PPE, making vaccine appointments, counseling victims of hate crimes, distributing emergency funds, and much more. Our CBOs are always the first place our communities go to for help because they simply cannot get the same culturally competent linguistically accessible service anywhere else. But at the same time, we remain historically underfunded. APAs rep represent over 15% of the population, yet our CBOs receive less than 5% of discretionary dollars and less than 1.5% of social service dollars. We saw how disinvestment in communities of color led to disproportionate impacts in the COVID-19 pandemic, and we are calling on the council to ensure that those same mistakes are not repeated. We are asking New York City Council to create vital initiatives to support culturally competent and language accessible direct service programs to address the disproportionate impacts of COVID-19 on our APA communities and to invest in community-based solutions to addressing the exponential rise in anti-Asian hate crimes. We need more affordable and accessible mental health services provided by trusted CBOs. We need more case managers to increase access to much needed benefits. We need more supports for our survivors. We need a better reporting system for hate crimes. We need in-language health outreach to ensure our communities have accurate COVID-19 information. We need budget equity. A budget is a moral document that shows who and what we value. And too often APAs, immigrants, and communities of color are shown that we matter when it comes to our votes, to holidays and public events, but not when it comes to investing real dollars in our communities. Now more than ever, investing in APA CBOs like SUPNA is essential for our neighborhood. I'm inspired and businesses to heal and recover, to stop Asian hate, and to ensure that we have an equitable recovery from the pandemic. Thank you, Councilmember Drum, for your continued support of our APA communities and to all of you for your time today. Thank you so much, Dia. And it's really been a pleasure to work with you and the AP, AAPI communities. And I look forward to continuing that and hopefully with a good outcome for the budget. Thank you.
Thank you. We will now hear from Eric Agarijo, followed by Lakshmi Sangamunathan. Time starts now. Aloha. Good afternoon. My name is Eric Agarijo, and I am the communication coordinator for the Korean American Family Service Center. Thank you to Chairman Drum and the esteemed members of the committee on finance for holding this important hearing and providing us the opportunity to submit testimony. KFSC is a nonprofit organization that provides social services to Korean Asian immigrant survivors and their children who are affected by domestic violence, sexual assault, and child abuse for the past 32 years. All of our programs and services are offered in a culturally and linguistically appropriate setting. 98% of our clients are immigrants and 100% of our staff members are immigrants themselves or children of immigrant parents. Over 95% of our clients' first language is not English and come from low-income backgrounds. During New York State on pause and throughout the COVID-19 public health and economic crisis, KFSE responded to a 300% increase in calls to our 24-hour bilingual hotline. 88% were related to domestic violence, sexual assault, and child abuse. In 2020, we responded to over 4,000 hotline calls and KF KFSC served 1,201 survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault and provided over 20,908 services related to domestic violence and sexual assault. Many of our survivors are undocumented and are excluded from accessing unemployment insurance and all other income supports. They lost financial means, some temporarily, others permanently, resulting in loss of livelihood and unable to support themselves and their children. These consequences are then exacerbated as they are ineligible for unemployment benefits and other labor protections by law from which they are excluded. Many in our community and their loved ones have contracted the virus and died. Without financial means, our immigrant survivors can afford food, rent, basic necessities, personal protective equipment and supplies, medical care, or even basic living expenses such as phone, internet, utility bills, etc. If you could just give me 30 more seconds, I'll wrap it up. Um, yes. KFSC, thank you. And um, fiscal year 2021, Asian-led and serving organizations received only 4.65% of city council discretionary dollars and less than 1.5% of social service contract dollars. Our community-based organizations never received funding that adequately supported their vital services in neighborhoods. And during a time when APA immigrants are especially vulnerable, they have, they have had to fill the tremendous gaps in services. KFSC is at the front line serving a community and the constituents to fill the gap during this unprecedented trauma. We're seeking support from the budget of finance to create the funding for the recovery and healing for Asian American New Yorkers, which would directly support the critical life-affirming community-based work to supporting our immigrant survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, and child abuse, and other support for the sustainability of the organization as we provide the culturally and linguistically services and programs. Once again, thank you very much for allowing me to testify, and we look forward to working with all of you. Mahalo. Thank you. And uh, thank you for the work that the Community Services uh, Community Center does. Council Member Rosenthal has her hand raised. Time starts now. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you, Chair Drum. You're always amazing on these um, hearings. I really appreciate your time and effort. Um, I, I wanted to ask Eric if you could just for a minute. First of all, I want you to know I agree with everything you just said. And I really appreciate the work that you have done always, but particularly during the pandemic. And I think the, I would be curious to know your thought about the city's response, the support that you've gotten, your organization has gotten during the pandemic for what you have seen happen with your clients? In other words, have you had the resources you've needed to be able to do outreach um, to serve your, your clients? Stuff like that. Oh, I think we're gonna have to unmute. Eric, thank you. Oh, th well, thank you very much for that question. And for food disclosure, I did come into the organization on December, I guess, during the 
height of pandemic, I moved from Hawaii to KFC and I was working remotely from Hawaii. So while I'm learning through the organization and uh, working alongside Jihei Fisher, executive director, I know we've been really strapped and we've been, it, I just came on board and we're just here to contribute. I know the systems and the people and the staff and the services and the programs are implemented or in place. It's just the funding, like we're basically flying and preparing we're, we're building the plane as it lifts off yeah so okay. i just have to wear multiple hats if it means doing outreach and doing our test and trace where we're navigating our clients through the korean language uh like we mentioned so a lot of our staff are just multitasking and we're really spreading ourselves thin and that's where we're asking for this deep cry for the funding that's necessary to ensure that our immigrant survivors and their children and our constituents are then um, being served you know, rightfully and righteously so. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate all the work you do. Um, thank you. Back to committee council. Now we hear from Lakshmi Sang Nathan, followed by Ravi Reddy. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Lakshmi Shamaganathan. I am a policy fellow from the Coalition of Asian American Children and Families, CACF. We greatly appreciate Chairman Drome and the esteemed members of the Committee on Finance for providing us this opportunity to submit testimony. For more than a decade, CACF has been leading the 15% and growing campaign, which unites over 50 Asian led and serving community based organizations across New York City to fight for a fair and equitable budget to protect the needs of our most vulnerable APA community members. Over the past year, the COVID-19 pandemic has been a time of immense fear and uncertainty and pain for our APA New Yorkers. Asian Americans have been two times more likely to test positive for the, for the virus than their white counterparts, yet less likely to get testing at all. Asian Americans have also experienced the largest increase in joblessness of all major racial groups in New York City, with unemployment claims rising by 6,900% in the first few months of the pandemic and a slow and grueling recovery process ever since. There have also been over 3,800 incidents of anti-Asian violence and a 1,900% increase in anti-Asian related hate crimes that have been reported in New York City over the past year. And these are only the incidents that have been reported. Recent data also reviews that our APA communities have been hit disproportionately harder by the pandemic as a result of systemic inequities relating to our healthcare and economic systems that long predate the pandemic. And these issues vary across our communities and have relied heavily upon our Asian-led and serving CBOs to fill in the gaps through culturally inclusive and language accessible programming that has the most impact on addressing the needs within our communities. Yet our CBOs remain historically underfunded, as Eric has just said. Um, last year, our APA organizations received under 5% of city council discretionary dollars, despite the fact that APAs comprise more than 15% of New York City's population. And as we have witnessed the severe rise in anti-Asian violence that results from racist and dangerous rhetoric surrounding the virus, now more than ever, our families, our youths, our communities need a focused effort from New York City to help us recover and heal from the many traumas that we are Time facing. Time expired. Can I have an additional 30 seconds, please? Thank you. With that yes, in mind, of course. We are calling on New York City Council to create the Recovery and Healing for Asian American New Yorkers initiative. This is a $4 million citywide initiative that would provide roughly $80,000 in direct allocation funding to 50 community-based organizations who are serving the diverse diaspora communities of New York City. That's the East, Southeast, South, West, and Central Asian American populations in New York. We are providing critical lifelines to our community based to our community at this time, yet we don't have enough funding to sustain our programming and services, which we which is why we are calling on Council for their solidarity, leadership and support in creating this new initiative for us. Thank you. Lakshmi, uh, how would this funding be it would go through the um, CACF? How, how, how do you see that happening? It would be directly allocated to the 50 organizations. Um, however, we are also asking in the amount of $80,000. However, there are roughly seven of those 50 organizations who weren't able to apply for discretionary funding this year. And so we would be asking for a community fund um, to pass through that funding to them. Through CACF? Yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. We will now hear from Ravi Reddy, followed by Rashni Ahmed. Your time will begin now. 
Well, thank you so much for uh, giving the Asian American Federation the opportunity to testify this afternoon. I'm Robbie Reddy, the Associate Director for Advocacy and Policy here at AAF. So now there have been 6,600 reports of anti-Asian incidents from March 2020 to March 2021 nationally. And the tragedy within this tragedy is that 1,500 of them, more than a fifth, have occurred in our city to say nothing of the continuing daily incidents. So this budget season, as you've heard before, we and our member and partner organizations are advocating in the context of an emergency. We're joined here today with other Asian American nonprofits who are fighting this crisis through in-language and culturally competent direct services support. The work they've done in their capacity as mental health providers, senior service providers, immigration advocates, and other direct service support should be argument enough to continue funding them. But the moment calls for far more than continuity. It calls for a coordinated campaign that sees the immediate crisis as an impetus for long-term community-driven solutions that stem the tide of rising anti-Asian hate and creates lasting community resiliencies across our city. That's why we're asking the city council to provide $10 million in new initiative funding for our Hope Against Hate campaign, through which funding will go towards empowering our community-based nonprofits to act as reporting centers for bias incidents through an in-language reporting tool in order to connect victims to the services they need in-depth anti-violence upstander trainings that go well beyond what is already being provided by the city and its partners, implementing a safety ambassador program that will consist of volunteers to escort vulnerable community members who are also trained in self-defense and mental health first aid. And finally, to create safe zones in communities across New York City to serve as safe havens for targeted Asian Americans by partnering with small businesses, houses of worship, and other community focal points. And while anti-Asian hate requires a massive coordinated response, it's just one fight our nonprofits are undertaking right now. We're asking city council to also allocate an initial investment for $1 million so we can continue our Asian small business support across the city. Up till now, we've uh, helped over 100 small business in Flushing. We need to continue that work. And then we're also asking for $2 million in legal funding for CBOs with a track record of providing not only immigration legal services, but also case management services. Finally, we're also asking for a $2 million investment to provide culturally competent mental health programming. So finally, um, you know, ultimately we need our community-based organizations and we need funding for them and for the Hope Against Hate campaign. The work they've done is more than a demonstration city council needs to continue funding them, but the crisis at hand is again, why continuity is not enough. As we come out of this pandemic, how we choose to spend our city resources during this critical time will speak volumes about our values and we ask the city council to prioritize community. We look forward to working with all of you to make sure we come out of this pandemic stronger together. Thank you. Ravi, um, you're asking for 10 million. Yes. And um, what groups would be involved? You have a list of groups that you would, how would that work? So the $10 million would be dispersed through an RFP process by Asian American Federation. This uh, RFP process will be um, based on three buckets, uh, nonprofits that are uh, doing some of this work already, uh, organizations that see a need amongst their clients for this sort of work, and then organizations that have a demonstrated capacity to either continue this work, do this work, or start new work, like the safety ambassador programs. Um, so this would be a simplified RFP process that would go towards uh, federation members, but also organizations across communities of color that continue to do this work. And your program is different than CACF. Are the organizations different or are they the same? The organizations may not be different. The key distinction here, we believe, is that uh, our uh, new initiative funding is uh, focused on the immediate crisis and long-term work rooted in the anti-Asian hate. So ours is more of a response to the moment. Um, ours is more of a response to the moment. We see uh, the CACF uh, funding ask as um, all, you know, also in need of full funding. We do not think these programs are mutually exclusive, but we do think the goals are different in the focus. There is more direct service oriented, ours is more focused on the moment and okay. creating a lot of community resiliencies. Yes. Sorry about my dog's walk. Don't worry about it. <laughs> have you, um, you forward, can you forward me uh, the synopsis? Have you already done that? Send it to me? Uh, I believe we sent uh, a letter outlining the bullet points, but we can also send a brief as well. Okay, that would be uh, great if I could get that. So send it to drum at council.nyc.gov we'll or to Robin Forrest, R Forrest, F O R S T. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Roshni Ahmed, followed by Sanjana Khan. 
Your time will begin. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Roshni Ahmed. I'm the Advocacy and Outreach Coordinator at Women for Afghan Women, Think Beach, Church Rome, and members of the Committee on Finance. Women for Afghan Women is the only social service organization specifically supporting the Afghan community in all of New York City alongside our diverse Muslim and Asian immigrant community. As part of the 15% and growing campaign, I'm here to share how the needs of our communities have grown exponentially during this pandemic and why it is imperative to support our recovering and healing for Asian American New Yorkers initiative uh, through CACF. Our community-based organizations never received funding that adequately supported our vital services and neighborhood. And during a time when AP immigrants are especially vulnerable, we have had to fill tremendous gaps in services. Even before this pandemic, was served as a lifeline for the community we work with. In the past year, we saw over a 20% increase in casework, which meant taking on critical and life-saving cases with the same limited resources and investment. Two caseworkers took on over 4,000 cases. We stand alongside 45 plus APA organizations calling for equitable and just funding that will ensure recovery, safety, and healing for our community. We call for restoration and enhancement of critical funding such as DOVE, immigrant survivors and domestic violence, college and career readiness support our seniors and immigrant opportunities initiative. CBOs like WA have been on the front lines of this pandemic. We too have been responding to egregious acts of gender-based violence with financial and social support community, uh, to community members. This includes providing individuals with direct cash assistance through grants and partner organizations, care packages with essential items and PP to almost 600 individuals. We've been assisting community members with vaccine and phone appointments, civic engagement initiatives, advocating for youth, seniors, and victims and survivors of gender-based violence, and language competencies in Farsi, Pashto, Urdu, Bengali, and more. And with your support, we can continue to do even more. Thank you for your time, time and consideration inspired. today. Thank you very much. We will now hear from Sanjana Khan, followed by Tasman Udin. Your time will begin. Hi, everyone. My name is Sanjana Khan. My pronouns are she, they. I am the co-founder and executive director of LOL. We are the only organization working with the Bangladeshi community in District 11 of the Bronx. Um, Bangladeshis are one of the fastest growing immigrant communities. I'm here to speak on behalf of CACF's $4 million budget request for the AAPI um, recovery and healing campaign. Um, I was born and raised in Norwood. I'm from District 11. I am a Bronx side through and through. And what I really want to talk about is how drastically affected the Bangladeshi community has been because of COVID-19. We don't statistically exist, hence why when I do go in places, they're like, no, Bangladeshis don't exist here. So LOL has actually, with a shoestring budget, have led the um, collection of data regarding health, economics, etc., for the Bangladeshi community. And from our data findings from COVID, over 80% of our community have lost all sources of income. On top of that, we've supported six women to leave this domestic violence relationships they've been in. I wonder if we didn't exist, who would be helping them? So in order to disaggregate Asian American Pacific Islander data is very important. We are not a monolithic community. Each of us are diverse and we need different, we all need different services. Um, we only started our program six months before COVID started, and we grew our membership base to 250 women who are participating in all sorts of programming. We are pushing for this budget to help us um, register women to vote. This is a community that has not been part of the voting bloc, has not had a voice in politics, in New York City politics. I also personally want to testify that someone who was in fifth grade during 9-11, this rise in Asian American hate crimes is extremely triggering and traumatic to the South Asian community. Um, so to recognize how important it is to have this mental health services, how traumatic, how triggering everything has been. Um, in that regard, um, also as a woman founder, uh, working with women in our community, men have not been supportive in our efforts. So it is extremely important that we have support from the city council for us to push forward these 
policy initiatives that we really want to bring through and give a seat to the table of women in our community that have been institutionally, culturally, and systematically um, taken power from. That's it for me. Thank you. Thank you very much. And as you know, I have a large Bangladeshi community in Jackson Heights as well. So that is particularly close to my heart. And I appreciate you coming in and giving testimony uh, about your community there in the Bronx. Thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Tasmin Udine, followed by Katie Bell. Your time will begin. Good afternoon. My name is Tasmin Dean, and I'm the Youth Program Director at Turning Point for Women and Families, a member of the 15% and Growing Campaign. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Turning Point was founded in 2004 as the first nonprofit to address domestic violence in New York City's Muslim community. Uh, we also conduct Arise New York workshops for youth to help them address bullying and hate crimes and provide them with the tools to become upstanders who can safely intervene and report incidents of hate and discrimination. Since the start of the pandemic, there have been over 3,800 incidents of anti-Asian violence and a 1,900% increase in anti-Asian related hate crimes in New York City. Now more than ever, our communities are vulnerable and need additional support. Many organizations have had to pivot resources to meet the needs of the community. Turning Point started a COVID relief fund, which allowed us to provide financial assistance to 22 DV survivors and 28 children to support their utilities, rent, and groceries for an entire year. We had to discontinue this financial support due to limited funds. Food and housing insecurity escalated during this time, and vulnerable members of our community are homeless and starving. They fear seeking support due to the stigma, shame, and uncertainty of benefits, and this is unacceptable. At no time have DV survivors needed us more, and we need to make sure that the options available to them are both culturally and religiously competent. At Turning Point, we do everything we can to ensure that our clients are not isolated and continue to receive counseling, that our seniors are able to overcome the digital divide, and that our youth continue to have a safe space to gather, share concerns, and express themselves. We urge each of you in the Finance Committee to support the 15% and Growing Campaign's Recovery and Healing for Asian American New Yorkers initiative. During this time of uncertainty, trauma, and discrimination, APA communities in New York City are counting on you to provide, our, to, to provide sustained support to our community-based organizations who offer critical and life-affirming services. Thank you. Thank you, Tasmin. And also, let me say, it's been a pleasure working with you over the last 12 years. I really appreciated it and uh, really admire your advocacy. Thank you, and thank you to everyone at Turning Points as well. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Katie Vo, followed by Danielle Mowry. Your time will begin. Good afternoon, my name is Katie Vo, and I am a youth 17 year old outreach and education specialist for the COVID-19 test and trace community based organizations, education and outreach program for the Chinese American Planning Council, also known as CPC. Our work is funded and managed by the city's health and hospitals corporation and the city's department of health and mental hygiene. I have been in this role since January of this year, and as part of my work, I regularly conduct in-person outreach to community members in the Flushing, Queens area, many of whom are Asian immigrants whose first language is Chinese. As a part of our outreach efforts, we distribute sanitizers, face coverings, and translated outreach materials to community members. To date, we have reached over 1,300 community members. Through this work, my colleagues and I see firsthand the importance of providing education and services about COVID-19 that are culturally and linguistically accessible. As you make your considerations regarding the city's budget for the next fiscal year, I urge you to preserve existing funding to continue supporting efforts, both within city agencies and with community-based partners like us, to provide linguistically and culturally appropriate services and education on COVID-19 to underrepresented and underserved communities. Additionally, I urge you to commit to investing in the human services workforce by allocating funds for the cost of living adjustments, as well as funding to correct the retroactive cuts to the sector in order for us to continue servicing, to continue service, 
serving as lifelines for low income immigrant communities and to guarantee a full recovery from this public health and economic crisis. Thank you to the Committee on Finance for hearing me and us all out. Thank you for coming in and for giving testimony. It's really important that we hear from young people. Thank you. Next, we will hear from Danielle Maori, followed by Jeanette Perez. Your time will begin. Hi, I'm Danielle Maori from the Partnership for the Homeless, and I want to thank everybody. Um, I hope everyone's doing well on this Zoom-filled Tuesday. Um, Thank you again for considering our funding request for 160,000 to keep New Yorkers safely housed. Uh, let me just delve in a little bit. We've, we've submitted a detailed brief, but also I just wanna give you a little bit of background on the partnership. How do we do this? How do we keep New Yorkers safely housed? We are focused on prevention. Prevention entails a range of areas and services to support um, people and ensure long-term stability. We address our programs and impact in more detail in our brief again, and we thank you for those of us from the council that we've had a chance to speak with about this. And for this short conversation, no, I'm gonna keep this focus on one component, which is rental assistance. We work with our clients to pay their rental arrears. We work with landlords, especially small landlords, to negotiate amounts to pay and to arrange and help keep our, uh, to arrange logistics. We stabilize both the tenant and the landlords this way and help keep our city's housing ecosystem whole. Small landlords are a strong source of affordable housing and our city needs them to come out of this crisis intact. We also need the many, many New Yorkers, some of whom I've heard addressed by some of the community organizations who are facing eviction to stay safely housed. Who are our clients? Lower income New Yorkers, rent burden, women of color, women with young children, undocumented, and people who don't qualify for federal aids and primarily families. With the pandemic, we are seeing more clients, more people in economic distress, especially women and women with young children, and much higher amounts of rent due. Still, the amount that it takes to prevent eviction, approximately uh, $4,000 is right now, um, is so much less the cost that it nearly 70,000 it takes to keep a family in shelter. Money, of course, is not the only cost here. Eviction, homelessness, housing instability, this is trauma, and trauma that people often never fully recover from. And this trauma ultimately hurts all of us as we see families suffer and communities fray and children lose connections to their friends and their education, which is why we believe the best way to solve homelessness- the Time is has expired. And I'm just, I have just a little bit to wrap up if that's okay. Um, which is why we believe the best way to solve homelessness is to prevent it. And we really appreciate your support. And just in closing, I'd like to also say that we join with, in a separate issue, Advocates with Children and many other organizations in their urgent request for the DOE to hire 150 shelter-based community coordinators to help students in shelter. This is a key issue for the partnership as well because children in shelter are missing school and this feeds intergenerational homelessness and this is also part of our prevention is helping children now is a key part of preventing long-term prevention and is, is secures a better future for them and i just like to say it sounds like everybody here we're ultimately here uh our goal and all our work we do is to secure a better future for all new yorkers so i thank you again for your time thank you very much danielle good that you came in appreciate it thank you Next, we'll hear from Hello. Janet Perez, followed by Cheryl Warfield. Your time will begin. Great. Thank you, everyone. Good afternoon, all. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Uh, my name is Janet Perez, Director of Programs at Meet Stag Organization, uh, a CBO based in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. Um, over the past two decade, decades, Mixteca has remained a small organization focused on providing programming and services in health, education, immigration, and mental health to the Latinx immigrant community in the broader me metropolitan area, but still mostly focused in Brooklyn. Um, so on behalf of Mixteca, I would like to emphasize the importance and impact of funding support that the budget hearing committee has on small CBOs like ours. Last year, we experienced a budget cut from DYCD um, and despite experiencing these cuts in the middle of a pandemic, Mixteca continued our education programming, which includes providing beginners and intermediate ESL, ESOL classes, basic computer literacy classes, financial management, skills building workshops, and college access series uh, to not only support immigrant English, English language learners, but also provide opportunities for youth, young adults, and older adults alike to advance their educational goals. 
So as a trusted CBO that majorly services undocumented and mixed status families, we serve as a bridge for community members to access culturally and linguistically service, services a mixteca. Uh, we call on the committee to uplift and continue to sustaining CBOs like ours that provide services to, to the community. Uh, so we just wanted to share a bit of our work and the importance that this one then has on small CBOs like ours. Thank you. Love, Ms. Teka. Thank you. Next, we'll we hear from Cheryl Warf Janet Perez, followed by Cheryl Warfield. Good time. We'll begin. I'm sorry, am I going again? Or? Thank you, Ms. Perez. Um, we'll be moving forward to Cheryl Warfield, followed by Amira Mustafa. Good time again. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Drum, my own council member Rosenthal, council member Van Bremer, and other council members for the opportunity to testify before this body on behalf of arts and culture. I speak to you today to urge the inclusion of $70 million in funding for the Cultural Plan for Recovery, also known as CPR, and $10 million to support New York City's independent artists and cultural workers. I am Cheryl Warfield, a professional opera singer and teaching artist on Manhattan's Upper West Side. For two decades, I have pre presented innovative art, arts and educational outreach programs in all five boroughs for minority youth and elderly persons in underserved communities through DOE, DYCD, and Sukasa contracts. I remind you that culture generates $110 billion dollars in economic activity for the city and employs nearly 400,000 people and that neighborhoods with cultural assets show better outcomes for education, aging, crime, health, and community well-being. Arts and, and culture are essential to New York's economic recovery and for quality education. The city must be forward-thinking and lay a, a strong foundation to stimulate the economy with initiatives that rebuild and restore arts and culture, fund arts education, and provide greater access to city contracts for artists and nonprofits of color working in underserved communities hit hardest by the pandemic that are not eligible for DCLA funding. I wholeheartedly support $70 million in CPR funding, which includes restoring funding for critical cultural initiatives, baseline funding for the Coalition of Theaters of Color, an additional 40 million for culture to heal our communities and lead the city's economic recovery, including social and emotional learning and anti-violence programs, an additional $30 million to DCLA and the continuation of the arts workforce program. Thank you for all your efforts toward, uh, towards a greater, more equitable and just New York. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Next, we'll hear from Amir Mustafa, followed by Benjamin Spearman. Your time will begin. Good afternoon. My name is Amir Mustafa, and I'm the founder and executive director of Art Defined Productions. We are a Bronx-based nonprofit art, arts organization with the mission to support and create platforms for literary and performing artists living in underserved communities. In the over 10 years we've existed, we've kept our workshops and events free to make our programming accessible to the community. While we enjoy offering these services, it's been a struggle to continue these programs, five to seven of them each month, and to grow and grow to the extent where we can help fill in the gaps formed by racial and financial inequalities of the Bronx. We've applied for discretionary funds from a handful of council members that lead the communities of the majority we serve, and some initiatives, namely the Adult Literacy Initiative, CASA, Digital Inclusion and Literacy Initiative, and a few others. That's why it's so important that the council restore initiative funding, restore and support the DCLA with an addition of 30 million. 
I join my colleagues in supporting the whole 70 million cultural plan for recovery, which includes those asks from the council, as well as baselining the funding for the coalition of theaters of color and an additional 40 million from the administration to provide equitable support for the hardest hit parts of our sector so we can heal our communities and lead the city's economic recovery. We are confident that with your help, Art Define and similar arts organizations can continue to fulfill our mission. Thank you for your time today. Thank you very much. Next, we'll hear from Benjamin Spearman, followed by Melody Capote. Time begins. Thank you to the Finance Committee and to Chair Drum. Your personal investment in the work of all of our organizations do is obvious, and your work is daunting. I'm Benjamin Spearman, General Director of the Bronx Opera. We've presented opera and worked in our community since 1967. Over the years, Bronx Opera has participated in three city council initiatives, CASA, Sioux CASA, and the Cultural Immigrant Initiative. We've received cultural development funds for our, our performances and our arts education work as well. And this week, year, we've applied to the Jewish Caucus. With this support, we've been able to create live and virtual performance as I am to partner with schools, parent groups, community centers, houses of worship, and senior centers to work to help enhance the lives of people in our community by connecting people as only the arts can. Even during COVID, we've been able to continue enriching the lives of people in our community through virtual, virtual productions, our distance learning choral programs for seniors, acting classes, music classes, and dance classes for special needs children. We've also just begun BXO Breathes, through which we bring opera singers to groups of recovering COVID patients to help them regain their breath. In addition, we're commissioning a musical work to memorialize the life and tragic death of Elijah McLean. Like each organization we'll hear from, we feel that our work is vital. It's wonderful to hear what everyone's doing, and it's a little daunting too. But the arts are not living in isolation. We are part of our communities, and we are part of the solution. Increasingly, we work in all the sectors you've heard from today. The support you give to us as arts organizations is critical to our work and to our ability to be part of the city's recovery from the pandemic. I urge you to fully fund the initiatives to maintain and increase cultural development fund and cultural institutions group funding, maintain member items, and increase administrative funding for the Department of Cultural Affairs so that that agency can manage New York City arts funding more smoothly. I thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And I'm a big believer in the smaller arts organization. So I appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we hear from Melody Capote, followed by Karina Kaufman Gutierrez. Time begins. Mr. Chairman, members of the City Council, and colleagues. My name is Melody Capote, Executive Director of the Caribbean Cultural Center, African Diaspora Institute. I come before you today to urge the City Council to take a long and overdue step to correct the inequitable and unfair funding for arts and culture organizations of color. We so often speak about New York's rich cultural diversity and its uncanny ability to blend threads of culture into a beautiful tapestry. What we are talking about, ladies and gentlemen, is communities of color. Let's face it, without the cultural and artistic contributions of communities of color, New York would not be the cultural capital it purports to be, and that's a fact. We have had our music, our culture stolen and replicated, resold and appropriated by people outside of our communities. Our institutions are so fragile and underfunded that the common cold translates to pneumonia. The pandemic made this so very clear. All too many institutions of color closed their doors in 2020, never, never to have their open again. And yet we talk about culture coming back. It's not coming back, it's coming backwards. I come to you today with one request, namely that you make the creation of the Cultural Equity Fund a mandatory minimum requirement for arts and culture funding in this and subsequent fiscal years. People ask what we can do to make up for the decades of cultural appropriation and cultural neglect inflicted on communities of color. Well, here's the answer. Establish a cultural equity fund within the executive budget and fund it at a level that does three things. 
first, recognize that for over a century, cultural organizations of color received almost no meaningful support within the city budget. Second, also recognize the fact that a critical mass of dollars is necessary in order to allow arts and cultural organizations of color to catch up to those economically privileged organizations. And third, recognize uh -huh. the need to develop the capacity and create a pipeline of talent necessary to populate organizations of color. I am asking that the Cultural Equity Fund receive appropriation of $75 million in this fiscal year. Our lives matter too. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Karina Kaufman Gutierrez, followed by Mohamed Atia. Time begins. Good afternoon, Chair Drum and everyone present today. Uh, my name is Karina Kaufman Gutierrez and I'm the Deputy Director of the Street Vendor Project of the Urban Justice Center. Thank you for the opportunity to share today. Um, with the staff of eight, SVP is the only organization that focuses on street vendors in New York City, providing legal representation, small business development and training, organizing support and strategic legislative advocacy. In just this past year alone, we've connected nearly 3,000 street vendors to resources and information about housing, food access, and loan and grant opportunities. We are respectfully requesting for New York City Council to support our, our ask to demand um, essential multilingual and cultural uh, outreach and community education services that we offer to street vendors across the five boroughs. Um, our membership base includes over 2,300 of New York City's vendors who've been part of our organization in, the, in its 20 year history. This population is primarily new immigrants who rely on vending to provide for themselves and for their families and have continued to provide for our communities throughout the pandemic. About 90% of street vendors are immigrants. Um, and at SVP, we ensure that there is excellent language access for members who come and join our, our monthly meetings and outreach sessions um, in Spanish, Mandarin, Bangla, Tibetan, and Wolof. There's an extremely high demand for our services, especially during this past year, and it has presented an unsustainable demand on a small staff body, um, and hence our, our urgent request for support to increase our ability to respond so that we can continue to support our community to both rebuild and to thrive. Um, the vendors that we work with trust and rely on SVP's grassroots organizing efforts, and we truly appreciate your support for this proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Mohamed Atia, followed by Rui Lee. Clock is ready. Mr. Mr. Atia, Atia, we're unable to hear you. Now, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can, sir. Great. Sorry about that. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Drum. Uh, my name is Mohamed Atiyah. I'm the director of the Street Vendor Project. We are a membership-based organization working to improve the working conditions of the approximately 2,000 street vendors across the city and provide essential services for them. As the only organization that focuses on street vendors in New York City, we serve street vendors through direct legal representation, small business development, organizing support, and leadership development. SVP requests supports from the New York City Council to further develop and expand the essential multilingual services we offer to street vendors. Street vendors uh, have special needs related to the mobility of their businesses. Also, it can be really difficult to establish relationships with the vendors community due to several barriers. In January 2021, New York City Council passed a landmark legislation, Intro 1116. Thanks everyone for uh, the overwhelming support to this legislation reforming the entire street vending system. As a result of the passage of this bill, 4,000 new supervisory licenses for mobile food vendors will be introduced over the next decade. Since then, SVP staff members have been fielding hundreds of calls per week to advise vendors. 
the high volume of intakes has presented an unsustainable demand on the small staff body that uh, the organization has, hence our urgent request for support to increase our ability to respond. As my colleague Karina mentioned, we have only eight staff members and we are serving thousands of vendors across the city, not only the 2,600 members we have right now. With the increased need to inform vendors of the updated rules and regulations in the new system, SVP requests support to expand capacity for our culturally and linguistically specific outreach services across the five boroughs. Additionally, the outreach specialists we are hoping to hire will work with SVP's graphic designers to create linguistically specific materials, as well as materials for the illiterate population. With the help of people, we are hoping to ensure that street vendors not only survive in our city, but also thrive and prosper as essential part of the city's fabric. Thanks, Chair Drum, and thanks all council members. Thanks, Mohammed. good to see you. You will now hear from Rui Lee, followed by Justin Pollack. Clock is ready. Hi, can you hear me? All right. Great. Yes. Good afternoon, Chair Drum and fellow council members. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Rui Lee, and I am the Women in BIPOC Small Business Empowerment Organizer at Street Vendor Project. Um, with New York City Council support, we hope to launch later phases of a vital new program, the Small Business Consultation Program. So with this Small Business Consultation Program, SVP aims to provide our members with the tools, resources, and skills to grow their businesses so they feel empowered to make the business decisions on their own that will help them succeed down the road. Uh, with this program, we are intentionally making invest investment in the development of financial empowerment and literacy by creating a year-long empowerment program uh, designed to provide a holistic approach to establishing financial independence, self-sufficiency, and small business growth for vendors. Um, and this program will on three phases, beginning with uh, phase one, which launched earlier this year, uh, that will focus on business and compliance, e-payment, social media. Uh, phase two will expand into our, uh, our uh, services for um, uh, finance for small businesses and personal finance. And there is a wide range of financial literacy within our membership. Uh, many operate relatively informally and do not have the access to technology like Excel QuickBooks. So we want to offer tangible tools to those who need it and make sure that uh, folks have the proper documents to, uh, needed to be loan ready. And phase three will cover marketing for those who want to take that next step to actively market their businesses. We can offer advice and strategies, um, create business cards or even logos to help them make their businesses uniquely theirs. And through the Small Business Consultation Program, uh, SBP will conduct outreach to vendors on the streets throughout the five boroughs and provide them with, with information on available services that we have and our pro uh, partners provide in relation to small business development, uh, legal services, financial literacies, and microloans. And providing small business assistance to stream vendors benefit the community by pro uh, providing primarily low-income migrants, uh, immigrants who work uh, as stream vendors with the skills to support this, their necessity to, to thrive and grow. Uh, uh, could I just have 30 more seconds, please? Yes. Thank you. Uh, and by educating vendors to improve their financial literacy, we can help them integrate into the formal uh, economy by allowing them to open bank accounts, access credit, regularly pay and uh, file taxes, uh, even eventually in some cases um, buy homes on their own. So when a vendor grows their business, that creates jobs and expands the economy. Uh, furthermore, by providing tax filing assistance to vendors, we are helping to increase tax compliance, therefore growing the revenue uh, to the city and state. And as the city reopens, we really want to make sure that our street vendors who, are, who were disproportionately devastated by the pandemic are part of the just economic recovery of the city. So thank you so much in consideration of this proposal in advancing the business development and financial empowerment of New York's smallest business owners. Thank you so much. What organization were you with? I'm sorry, I missed that. Uh, I'm also with the Street Vendor Project. Oh, okay, good. Okay. Center, yes. All right, good. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Justin Polak, followed by Zaire Nazir. Clock is ready. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you. My name is Justin Pollack, and uh, I've spent my career on Wall Street. 
but I really wanted to follow the last few uh, testimonies and just share my enthusiasm for what the city council has done this year in addressing the archaic law that used to govern vending of food on public streets. Because the new law that you just passed provides a critical update uh, to this important industry. But I wanna focus on the individual vendors because it's gonna require a constant focus on complying with this new law. And as an investment professional, I, I've committed hundreds of millions of dollars to private businesses, including quite a few enterprises here in New York City. And most of these companies have full-time staff that can interpret regulations and negotiate the formalities of the city's governing institutions while also operating a profitable business. And yet I've, I've found that well-intentioned rules that all businesses must observe are difficult to follow despite the fact that I'm a native New Yorker and English is, is my first language. And that gives me deep insight to the challenge for vendors who must operate within the same guidelines, but with far less support. And I've, I've spent the past few years working with the nonprofit Street Vendor Project as a member of the advisory board. The street vendors represent the best of New York. They're all small business people. They're largely drawn from our immigrant population, minority neighborhoods, and military veterans across the five boroughs. And I applaud the city council for leveling the playing field with the passage of the new law. But the next step is ensuring that the vendors comply with the policies of the new Office of Street Vendor Enforcement. And that's gonna require uh, an effort that's beyond the, cap the capabilities of the municipal administration. The city is not equipped to quickly educate 20,000 vendors who operate outside on the street without the benefit of desktop, desktop technology and who speak many different languages. Instead, I suggest utilizing the foundation laid by the Street Vendor Project over the past couple of decades. With a limited amount of fiscal support, uh, just $500,000 from the council, Street Vendor Project can continue its work instructing its members to ensure compliance with the new law. And Street Vendor Project can do this in English, Spanish, Mandarin, Arabic, Bangla, and many other languages. So I encourage the council to take the route of leveraging the infrastructure that's readily available from the Street Vendor Project to ensure implementation of the street vending law is fulfilled. And thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much. And uh, we appreciate you coming in to support the street vendors. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Zara Nasser, followed by Mallory Tompkins. Clock is ready. Um, hello, Council Member Drum and Finance Committee members. My name is Zara Nasser, and I work at the New York City Anti Violence Project, AVP. And I wanted to talk to you all today about AVP's important work supporting survivors, um, LGBTQ survivors of violence, which is even more important during this time of crisis and economic instability. We appreciate the council's past support of our work and just wanted to reiterate how important it is for us to continue receiving support to do this vital work. We're the only LGBT, LGBTQ specific victim services agency in the city. We operate a bilingual 24 seven hotline and provide legal services, counseling and advocacy. All of our services are free and confidential and have been fully remote since March. During this time of crisis, violence is increasing, especially against LGBTQ New Yorkers. 2020 was one of the deadliest years for hate violence, especially against black trans women. Every week we get reports from the Office of the Prevention of Hate Crimes about anti-LGBTQ violence in this city. And we get daily calls to our hotline from LGBTQ and HIV affected survivors of intimate partner, sexual hate and or police violence requesting support and resources. As these crises grow, so does the work that we do to support survivors. We're often having to reach out more frequently and do more support work with council members affected by, uh, community, uh, community members affected by increased and more complex webs of violence. We're also training more and more community members than ever in bystander intervention to keep their communities safe. We're seeking FY20 level restorations and general operations funding, Dove, the outreach work to connect persons involved in the sex trades with supported services initiative, the initiative for immigrant survivors of domestic violence and the legal services for the working poor initiative. We're also requesting a restoration of the hate crimes for prevention initiative, which was cut completely last year, despite rising violence against marginalized communities. As a member of the CPR coalition, we're also urging the council to pull back and divest from NYPD. Many of the root causes of violence that we're seeing in the city right now can only be addressed through preventative services, aftercare and support, and resources for communities and survivors, not through more policing. We appreciate the past support of the council and can continue, look forward to continuing to work together. Thank you. We 
We will now hear from Mallory Tompkins, followed by Randy Labib. Clock is ready. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Mallory Tompkins, and I represent 82nd Street Academics. Last year around this time, I spoke with several members of City Council about Jaden. His family had recently arrived from the Dominican Republic, and I was sharing with you the joys of supporting his progress with English. Ten days after I spoke with you, I saw Jaden in person, neither of us knowing that it would be the last time that we shared a table together for more than a year. Jaden's family is part of the roughly 70% of students in our community that are home for learning this school year. As part of the Corona, Jackson Heights, and East Elmhurst neighborhoods, Jaden's family is part of an area that has been disproportionately hit by the dangers of the coronavirus. We know that social emotional learning, conversational skills, and fluency are best achieved when students are in supportive environments that are in person, surrounding themselves with peers that are also working towards these same goals. Our mission is to complement the public school system so that students can have equal access to college education. We celebrate their home language by making sure they are served by staff members that live and work in their community. Since the pandemic, we have introduced tutoring programs and extended our options for two-year-old children to support families who are attempting to get back to work. Jaden's grit and resiliency knows no bounds. He's joined our tutoring program to continue his language skills and he's continued to thrive in small groups that have been supported by allocations uh, thanks to the friends of our agency on this call, Council Members Moya and Drum. With food pantry lines and homelessness on the rise, you might wonder why something like this is important. Jaden's mom is a single parent who needs to work a full-time job to keep the lights on at home. How many families can go back to work without a place for their child to go or a guide for their child's education outside of school hours? We respectfully request $80,000 to fund essential services for our families, such as full-time preschool and tutoring. Thank you for your continued support of our learning community. Uh, thank you, Mallory, for coming in. I am very much uh, aware of the work that you do in the Jackson Heights and uh, Elmhurst communities and other communities as well now that you've expanded out. And uh, I appreciate everything you do. So thank you. And uh, we'll be in touch as we move through the process of the budget. Thank you. And thank you. You're, uh, you've just, the city council has been very adaptive in the funding model this year, considering the needs and the complexities. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Randy Levine, followed by Maggie Moroff. Clock is ready. Thank you for this opportunity. My name is Randy Levine. I'm policy director of Advocates for Children of New York. The city has a historic opportunity to create much needed lasting change for students following the pandemic. The executive budget has some important education investments, but is short on details in some areas and has inadequate funding in others. The FY22 executive budget includes $500 million for academic recovery with no specifics. We recommend allocating $50 million for evidence-based culturally responsive reading curricula as recommended in the city council's response to the preliminary budget and $150 million for small group reading intervention. Every student should learn to read in our public schools. And $100 million to provide targeted support to English language learners and ensure they receive the legally required language instruction denied during the pandemic. The executive budget includes $236 million for compensatory special education services, again with no specifics. Before adoption, please ensure the city details how it will provide the makeup, instruction, and services to which students with disabilities are entitled as a result of the pandemic and ensure there's adequate funding. We appreciate the new investment in preschool special education, but there's no funding slated until FY23 to address the preschool special education class shortage that has left children sitting at home in violation of their rights and no commitment even in FY23 to provide salary parity to their teachers. Please include $85 million in FY22 for preschool special classes and salary parity as recommended by the city council. In addition to adding more mental health staff for students, the FY22 budget should include $15 million for a mental health continuum as recommended by the city council to provide an integrated system of intensive mental health supports for students in high need schools and $118 million to expand school-wide restorative practices. The education budget should also include $55 million to hire 500 community coordinators 
including 150 shelter based coordinators to engage in intensive outreach and re-engage students in school, $46 million for a DOE multilingual communications plan, $1.5 million for a small DOE office focused on students in foster care, as the DOE currently has no staff dedicated to supporting students in foster care who have the lowest graduation rate of any student group in New York City. Our written testimony has additional recommendations and detail. We deeply appreciate your leadership, Chair Drum, and are grateful for the work of the City Council. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. And I want to just say what a pleasure it's been to work with you and Advocates for Children, with Kim Sweet and with Maggie as well. Over the last 12 years, you are like the foremost advocates for uh, special education students and all of the cases that my office has sent you uh, and you've taken care of them and gotten them uh, justice, actually you've gotten them justice um, is uh, really been beneficial to, to my district. So thank you. And we look forward to working with you as we move toward adoption. Uh, and uh, as this, this is my final budget, um, I just wanted to say thank you again for, for all that you do. Thank you, Randy. Thank you. It's been so wonderful to have such a teacher and a leader and fighter in the city council. Thank you. Thanks, Randy. We'll now hear from Maggie Mora, followed by Jeff Lau. Clock is ready. Good afternoon, Chair Drum. Thank I you. didn't know you were next, Maggie. <laughs> I swear, I did not know you were next. <laughs> Thank you so much for your kind words just now. And um, I'll jump to the end of my testimony quickly. And just to say thank you for all of your partnership all over, over the years on behalf of students with disabilities and of their families. Um, so I speak today on behalf of the Arise Coalition about the need for funds for evidence-based literacy supports for all students, about compensatory services for students with disabilities and about specialized placements for preschool students with disabilities. My written testimony as always is more detailed but I'm gonna shorten it here. So echoing some of what you've heard already, when school staff have access to evidence-based, culturally relevant reading curricula, and when they are trained and supported to use those, still, their students will learn how to read. Um, there will still be some students who need small group or one-on-one -on -one intervention, but the science is clear that they can all become readers. Um, yet too many students don't currently get that um, for our third through eighth graders, less than one half of them overall, only 36% of black and Hispanic students and less than 16% of students with disabilities were reading proficiently in 2019. We're asking the city to include at least 50 million in the budget for evidence-based culturally responsive literacy curricula. So the teachers have what they need to teach their students effectively and at least 150 million for targeted intervention for the students who need more help. Also, while we recognize all done this year by DOE staff to support students with disabilities, too many students with IEPs who are disproportionately Black and Latinx and from lower income families went without key instruction and all the special ed supports that they required. The city must make their plan for determining who requires comp services, what will be offered to them, and how the city will actually implement that um, public. That's going to require funding, but no family, no family should have to litigate that in order to make it happen. And then lastly, um, is, as you've heard, just a few more seconds, sorry, um, currently a huge shortage of preschool special ed seats. Uh, the budget, we're echoing the call for at least 85 million to guarantee a preschool special ed seat for every student who needs one and salary parity for their teachers, regardless of where they work. Thank you again for all you have done over the years and for your partnership. And I am looking forward to working together in some other context going forward. Yes, me too. Thank you, Maggie. It's always been great to hear from you and I deeply appreciate your advocacy. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Jeff Lau followed by Kate McDonough. Clock is ready. Good afternoon uh, to the chair of the Finance Committee, Council Member Drum. In addition to the City Council, my name is Jeffrey Lau and I'm the Adult Literacy Director at the Chinese American Planning Council. I'm here today to ask the city to baseline the $12 million Adult Literacy Initiative, launch the Adult Literacy Pilot Project and invest in human services like CPC, especially now as our community struggle to rebuild in a post-COVID world. Community organizations like CPC are providing the culturally competent and language accessible services our neighborhoods need despite significant cuts to our funding. 
but this is making it more difficult to staff the services to meet the needs of our growing community's concerns. We know that unemployment within the AAPI community in New York has increased almost 7,000% since the start of COVID-19. As the Adult Literacy Program Director, the community members that I see come to learn English to better support their children with remote learning. They come because they need the skill to navigate the healthcare system. Students learn English to enter the workforce or improve their job performance. They come because they're applying for US citizenship. Through our program, students are learning about their American rights, how to start a small business, and how to report a crime. It's been disruptive and disadvantageous for students to take summer breaks because we're waiting for classes to be renewed through single year investments. Single year investments and low reimbursement rates mean we can't provide staffing for the wraparound services and counseling that the students need outside of the classrooms and that CPC provides. Right now, 59% of Asian Americans are worried about their next month's rent payment. Right now, community members are receiving information for financial assistance, legal aid, domestic violence, healthcare access, and translation services through our community centers. Now I'm asking to invest in human services. Baseline the Adult Literacy Initiative and give our communities the equity they need to succeed post-COVID. Invest in adult literacy pilot programs so our programs can provide the needed services to our students. Invest in human services as we work towards rebuilding our communities stronger and more resilient. And finally, I wanna say, stop Asian hate now. Thank you. Mm. Thank you for uh, your ending comment. Um, yes, stop Asian hate now. And uh, I just don't get, um, you know, why we have to every year go back and forth with the administration about the adult literacy fund. It's just gotten to the point of ridiculous at this point, but we'll advocate again and, uh, and hopefully we'll make sure that you get that funding. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, thank you very much, Chair Drum. We will now hear from Kate McDonough followed by Emily Hellstrom. Talk is ready. Hi, I'm uh, Kate McDonough with the Dignity in Schools Campaign New York, a coalition of over 20 New York City-based organizations consisting of students, parents, educators, and advocates who work towards education justice and the end to the school to prison pipeline. Um, I'd like to just quickly thank you, Chair Jerome, for all your support of our work and the coalition um, over the years that you've been in council. Um, so you've heard from many of our youth leaders earlier today in their call for police-free schools. Um, I'll uplift that I was in eighth grade at a school in the Bronx with no windows and few resources when the NYPD took over school policing. Um, and I don't have words for what it feels like to work with young people who weren't even born when that happened. Um, I think the city does have a real opportunity now to start repairing the harm um, by divesting from school policing and investing in the resources that our young people want, need, and deserve. Um, so our budget demands are uh, to fully fund meaningful restorative justice. Um, the mayor has never fully funded restorative justice. We're asking for uh, $118 million uh, to adequately fund restorative justice in 500 high schools this year. Um, we're also asking for the expansion of social emotional supports at $117 million um, to help hire more guidance counselors and social workers and also invest in the mental health continuum. Um, lastly, uh, we're calling for the ending of school policing. Um, the council does have an opportunity now to um, divest from school policing by not hiring the 554 uh, school police positions that have been lost to attrition um, and reinvesting that $50 million um, towards restorative justice support staff and mental health support for youth. Uh, for youth. Uh, thank you again for all your support and I uh, hope to work with you as we close things out. Thanks, Kate. And uh, you're right, we need to get rid of policing in schools. We need to support cultural response and sustaining education. We need to uh, ensure that there is implicit bias training going on in the schools as well. So I'm aligned with you on this and uh, let's continue to fight. Wonderful, thank you so much, Chair John. Next, we'll hear from Emily Hellstrom followed by Kim Watkins. Time starts now. Hi, 95% um, of children can learn to read on grade level if they are given the proper instruction. I just think it's important to let that statistic stand because science has weighed in and it flies in the face of the reality on the ground. 
So I repeat, 95% of children can become skilled reader, readers. My name is Emily Hellstrom. I'm the vice president of the CEC for District 2, and I founded the chair and I'm the founder and chair of the Students with Disabilities Committee, a member of the Arise Literacy Coalition, and I'm part of a team trying to start the first DOE public school for children with dyslexia and language-based learning disabilities, which I do hope will be funded soon too. Over the past four years, I have met with hundreds of individual families who are desperate to receive the literacy instruction for their children that actually works. Structured literacy is sound science. It is essential for students with dyslexia and other LBLDs, but over 60% of our students must be taught this way in order to learn to read. And an added benefit is that it works for all learners. We must dedicate money to ensure that all principals, teachers, paras, speech therapists, and more receive the evidence-based literacy training that we know works. We must also dedicate funds to the small but highly successful universal literacy program started by Andrew Fletcher at the DOE. As Zaretta Hammond, the author of Culturally Responsive Teaching and the Brain, recently said, ineffective reading instruction is the main way we will ensure inequity will continue. It's cognitive redlining in the classroom. We passed a robust resolution at the CEC District 2 regarding the importance of ev evidence-based structured literacy in our classrooms, and a similar resolution was passed at CEC D4 and CEC D5. It also specifically called out the importance to not spend money on curriculum that has been proven not to work and to actively harm students' ability to read. With this budget, we have the opportunity to put our money towards teacher training, curriculum, and literacy instruction that will help us right. achieve the goal that science puts in front of us. 95%. Thank you so much. We will hear from Kim Watkins, followed by Janine Keeley. Time starts now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair Drum, for holding this hearing. I, I'm Kim Watkins. I'm president of CEC3. I want to just take a second to lift up all of my CEC colleagues that have been speaking on really important educational issues. Uh, so many important uh, tugs at the budget dollar, but I'm here today to talk about another one, um, and that is putting a permanent full-time nurse in every school. I'm going to read some excerpts from a letter that nurses, retired nurses, and nurses have put together uh, that's being published tomorrow in the Gotham Gazette. Um, I encourage you to take a look at the full detail because what has just been presented from the chancellor in terms of our reopening for this fall that a nurse will be in every school is not accurate. We are about to have 400 vacancies in our schools because we have chosen to outsource this job instead of paying the women mostly who work in this position equal pay for equal work. We have 1,400 buildings with 1,800 schools roughly and fewer than 600 salaried full-time nurses that work for the DOE. The rest are either being paid hourly by DOH or they're being outsourced. And so we have multiple tiers, multiple unions, really complex, but this is the year, if there was ever a time to invest in the women that, and a few men who take care of our kids in our public school system, this is the year to invest in that. So the nurses are asking that we pay for a permanent, a nurse, in every school, my CEC has been working on this issue for three years. We've written multiple letters and resolutions, and some of these nurses have been working on this issue for more than a decade. It is long overdue that we take this seriously, and it is unjust that we pay some women almost double what we pay others to do the same work in our school system. Our kids are worth it. Our health is important. So thank you for uh, so much for listening, and uh, I hope we can get this done this year. Thanks, Kim, and thanks for always being such a strong advocate for our schools and our children. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. We'll now hear from Janine Keeley, followed by Amy Tsai. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Janine Kiley. I'm the parent of children with disabilities and a member of the Arise Literacy Coalition. I'm also part of the team seeking a green light to start the first DOE public school for dis students with dyslexia and language-based learning disabilities. My son was labeled a behavior problem in pre-K. School suggested a feelings doctor. He failed spelling tests, couldn't sound out simple words, got up and down during library selecting books he couldn't read to impress his friends. Our son felt dumb and fell further and further behind. 
These are common signs of dyslexia, but we were told they'd eventually catch up. He continued to act out. One experienced educator suggested he attend a therapeutic residential treatment program with animal therapy. In this city, if our son were a black or brown boy, he would have had a higher chance of being labeled emotionally disturbed and recommended to a more restrictive educational setting. But we are a family with resources. In third grade, we paid for a private neuropsych exam that diagnosed him with dyslexia and ADHD. We funded private tutoring and he is now thriving in a public middle school. Unfortunately, most families cannot afford private interventions and the thousand dollars promised by one mayoral candidate won't cut it. Bottom line, our city is failing to teach children to read. Um, NAEP reading scores show that only 26% of New York City students are proficient in reading by eighth grade. Black and Hispanic students and students living in poverty have the lowest scores. To address these significant gaps in New York City schools, I asked the city to invest $50 million in evidence-based reading curricula and another $150 million for small group reading support taught by teachers who are trained in structured literacy. Thank you. When you say evidence-based literacy, is there a specific program you're referring to? I've heard that a few times today now. There are programs and approaches. So our, our, there are approaches like Orton Gillingham or Letters, which is an approach yes. and then specific curricula that the city can purchase that go with these. Um, so that the answer is both. Okay, okay. thank you. Yeah, well, that, I'm, that, I'm somewhat familiar. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I, I, Thank you, I am so much familiar with it, so thank you. Okay. We will now hear from Amy Tsai, followed by Eric Jors. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chair Drome and the members of the Committee on Finance. My name is Amy Sai. I am a member of the Citywide Council for District 75. I'm also a parent advocate and activist here in the Bronx. I'm also the mom of five children, three of them with students with disabilities in New York City public school system. I speak today for all of our students here in New York City citywide, but especially for our students in District 75 inclusion programs, NEST programs, Horizon programs, ACES programs, AIMS programs, which are specialized programs with special needs students. And I just wanted to focus on the disturbing news that we received yesterday from our mayor's announcement that uh, coming September, our students will be fully in person, no remote. And that is very upsetting to me and many of our community parents. Um, we know that a lot of times we are opted to contain in no voices, um, contain to no choices and no opportunities. And I wanna just kind of offer the three top of mind um, that I really wanna make sure that we have investment in our children's, which is um, the class size. I live in a Bronx, which is very overcrowded, even though calf sizes in our classrooms for ICTs are not beneficial. And cer certainly during this remote time of learning, we've seen that class, class groups are really es essential for our students to learn and thrive. So I really want us to continue a long-term investment for class size. Secondly, trauma and healing intervention. Yes, the DOE has invested some type of plan, but not really an official plan to really focus on not just the COVID that we're dealing right now, but also what we've dealt with Black Lives Matter, anti-Asian hate, hate and crime in general, national wide, and also in our Capitol Hill. My children have devastated through this whole time because I'm Asian American, my children are multiracial. Thirdly, language justice is really important because in order to be equitable and inclusive, we want to make sure that every single parent and family community is involved in our children's education and their success. So thank you so much for this opportunity to speak today and take care. Thank you very much. I appreciate your testimony. We will now hear from Eric Jors, followed by Rachel Gazdick. Time starts now. Hello, Mr. Chairman. Hello, members of the council. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Also, hello, Sergeant Perez. It's nice to see you. I miss seeing you in person. Um, I, I would like to speak very briefly about, I'm sorry, I'm the um, Director of Government Affairs for the New York City Charter School Center. Charter schools in New York City serve about 138,000 students about 90% of which whom are Black or Latinx, 80% um, qualifies economically disadvantaged. There were a lot of cuts that came up as COVID hit, and we understood some of those cuts 
had to be shared equally and kind of we're willing to do our part. Now that the money has been restored, we're still left with a few, we're still left with some holes. Number one, the district charter partnership, which my organization started, Carmen Farina picked up for the DOE and transferred it to a more institutional setting where 350 charter and district schools work together, sharing best practices, figuring out what, what we could do better for kids. That was cut and has not been restored in this new budget. Second, the Learning Bridges program that was put in place as childcare for parents in hybrid learning. Those seats were not extended to families of charter students. Even when it became apparent they were under-enrolled, there was no response from City Hall on allowing charter families to be part of that program. The third one, and maybe the most obnoxious in some ways, is Charter schools were completely shut out of the COVID-19 testing that DOE does for, um, does for other public schools. So charter schools and families have been on their own to provide testing to make sure those school buildings are safe. It is a blatant violation of state law. We have won a lawsuit against the city. The city is appealing and kind of slow. Sorry, sir. Um, and sorry, but just to finish up then very quickly, um, we would ask that the funding be restored for the district charter partnerships and that pressure is put on City Hall to make sure that all kids are tested. Part of the absurdity is that testing that our kids don't get is in the same building with DOE students and DOE teachers. So you have different testing regimens, some strict, some with no rules around them, for families and staff in the same buildings. It's an absurdity, and we hope that the council can weigh in and force City Hall's hand a bit. Lastly, Mr. Chair, we've been doing this a long time. It's wonderful to see you, and thank you for your public service all these years. It's really been a pleasure working with you. Thank you, Eric, and it's always good to see you as well. Uh, although sometimes we have disagreed, uh, <laughs> I have appreciated our relationship, our professional relationship, and our back and forth and I value that highly. And I knew you even before getting elected, you know what I mean. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much for your service. Be well, thank you. Appreciate it, Eric. Thank you, thank you, Eric. And next we'll hear from Rachel Gazdick, followed by Jalika Hamilton. Time starts now. Thank you, Chairman Drum and members of the committee. My name is Terry West and I am the Director of Government Contracts and School Partnerships at New York Edge. I'm providing testimony this afternoon on behalf of our CEO, Rachel Gazdick. 29 years ago, New York Edge was created at the suggestion of the New York City Council to provide free wraparound summer camps for youngsters attending summer school. From these beginnings, we have grown into the largest provider of after school and summer programming in New York City traditionally serving over 40,000 students a year at 134 locations throughout the five boroughs. And as my staff and I prepare for the New York Edge's 29th summer of pro providing free camp activities for youth across the city, I am here today to ask that you advocate for and for prioritizing our FY22 citywide funding request of $1 million under the council's after school enrichment initiative. Our mission is to help bridge the opportunity gap among students in underinvested communities by providing programs designed to improve academic performance, health and wellness, self-confidence, and leadership skills for success in life. It is the belief of our board and staff that every child is gifted and talented if only given the necessary tools, resources, and supports. And as our name implies, we strive to provide every student in our programs with the edge that they need to succeed in the classroom and in life. And with the council as our partner, we are succeeding in our mission. 80% of principals attest to the power of New York Edge in supporting academic improvement in their schools. New York Edge, its students and families are extraordinarily grateful for the support provided by the New York City Council these past 29 years. We are now looking to you to meet the needs of the next generation of young people by supporting our FY22 citywide funding request of $1 million, that which will bring fun. us back to our FY20 level of funding. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Rachel. <clears throat> I hear that you're doing great things with New York Edge, and I appreciate that innovation and, and, and new things that you're doing with the organization. And uh, yes, we really rely on you heavily to provide programs for our students, uh, both during the year and certainly during the summer as well. So thank you, and uh, we look forward to working with you as we move to adoption. Thank you, Chairman Joe. We'll now hear from Jalika Hamilton, followed by Komal Guma Gumani. Time starts now. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for sharing your time with me. Um, my name is Jalika Hamilton. I currently reside in the borough of Queens. I aged out of foster care about four years ago, but I can still remember almost um, being unfairly evicted from housing after spending 12 years navigating the battlefields of the foster care system. As I was about to face the real world with no support to even make a mistake because there would be no one there to catch me. Thankfully, I was introduced to a wonderful woman um, named Liz Northcutt. She stepped up to be my coach for me, my life coach. Um, she, was, she not only invested her time to teach me realist, realistically budgeting and find sources to, as an adult to finish my education, but she also invested part of herself by being someone to talk to or even to cry on or someone that I knew that when the holidays came around, I will always have a seat in her home. I am now a graduate with two degrees including a bachelor's. I'm also a full-time health worker and a productive citizen of New York City. Fair Futures made it possible for me to reach these goals. Without the sport of Fair Futures that, offered, that, that they offer, youth become statistics. The unfair statistics in foster care do not stop when we age out because one out of three youth that ages out either becomes homeless, incarcerated, or suicidal within the first three years of their independent living. During the beginning of the COVID epidemic, it was Fair Futures that stepped up immediately and found emergency funds for me to book accommodations, as well as find laptops to finish my education and even plan therapy Zoom calls. Baselining Fair Futures is an investment into our future generations of doctors, lawyers, and leaders. Fair Futures is the first of its kind because they're ran by a team who have worked in or around foster care system and we the unfair disparities and blind spots within it. These people want to do more, but the regular nine to five jobs was not cutting it. The people recognize that the people recognize that the youth need more, a generation of youth that already had to face obstacles of trauma before and after foster care and rise above it. Who chose not to let their abuse be an excuse, but few to become a living testimony on their pursuit of happiness? Thank you for investing in us and baselining our supports for us. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Julika. You are an inspiration and you give hope to many, many people uh, who have found themselves in the foster care system. And your testimony here today is wonderful. We need to hear your voice and others as well to advocate for those who have gone through the system. Uh, and uh, you are a wonderful example of how uh, foster youth can become successful in life. And I just am very grateful and happy for you. Keep it up and keep staying strong. Thank you. Thank you so much. We will now hear from Komal Gumani, followed by Amelia Ramirez. I'm starts now. Good afternoon. Thank you to the Council for holding this important hearing and for allowing me to speak. My name is Komal Gumani and I'm a Fair Futures coach and New Alternatives for Children. I will testify on behalf of my youth who cannot be here today. Oh, yeah. My name is Paul Anthony Urbanek. I am 21 years old and I got into foster care in April 2018 when my mother passed away from a heart attack right before I turned 18. I got diagnosed with autism when I was a baby. I am currently living in a group home. I am here today to share my story and ask for your support in saving Fair Futures. Fair Futures staff at NAC have supported me when I was in care and continued to support me after I aged out. Joelle was a great education specialist to me. We talk regularly on the phone about my plans and goals for the future. He helped me with summer youth, vocational training, and told me about higher education options. My social worker with guidance from David, our housing specialist, helped me find housing. The group home staff treats me very well and helps me become more independent by teaching me how to prepare simple meals and making purchases. 
When I left CARE, I met Gromel, the Fair Futures coach at NAC, and Chalentia, the coach supervisor, through the team group. The team group always has informative topics for youth to talk about, including climate change, police brutality, and mental health, among many others. Gromel and Chalentia always give everyone the chance to speak their mind. We also do fun projects that allow us to be creative. Through the team group, I found a community of other youth at NAC during the pandemic and made new friends who are friendly and smart. I am grateful for the support of Fair Future staff during my time in care, as well as transitioning out of care. Every foster youth deserves educational, vocational, housing, and emotional support, which is why Fair Futures needs $20 million baseline. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you. Thank you, Kamal. And thank you for being a strong advocate as well. And, uh, you know, I was one of the original supporters of Fair Futures, and I'm continuing to be. And uh, as we move to adoption, I hope that we get that uh, money baseline. Thank you. We'll now hear from Amelia Ramirez, followed by Shayana Medley. Time starts now. Good afternoon, everyone, and good afternoon, council members. First, I want to thank you all for just consistently supporting Fair Futures. Now more than ever, we need you to continue fighting for us and for our youth in foster care. My name is Amelia Ramirez and I work as a youth coach at Sheltering Arms. Working here has made me realize how truly important Fair Futures is. Fair Futures is an entire support system created for young people to thrive and ultimately be successful. This support system is needed because unfortunately it isn't that easy for kids in foster care. Most kids in foster care don't have that many things in their life that are constant. They're always changing their home or their family. It's always something that's changing for them. But with Fair Futures, youth get to have something that is constant in their lives. And that is their coach who will always be there to support them no matter what. Even long after they're out of foster care, we're still there for them, helping them throughout anything they need. Out of the 10 youth that I've worked with, I've helped two re-enroll back to school one find a stable job, three get their driver's license, two get in therapy, and three into tutoring. And although it may not seem like much to some, this is a huge step for kids in foster care. This is something that will also lead them closer to achieving their goals. It is important for NYC to fully, to fully fund Fair Futures because youth in foster care need a strong support system now more than ever. Youth need to support, motivation, compassion, love and patience to move forward and continue to persist through their struggles. They need someone on their side that is going to fight and advocate for them because that is what coaches in sheltering arms and fair futures do. Please continue to fight to baseline 20 million for fair futures in the city's FY22 budget. Thank you so much. And let me just say thank you. And um, you know, I think you're so right about uh, stability. Uh, my family, when I was younger, we were poor. My, we received public assistance. Um, we used food stamps. Uh, and we had to move quite often because we couldn't pay the rent is really what it came down to. And so I think in my first 20 years, I moved 12 times to different places. Fortunately, I had my own biological family to stay with, but um, it was still very difficult. So I really appreciate you raising the issue of stability uh, within the foster care uh, system and having youth being able to, you know, have that advantage of some type of stability in their lives because there's oftentimes just no stability in their lives at all. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Council Member John. We will now hear from Shayana Medley followed by, Sh by Shade Lifcott. I'm stuck now. Good afternoon. My name is Shayana Medley. I am 15 years old. I live in Staten Island, New York. My agency is Seaman Society. Time before joining Fair Futures, I felt as though my point of view was very unaudible. During this time, I felt as though being a role model and a leader to youth voices was, should be witnessed with open minds and clear paths. I struggled with financial management and schoolwork, but my, my Fair Futures mentor is Lucas Simmons. Having him around for three months is so fundamental to me through all the good and bad struggles. Although <laughs> him being my mentor, was an eye opener to see how much of a voice and right I had. I, it opened me up to be more optimistic and outspoken to what I need. During COVID-19, Lucas Simmons was very, very engaging and accessible to me and a lot. 
for a lot of things. However, I feel as though, that's how I felt about the pursuing. I'm sorry. I feel as though New York City's baseline funding for fair futures is very important for all youth to have voices and to grow into young people towards someone with bright futures and clear paths with colleges and high school scholarships, et cetera. We're calling on city baselines for 20 million to save fair futures and to, to continue provide foster youth with support that they need to be successful adults. Thank you. Thank you again. You heard what I've had to say. Um, we know we must support our youth. Thank you. We'll now hear from Shade Lithcutt, followed by Alejandra Duke Cifuentes. I'm starts now. Ms. Lithcott, are you there? Okay, uh, we'll circle back. So we'll now hear from Alejandra Duke Cifuentes, followed by Jarena Ribbons. Time starts now. Hello, can, Hello you, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, let's hear from Ms. Lithcom. Yes, hi, how are you? Sorry, sorry, <laughs> apologies. I'm having a little bit of internet connection uh, challenges. Can you hear me now, clearly? Yes. Wonderful. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Brom um, and esteemed members of the City Council. My name is Shade Lithcott. I am the CEO of the National Black Theater and the Chair of Coalitions of Theaters of Color, the largest um, coalition of culturally specific theaters existing in all five boroughs. I'm going to apologize in advance because, um, of course, as you've called my name, um, my computer has frozen. So I don't know if you can still hear me, um, uh, as I know that my computer has frozen. Is it possible um, I can go right after the next person? I really do apologize. I don't even know if you can hear me um, as I'm frozen. Yeah. Okay, my, uh, my, oh, here we are, sorry. I'm gonna begin again. Good afternoon, my name is Shade Lithcott. I'm the CEO of the National Black Theater and Chair of Coalitions of Theaters of Color, a coalition that represents the largest body of culturally specific theaters in all five boroughs. Um, it has come in unexpected, from unexpected people in unexpected places while standing online to get vaccinated in grocery stores, on Facebook, and in my inbox. People, strangers, over the last year have stopped me to say that NBT literally have saved their or their friends and loved ones' lives. You see, CTC is a coalition that represents 52 cultural organizations, most in communities hardest hit by COVID-19. However, CTC is more than just theaters. CTC organizations represent 52 cultural arts organizations. Um, um, uh, CTC organizations, especially in this past year, have functioned as safe haven for artists and communities that identify as Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Even through the extreme challenges and traumas of this past year, our CTC organizations have continued to serve hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers with vitally needed cultural, educational, and social resources in local neighborhoods and the broader residents living in the outer boroughs. Um, from vaccination hesitancy webinars uh, uh, conducted by High Arts in East Harlem to digital education and activism by the Chinese Theater Works in Queens. Art therapy that mind builders in the Bronx provide their kids, some of whom have lost both parents to COVID-19. Today, in my abbreviated testimony, I would like to convey that there is no reopening or recovery for our great city without comprehensive and equitable plan for arts and culture. And that's why on behalf of members of the CTC, we join our colleagues in the sector um, 
and ask you to support the cultural plan for recovery to add $70 million to the cultural budget in FY22, and 15 million of which would go to the historic and first time creation of a cultural equity fund. But most importantly, we ask that you, after last year's tremendous victory of bringing no harm to the CTC, take our hands and step us one step further and baseline our funding. The insecurity of CDF funding and uh, discretionary funding is completely destabilizing to our organization. And we're asking respectfully that you secure an annual investment in our organization by baselining the CTC. We are beyond grateful to the council for voting no harm last year and respectfully implore you to continue to move in the direction of budget justice with one um, with more secure and equitable distribution of funding as we heal our way forward. Thank you, Chair Drum, and apologies for the technical difficulties. No worries, and thank you for your uh, testimony. And I, I, for one, am very supportive of communities, um, community theaters of color as well, and also of our smaller cultural organizations. So we look forward to continuing to support you in the budget. I know that the chair of the... Um, Cultural Committee, the Library and Cultural Committee, Councilmember Van Bremer would like to say a word. Hi, Councilman Van Bremer. There we go. Can you hear me? We're in time. Yes. Yeah, so uh, so first of all, I just want to say I uh, thank you, uh, Chair Drum, um, for uh, leading the hearing, and, and I. Uh, wanted to come back to the hearing, of course, to hear so many of our uh, cultural partners and leaders and uh, Sade is one of the heroes of our movement. And um, every uh, time uh, she speaks, we learn something. And uh, I just wanna assure you, um, Sade, that uh, we are actively talking about uh, these issues, including the baselining discussion, which of course is gonna be uh, a big one. And, uh, and obviously, you know how much, uh, how strongly I feel about uh, CTC and Majority Leader Combo. And I have been on the phone uh, uh, this week and last, um, you know, uh, talking out as we often do our, our, our strategies around uh, uh, the budget uh, and, and how the two of us uh, form together as a, as a team with obviously many of our other colleagues who, who share our love of culture and the arts. But but just want to say thank you, and and uh, you know it is it is something that you know is top of mind for for myself and 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 Lori obviously, and and uh, uh, just wanted to let you know that I'm here. I see you. I hear you. Even when you have technical difficulties, you are heard. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Councilmember Van Bramer. And just, I didn't realize you were on today. None of what has happened to the coalition, the Peters of Color, would would not be possible if it weren't for your leadership and Lori's leadership and you really showing how we lead from a space of equity, placing our values with our in our pen as we make these decisions in um, company with your esteemed colleagues. So I can't tell you how much of a champion you have been to the CTC and we are truly grateful and we are looking for secure funding moving forward with baselining. So thank you so much and to uh, Chair Drum for the extra minute of time. <laughs> thank you, Shade. And, and I've been bouncing back and forth, but as you know, Jack Bernadovitz, our cultural rock star is, uh, uh, monitoring the hearings and is like, uh, here come the culturals. Uh, we got to get, uh, uh, got to get back on. So, uh, so we're here. Um, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll now hear from Alejandra Duke Cifuentes. Thank you for your patience. And then followed by Jarena Ribbons. Hello. Hello and thank you for having me. My name is Alejandra Duque Cifuentes and I'm the Executive Director of Dance NYC. As a service organization for the dance industry in New York City, we work to ensure independent dance workers and organizations can thrive. Um, it's well known that COVID-19 has had a catastrophic impact on our sector, um, exacerbating deep, deeply inequitable practices that existed before this moment. A 2021 report from the New York City Comptroller found that two thirds of all arts jobs in the city disappeared because of the pandemic. That's 
nearly 200,000 people and their families impacted. Even as the arts workforce continues to provide arts education, performances, and mutual aid in their communities, many arts workers and organizations um, and the organizations that they're a part of are still unable to access resources to support their basic human needs, including medical and mental health care, food and housing, and importantly, the dignified wages that allow them to thrive and to run their organizations healthily. Of those impacted Black, Indigenous, peoples of color, disabled, immigrant, undocumented, and trans artists have been the hardest hit. Our data shows that these arts workers and organizations, often with the smallest budgets, are not only the lion's share of our sector, but also the most adaptive and employ a workforce that is representative of the demography of our city. And yet, they have the least access to funding and support. In a climate that has threatened our humanity and Artists really are the ones that are playing a key role in organizing us, sharing our stories, and continuing to highlight the creative and cultural capacity of our city. A healthy city needs healthy local communities, and local communities cannot recover or thrive without a strong arts and cultural presence. Artists are necessary workers. It's for this reason that today I join my colleagues in requesting that the city implements the Cultural Plan for Recovery, which distributes $70 million in support to the arts and cultural sector including a restoration of the 20.2 million from fiscal year 21 for arts and culture with an additional investment of 9.8 million to bring this funding back to prior levels a restoration of council funding initiatives including the baselining of the coalitions uh theater for theaters of color support and um, the creation of the cultural equity fund, which so many of my colleagues have already shared. Additionally, the city recently announced the New York City Artist Court. And it's important for us to continue to think about how this is not just the helicopter support that drops in some, some help and leaves, but how it can remain an active program that turns into a proper workforce program to secure the arts workforce. We need to support organizations, we need to support individuals, and we need to make sure that the artists that live in our city can stay in our city and don't have to leave to other places because they can't afford to live here because they don't make enough to be here. Um, and so I encourage us to really think about how our cultural communities, as my colleague Melody Capote mentioned earlier in her testimony, New York City culture is what it is because of the black and brown and indigenous and immigrant and disabled communities that make it what it is. And so we have to put our money where our mouth is and ensure that they can thrive here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Van Bramer. Thank you, um, Alejandra. And I, I, I just wanted to say in particular, your comments about the recently announced fund for artists are are on point. I I share. Well, I shouldn't I shouldn't say I have some concerns about that uh, program and how it will be implemented, and um, and some concerns around the mayor having discovered a love for culture and the arts in the last few weeks. Um, but um, you know, and that's great because. Uh, Whenever you find a love for it, that's good, even if you, you come to it late in, in life. But the point is to make sure that it's real uh, and that it's based in equity and that it's it's not a flash in the pan one time. All of a sudden, we love culture and the arts and have a press conference about it, but that it's actually going to continue long past this year. Um, so. Uh, you know, we're going to have a new, new everything basically in January, and and that concerns me. So that's why we have to make sure that it's it's baked in, right? The support for artists is real uh, and transcends a, a particular fiscal year, particular administration, uh, and 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 uh, and we can continue to uh, rely on it, right? And not just a one shot. Uh, you know, look at us. We now love culture. Um, kind of stuff, which that might've been a little political, but it was true, so thank you. We'll now hear from Jarena Ribbons, followed by Olympia Kazi. Starting time. Okay, there we go. Hi, good afternoon, Chairman Drum, members of the Finance Committee, Council Member Van Bramer. 
It is my privilege to address this body today. My name is Irina Ribbons, and I'm the executive director of Ice Theater of New York, which is a nonprofit dance company on ice. We're proud to have been part of the fabric of New York's cultural community for over 35 years. In this meeting, I will focus on one aspect of our services, Annually, we introduce up to 2,002 school children to the fine art of dancing on ice and the physical activity of skating, which they can do in their own neighborhoods. Our classes moved online during the shutdown, providing enriching experience to the children stuck at home citywide. To quote Governor Cuomo, Ice Theater of New York enables New York City public school children to get out on the ice, and it is widely recognized for its innovative educational program that uses skating as an effective, empowering motivator and teaching tool. In a normal year, we employ up to 50 artists and our public performances attract up to 30,000 people. We weathered the storm by pivoting to virtual programming with the help of some federal funds and our private patrons, but we will need continued support to get back to full live programming. The better part of which we offer for free to city residents, tourists and public school children. Just like all city performing arts organizations, we need funding restored so we can re-employ the teachers, the artists, and get back to public performances and start serving the community again. I urge you to continue funding the arts. Ice Theater of New York joins our colleagues in supporting the $70 million cultural plan for recovery, with which you're familiar. And we also applaud the administration's support of independent artists with the Artist Corps and ask for $10 million to fund that effort. Ice Theater of New York is looking forward to continuing as part of the essential cultural framework of the city, which generates $110 billion in economic activity annually. We are worthy of support. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, well, now you know, it sounds like such a, I was gonna say, it sounds like such a wonderful program. I didn't know of it before. Thank you for coming in today and giving testimony. Great. Well, you'll have to come and watch us in action someday. I will. Get me an invitation for like September or something. Okay. Reach out to me. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from Olympia Kazi, followed by Matthew Storial. Thank you so much. My Body name time. is Olympia Kazi. Uh, Olympia Kazi, and I'm a founding member of the Music Workers Alliance, a group of mostly independent musicians and DJs who got organized to fight against unfair treatment. So last year's budget cuts on services, the exclusion of vulnerable people from relief, and the lack of real action on the issue of residential and commercial rent have left thousands of New Yorkers, including many artists, as Alejandra said before, facing homelessness and crushing debt. New York's economy was roaring before the pandemic, but just for very few, and this was directly connected to the hardships and exploitation faced by the majority of working New Yorkers. So my first comment to you today is let's make sure that this budget puts people first on every issue. Arts and culture are very important for New Yorkers' joy and well-being, and it is important for New York City's economy. But we cannot talk about arts and culture recovery without talking about artists' proper pay, fair treatment, and access to benefits. Benefits. In this year's budget, we need to restore funding to all cultural organizations in the Department of Cultural Affairs, but we also need to focus on equity by creating dedicated funding stream that meaningfully supports and protects artists, especially those from historically marginalized communities. So the performing arts sector was completely shut for more than a year. A great number of arts workers won't regain full employment for many more months. And hundreds of them joined rallies led by the Music Workers Alliance this year to demand a real WPA style works program. The 25 million recently dedicated to the New York City Artist Corps by the mayor, let's say it's a positive sign, but uh, Council Member Van Bremer already said what it is, but it needs to be extended and expanded in this year's budget. It also needs to be revised so that it becomes a real workforce program informed by the impacted workers' needs. Now, I also need to say that I'm a mother of an incoming pre-K and a rising first grader, and I've been following the work of Alliance for Quality Education, and I support their agenda and their, their ask for this year's budget. We do need to fully fund social and emotional learning, make the class smaller and most importantly i want to ask you to stop funding programs and policies that we know have exacerbated segregation and inequities in education so thank you and let's work together to make all this better thank you we'll now hear from matthew storial followed by jennifer stewart 
Starting Everyone, time. Um, my name is Lisa Gilday. I'm not Matthew, but um, I am the Chief Operating Officer of Birch Family Services, and I am filling in for Matt, uh, who could not be here. Um, and I am, uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson Drum and Council members for, for providing us with the opportunity to provide testimony, specifically as it pertains to preschool special education. Birch is a leading provider of special education preschool services in New York City, operating eight New York State approved 4410 preschool programs in the boroughs of Manhattan, Queens, Brooklyn, and the Bronx. The students that we provide services to are New York City public school students who are referred to us by the New York City Department of Education because they are unable to meet the students' needs. Birch works in partnership with the New York City DOE in providing UPK early childhood and special classes in our preschool programs so children may thrive in the least restrictive environment. My testimony will focus on issues pertaining to equity, access, and quality that currently exist in 4410 programs and recommendations to address these matters. Preschool special education programs offer small class sizes and provide students with targeted, individualized academic and social emotional interventions. The majority of special education preschool students in New York City, 86%, receive their services through community-based non-public pro programs operating 4410 special classes ranging from six to 18 students per class. Children with disabilities who have the opportunity for this specialized intervention during the preschool years are more likely to succeed in elementary school and beyond. We applaud the mayor for recognizing the value of 4410 programs through expansion of universal pre-K to include 3K and increase special education integrated classes. However, the proposed executive budget only includes a new investment of 22 million in FY22 to the New York City DOE and an increase to 88 million in FY23 for preschool special education without an immediate or clear plan to support non-public 4410 education providers who serve an overwhelming majority of this population. I'm expired. Will free and appropriate public education be afforded to special education students? This must be called into question. I'll just be another few, uh, 30 seconds. Prior to the pandemic, there was a shortage of more than 1,000 preschool special class seats. While referrals have declined during the pandemic, there continues to be shortage of class seats, particularly for those with, who need six and eight student classes. This lack of access to the right kind of educational opportunity cannot continue in the upcoming school year. Um, the expansion of 3K for all of New York City's children is laudable, but to be accessible and equitable for all, we must ensure that there's adequate capacity for special classes for those mandated for such placement. We commend the city council's response to the budget and support the proposal of 85 million to address the shortage of special education classes. The council's budget goes one step further, it reflects the council's commitment to ensure salary parity for those cert certified special education teachers working with our most complex and vulnerable students. Uh, preschoolers with significant disabilities cannot wait another year for the city to make needed investments to meet their needs. We urge the council to do the right thing and include their proposed 85 million in the final budget for FY 2022 to address the issues of equity, access, and quality presented, ensure that every preschool child who requires a special education seat has one, and that preschool special education teachers are treated the same as all New York City early childhood education teachers. Thank you very much. We will now hear from Jennifer Stewart, followed by Jennifer Choi. Hi, my name is Jennifer Stewart, and I'm one of the founding members of Caring Parents, a group that advocates for equity and education for disabled children who cannot be accommodated by the DOE, and they end up either attending 4410 schools or for school age 853 community-based organizations. As a former teacher, I was thrilled to see early childhood education get the recognition it deserves but calling it 3K and pre-K for all is absolutely dishonest when you're consistently excluding marginalized communities. It feels like our elected officials are acting like one of the most vulnerable communities in New York City just doesn't exist. And at this point, the neglect of 4410s on both the state and city levels feels like a deliberate vanishing of our kids. The children who need the most are getting the least, and we thank you for adding more self-contained inclusion classes to level the playing field for some special needs students. But what about the children whose needs cannot be met by inclusion classes? Where will they end up going when their 4410 CBOs eventually close down? The Early Childhood Education Pay Parity Agreement goes into effect in October. 
where does the council think all of those extra teachers are going to come from? I'll tell you, many will leave their jobs at 4410s where, where the children with the most severe needs are served because they simply cannot compete with the salary and benefit incentives for three and pre-K for all. There is zero incentive to work in a 4410 for unfair wages and poor benefits. I don't blame the teachers for leaving, but there is still a dire need for these schools for the children who need the most support. And it won't be long before they buckle under the pressure and all these children will be left without a seat at all. Pay parity would be a great start. It would allow 4410s to retain their teachers and encourage more to work there. By doing this, less schools will close, new ones will open, Don and the smart. seat shortage will grow smaller. I have 10 more seconds. Our kids start off in a world that does not accommodate them, and you're contributing to that on an institutional level. You've built a wonderful full day program for their peers, but it's a program that our kids are not welcome in and one that will ultimately kill the only programs that they are welcome in. So please either start by offering pay parity to 4410 teachers or stop using the word all because it's a blatant lie. Earlier, we heard from 10 year old Lucas Healy who was already aware that he doesn't fit into the DOE's little boxes. And we shouldn't be hearing that in 2021. No child should ever feel like they're not included by the institutions that are meant to support them. Thank you. We will now hear from Jennifer Choi, followed by Josephine Okangu. Starting Thank to be uh, thank you, Chair Drum. My name is Jennifer Che. I am a Woodside, Queens parent of an 11th grader with multiple disabilities and an IEP. I'm also a special education advocate and a member of the Arise Coalition. I'm here to discuss the need to include funding for compensatory services and to request for the DOE to tell us what their plan is for compensatory service provision. My child is one of many students with disabilities who was not able to fully participate in their education because of remote instruction. Most high schools, including my child's high school, offer Zoom in a room, which for us is even worse than Zoom at home. Um, I'm not faulting high schools for doing this, uh, but that doesn't erase the fact that my child wasn't able to make progress on his goals. Um, in fact, he's severely regressed and to the point where we're very worried about is if he's able to move on beyond high school. Students with disabilities have a right to reach challenging objectives of further employment, further education, and independent living. Um, for many of our kids, it's not just a lost year. It's a year of losses. It's a year of going backwards. High school students like mine not only need compensatory services, they need more time to work on their goals before they enter the world of as independent adults. Um, currently, there are no concrete answers for diploma track children who are not ready to move on and want to extend their graduation date. The mayor's budget proposal of $236 million for compensatory special education services, um, there is one of that, but the DOE has not provided any information on how they will spend this money, how students with disabilities get their makeup instruction and services. These questions must, please, please, they uh, must be answered before you adopt the budget. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from Josephine Okungu, followed by Nancy Cruz. Starting time. Come, hello. We can hear you. Okay. My name is Josephine Okungu. And sorry, just get in, get in. I'm so sorry. My child has special needs and I have to ensure his safety first. And I'm sorry, I hope everyone can hear me. I'm going to read my testament. My name is Josephine Okungu. I'm here as a New York State certified teacher, a former 4410 preschool special ed teacher and a parent to a child with autism and an 
and advocate for equity for students with disabilities. Recently, I quit my teaching job in a 44-10 preschool special ed program because my salary wasn't enough to provide for my family. It was a very tough decision, but my husband had lost his job, so I made drastic decisions. Just like every teacher in New York City, I earned my master's degree, passed the exams. I worked very hard to become certified. And believe me, it's a daunting process. But after all my hard work, I realized that equity in teacher remuneration excludes teachers like me who work in a 4410 preschool special ed program. Why was I paid less than general education pre-K teachers when I'm as qualified as they are? Is it because I teach students with disabilities? 4410 preschool special ed programs serve three to five year old children with significant disabilities. Parents like me whose children attended or attend 4410 programs did not choose to send our kids there. Our kids were placed there by the DOE because they need extra support and the DOE determined they cannot get that support in 3K or pre-K or all pre-K for all classes. These kids do not have the luxury of attending their I'm neighborhood sorry. preschool. Please explain to me why City reached a salary parity agreement to pay pre-K teachers at CBOs the same salaries as public school teachers, but excluded 4410 special ed teachers. Why should the preschoolers who need the most have teachers who are paid the least? And why doesn't this year's budget fix this discriminatory process? that leaves more teachers like me leaving. Please let me finish. Thank you city council for recommending salary parity for 4410 teachers in your budget response. The mayor's budget increases funding for preschool special education, but still does not guarantee salary parity. I'm here to beg, demand, implore, beseech that you show that you believe in preschoolers with special uh, needs by investing in them in the final budget. You must make sure there's a preschool special ed class seat for every child who needs one. Please change this co course and give salary parity. And please make sure the city stops discriminating against this population that we serve just because they cannot speak for themselves. And thank you so much for giving me time. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from Nancy Crooms, followed by Linda Rosenthal. Talk is ready. Starting time. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear yes. you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Nancy, and I'm here this afternoon as a parent and member of Caring Parents. I am a parent of twin boys who are both autistic. John and Adam both received early intervention and special education services since pre-K. From grades K through five, Adam attended a 12-1-1 class in a community school and was provided with special education services, including an individual paraprofessional. For 2018-19 year, Adam was placed in a District 75 school. While attending District 75 school for almost two years, Adam was mentally, physically, and emotionally abused because the school system didn't know how to deal with Adam. Adam has a prior IEP which stated he needed OTPT counseling and one-on-one -on -one para. I later found out he never had services because they didn't have enough therapists and teachers to administer the services. While in District 75 school, I had him had daily meltdowns at schools and at home. What does this mean? It's when he cries, hits himself, and overpowers his dad and myself with his strength when we try to calm him down. This was happening for most of the time at District 75 because he was very unhappy at the school and couldn't explain what he was feeling. I knew District 75 was not a good fit for Adam. My family was so overwhelmed with what Adam was going through that we had no choice but to hire a lawyer. The DOE failed to give Adam a free, appropriate public education. He was placed in St. Dominic School, which is an A53 school. Since June 2019, Adam has been attending St. Dominic's in Rockland, New York. It has been a dream come true. The faculty at St. Dominic's are amazing. Adam has an I annual IEP, and he gets all his services at St. Dominic's, including a para, which he so desperately needs. Adam rarely has meltdowns because St. Dominic's has taught him how to express himself verbally, not physically. 
I see Adam's future as a promising one because of St. Dominic's. He will be an individual getting a job and giving back to his community, but only because of St. Dominic's and their wonderful teachers. Mm-hmm. I just recently mm-hmm. found out that the New York State budget doesn't include our school in them. Why? Our A53 students are part of the DOE. They are in A53 because of the DOE failed them. Whose fault is that? New York State should be proud of A53 schools because they provide all the services that our special needs children need. They are helping our special needs children in becoming independent individuals who give back to their communities. Please include our A53 children in your budget. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to testify. We will now hear from Linda Rosenthal, followed by Alice Bufkin. Buck is ready. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you about the proposed executive budget. My name is Linda Rosenthal, and I'm the Director of Early Childhood Educational Services for Volunteers of America, Greater New York. I oversee the Bronx Early Learning Center, a 4410 preschool special education program for children with significant developmental disabilities, which is approved by the New York State Education Department and under contract with the New York City Department of Education to provide multidisciplinary evaluations, special education services, and therapeutic services to preschool students with disabilities. We serve New York City's students and we are not private schools. <clears throat> I am here today to ask that the executive budget include salary increases for the teachers in the pre- preschool special education programs. Under the city's salary parity agreement, this is only fair. Currently, there is a gap in pay between what public school teachers receive in salary and the special education teachers in community-based organizations such as ours. The very real concern is that our teachers, who until now have remained with our programs out of dedication to our children and families, will be forced to leave for the far higher paying public schools, Head Start and child care positions in response to the realities of their own life's needs. This will be tragic. All children deserve New York State certified teachers. Our teachers are duly certified in early childhood education and special education. Our teachers are not being treated equitably and they are being forced to leave our programs for higher paying positions. While the city has made strides toward salary parity for CBO early childhood educators working in child care centers and Head Start programs, teachers in our programs in 4410 preschool special education programs were not included. As a result, effective October, CBS, CBO preschool special education teachers will now be the lowest paid early childhood teachers in New York City, including 20 $20,000 less in salary per year. I'm expired. Uh, one final comment. The city must extend salary parity for teachers at CBO preschool special education programs so that we can continue to support preschool students with disabilities. On behalf of Volunteers of America and the Bronx Early Learning Center, I want to thank Council Member Traeger, Chairman Drum, and the members of the City Council Finance Committee. We greatly appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Member Chin, and we will now hear from Alice Bufkin, followed by Adam Ganser. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Drum and members of the committee, and thank you for this opportunity to provide testimony today. My name is Alice Bufkin, and I am the Director of Policy for Child and Adolescent Health at Citizens Committee for Children. The time I have today, I want to touch briefly on several issues in the budget that are important to children and families. You'll find more detail and additional items in my written testimony. Starting with the youngest New Yorkers, we urge city leaders to significantly increase full-day year-round programs that serve infants and toddlers, as well as provide a full day of care and summer services for three and four-year-olds. For young people in summer rising, we urge you to increase rates for the program and expedite staff clearances to ensure CBOs have everything they need to make the program a success. In response to the profound and social and emotional toll the pandemic has had on children, we urge you to restore and enhance funding for the city council's mental health initiatives. For years, these flexible programs have used non-traditional community-based settings to help identify children and families in need and offer developmentally appropriate services and supports. In terms of school-based behavioral supports, we believe social workers are a critically important part of this landscape and are grateful for significant investments in this workforce. 
We urge the city to take a thoughtful approach to implementing these providers and schools by ensuring they receive the structural support they need, by ensuring communities are actively engaged in any implementation plans, and by ensuring that the city is also addressing challenges and enhancing supports for community-based behavioral health providers who face severe funding struggles. In addition, we join others in urging greater investment in restorative practices and funding for a mental health continuum in schools. Regarding the depth of the hunger crisis in New York City, we strongly support city council proposals to increase funding for emergency food programs and nutrition benefit program enrollment and outreach through HRA. We have significant additional investments in school food and community-based providers and the restoration of cuts to city council hunger-related discretionary initiatives. Finally, children and families have experienced unprecedented housing insecurity due to COVID. The city's rent subsidy is too low to meet the actual cost for, of New York City rents. We strongly support passage of intro 146 to raise the rent limits of the city's rent subsidies so that families have greater access to permanent housing. Thank you to the City Council for all your work on behalf of children and families. We'll now hear from Adam Ganser, followed by Gregory Brender. Clock is ready. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry, I was caught off guard here. Uh, my name is Adam Ganser. I am the executive director of New Yorkers for Parks. We are the founding member of the Playfair Coalition, which includes over 300 organizations from across the five boroughs, many of whom have already testified today and more who will testify after me. I thank the council for the opportunity to speak today. During the last year and a half, New York City's parks and parks workers have been essential as parks were the only places where New Yorkers could gather with family, friends, and community. Despite this, the city dealt the Parks Department a crushing and I would say unnecessary blow, cutting the agency's funding by 14%, some $84 million that our city's parks desperately needed. That number is a drop in the bucket for the city, but paralyzing for the department. The cuts left our parks in the worst condi conditions on record, particularly in those very neighborhoods that were hardest hit by the pandemic. We call on the mayor and the city council to play fair now for parks and restore 79 million in critical funding needed to make sure our parks are safe, clean, and accessible. Specifically, we would like, uh, would like the city to baseline 100 city park workers and 50 gardeners, restore the New York City's park seasonal staff budget restore the parks Oppor opportunity program, uh, restore 50 urban park rangers staff lines that were cut last year, restore 80 parks enforcement patrol staff lines that were cut last year, uh, restore contracts for tree pruning, stump removal, and invasive species control, restore full funding for the parks equity initiative, which is uh, a, an amazing program that was unnecessarily cut, uh, restore funding for green thumb, and restore funding for, criti uh, for our city's natural forests, wetlands, and trails. The city budget is a statement of the city's priorities, and for decades, the budget for New York City parks has been chronically insufficient. COVID That's didn't create fine. this problem, but it has brought the disinvestment to a head. We urge the city's leadership to make sure the budget this year reflects the urgency of our citizens and their need for our parks for this year and for beyond. Thank you. We'll now hear from Gregory Brender, followed by Julie Tai. Clock is ready. Good afternoon. Thank you so much, Chair Drum and members of the City Council for the opportunity to testify. My name is Gregory Brender and I'm here on behalf of the Daycare Council. Uh, our, ne our nearly 93 members provide childcare in over 200 locations throughout the city. Um, we have come to you many times and your leadership has been so integral to uh, supporting the early childhood system, including most uh, significantly in the fight for salary parity once again, we're looking to the council's leadership to support and sustain the early childhood system. Uh, we strongly support the proposal in the city council's preliminary budget response to invest $45 million to ensure that full-time year-round childcare is available to the families that need it the most. The mayor's budget significantly increases funding for 3K programs that operate during the school day and school year, but there's no significant expansion for the extended day, extended year programs that work on a working family schedule that parents desperately need. 
we believe that this funding that the council has proposed is both prudent and achievable given the funding that the city expects to receive from President Biden's American Rescue Plan. In particular, we propose that the city invest $10 million to invest to um, bring in approximately 1,000 new full day family child care slots for infants and toddlers where there's the greatest need for service, 17.5 million to convert over 2,000 slots that are currently school day, school year only for three and four year olds into extended day slots that can be done with programs that are having, that have contracts currently and are slated to lose their extended day contracts and 17.5 million to expand center-based infant toddler capacity by approximately 700 slots. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify and we look forward to working with you. Next, we have Julie Tai, followed by Stacy Pappas. Clock is ready. Hello, uh, obviously I'm not Julie Tai, I'm testifying in her place. My name is uh, Carlos castell Croak, and I'm the associate for New York City Programs at the New York League of Conservation Voters. NYLCB is pleased to see the city reinvesting in the environment through the revival of the curbside composting program and a commitment to electrify our city school buses. These two initiatives are critical steps towards reducing our emissions, cleaning our streets and air, and protecting our vulnerable communities that have been overburdened by decades of environmental racism. It is imperative that the city provide adequate funding for these programs and, in the case of curbside organic waste, that we do rapidly roll out the program citywide. While federal dollars are providing the financial relief needed to implement these critical initiatives, there is still much more we must do to make a permanent commitment to the environment. Parks and our green spaces are one of the city's most valuable environmental assets and are a major source of the city's urban canopy, which mitigates climate change, provides clean air and habitats for native wildlife, and contributes to the well being of our residents and economy. Unfortunately, due to the $45 million in cuts to seasonal staff spending and forestry contracts, Last year, parks saw one of their worst years for cleanliness on record. Therefore, in this critical third year of our Playfair campaign, we are asking the council to play fair now and restore 78.9 million in the FY22 parks budget to ensure our parks are safe, clean, and accessible. In addition to parks funding, it is imperative that the city baseline funding for full staffing in critical environmental offices, such as the Office of Building Emissions and Energy Performance and the Mayor's Office of Climate Resiliency. These offices must be operating at full capacity to ensure New York City is at the forefront of the fight against climate change. The COVID-19 crisis is still placing stress on our economy and communities. This was apparent in the FY21 budget, but does not need to be the case again this year now that the federal government has provided relief. We urge the mayor and the city council to have foresight to prepare for the climate crisis by making permanent commitments to environmental investments. Bold action can be taken by implementing a citywide curbside organic collection program Base sliding 1% of the city budget for parks and doubling down on the mayor's commitment to electrify all New York City school buses by passing legislation that mandates it. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. We now have Stacy Pappas followed by Tara Das. Clock is ready. My name is Stacey Pappas. I'm executive director of Friends of the East River Esplanade. Many of my colleagues testifying today are telling you the exact same thing. Our parks are underfunded and overutilized, and because of this, they're in the worst shape they've been in since 2004. Anyone walking along the East River Esplanade can tell you exactly where the sinkholes are forming. The garbage cans are consistently overflowing onto the pedestrian path and dropping garbage into the East River. Why is that? because there's no vehicle access. So staff have to manually carry trash bags out of the park to a garbage drop. It is physically impossible for park staff to keep up with the amount of trash that is produced, not because of people littering, but because of the deteriorating conditions of the pathways and crumbling substructure of the Esplanade. Park staff cannot drive a vehicle in to transport trash out, and the city has not yet begun substructural repairs planned in 2019. Budget cuts have created an abundance of inefficiencies for park staff on the Esplanade and their ability to do their jobs. Trees are planted, but there is no water source. Lawns are seeded, but there's no irrigation system or fences to protect the new growth. New open spaces are developed, yet water and electricity are not connected. The remedy, more money and time to rip it up and start over. Pathways are laid out, but not wide enough or supportive enough for vehicle access. Seasonal labor is hired, yet incapable of doing skilled jobs. Volunteers are asked to help out, but Parks makes them wait 30 plus days to approve their projects. NYC Park's role is to maintain the hardscapes, landscapes, trees, lawns, benches, pathways, playgrounds, and comfort stations. They're not our mothers or our housekeepers. They're not here to tidy up after us. 
clean up your own mess, curb your dog, pull them out of the gardens that volunteers work so hard to maintain, use the dog runs that have been built for you, teach your children not to litter. Once our citizens take responsibility for their own garbage, NYC parks can focus on maintaining the actual park. Hours of their workday are spent cleaning up after every one of us. It's no wonder they cannot get to any other tasks in a timely manner. It doesn't take more money to clean up the esplanade. It takes more money to improve the processes, create supportive and resource-rich working conditions for the park staff for thought and planning for daily and seasonal maintenance and for the repairs to the esplanade. Budget cuts created gaps in the workflow and it shows. Increase the budget, use the $284 million for esplanade repairs and improve the system starting in FY22. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from Tara Das, followed by Lynn Kelly. Talk is ready. Great. To the members of City Council and Chairman Drum, thank you for the leadership and support you give to our city, and thank you for this opportunity to testify. My name is Tara Das, and I'm the Government Affairs Manager with New York Restoration Project, and I'm testifying on behalf of Lynn Kelly, our Executive Director. For 25 years, NYRP has helped build and maintain the city's green infrastructure improving access to open space in our city's most under-resourced neighborhoods, promoting food security through urban agriculture, and supporting healthy communities. We oversee 80 acres of city parkland, operate 52 community gardens, and provide 20,000 square feet of food production space. Just last year, we produced $180,000 worth of food, and we distributed this to families in need at no extra cost. The COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated the deep environmental and social injustices in our city. Low-income communities suffering the most from lack of access to quality green space were also hit largest by pandemic, both in terms of health and economic outcomes. NRIP acted on these issues because the lack of municipal investment stunted many of New York's underserved neighborhoods. Unfortunately, the proposed FY22 budget continues to undervalue the critical role of green space in New Yorkers' lives. I ask you, why does the administration chronically underfund an agency that is responsible for an asset they credit as being vital to the health and well being of New Yorkers? 2020 parks conditions were the worst on record since NYC parks began recording them in 2004. There are simply not nearly enough city park workers, gardeners, urban park rangers, or PEP officers to cover 14% of the city's land. And it is grossly unfair to assume that volunteers will make up the lack of funded staff. This proposed allocation risks continuing the hardships faced by many communities, but that can change. With greater investment in NYC I'm parks, sorry. organizations such as NYRP can work together with the city to secure and flourish the city's green spaces. Please play fair for NYC Parks. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. We will now hear from Kay Webster, followed by Christina Taylor. Lock is ready. Hi, thank you. Uh, I'm Kay Webster of the Sarah Roosevelt Park Community Coalition. We formed in the late 70s to take this park back from violent drug dealers. We build gardens and community as neighbors with Councilmember Chin, New Yorkers for Parks, the Hort, Audubon, the BRC, homeless men, Chinese elders with Kwai Mei birds, songbirds, ELL Public Schools, Tenement Museum, University Settlement, AFI, Green Thumb, Citizens for NYC Parks, and anyone else. We posted uh, pandemic health guidance for those who slept here to avoid congregate setting sites and solidarity signs in three languages when anti-Asian violence spiked. We hold events like Juneteenth annually to honor our cultures. We meet with our beat cops. We work to be united. We have always been a 100% volunteer coalition because some parks are never ever going to become well-off conservancies. Now we are seeing signs familiar to those of us who've been here for four decades when no one, not parks, not police, dared to enter this park. Volunteers and park staff make a park safer. We need parks maintenance staff baselined with a path to long-term decently paid jobs with benefits and skills training. People need to be invested in. Picking up garbage, used needles, human feces is not as glamorous as you might think. We need tree pruners, falling limbs kill, park gardeners who know how to garden in tough conditions, urban park rangers to remind us that nature is all around us and matters, 
committed composting inside our parks as part of a sustainable future. Infrastructure like Bruckner boxes, we can't plant if we can't water. Park buildings return to community use. Bathrooms can't safely be opened with no supervision. Bob Humber is 84. He daily anchors this park by greeting everyone, gardening, advising, feeding and clothing the park's homeless who call him dad. I clean up human feces and trash. I plant flowers. And I've, held, and I've held the head of a dying 19 year old who was stabbed in this park. We're here, but volunteers can't keep a park. We need baseline funding for the last democratic meeting spaces in the city, our public parks. Thank you, Playfair for Parks. Thank you. We'll now hear from Christina Taylor, followed by Roxanne Delgado. I begins. Good afternoon. My name is Christina Taylor. I'm the Director of Programs and Operations for the Van Cortland Park Alliance in the Bronx. We are grateful for the addition of seasonal staff at New York City Parks this year, but New York City Parks is still chronically underfunded and understaffed. There are not nearly enough city park workers, gardeners, urban park rangers, or PEP officers. In fact, there's only about 300 park enforcement patrol officers that are expected to patrol all the parks in all the boroughs. In the Bronx, this translates to approximately four PEP officers per shift for the whole borough. And in the summer, they get pulled to waterfronts, pools, and then large parks such as ours suffer from overuse and lack of oversight. The budget for New York City, for, sorry, the budget for parks in other large cities is about 2% of the overall budget on average. But in New York City, it's half a percent. Parks takes up 14% of, park, of New York City, but only get half a percent of the budget. That is not enough money to run an agency of the size and scope that New York City Parks is asked to maintain. Van Cortland Park alone is 1,146 acres and serves nearly 3 million visitors a year. Yet on a good day, we might have two PEP officers covering the entire park, and their shift is not 24-7. Right now, with the people still gathering mostly outdoors, there are large groups partying, breaking park rules and playing exceedingly loud music into the morning. NYPD is busy with violent crimes and park enforcement patrol ends their shift at 10 p.m. There's no one to deal with the difficult issues like this overnight. Communities that border the perimeter of each park have experienced a deep decline in quality of life as a result. They're calling 911, 311 and park administration for help, but they're not getting it. Plainly stated, we need more parks enforcement patrol. In addition, there still remains a hiring freeze at New York City Parks that leaves 200 people positions not filled, along with the fact that the majority of parks positions are not baseline, which means they must be renewed every year by elected officials and do not guarantee park workers their jobs. We need to move beyond a cycle of cycle funding. New York City Parks needs to be at least 1% of the city budget. Thank uh, you. Thank you. One moment. We will now hear from Athena Bernkopf, followed by Albert Scott. Bob is ready. Um, uh, good afternoon, committee chair Drob and members of the committee. Um, thank you so much for giving me time or the opportunity to testify today. Uh, my name is Athena Bernkoff, and I'm the project coordinator of the East Harlem and Barrio Community Land Trust, which is one of the 18 partner organizations that are part of the Citywide Community Land Trust Initiative. I'm here to urge the City Council to fully fund the Citywide CLT Initiative at $1.51 million in fiscal year 22 to help stabilize housing, combat speculation, and ensure a just recovery from the COVID-19 crisis in Black, Brown, and immigrant neighborhoods. The East Harlem Barrio CLT works to fight the root causes of displacement and homelessness, develop and preserve permanently affordable housing, commercial, green, and cultural space, and promote self-determination in East and Central Harlem. As a strategy to ensure permanent affordability, the East Harlem Barrio CLT will own land and lease it to buildings on that land, as well as develop a resident-controlled mutual housing association. In the past year, we have closed on the first four properties to enter onto the CLT, including four residential buildings that will be owned by a newly formed East Harlem and Barrio Mutual Housing Association. All of the current residents of these buildings are black and, black, black and brown working class people, including elders and immigrants who have called Harlem home for decades, even as gentrification transformed the neighborhood around them. 
In closing on this transfer, we've been able to begin on long needed repairs with a nonprofit, with nonprofit developer partners, Banana Kelly and Catch. These are repairs that some residents have been waiting on for over 12 years when they were displaced from their homes because the conditions in their buildings were unlivable. This project serves to protect the long-term stability, stability of the property and rent in the buildings through a 99 year ground lease that will go into effect between the land trust and the mutual housing association. All of the residential units will be rented below market rate and a range from 35 to 100% AMI. And we continue to deepen resident engagement through the rehabilitation process and trainings to prepare tenants of the buildings to step into leadership of the Mutual Housing Association and the CLT. We've turned to community land trust as one of the most powerful tools we can use right now to invest in development I'm without excited. displacement. We center the leadership of black and brown working class communities in the stewardship of land and property, knowing that we are the most impacted by the city's housing and public health crises and therefore the best qualified to build out the foundations of healthy neighborhoods that actually meet our most critical needs. This is what we mean when we talk about a just recovery from the pandemic and beyond. We're talking about building up neighborhoods where community members know they are safe and secure in their housing into the long term future. Um, without this effort, we're looking at more short-term actions that incur exorbitant costs to the city and don't actually address the root causes of the health, of the housing and health crises in the city. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and we look, look forward to working with you all towards a just recovery for the city. Be well and take care. We'll now hear from Albert Scott, followed by Boris Santos. Clock is ready. Thank you. Good afternoon, committee chair Drum and members of the committee and thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is uh, Albert Scott and I am a board member of the East New York Community Land Trust. Uh, we are a grassroots volunteer and resident led CLT fighting for community control of land so that what is built on the land meet the needs of the working family and the working poor family of black and brown people in their respective communities. Um, East New York CLT and 17 partner organizations are part of a citywide CLT initiative that seeks $1.51 million in city council discretionary funding in fiscal year 2022. We ask the committee to recommend renewed funding for the citywide CLT initiative in the fiscal year 2020 in the fiscal year 2022 budget. We rely on the CLT initiative funding to move our work forward, and we have done so much with the funding. Um, for time purposes, we were able to um, coordinate and organize co uh, community uh, to do um, surveys of public land, host um, various. Um, educational forums in regards to CLT educations and how we could help build up the community for collective ownership, community ownership, um, increased generational wealth within communities such as Brownsville and East New York. Um, this, the funding will mean so much to our community as we fight speculation, fight housing instability, economic instability in our community. This is a tool that we need that need to be strengthened and funded again to beat back the vultures of speculation in communities such as Brownsville and East New York. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next, we have Boris Santos, followed by Deborah Ack. Clock is ready. Uh, good afternoon. Greetings to the chair, Chairperson Drum, and all council members. My name is Boris Santos. I am the treasurer of the East New York Community Land Trust, or board member as well. I come before you to give testimony and urge the city council to fund the Community Land Trust initiative to the degree of $1.51 million for fiscal year 2022, as my colleagues have referred to. Um, and to demand that the city give an update to Community Board 5 or the East New York community at large as it relates to the status of the commitments made to the community through the April 2016 approved rezoning. I want to first begin, uh, first, I want to first thank, um, begin by thanking the council for being the first to recognize the need of funding, specifically, specifically discretionary funding to help build, grow, and expand the COT movement. From DISCO and Proposition was the COT initiative funding born out of, first funded in 2020 for a total of an estimated 850,000. The funding dipped a bit to 650,000 in fiscal year 2021. But it's important to note that funding 
remain through dire fiscal circumstances as our city was ravaged by the, by the COVID-19 pandemic. Yes, front funding remained as the council, quote unquote, looked through each budget line thoroughly and asked, is this essential uh, to preserve, maintain our social safety net? That in the words of Speaker Johnson. So it would follow that this initiative must be funded this upcoming fiscal year and at a time when we are working towards our recovery as the city's coffers look somewhat decent, particularly because of the financial support um, from the federal government, we must further show how, how important this initiative is by bolstering this funding at least to the level of $1.51 million. Um, I want to end by uh, making one simple but necessary demand. Since the rezoning of East New York in April 2016, our community has yet to receive an update beyond the one last made in the city's rezoning tracker with regards to its commitments. We're talking about our community not getting a progress report for about three years. Um, and what this has caused is people organizing the ground to make demands about money that the city has already committed and allocated to the East New York, um, wrapping up in 10 seconds. Uh, recent reports show this. Um, our community deserves full, consistent, and transparent reporting with regards to the finalization of the work done after the funding streams were allocated. I repeat, the city must be able to report to the community board at least to give a clear and documented progress of the East New York rezoning commitments. I look forward to that happening immediately after the summer and before this mayor leaves Gracie Mansion. Um, I'm willing to work with my council member to make this happen. And I thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you. We will now hear from Deborah Ack and then we'll circle back to Roxanne Delgado. The lock is ready. Hi, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. First, we're going to hear from Ms. Ack. Is she there? Yes, I'm here. Hi. Good afternoon, Council Member, Council Chair, Chairman Drum, and City Council Members. My name is Deborah Ack, and I am a board member of the East New York Community Land Trust. East New York CLT and 18 partner organizations are part of a citywide CLT initiative that seeks. 1.51 million in city council discretionary funding in FY 2022. The funding will assist our work to move forward. We have accomplished so much with the funding and there is more work to be done. The East New York CLT has given my life purpose, especially during the pandemic. It has truly opened my eyes to housing, generational wealth and entrepreneurship that is lost in my community. We, the East New York CLT, will return these desperate needs to our community through community organizing. Just recently, we visited an, we visited an area that is on the borderline of Brooklyn and Queens, the lost community of the whole. It tore at my heart to hear the stories of how our people are living without a sewer system in the neighborhood and are living in the 50s with septic tanks, no paved streets, side, no sidewalks, along, along with continuous flooding. Along with residents of the whole and East New York CLT community organizational skills, we will fight for this lost community giving them a sense of pride for their community. Funding from the council will allow the East New York CLT to work with these residents and other residents in the East New York area. We need the city council to invest in our CLT and in the citywide CLT movement. Support the CLT movement by investing 1.5 million in your FY 2022 budget. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity to testify and look forward to talking with you guys again. Thank you. Thank you. We have questions from Council Member Diaz. It's more so not a question, but I, I wanna thank my Eastern York people for standing tall and standing proud as I transition from an advocate with you to be here, council member, it brings me great, great joy to know that you're amongst the 290 so people that have been on since 10 o'clock this morning. I am committed to having the conversation with the mayor about the rezone 
It has not happened, but publicly I want to state it is on the record. It is in conversation. And Boris, it will happen before the end of, of June. Again, let's just circle back, check. And Pablo put Alexis, I did send an email out to her this morning, a text message for our next meeting. So again, thank you for fighting the fight. The stronger you are, the easier it is for me to make your deliverables. Thank you, Chair Drum. Thank you. Um, now we'll hear from Roxanne Delgado, followed by Hannah Anushe. Time's ready to begin. Yes, hello. I'm so sorry about the background on my, on my way to work, but my name is Roxanne Delgado. I'm the founder of Friends of Town Parkway, which was founded in uh, summer of 2017 to address the lack of maintenance and cleanliness in our parkway. And I'm here to ask the city to play fair with parks, because this is more than about money. It's about equity, social, and environmental justice. The Bronx has the highest asthma rate, and trees can prevent asthma. It's, it's proven. It's a fact. And it seems that they have money to build trees, to cut trees, to plant trees, but no money to care for our trees. And older trees tend to absorb more carbon dioxide and tend to do it faster than the younger trees. This prevents asthma, and in the long run, it saves us millions of dollars. On Park's own website, the inspection grade for all trees on Palm Parkway is a grade C. In fact, several of trees were damaged by Park's lawnmower because they have to do more with less, so they tend to be careless, or they tend to use um, large equipment instead of doing it manually or with or, or wee whackers. Because we have a parkway, we are given less priorities than playgrounds and even parks and playgrounds. Our, our parkway is highly used by low-income working class, NYCHA, residents, and immigrants. In our old green spaces, oh my gosh, regardless of which zip code or what type of um, green space deserve adequate maintenance and tree care, which some parkway currently lacks. All green spaces, regardless of what zip code or what type of green space deserve adequate maintenance and tree care, which some parkway currently lacks. All I ask is 1% for parks operation maintenance for it to be baseline because as Councilman Van Brammer stated, we don't know who what would be the next administration, so we should have leave a legacy plan for the next generation. And crime can be prevented when parks are clean because when it's clean, it attracts good people. When it's filthy, it attracts bad characters who tend to do bad things, which is why we need PEP officers. So do you know the United Nations stated that we need to think globally and act locally, and it's time for us to um, act for our parks. And I'm sorry I'm heading up to work, but this is... Okay. Sorry. But I'm sorry... Um, I'm heading to work, but this is the perfect case of the inequities we have. You know, like everyone else, I don't have to come for not to work. I don't have to come to be behind my in, behind this office. I, but like most of the people in my neighborhood, we're low income, working poor, we're always struggling, paycheck to paycheck. But I'm here despite the fact that all my struggles, because park is very important to our community, and we need the mayor and police city council for once to play fair with park. Thank you for your time. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much. We will now hear from Hannah Anushe, followed by Azoria Fields. Your time will begin. Good afternoon, Chair Drum and City Council members. My name is Hannah Anushe, and I'm the coordinator of the East New York Community Land Trust, or East New York CLT for short. Um, and I am on staff at Cypress Hills Local Development Corporation, or CHLDC for short. Um, East New York CLT is a member of the New York City Community Land Trust Initiative, or NICELY, and we're one of 18 CLT groups in the growing citywide CLT movement. I'm here to request that the City Council provide $1.51 in funding for the citywide CLT initiative. This will allow CHLDC to support the growth of the East New York Community Land Trust. CHLDC received funding for the CLT initiative in fiscal year 21, and this allowed us to hire a CLT coordinator to support community leaders in the formation of the East New York CLT. Together, we've grown the capacity of the East New York CLT tremendously over the last year, and now we're really eager to acquire land and to partner with nonprofit developers to build much needed low income housing. But in order to acquire land, ongoing organizing and engagement of residents is an enormous priority. The East New York CLT members do an incredible amount of work as volunteers, but it's a lot of work. And the city council funding for staff and other operational costs is so crucial for our ability to grow the East New York CLT. Thank you so much for your time.
Thank you. Uh, we'll now hear from Uzoria Fields, followed by Dayanara Del Rio. Good afternoon, good. Chair Drum and City Council members, and thank you so much for the opportunity to testify on today. My name is Isora Fields, and I am the Vice President of the East New York Community Land Trust. And I am here today to urge you all to fully fund the, East, the CLT initiative across the city at $1.51 million in the East New York Community Land Trust specifically. As these funds are helping with our operations on the day-to-day -day organizing towards our mission of securing long-term affordability of land for our community. The East New York CLT is a grassroots organization that was birthed out of the pandemic. We are advocates for community control of land to provide truly sustainable affordability, create affordable home ownership opportunities for the people of East New York, commercial spaces for locally owned, black and brown owned businesses and other community needs. We are currently faced with a global pandemic and a homelessness crisis. My organization has surveyed hundreds of lots in East New York alone that are under the jurisdiction of HPD and other city agencies that have been left vacant and unkept providing opportunities for dumping of trash, breeding of rats and other pests. Instead, we would like to see these lots turned over to us so that we can provide home ownership opportunities for our community, spaces for commercial businesses and rental opportunities for the East New York community that are truly affordable. As it stands, several developments have been built in East New York and marketed under the guise of affordable housing. However, the question becomes affordable for whom? The AMI used to qualify families for housing in these developments are typically much higher than the AMI of East New York. This contributes to the systematic displacement of long-term East New York residents who simply cannot afford to live here anymore. As a local realtor, it pains me to tell potential clients and my neighbors that they cannot afford to purchase a home where they've lived for decades and they've raised their families. When out surveying our neighbors, we discovered that some of them are living under deplorable conditions to avoid homelessness and to avoid the New York City shelter system. Ms. Deborah spoke to it a bit earlier that there are areas where there are no paved roads, there are no sidewalks, they don't have access to city sewer. There is, a, there is a huge flooding problem. And this is not something that we can allow to continue here in New York City. We ask that the, the city council fully fund the CLT initiative across the city, as well as provide continued funding and support for our efforts to not only house our people, but to regain community control of land. Thank you. We'll now hear from Dayanira Del Rio, followed by John Krinsky. You may begin. Good afternoon, Chair Drum and members of the committee, and thanks so much for the opportunity to testify at today's hearing. Um, my name is Dayanira Del Rio. I'm the co-director at New Economy Project, a citywide organization that works with community groups citywide to build a just economy for all New Yorkers. Among our other activities, New Economy Project coordinates the citywide community land trust initiative that you've heard a little bit about already. Um, this initiative was launched in fiscal year 20, so less than two years ago. And in that short time, this city council funding um, has supported the formation and expansion of more than a dozen community land trusts across the five boroughs, from the South and Northwest Bronx to East Harlem, the Lower East Side, Brownsville, East New York, and beyond. I'm leaving out a lot of neighborhoods, unfortunately. Um, as community-controlled nonprofits, CLTs work to take land out of the private speculative market and ensure that it is used for deeply and permanently affordable housing, affordable commercial and storefront space, community gardens, and a host of other needs. And the diversity of local projects that are taking root on CLTs throughout the city is a real uh, testament to its flexibility to meet a whole range of community needs 
while preserving critical public investment in affordable housing and other neighborhood development. Over less than two years and throughout the pandemic, as you've heard, the CLT initiative has not just sustained, but has amplified and increased its work citywide, incorporating new CLTs and expanding existing ones like the Cooper Square CLT on the Lower East Side, which just uh, brought two more multifamily buildings onto its CLT. Groups have engaged thousands of community members in education, organizing, and community land trust governance. Uh, groups have spearheaded mutual aid relief efforts in their communities when COVID hit and ongoing, uh, and so much more. Two land trusts, as you've heard, including um, the East uh, Harlem, El Barrio CLT, have expired explain. their first properties, and many others are well on their way to doing so. Um, this all occurred despite deep cuts uh, to funding in fiscal year 21, when groups were less than a year into this work. So in fiscal year 22, our initiative is seeking expanded and full funding of 1.51 million for 18 groups. This will allow us to bring two additional organizations into the initiative, two new CLTs, and an additional citywide technical assistance provider. And crucially, it will bring this community land trust initiative, which has done so much more than the modest funding has actually covered, but it will bring this initiative more in line with other initiatives that the council supports, allowing groups to dedicate meaningful staffing and resources to continue and sustain this work. Um, as you've heard today, there are a range of needs and opportunities for the council to equitably invest in a just recovery for black, brown and immigrant New Yorkers and their neighborhoods. Community land trusts are gonna be a critical part of that equation. Um, and we urge the city council to please not only renew, but to increase funding for this vital work uh, to combat speculation and displacement in the wake of this pandemic um, and to ensure a fair and just recovery for all New Yorkers. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. We will now hear from John Krinsky, followed by Michelle Newbelauer. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Drum and members of the City Council Finance Committee. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is John Krinsky. I'm a professor at City College of New York, uh, uh, Chairman Drum, uh, in the Department of Political Science. With my colleague, Hillary Caldwell, I also run the Community Change Studies Program, which is an intensive minor that connects City College students with a wide variety of community organizations in the city and teaches community organizing, community-based research, and related skills. Ms. Caldwell and I have been involved with the New York City Community Land Initiative from its beginnings in 2012, and I currently serve on the board. I've been proud that our efforts at City College have taken a leading role in providing technical assistance to existing and emerging community land trusts in preparing training curricula and materials. Thanks to the funding for, uh, already provided through the City Council's Community Land Trust Initiative, community land trusts are now acquiring their first properties, but also training residents for self-governance training them to understand the steps of the rehabilitation process so they can have some control over it, reaching out to residents of housing it's already owned by organizations that are sponsoring CLTs in order that they understand the kind of collective stewardship CLTs can provide and their role in it and much else. We work weekly with CLT organizers to address their training and education needs in detail. Further at City College, we posted leaders and organizers from three CLTs, including Ms. Fields, whom you just heard from, in an inaugural grassroots leaders fellows program where they take the courses in our minor and develop projects that deepen the engagement of neighborhood residents in the CLTs as they develop. We plan to expand this program next year and over the next three years. With a growing number of CLTs and growing education, outreach and training needs, as the CLTs engage in different parts of the organizing and development process, the work to support these groups is growing in volume and complexity. We ask not just for a continuance of the CLT initiative but for an enhancement of it in order to meet these critical needs. Thank you again for your support for the CLT initiative and I look forward to it bearing even more fruit soon. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Michelle Neugebauer followed by Pilar de Jesus. It's time we'll begin. Good afternoon, Chair Drum and uh, team council members, especially our new elected council member, Dharma Diaz. 
testified today on behalf of the Cypress Hills Local Development Corporation, a 38-year-old nonprofit CDC and settlement house in East New York. And I'm testifying about the basement legalization pilot. Um, our organization, along with a coalition of houses of worship and community-based organizations called the Coalition for Community Advancement that our council member used to be on, um, fought really hard for a fair and equitable rezoning of East New York. We didn't win the battle, but one of the victories we did win was a $12 million promise in writing from this current mayor and the city council to fund a basement legalization pilot in East New York. The response from the community was incredibly enthusiastic. There was a lot of uh, passion around this because people in the neighborhood knew, like we knew, that it's a win-win, a win for tenants who get safe, healthy, legal, affordable apartments, and a win for homeowners who get extra income and who do not have to fear anymore that DOB inspector knocking on their door. So basement legalization is a way for the city to create safe, habitable units and cheaper than building from the ground up while you're still supporting low and moderate income Black and Latino homeowners in highly impacted areas um, from the pandemic like East New York Cypress Hills. And we were hit incredibly hard by the pandemic. We've had close to 800 deaths in the neighborhood. Over 20,000 people have suffered from the virus. And one of the reasons, one of many, but one of the reasons that our infection rate was so high is that our housing is overcrowded and basement legalization is a way out of that. The time has expired. $7 million should not have been cut from the basement legalization pilot. We ask that the city council restore it and live up to its promises. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. And uh, you probably know that I am a supporter of basement legalization. I work here locally with Chaya on that right from the get go. Thank you. Yeah. And I just want to ask you, weren't you our last person last year in the budget <laughs> hearings? <laughs> yes, at 1130 at night, I give you 1130 all kudos night, yes. that you hung in there with me. Yeah, you did. No, you did a lot better this year getting in here. What about a little after four? I think it is 409. <laughs> so thank you for always coming in and giving testimony. We really deeply appreciate it. I do look forward to continuing to work with you on this for the next seven months that I have in the council and to continue to support basement legalization. I see it as a real viable alternative, a real good way to bring a market onto the market. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks, John. Next, we'll hear from Pilar de Jesus, followed by Kevin Jones. Your time will begin. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you. I'm also glad to make it before 7 p.m., especially signing up so late. Um, and thank you for Rebecca for accommodating me. Um, but yeah, good afternoon. My name is Pilar de Jesus. I wear many hats in this state. Um, I'm a member of CPR, Communities Unite for Police Reform. I'm a member of Decriminalized Nature. I was one of the advocates who worked on the Marijuana Regulation Taxation Act. I am a senior advocacy coordinator in the tenant unit at Take Root Justice. In a nutshell, I'm a passionate Latina, born and raised in East Harlem, a fighter, an aunt, a sister, a daughter, a survivor of many of the outdated racist policies in this state and this country, unfortunately, as well. Um, and I'm here just to say that one, we don't need to fund the police anymore. And you know what we know from decades of experience, there have been billions of dollars that have always been going towards organized violence, such as the police departments often in the name of improving community and police relations, but this doesn't mean treating people differently. It usually means taxpayer money being spent on police, you know, police relation, relations campaigns, and it means money being taken away from the support systems in the communities that have been and still continue to be molested by police on a day-to-day -day basis. These outdated racist policies and budgets that many of you leaders, unfortunately, fund instills violence towards New Yorkers and our mental health. Mental health is a, especially in my opinion, in my opinion, it should be as your, in your opinion as well, 
mental health should always be a priority. And which is why I ask that we do not continue to fund violence by giving the police more money, but that we, one, we support um, le legislation that Rosenthal and um, Senator um, Rivera have introduced on a state level to decriminalize psilocybin and decriminalize um, controlled substances. And let's talk about alternatives. Your time has expired. And I'm going to wrap up uh, mental health treatments like psilocybin therapy. You know, we also may need police officers to think about having some psilocybin therapy. You know, if we do so, if you look at the research on the benefits on it, this could be really helpful with helping police being reintegrated into society. Um, but mostly, I just want to say, and I'll find, I'll end with all of this: is you know, please do not defund we. You know, if organizations like mine are defunded, how can we continue to support our partners who are working with the, the communities that are fighting against the greedy landlords doing criminal criminal acts to our tenants? And I know this from working with them They, you know, we're not holding them in criminal court. But, you know, from what I read and what, the way I understand the law, they are being very criminal to our tenants. How can we continue to support people in the community who want to open a small business like worker co-ops, you know, so we need the money not to go to the NYPD, but to organizations like mine and the others here, you know, legal service providers are so much needed education. Police officers do not belong in schools. Police officers are very triggering. And as I keep mentioning, I mentioned earlier, mental health is really important. And as you can see, the city, had the mental health these days is really unstable. It has always been unstable. And unfortunately, it has a lot to do with the violence from police and the violent, racist, outdated policies that, you know, legislators current and past have, you know, supported and continue to not even reform. And so again, I just again ask that we fund the 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 support systems and not the police. I think we we can see there's evidence to show that that way is not working. And let's really focus on the mental health of everyone, including the officers. And I think they don't need to be the responders in mental health because they also don't know how to respond to it. And I would also like, how are they getting their mental health addressed? And like I said, I would be a big advocate for psilocybin therapy. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Kevin Jones, followed by Rachel Shiro. You may begin. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Drum and members of the City Council Committee on Finance. My name is Kevin Jones, and I'm the Associate State Director for Advocacy at AARP New York representing 750,000 New York City members of AARP. I wanna thank you for providing me the opportunity to testify at today's hearings, where I'll be re reiterating some of our priorities for the FY22 adopted budget and further underscoring the needs of New York's 50 plus community as the city reopens and recovers from COVID-19. As many of you already know, older adults are one of the fastest growing populations in New York City and will continue to make up a greater share of the city's residents in the coming years. Despite the growing need for aging related services throughout New York City, the city services and programming for older adults remain chronically underfunded as the Department for the Aging's budget continues to make up less than half a percent of the city's entire budget. These issues prior to the pandemic have only been compounded as COVID-19 has brought about new challenges, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and issues for the 50, for the 50 plus. Uh, specifically, AARP is calling on the city to meet the unique needs of the 50 plus New Yorkers by making the following, following investments in the final FY22 budget. Investing 16.6 million in additional funding for home delivered meals, securing 4.4 million in one-time funding to address the city's digital divide by supporting technology services for senior centers and expanding overall access to technology among New Yorkers. Uh, ensuring that 10 million in, uh, ensuring the 10 million in fund and promised funding, excuse me, for the model senior center budget uh, um, included in the FY22 budget to support senior center staff and development, supporting the city's network of nonprofit and community-based organizations that provide critical services to the 50 plus, specifically by funding, uh, fully funding the indirect cost rate initiative for FY21, FY22, and future years, as outlined in the mayor's executive budget creating a cost of living adjustment for all human service contracts at a rate of 3%, which would amount to 48 million total for the budget, providing funding for comprehensive emergency pay for human service workers retroactive to March 23rd, 2020. And lastly, AARP calls on the city to restore 
and fully fund all city council aging related discretionary funds to FY20 levels to support critical programs for older New Yorkers, specifically the support our seniors at 5.1 million, the geriatric mental health initiative at 2.8 million, naturally occurring retirement communities at 5.4 million, the healthy aging initiative at just the over time 20, has expired. Casa at 3.3 and immigrant senior services at 1.5 million. Thank you for providing me the opportunity to testify today. Um, I will also provide this testimony in writing and um, I'm happy to any questions, but thank you for all your work. We will now hear from Rachel Chereau followed by Caitlin Andrews. Hi, thank you for the um, opportunity to speak. I, uh, echoing AARP, City Meals will not be redundant. I'm Rachel Shero from City Meals on Wheels. I just wanna emphasize how devastating the pandemic has been on this population disproportionately, both regarding health and social isolation. Hunger and loneliness were both issues before this crisis and will continue after. We appreciate that this fact has been highlighted and we hope more support will be given to combat food insecurity among the older adult population in New York City. And as Kevin said, it is the fastest growing population in the city and the country. We will, uh, the older adult population will, out, um, will outnumber those under 18 in less than 20 years. City Meals and Meals on Wheels is a vital lifeline to those who are unable to shop or cook for themselves. Um, we have always known how critical our services and staff are and listening to um, my colleagues who have spoken for hours about this, we are the essential workers and we need to make sure that these folks are supported and that the recipients are not without food and a friendly face. We're re requesting $500,000 from council for FY22 in order to continue this necessary work to ensure we can get this emergency supplementary food to those who are still afraid to go out. We don't know when senior centers will reopen and we have not completed the vaccinations that are needed for this uh, vulnerable population. Thank you for your time today. I have submitted my testimony and I'm here to take questions. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Kaylin Andrews followed by Melissa Schwartz. The time will begin. Hello, my name is Caitlin Andrews. I'm the Director of Public Policy here on behalf of Live on New York. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Live on New York's members include more than 100 community-based nonprofits that provide core services that allow older New Yorkers to thrive in our communities as we age. As New York City begins to emerge from the pandemic that took the lives of thousands of individuals, many of whom were older adults, and as this budget, built upon millions in stimulus funds, will plant the seeds for our recovery at large, the stakes have rarely been higher. With this in mind, Live on New York is appreciative of the investments included in the executive budget and prompted in many ways by the council's preliminary budget response in years of advocacy. Specifically, we're appreciative of the decision to fully restore the indirect cost rate, the model senior center budget initiative, and new funding towards the community care plan. However, given that the Department for the Aging budget remains at less than one half of 1% of the overall city budget, the city must go farther in its adopted budget to truly set the trajectory for a recovery that leaves no New Yorker behind. Centered around the inequities made parent during the pandemic, Live on New York proposes three major investments to better address these issues. One, $16.6 million for the Home Delivered Meals Program, which is different from Get Food and serves older New Yorkers who, due to chronic illness, mobility limitation, or disability, will remain homebound long after COVID-19 subsides. This program has been underfunded for years and lags far behind the national average in funding. We need this funding desperately. 4.4 million to address the digital divide, which we've seen has been so troubling throughout the pandemic. 48 million for a cost of living adjustment for essential workers. This is across um, service providers, not just for the Department for the Aging, but we recognize that all human service providers stepped up throughout COVID-19 to support our communities and deserve this investment. We also support prioritizing staff hiring within HPD to continue the historic progress made within the administration's affordable housing plan and we request a restoration of council discretionary funds to FY20. Has expired. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Melissa Sklarts, followed by Shubra Dada. Time starts. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Melissa Sklarts. I'm the government relations strategist at SAGE. Thank you for holding the hearing today in executive budget. Thank you, Chair Drum, Council Member Chin, Speaker Johnson, the entire council for being 
champion for LGBT elders and, and its long-term commitment to SAGE. SAGE is the uh, country's first and largest organization dedicated to improving the lives of LGBT older people, providing vital services for LGBT elders and the older people living with AIDS. Um, because of thin support networks, LGBT older people need to reply, rely more on community service providers as they age. Over the last 14 months, we've seen firsthand how the pandemic has drastically increased LGBT elders' needs for services and supports. Throughout the pandemic, SAGE has shifted capacity and resources to adapt programs and services for virtual and telephonic delivery. SAGE exists to provide LGBT elders with services through our SAGE centers, including care management and related health housing and other services to ensure thousands of LGBT elders can continue to stay engaged and stay connected. In addition to our programs for LGBT elders, we also support older LGBT veterans through our SAGE Vets program. Through the pandemic, SAGE Vets has offered one-on-one -on -one group support and launched virtual programming to continue to connect older LGBT veterans to the community. LGBT older veterans need and deserve affordable, welcoming housing with support from New York City. SAGE has opened New York's first LGBT welcome affordable elder housing, first Stonewall House in Fort Greene, Brooklyn in 2020, and this year, Cretona Pride House in the East Tremont section of the Bronx. Both buildings offer 100% affordable apartments for low-income elders with a portion of the units specifically set aside for chronically homeless elders. Um, both residences have state-of-the-art state centers open to residents and members of the surrounding community. SAGE requests a restoration of our New York City Council funding commiserate with fiscal year 2020 levels. Support from, the, support from the council supports our housing, our SAGE centers and our programming. These programs include restoration of council initiative LGBT sen senior services, restoration of center uh, program and enhancement initiative, to support the Windsor Center, restoration of funding from the Council's LGBT Caucus, restoration of the Veterans Community Development Fund to support SAGE vets, and finally 150,000 additional support to bridge the gap between SAGE's current discretionary funding from the Council uh, in the need to help set up the SAGE Center at Cretona Pride House. SAGE deeply values our partnership with the Council. Thanks for your consideration. Uh, we value the partnership and look forward to working with you closely in the future. Thank you, Melissa. Good to see you. Chair Drum, Councilmember Chin has a question. Yes, Councilmember uh, Chin. Time starts. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chair Drum. I don't really have a question. I mean, I, I just want to thank um, the senior service providers and advocates for, you know, live on for coming to testify to reiterate the needs. Uh, at the uh, executive budget meeting with OMB, I raised all those lists to them and the director uh, knows about it. And he said, we will work with you until adoption. So we still got a lot of work to, to do. And I, I really uh, am thankful that we have Chair Drum as our, you know, finance chair. He's going to be working with me and, and my other colleagues in BNT, and we're going to make sure that the senior budget this year, Chair Drum, it's got to go over that half a percent, okay? Yes. <laughs> so uh, we got to be you. more than $500 million. Uh, that, That's our goal this year. So I, I thank all the advocates and uh, continue to speak to all the council members and continue the advocacy until we get this final budget done. So thank you, everyone. Next, we'll hear from Shepard Dada, followed by Denisha Harris. Time starts. Oh, thank you, Councilmember Gom and Council Councilmember for the opportunity to testify today. I'm Shubhra Dada, pro Program Manager and Community Outreach Supervisor at India Home. India Home serves South Asian older adult community with culturally comp competent services and serves the Queens and broader New York City community. Our community has been through a lot in the past year with over 85,000 patients in New York City from the uh, New York City Health and Hospital System who were um, COVID patients and they were from, uh, from South Asian background. We also had one of the second highest um, uh, persons uh, testing positive for COVID and the second highest rate of hospital, hospitalization. 
Furthermore, the intersection of being South Asian and being an older adult has presented unique challenges to our, for our community. In New York City, 23% of APA seniors live in poverty. More than two in three seniors have limited English proficiency. This is where India Home steps in and they provide cultural competent services for the seniors during these difficult times. We have provided information to our seniors during these difficult times, providing them with information about getting tested as well as about um, address to getting the vaccine, uh, concerning their vaccine hesitancy, how to deal with that. We also distributed all uh, PPE to the community. In total, we have uh, reached out to a total of more than 25,000 community members during our COVID outreaches and distributed more than over 200,000 masks to our community. We had made sure that people of, um, who speak Bengali, Hindi, Punjabi, Urdu, Gujarati, Tamil, Telugu, Nepali, Spanish, and Mandarin all have access to this information with our services. With all the um, events that are going on, despite the Asian-led uh, organizations going above and beyond in the past years, the fact still remains that over 15% and um, of the New York City residents are uh, time, time expired Asian Pacific Americans. So uh, we would request your uh, administration to actually look into the fact of giving us more opportunity and look into the budget in this regards. Thank you. Thank you, so Dr. K. Next, we'll hear from Denisha Harris, followed by Juan Tokubal. Time starts. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Denisha Harris. I'm 19 years old. I am with Lutheran Social Services, and I'm also here to talk about why um coaching like future coaching is helping helping me and also i've been in care for two years now i'm in care with a family member and coaching has helped me like a lot my coach is egypt she's like the best coach i've ever asked for since like this is my first time I just, especially being in foster care and actually having someone by my side to help me with like school and stuff like that. And it made a difference in my life with me not struggling no more sometimes. And also having someone to like help me with doing emails sent to my professors, um, making sure that I have all my stuff finish on my classes and see if my GPA is up there to the part and all of that. During COVID, it was actually kind of hard for me because 2019, I just went straight into college. Mostly some kids say college is not for them, but I wanted to go to college because I wanted to make, you know, make a name for myself, I guess you can say. And also to have, be the first child of my dad's six kids to have a college degree. So being in college, it kind of helped me. And then also seeing the struggles I've went through and also learning from them to make sure I pass my semester in the fall semester and spring semester. So I'm glad that I have a fair future coach to help me with that. And I would feel kind of bad. I would kind of feel sad if I don't have Egypt anymore to help me. Time expired. Okay. Thank you. Do you want to say anything more? Or are you finished? I would like to say You're something. Sweet. No, I'm not actually. I was just finished. Um, mm. Go ahead, finish I feel up. like I feel like having a fair future coach would help any child in foster care because some parents are not able to pay for their student for their child to go to college. They will have to do loans, and not everybody has the proper have the exact um 
income to put the child through college. So I'm glad that I have her to do it. And I'm glad I also have like a, a good support system. If I didn't, I don't know where would I be right now. As far as in college, I might as well have some loans, but I'm glad I don't because I have Egypt to help me and also everyone in the agency. Well, thank you. And Egypt must be a very special person. And Denisha, you are a true power of example. And I really enjoyed hearing what you said. And I think that the fact that you're in college and that you're working toward that degree speaks volumes about your character and about your strength. So good luck with that. And thank you so much for coming and giving your testimony. I really deeply appreciate it. Thank you. We will now hear from Juan. I'm sorry, moderator, you broke up. We didn't hear the last witness. My apologies. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. We will now hear from Juan Tucubal, followed by Shania Jeffrey. Time starts. Good afternoon. My name is Juan Tucubal. I am 20 years old. I'm living in Queens Awesome Park. I'm going to testify about my experience of having a fair future coach. So, my life before I met my coach was was hard, and my future wasn't wasn't clear for me because there is nobody to talk about my future with me. Sometimes I want to do something, but I don't even know how to start and where to start. The name of my fair future coach is Mr. Jelani. This means a lot for me to have to have him in my life because he's always there for me. Sometimes. I have I have trouble with school or or other issues, and and I have the confidence to go and talk to to him because he is somebody that I trust. He always makes me feel better when I I am a uh, in a bad mood or when I am going going through a challenge. He's always there to motivate me with his advice or physical help. Also, not the only person in the agency that has helped me. There is also, in the agency, there is also Mr. Mike that helped me to get a job to be part of the summer youth program. And Ms. Hadia, a person that is helping me a lot with school, is always there checking me that is going, what is going on, what is going on with school. And, and of course, my social worker, which is Ms. Bao. A goal that they helped me to achieve, I think, is to be part of the summer youth program because they helped me during the process. For example, they they helped me with the application process and my resume also prepared prepared me for the interview. And of course, they helped me with my goal with school. For example, for applying for financial aid for college. And they, they took me to visit college. My coach has been so important to me during the pandemic because for all students, it's a challenge to take classes online because it's some, something that we, we are not used to. It. it was hard for me Time expired. to take classes online during the pandemic, but my coach was always there even, even though we, we are not able to meet in person, but we got to meet in Zoom. I think it's important that the New York City baseline finding for fair future in, in the city budget and ensure all youth people in, in care have access to fair future support because it's very important to have somebody to talk talk them about their future and, and their dream so they can be motivated to achieve their goal. Many young people have a, a dream or goal, but they, they need somebody to remind them that they can do it. They, they need a push from someone. Sometimes we feel that we are giving up, but our coach doesn't let us to give up. They make, they make sure that we are in the right way, especially in this situation with the pandemic. Many young people would love to, to have a coach to support them. Thank you so much. 
Thank you very much, Juan, and I appreciate you coming in and giving testimony about how important it is to have that coach it really can make a difference in your life. Thank you very, very much. We will now hear from Shania Jeffrey, followed by Caitlin Delphin. Time starts. Um, hi, I don't know about what are we talking about? Ms. Jeffrey, are you ready? Yeah, I'm asking what are we talking about? Um, you're registered to testify to, at today's executive budget hearing. Huh? You're registered to testify at today's executive budget hearing. What is it? Uh, Ms. Jeffrey, today we're accepting testimony regarding the fiscal 22, uh, 2022 executive budget for the city of New York. So if you have any comments regarding this year's proposed budget, we'd be happy to hear your testimony now. I don't have anything. I don't know what to say. Don't know what to okay, thank you. Then we'll move on to the next person. Thank you. We will now move forward to Caitlin Delphin, followed by Brian Cockrell. Time starts. Hi, thank you for having me today. Um, my name is Caitlin Delphin, and I'm a special education teacher at a high school in Bensonhurst, Brooklyn, and I'm a member of Teachers Unite. And I'm here today to um, express my opposition to the continued funding of policing in our schools. As a teacher, I know that we need to fund more teachers, counselors, social workers, and restorative justice professionals and reduce the number of police in schools now. Um, our budgets speak volumes about where we place priorities. And right now the budget is prioritizing policing and surveillance over the health, wealth, the health and welfare and actual safety of our students. This has been a long, hard year for all of us and our children have been impacted in a huge way. Despite this, year's difficulties, we've all had moments in the classroom of connection, joy, and students letting their true selves shine through. We need to be building on these positive moments and moving forward to help our students begin to heal and create communities that encourage connection and restorative processes. My students have gained so many skills in the last year, including self-motivation, time management, multitasking on top of the academic skills and learning that they are doing, despite all of the schedule changes and uncertainty that we've been faced with all year. But I'm not at all right now concerned about an achievement gap arising among our students. I'm so proud of everything they've accomplished over the past year. I'm amazed at the independence and persistence that my high schoolers have shown. I've seen them build skills and continue to learn in a very difficult environment. However, I'm extremely concerned about the care gap that we are showing them. We are here at a time when many cities and towns have made the decision to reduce or end the policing in schools and back those decisions with their budgets. And right now in New York City, we are still wavering on the shift of school safety to the DOE and debating whether or not we're going to hire more school safety agents next year, which will continue to perpetrate the systems of policing that cause violence and harm to all of our students, and in particular to our black and brown students and our students with disabilities. These students are seeing a city that is beginning to slowly recover from the last year. However, rather than resources for their recovery at school, they're seeing the prioritization of policing over their health and education. It will be apparent to my students from the very moment they walk in through the doors of my school that the city has prioritized policing. The Time vast expired. majority of my students have not been in school for over a year and they will be welcomed back by scanning instead of more social workers, more guidance counselors, more teachers, or more restorative justice coordinators. I'm here today to demand that in the fiscal year 2022 budget, the city reject any spending on training new school police and instead invest that in restorative justice, social workers and guidance counselors and teachers. Thank you. We will now hear from Brian Cockrell followed by Tabitha Holly. Time starts. My name is Brian Cockrell. I use he, him pronouns and I am an ENL teacher in the Bronx. I am a member of Teachers Unite. I am asking you to defund school policing, expand student access to social and emotional supports and fully fund restorative justice. And when I say defund, I mean take away the funds from the police and use them for services that allow people to thrive and to address root causes of harm. Moving school police to another department simply reforms the police. That's not what I'm asking for. I urge you to consider this question by Miriam Kaba. What do we need to do to stop police from killing black people and others with impunity? 
Kaba responds, we can start by reducing people's contact with police altogether. When I'm in my school building, I wonder what vision of safety are cops supposedly fulfilling in some people's eyes? Is it operating metal detectors? Because the New York Civil Liberties Union says that the NYPD's school safety decision division unfairly targets schools attended by students of color in low income communities for metal detector screening. And I have never seen cops in schools de-escalate any conflict. Instead, they have gotten upset with me when I asked them to wear a mask. And they have proudly shared with me that they have the power to arrest. This is punitive, not restorative justice. Sometimes it feels like we are programmed to believe that cops keep us safe, but history shows that they protect and serve only the interests of white supremacy. I want for my school community safety that looks like more restorative justice practitioners, counselors, parent coordinators, and youth advocates. Looking at the history of this country, I encourage you to take to heart this statement by Dylan Rodriguez that abolition is an ethical obligation. People often say, if I were alive centuries ago, I would have, you don't have to imagine this. Now is the time to act and to fulfill an ethical obligation to build the most nurturing, compassionate, and liberatory experiences possible for people in our schools. Drop all the charges against Prakash Churaman and abolish policing. Thank you. What would you say to, uh, let me play devil's advocate here a little bit, to those of you that most of the school safety agents are of color? Did you hear me? You're asking my well, response to that question. Yes, yes, yes. I was wondering what, how you would respond to that, because that is something that's thrown out there. I would respond first that policing is inherently a racist institution looking at the history of the US. And also, can we invest in jobs that for people who want to work in schools that are caring positions that promote restorative justice? Let's provide funding and support and training for people in restorative and transformative justice rather than position. But you would rather, are you, say, are you saying fire the school safety agents? I'm saying instead of them serving as school safety agents or police, offer them jobs and training in position that is not part of the NYPD or some guise of policing, but that is actually a job in restorative and transformative justice that does care rather than harm. So take them out of uniform, basically. Could you repeat your question? Yeah, take them out of uniform. Take them out of uniform. Correct. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. We will now hear from Tabitha Holly, followed by Kate Hoy. Time starts. Good afternoon, Finance Chair Drum and the Committee on Finance. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. My name is Tabitha Holly. I'm the pastor of New Day Church that is primarily based in the Northwest Bronx. I live in City Council District 8. Last summer, the police that you pay with the people's money terrorized entire neighborhoods. To add insult to injury, many of your peers had the audacity to lie about what you actually cut in last year's budget and you funneled money into the terror of black and brown students in the Bronx and around the city, which explains today's pressure around police free schools. You have a duty to repent for your wicked and sinful ways this year, and I have a sacred duty to tell you the truth. This is the people's budget. And for those who are serving your last term, this is your last opportunity to repent now for the ways that you have used this money and abused it and to repair harm. In the COVID-19 pandemic, I have watched community members on their own dime feed each other. I've watched community members on their own dime navigate and negotiate violent and nonviolent conflict so that they wouldn't have to call in incompetent and unequipped officers of the state. In this pandemic, we have watched restorative justice practitioners and social workers across this city navigate entirely new terrain in the context of a global pandemic. We have watched communities come together on their own dime and be present for those experiencing mental health crises. We have watched families come together on their own dime to do the work of supporting young people to thrive in this pandemic. And now it is time for you to do your part. 
If you allow a $200 million increase for the NYPD, there will be blood on your hands. There is yet a better way. Pay the people back. Invest in the community groups that have been doing this work for little to nothing, or else continue to prove the inefficiency of this system of policing rooted in white supremacist violence and terror. Time expired. Defund the NYPD and pay the people back. Cut the NYPD budget and police force by 50%. Freeze all new hiring and overtime to free up money for communities. Police must be removed from our schools, our mental health, and our drug use response, our subways, homeless outreach, public shelters. We must invest in robust public health and community services. Pay the people back. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Kate Hoy, followed by Christopher Traber. Time starts. Good afternoon, Chair Drum and members of the Committee on Finance. My name is Kate Hoy and I live in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. I am the Director of Advocacy Services at AHRC New York City. AHRC is a family governed organization and one of the first and largest social service agencies in the country serving individuals with disabilities and their families. I'm here today on behalf of the 250 plus families, students, and professionals I work with each year in my capacity as an education advocate and in solidarity with the Arise Coalition, of which I am a proud member. The city cannot wait until 2023 to fund preschool special education program seats, and it must commit this year to salary parity for its 4410 preschool special education teachers. Preschool special education teachers require more training and must attain the same level of certification as other special education providers yet they are paid much less, often tens of thousands of dollars less while required to do much more for their students. The Department of Education's own policy guidance says it best. Preschool children in special classes receive IEP recommendations and program placement from the local CPSE. Children in special classes have considerable educational needs, which require a comprehensive special education program to meet their IEP goals. These children require more adult support, more attention, more direction, and more supervision than is typical in general education settings to benefit from the instructional program. Please note, parents do not choose the program that their child attends. These children are New York City children, are placed by CPSE staff, and soon by a centralized enrollment office into an appropriate special education program that can meet their child's IEP mandate. While a program may be appropriate, it cannot be equitable if its teachers are paid significantly less to educate children with the most significant disabilities. I urge you to fund salary parity for preschool special education teachers for fiscal year 2022. We cannot delay. Our children cannot and will not wait. We will all remember the choices made when it mattered most and when our elected leaders had it within their power to change our children's future for the better. Please commit to preschool special education salary parity now. Thank you very much, Chair Drum, and to the committee for your time today. Thank you. We'll now hear from Christopher Traber, followed by Carolyn Cleveland. Time starts. Good afternoon, Council Member Drum and members of the Finance Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. My name is Christopher Traber. I'm the Associate Executive Director for Children's Services with Interagency Council. We're a nonprofit membership association of more than 130 agencies that serve children and adults with developmental disabilities in New York City and the metropolitan area. My testimony today will focus on preschool special education and the children and families who depend on these critical services. Special Education 4410 Preschools provide special education services to children with disabilities ages three to five. Many of these young children have been diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder, cerebral palsy, and other developmental disabilities. Every child who attends a 4410 special education preschool, preschool program are, are public school children. Our 4410 preschools serve 86% of all New York City children ages three to five who need preschool special education. They're a vital resource to the city of New York, but they haven't been treated that way. The salary parity agreement, which is a significant accomplishment in New York City for teachers in early childhood programs, have left out our teachers, and it has a devastating impact on our programs. We are calling on the city council in New York City to address this exclusion and provide funds in this year's budget to ensure that certified special education teachers in 4410 preschool special education programs receive the same pay raises as all are the early childhood teachers. Our teachers believe they have been forgotten by the city. And we ask that you not forget our preschool children with development disabilities and our teachers who provide these critical services. Teachers in our preschools 
are paid almost 40% less than what teachers in public schools get paid. Our schools are facing a staffing crisis and it's getting worse. Right now, our schools have enough teachers to staff their classrooms only because there's limited numbers of children in the, in the rooms right now. However, in September, when all the children come back, we are very concerned that there will not be enough teachers to open all the classrooms. The struggle to recruit and retain certified teachers is making incre increasingly difficult for our schools to continue to provide a quality education. And we have schools right now that are considering closure because they can't recruit special education teachers. We're generally concerned that if nothing is done to address this issue and, and provide sufficient funding for our schools, more preschools will close their doors and children will sit at home and wait. Time expired. Just one, one, one more minute. In, in the mayor's executive budget, there's additional funds to support preschool special education, but not $1 allocated to address salary parity for our 4410 teachers. This is unacceptable. It's time for, to address salary parity for teachers in early childhood special education preschool programs. We urge the city council to include $85 million in the final budget for preschool special education to commit to salary parity for our teachers and ensure that there's a seat for every preschool child who needs, needs one in September. Thank you. We will now hear from Carolyn Cleveland, followed by Gian Alter. Hi, um, I want to thank the council and Chair Drum for the opportunity to be here. And I want to thank Chris Traber for his testimony, which is directly linked to my own. Um, my name is Carolyn Cleveland, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer at the Kennedy Children's Center. We are a 4410 special education preschool program serving nearly 400 children in East Harlem and the Bronx. And I am here to address the critical shortage of teaching staff and programs like ours and the need for salary parity for 4410 teachers. Teachers at our programs have the same educational and certification requirements as teachers in DOE programs. And yet, as we've heard, they are paid 30% to 40% less. Our student population is overwhelmingly children of color from low-income households. Over 40% of our students are bilingual, all with special needs. Because these unequal pay rates make it almost impossible to attract experienced teachers, this means that many of New York City's most challenged and vulnerable students are being taught by teachers who are young, inexperienced, and uncertified. We're working to address the teacher shortage with our Grow Your Own program, which trains low-income adults to become certified teacher assistants and teachers. Grow Your Own is a powerful tool for bringing more diverse candidates into the teaching field, but without salary parity, 4410 programs like ours will never be able to retain the teachers that our students need to succeed. The current executive budget includes an investment of 22 million in FY22 and 88 million in FY23, but the FY22 budget does not include any money to address the critical shortage of preschool special education seats, and it increases pay for some teachers while ignoring 4410 teachers. This is not fair to these dedicated teachers or to their students who will fall even further behind if this iniquity is not addressed. It is vital that the final FY22 budget include 85 million to fulfill the demand for preschool special education services and provide salary parity to our teachers as recommended in the city council's response to the preliminary budget. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. We will now hear from Jan Alter, followed by Joyce Glassman. Time starts. Hi, good afternoon. Um, my name is Jeannie Alter, and I'm the executive director of Kennedy Children's Center, um, which is located in East Harlem and the South Bronx. I've been working in New York City 4410 programs for 30 years, and this issue is very near and dear to my heart as both a teacher and an administrator. Who will teach our children? I ask this question every day because we all agree that every child has a right to qualified certified teachers. And there's not a shortage of early childhood teachers who care about young children with special needs, but there is a lack of funding and support for these teachers who wanna work with these young and vulnerable learners. The current executive budget, which I was glad to see does include a new investment of 22 million in 20, in fiscal year 22 and 88 million in fiscal 23. And while I'm pleased to see New York City make this much needed investment, the 22 budget does not include any money to address both the shortage of classes for our children or the salary parity that you've now heard um, many of my colleagues speak about. 
Um, New York City Early Childhood Special Ed has been dealing with this problem for 30 years. If we really want to deal with educational equity for both typical and children with special needs in all neighborhoods of New York City, then we need to address it through funding. For the past five years, we've been operating our own privately funded GYO program that's helping to put quality teachers in front of the children that need them the most. We have a solution to recruit and train new teachers, but without fair compensation, we will not retain them in our schools. Teaching young children with special needs is not for everyone. We have dedicated and capable teachers who are specifically trained to work with children with significant language delays, autistic spectrum disorders, and behavioral challenges. Why should these teachers make any less than teachers who teach developing children in the New York City Department of Ed? Why are New York City preschool children with special needs sitting at home when we know how vulnerable they are and how early education is the one of the most absolute things that we agree on that's a solution to their success in the future. Time expired. Funding, let me just close, thank you. Insufficient funding and a lack of certified teachers has led us to this crisis, but we have an opportunity to apply the funds that are available and, and help these children. Um, I've spent my career fighting for the needs of these children and families in New York City, and I will continue to be a voice for the urgency and importance of the 4410 community. Thank you. We will now hear from Joyce Glassman. Time starts. Good afternoon, Chairman Drummond, Council Members. Um, I am Joyce Glassman, and I'm glad that I have this opportunity to amplify the messages from some of my colleagues. I am a special education teacher and administrator. I have worked for almost 50 years with pre-K kids with disabilities who attend community-based organizations. I lead the New York City Coalition for Children with Special Needs, an organization of about 75 CBOs working with disabled preschoolers. For three decades, these CBOs have contracted with the DOE to provide special education services to the majority of New York City's disabled preschool students. I have seen how skilled teachers can make a difference. Our disabled preschool students need specialized help to learn the same things as other children, how to communicate their needs, be increasingly independent, how to share and be fair. Our hard work results in positive changes, even occasional miracles. Highly qualified teachers are needed to provide young disabled children with the quality of services they need to learn and make the progress their families are so desperately seeking. But the teachers working at DOE contracted CBOs are not being treated fairly. They lack salary parity with all other early childhood educators working under DOE contracts. We constantly lose teachers to other DOE early childhood options that can pay far more. Without qualified teachers, our programs cannot function. All this time, all at this time, when there are already not enough preschool special education classes to meet the needs of young children. Salary unfairness also discriminates against our disabled students by robbing them of the skilled teachers they need to realize their full potential. Every child needs a seat and every CBO special education needs, teacher needs to be paid fairly. Please ensure that the final budgets for both FY22 and FY23 include $85 million to ensure preschool special education class seats for every child who needs one and to pay preschool special education teachers the same salaries as other early childhood teachers. Preschoolers try to be fair. It's past time for us to be fair as well. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. We will now hear from Jolene Gunther Doherty, followed by Ramana Deep Carr. Time starts. Hello, I'm here to speak as a community based 4410 preschool special education program director. I ask that the final fiscal year 2022 budget include $85 million to address the preschool special education class shortage and most importantly, provide salary parity 
to teachers of preschool special education classes at community-based organizations like mine, as already recommended in the city council's response to the preliminary budget. The executive budget includes a new investment of $22 million in fiscal year 2022, going up to $88 million in fiscal year 2023 for preschool special education. While I'm pleased to see an investment in preschool special education and support several of the initiatives proposed, there is no funding slated for fiscal year 2022 to provide salary parity to our preschool special education teachers and still no commitment to providing salary parity even in fiscal year 2023. Under the city's salary parity agreement, other early childhood teachers will receive salary increases in October of 2021. And this will be a difference of $20,000 on average, which would lead many of our preschool special ed class teachers to flock to general education classes and leave children with disabilities without teachers. I had one classroom that went through three teachers in a year. I just had another teacher leave this month. Not because these teachers wanted to, but because they needed to be able to financially support their families. Preschoolers with significant disabilities should not have to wait another year for the city to make needed investments in 4410 preschool programs. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from Ramon Dati Kerr. Starting time. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ramon Dipor. I'm a policy associate with the New York Public Interest Research Group and a student at CUNY City College of New York. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. COVID-19 has had major impacts on students and higher education institutions. In the immediate, schools closed and classes and student activities abruptly moved to virtual format. Many students have found the transition particularly taxing on their mental health. Despite these challenges, a college-educated workforce is key for supporting a just recovery for individuals and nurturing an economy strained by COVID-19. CUNY is a lifeline for working-class New Yorkers and people of color. But unfortunately, Mayor de Blasio's executive budget includes a $67 million cut to CUNY's community colleges, eliminating funding for vital mental health and academic counselors, and cutting programs that help students graduate and thrive such as campus childcare and remediation programs. We are glad to hear that CUNY ASAP funding is being restored through providing one-on-one -on -one advisement, specialized workshops, tuition assistance, and covering MetroCard and textbook costs, ASAP has helped students stay on track. The new deal for CUNY is about broadening that paradigm for all students. All students should have access to regular advisements, smaller classes, and getting the classes they need to graduate. Additionally, all students who need it should also have access to responsive mental health counseling. Even before the pandemic began, between 2009 and 2015, visits to campus, campus mental health centers climbed by 30%. We urged the city council to enact a final budget, which provides a $20.4 $20 million in new investments to help the university begin to meet the minimum ratios of mental health counselors, academic advisors, and full-time faculty to students that are required in the New Deal for CUNY. Additionally, community colleges support more access to post-secondary education enroll more students of color and low-income students and contribute to the development of an educated citizenry and skilled workforce. Although the city has stepped up in previous years to take steps to stabilize CUNY and SUNY community college funding, New York still charges one of the highest public community college average tuition and fees Time in the nation. Um, I'll just take a few more seconds to wrap it up. We urge the city council to enact a final budget which commits an additional $40 million to hold community college budgets harmless from the tuition losses from the pandemic-related enrollment dips as requested by the CUNY administration. Uh, furthermore, the pandemic has also driven the hunger crisis in New York to new levels. The number of food insecure New York City residents has doubled since the onset of the pandemic. The level of worry CUNY students have about running out of food because of the lack of money was more than three times higher in 2020 than in 2018. We urge the city council to enact a final budget which fully funds city council supported initiatives, including campus child care centers, the Merit Scholarship Program, and the Council's CUNY Food and Security Pilot Program, which should be brought back to serve more students. Thank you for your time. 
Thank you. We will now hear from Nia Morgan, followed by Darren Mack. Starting time. Hello, my name is Nia Morgan, and I'm the Research and Operations Coordinator with the Urban Youth Collaborative, a coalition made up of student leaders from across the city fighting for police-free schools. I am testifying today on behalf of this coalition to urge you to divest from school policing and invest in student care. Today is the anniversary of the police murder of George Floyd. Since the last time student leaders and I testified for police-free schools two months ago, we have witnessed the police murder of four young people, Duante Wright, 20, Adam Toledo, 13, Makaya Bryant, 16, and Anthony Thompson, Jr., 17, who was murdered by police in his school. It should be no surprise that for many students, especially students of color, police in schools do not represent safety. Yet the city is set to once again spend nearly $450 million on school policing next year, sending these students back to school in September after a traumatic year filled with police violence and a global pandemic to be greeted by metal detectors and school police. Shame on the city. With the influx of money from the state and federal governments for education, this is not the time to continue investing in the racist, harmful, and effective and costly system of school policing. It is not enough to invest some money in support staff without addressing the toll of policing on youth. Two weeks ago at the Public Safety Committee's budget hearing, the NYPD Deputy Chief of the School Safety Division stated that 554 school police positions have been lost since January 2020. This is equal to about $50 million that is currently in the School Safety Division budget for FY22. The council should reinvest this $50 million into staff and programs to support students. We need this money to meaningfully fund student care. New York City has never fully funded for short of justice practices. Now the council in this preliminary budget response is calling for about $50 million for short of justice practices, while the mayor is calling for about $12 million for it. We're calling for $118 million so that we can fully fund and implement RJ in 500 high schools with coordinators, trainings, curriculum, and more. We're calling for $162 million to ensure that there's one social worker and guidance counselor for, for 150 students. We need $15 million for mental health continuum, and we need $15 million for college access programs. We urge you to work towards police free schools by rejecting the hiring of new school police and reinvest this money into real solutions that will make New York City a more equitable place to live, learn, and grow. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from Darren Mack, followed by Sarita Daftery. Thank you so much. For Starting time. Thank you so much for this opportunity to testify, chairman and members of the council. I'm Darren Mack, co-director of Freedom Agenda, which is a member-led project dedicated to organizing people and communities directly impacted by incarceration to achieve decarceration and system transformation. I'm also a survivor of Rikers Island. The failures of the city to address DOC staff misconduct, abuse, and mismanagement has led to a federal monitor which reported what survivors of Rikers have known for far too long. That is, more COs equals more abuse. According to the 11th Nunez Federal Monitor, quote, the size of the department's complement of staff, particularly the number assigned to the jails, is highly unusual and is one of the richest staffing ratios among the systems with which the monitoring team has had experience. This is true even with the unusually high number of staff who have not reported to work due to chronic illness, COVID-19, and other reasons, unquote. Also, the monitor reported that, quote, the department struggles to manage its large number of staff productively, to deploy them effectively, to supervise them responsibly, and to elevate the base level of skill of its staff. All of this has a direct impact on the department's ability to reduce the level of violence and ensure the safety and well-being of staff and incarcerated individuals, unquote. So this report you know, also points out what I experienced on Rikers Island during my 19 months incarcerated there as a teenager when the population was over 20,000 people detained and no spotlight, no monitor, and no concern during that time, which is that DOC does not hold their staff accountable. So I am encouraging, I am encouraging that the city council to reject the proposed $160 million increase in more COs and re redirect Time expired. Those, I'm almost finished. Redirect those resources towards violence interrupters, incredible messengers, you know, who can reach those people and communities like the South Bronx, Bronzeville, and Stapleton that are hard to reach by other city agencies non-police responses to people with serious mental health issues like the Cahoots program in Eugene, Oregon, parks, libraries, and last but not least, the community land trust work. Cancel the proposed new class, deflate DOC's bloated budget, 
and invest in impacted communities that have been historically under-resourced. Thank you. Thank you, Darren, for your advocacy. And um, you're absolutely right that um, the Monitor's report, Mr. Martin's report was damning of the uh, DOC administration and leadership there. Just absolutely horrible. And I look forward to continuing to work with you to fight for justice on Rikers Island and for all incarcerated individuals. Thank you, Darren. We will now hear from Sarita Daftery, followed by Lois Lee. Starting time. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Drum. Nice to see you. Um, and I'll just be picking up a bit on where my co-director Darren left off. Um, my name is Sarita Daftery. I'm a co-director of Freedom Agenda. Um, and I will be sending detailed written testimony, but I just want to highlight something um, that's been very apparent today. Um, you know, if, if schools and libraries and arts organizations and students and, and young people and immigrant communities and Black communities and disabled people and all of those folks who spoke today do not get the funding that they clearly need, it will, be, it will not be because we don't have enough money. It will be because the city has failed to end its reliance on a policing and jail-based economy. And I know that council member Drum and several other council members on this call want to prevent that failure. And we're really going to need your leadership <laughs> this year. Um, I, wanna, I wanna focus on the Department of Correction budget. Um, in, in written testimony, we'll share our deflate DOC report, a report from the Vera Institute on DOC's budget, the, the monitor's report, which you've already seen Chair Drum, the other council members um, should look at as well. They all tell the same story. New York City runs by far the most expensive and the most richly staffed jail system in the nation with the worst results. Um, our members have been leaders in the movement to close Rikers Island, which has always been about more than physical buildings and the council members who, who stood with us know that. Uh, what our members ultimately want is to see the money that has been funneled into DOC redirected to address root causes of incarceration. And it is past time to start on that. And th that hasn't been happening. Jail, number of people in jail is dropping, DOC budget hasn't budged. Um, this council must resist any attempts to grow DOC's operations budget, including the mayor's outrageous agreement with COBA to hire 400 new officers. Um, allowing an increase in DOC's operations budget at this moment would send entirely the wrong message in a couple of ways. First, it would send the message that a perceived staffing shortage that is created, completely created by failed and absent management will be rewarded by more resources. <laughs> the council cannot- Time that. expired. Uh, I'll, I'll wrap up. Um, second, it sends the message that the city plans to double down on a jail-based economy that has harmed communities of color including of course incarcerated people, but also people who work in the toxic environment of DOC solely because it was the best paying job available to them. If the city had proactively initiated a just transition, offering training for COs to prepare for other jobs combined with a commitment to better compensate the jobs that folks have been talking about all day, you know, non-law enforcement jobs that are clearly essential like human services, parks workers, healthcare workers, uh, if, we, if the city had initiated that transition, we could have already freed up a billion dollars in annual jail costs to spend on everything else that we've talked about all, all day. Um, so while the mayor's budget proposal makes it clear he's not taking leadership to move the city towards a just transition, the council must at least prevent him from moving us in the opposite direction. Thank you. Thanks, Sarita. And um... The battle continues, you know, it's insane that we're spending, um, you know, that we are the most expensive and I, I forget your exact wording there. And yet we have the worst results. It's, I just can't explain it, but look forward to continuing to fight with you. Thank you. We will now hear from Lois Lee followed by Christina Gavin. Starting the time. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can now. Okay. Hi, Danny. It's always good to see you. And I'm, I'm Lois Lee representing CPC, Early Childhood Division. Is a, okay, so I'm gonna speak on three things. Fair student funding. Are you still hearing that back um, thing? Can you hear me? Okay. 
Excuse, excuse me, Miss Lee. This is uh, Chief Sergeant Terence Rafael Perez. It sounds like you may have you're playing the hearing in the background, and we're getting some serious feedback. Which okay, can you shut that off? Shut yes, please. Off? Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, can you shut that off? Okay, can you hear me now? Now we're still getting the feedback. Okay, now we don't hear you at all now. We'll circle back to Lois Lee when she's able to address her audio issues. Next panelist is Christina Gavin. Starting time. Outside and you won't, you won't acknowledge it, you won't even hear it because you're- Miss Gavin? Oh yes, can you, can you hear me? Yes, we can. We're ready for okay. you to come Thanks. Uh, my name is Christina Gavin. I am one of two campus librarians at a campus of six high schools in the Northeast Bronx. We're located in Westchester Square. When we're not in a global pandemic, my students enjoy accessing a library that's full of contemporary books in different languages and formats, lots of graphic novels, tons of manga, board games, arts and crafts materials, and computers. The library is home to multiple clubs. We've hosted author visits where students from the entire campus come together to meet an author, ask questions about becoming writers themselves and have book signs. We've actually had three virtual author visits um, featuring LGBTQ writers during the pandemic, thanks to the DOE Office of Library Services and Lambda Literary. Our library was recently remodeled. It's a wonderful space where my students can exist, learn, explore and create without worrying about grades or wrong answers. And school librarians also collaborate with classroom teachers to provide instruction across the city, the library's the only shared instructional resource in our campus of schools. Unfortunately, though, this is my ninth year in the DOE. I worked for five years as a special education teacher at three different school buildings here in the Bronx. And this is the first building I've worked in that's had a functional library. Many of my students report this is the first time they've had access to a library in their school or they had one in elementary, but not in middle or vice versa. And this is a common refrain across the city. The New York State Commissioner of Education's regulations mandate that every school in New York State have a school library staffed by a pedagogue and that every secondary school have a certified school librarian. In many regards, New York City is the most important city in our country, but we are not leading in school library access. There are about 1800 schools, but only about 200 certified school librarians. Um, the Harlem Council of Elders frequently cites that about 90% of Harlem secondary schools do not have librarians. With the influx of full fair student funding and stimulus funds, now is the perfect time to correct this inequity. Increase funding for alternative and subsidized training programs for school librarians, provide funding to create school libraries and require that all New York City public schools be in compliance with state laws to provide school library access equitably for all students. Every New York City public school student deserves a librarian. Time in every Just before you go. Yes. I just want to see if, where, where you are. Okay. Um, there you are. Okay. Uh, Christina Gavin, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. That was a great uh, uh, um, testimony. Um, and I'm, I, you're absolutely right. And we've had hearings on the situation with librarians. Uh, and when I was a teacher, I was a teacher for 25 years before I got elected to the council. Uh, what happened in my school was that they cleared out the library so that they could create a computer room. Uh, and it shouldn't be that you have one or the other, you should really be able to have both. And so that's something that we are fighting and uh, we'll continue to fight. And also, uh, yes, the DOE brought Land of Literary to you, but the city council funded it. So I know, I remember. My program. I remember. <laughs> uh, so and it's unfortunate when a school would choose a computer lab over a library because that's also in violation of NYSED commissioner regulations 91.1 .1 and 91.2 that say every school needs a library, every secondary needs a school librarian. And schools should not have the option to pick and choose which 
mandates they're going to follow because then it trickles down to our students. They don't have equitable access. It's not fair to them. Those, those are my dogs. Um, I, I just wanted to offer you, if you're interested in uh, LGBT history, uh, get in touch with me and I'm going to refer you to Eric Vaughn at um, the DOE. He's the LGBTQ oh, liaison. I know. Oh, We're okay, in a great. Facebook so group together. <laughs> all right, good. Get him and he has some stuff on LGBT history, though. I'm so glad that you were able to take advantage of Lambda Literary. I just, I just left my school's um, GSA meeting to switch over oh, really quickly to the hearing. <laughs> You have to invite me there. You have to get me up Oh, there great. We, will, we would love to have you. Okay, I would love to come. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you. We will now hear from Debbie Meyer, followed by Mark Gonsalves. Starting time. Thank you. I'm Debbie Meyer, and I'm once again a public school parent. I'm also a member of Arise. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and listen to the story. When he was almost three years old, my son looked up at a sign and said, MTA spells bus. This was pre-reading, I was told. But he could not hear rhymes and hated Dr. Seuss and he hated Sesame Street. He liked shows with plots. Often people couldn't understand him, but he had a big vocabulary and his, he hid his need for speech therapy from all, including his doctor. His pre-K teacher was concerned that he didn't know his colors, although his health form clearly stated that he was colorblind. She didn't mind that he was not able to segment words into sounds, the first stage of reading. She did say he was bright and enjoyed to teach. I thought I'd won the lottery when Isaac was accepted to a public progressive school. He memorized the books in the baggies. We read to him aloud, but he couldn't read himself. His kindergarten teacher told us he was bright and enjoyed to teach. In first grade, he was clearly struggling. Our school's response? They had Isaac attend a one-week summer program for professional development in teaching reading. He was not the only struggling reading there, reader there. In second grade, a school evaluation showed he was indeed bright, but couldn't read or express himself in writing near grade level. We mentioned to the school team that dyslexia runs in our family. We were hushed as though dyslexia didn't exist. The team told us he would do fine in a co-teaching classroom, but he did not, neither did many others. So we enrolled him in a specialized school which has its own teacher training institute and we sued the city for tuition. Now my son knows how words work, he can read. He learned how to write, research and take notes. His frustration dissipated, he was no longer suicidal. He is now a sophomore at Bard Manhattan. But what about all the kids he left behind? The ones without parents who can advocate or have resources to spend. What about the kids that are both victims of poor instruction and low expectations endemic with our system? Why don't teaching colleges teach teachers how to teach reading? Why, with all the evidence, is there still controversy over how to teach kids to read? Dyslexic students are the canaries in the coal mine. Why are we okay with teaching just one third of students to read? This is not only seen in test scores, it's seen in the high costs of remediation high cost of special ed in upper elementary school, middle school, high school, adult literacy programs, and the dyslexia and illiteracy rates in prison and among the homeless. The school to prison pipeline starts in early education. It starts with literacy instruction. Let's invest in evidence-based literacy instruction at CUNY teaching colleges and at the DOE. And let's save in special education, save in incarceration, and save in homeless services. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Mark Gonsalves and circle back to Lois Lee. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Drum and all council members. My name is Mark Gonsalves and I'm a parent with two children, one that goes to our local elementary school and one that goes to an 853 school. With this budget, the council has some, a chance to do something they have never done before and discrimination of students with disabilities. My older son, Josh, is 11 years old. He is on the autism spectrum. We had planned for him to go to our locally zoned school. We so wanted that to happen, but it was not to be. Josh's form of autism is severe enough that the locally zoned school was not appropriate. In fact, none of the DOE schools were deemed appropriate by the DOE, and thus Josh is at an 853 school. 853 schools are for the most complex students, which the DOE has determined that they cannot educate. The DOE directly pays Josh's school to educate him because the DOE can't. 
For the last six years, the DOE has rejected my son. That's right, they have rejected him. The DOE for the last six years has said they don't want him because they don't have a place for him. Josh has been, been doing well at his publicly funded 853 school, but he has had setbacks. This year, Josh lost both of his assistant teachers. Why? Because Josh's school can't pay them enough to compete with the DOE salaries and benefits. Two years ago, Josh lost his teacher mid-year. Where did she go? She went to a DOE school. Why? Because the DOE paid her significantly more, gave her significantly better benefits, and told her she didn't have to work year round, as my son is in a 12 month program due to being on the spectrum. Josh's school, like other 853 and 4410 preschools, are losing teachers because the DOE and the city of New York are not offering teachers and staff pay parity. Josh is being discriminated against by the DOE and the New York City because he is not getting the funding from the DOE and the city at the same rate as other publicly funded schools. This is causing significant teacher turnover and directly setting I'm back expired. my son's learning as new teachers and assistant teachers have to come in, learn how to work with my son, and it thus impacts his learning. What will the legacy be of this city council? Will the city council enable discrimination of students with disabilities to continue, or will your legacy be of ending discrimination for students with disabilities? This council has the chance to end discrimination by fully funding pay parity for all 853 and 4410 teachers and staff. So what will it be council members? Will you enable discrimination of students with disabilities to continue or will you be the council whose legacy is of ending discrimination for students with disabilities? Thank you. Mr. Gonzalez. Yes, uh, what, what is, I'm not sure, I've not heard the word 853 school. Can you describe that to me? Absolutely. So an 853 school is a state, um, it's part of state law that was enacted in 1976. Okay. Um, it's basically when the local dis school districts do not have the facilities to educate the most um, severe cases. And so New York City DOE literally pays my school with checks, direct chart, direct, direct debits, whatever you want to call it. But they literally pay the school monthly to educate my son because the DOE with their thousand plus schools has no school available for him. Yeah, okay, now, now I'm familiar with the, with the uh, number, but uh, let me ask you this question also. Yes, sure. Did you have to fight, did you have to fight to get your child into that program? I had to fight for him to get appropriate education, the appropriate education. They wanted to put him in a more restrictive environment than was legally allowed. And so okay. yes, I had to fight for my son's rights. So we, the city and of New York was not breaking the law. And that, and that included the fight for the being in the in a private school. It's a publicly funded nonprofit school. It is not private. Okay. So, okay. but yes, I did have to fight for him the first year. And then every other year they have agreed that the proper location is not at the DOE. So I have not had to fight okay, since. Okay, no, I'm really going to I agree with you on everything that you said and, and, and familiar with the case. We've, we've had some hearings on it, as a matter of fact, when I was education chair. Um, and um, when I say fight to get your child into the school, I mean, oftentimes they put obstacles in the way for parents to get proper placement for their children. And, um, and of course, in your case, don't even have um, the proper placement for them. So then parents have to go to either an outside or private or a nonprofit, whatever it may be. Yeah. Um, but uh, yes, and I also was a daycare center teacher oh, wow. um, prior, so prior to being in the Department of Ed, yeah, we... and I left because I, I left because of the salary as well. So I just want to thank you for coming in, and and I'm just to say that we will continue to advocate um, on your behalf and on your on your child's behalf. Well. Thank you, Chair Drum, and thank you for for serving all of the New Yorkers. Thank you. We will now circle back to Lois Lee, followed by Lauren Calvin. Time starts now. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Hi, Danny. I was always good Hi, to Lois. see you. <laughs> so I'm Lois Lee, representing CPC um, Early Childhood Centers. Now, I'm talking about fair student funding for DOE. It should apply to early childhood centers in the hiring of teachers, after school programs and summer programs and the choosing of curriculum. The ECC budget is 50% less 
than the DOE, which you already know. Mark spoke about pay parity for directors. Henry spoke yes. for pay parity for uh, teachers. But no one spoke about assistant teachers. My assistant teachers should get pay parity with power professionals, and they should have tiers like power professionals. A power professional with a BA degree of 40, uh, gets 40,000 a year, 40K. My teacher gets 32,000, my TAs. All of my TAs have BA degrees. So it's not fair that we don't have these tiers. I don't want to lose my teachers to the DOE the way everyone else has been talking about public schools. I want high quality uh, early childhood centers means high quality staff. Okay, second issue, summer rising. The DOE, DYCD must communicate with CBOs. We do not know where we will be housed this summer. Online, my school, PS20, is a summer rising. But our principal, wonderful person, she doesn't know. She says she's not sure. So when will they tell us where CPC summarizing will be located? Right ne next week will be June, and we still have not heard. So we need some more communication. The last issue that, uh, Danny, you really appreciate this. It has to be, do with mm -hmm. choosing curriculum. Now, I'm going to show you. I would love to have an emergent, relevant a uh, meaningful curriculum and not stick to the DOE units of study to the letter because this is ridiculous. This year and last year I taught what is COVID-19. When Verona the Corona came to town, I don't want I'm to wash funny. my hands. Then we also taught uh, to be culturally responsive. This is our Lunar New Year about Korea, China, Thailand, Vietnam, and India. Coming to America, a history of immigration. Remember, these books are not on the DOE list. And I have a lot of books from my uh, Latinx uh, community, Sopa de Free Holes. And from my Black community, Wilma Unlimited, City Shapes. You know, when you see the City Shapes, it's all children of color. And then, Danny, you really like this. Julian is a mermaid. <laughs> Do you see that? Hold on a minute. It is a mermaid. It was just that it was just so cute about the mermaid parade. And also oh, I love that. about women's history, she persisted. 13 women who persisted. Uh, about for all of our uh, autistic kids that we have and special needs kids, Ani and the new child, someone special just like you, and you matter. So what I'm trying to say is we need uh, you know, in fair student funding, they're supposed to give money for choosing your curriculum. Hey, we should get the same thing, don't you think? Right? So, we are the seas of change. All the books that I'm showing you, I have used in teaching. So, what does it mean to be kind? Be kind to all of us in the early childhood uh, sector. I know you're very familiar with us, and I love you, Danny. You already know the CPC uh, talking points that you have heard from Colin and everyone else. So we support all of those needs for human services. But I just really wish that they would give us flexibility in choosing the books for our curriculum. That's all I'm asking. So those are my three asks. Thank you, Danny. You know, Lois, you always make it interesting, and the teacher in you always comes out. You bring the uh, books with you to show us what it is, that what a inclusive curriculum means. Uh, and so I'm very, very grateful for your testimony. I'm glad that we were able to get your um, your, your uh, audio problem settled. So thank you. And we will continue to fight, Lois. You know, we'll keep going forward. Okay, pay parity. Thanks. Teacher assistance. Thank you. I got it. We will now hear from Lauren Clavin, followed by Liz Ackles. Time starts now. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to give testimony. Um, good afternoon, Chair Drum. I'm a lifelong Queens resident, and I was uh, formerly a constituent of yours. It's nice to see you. I am a public school parent to a rising first grader with an IEP and a child who will be entering pre-K in the fall. Um, I can't and I won't speak to resource equity in our schools better than the tireless advocates and parent leaders who spoke today, uh, like Maria Bautista, Natasha Capers, Paulette Healy, and her wonderful son, and Senator Robert Jackson, just to name a few. So uh, I, I'll just say, listen to them. Please allocate the money organizations like AQE have fought for for over three decades in the ways that they have laid out brilliantly today. 
Uh, they're demanding $1 billion for culturally responsive schools, $350 million to support English language learners and our immigrant families, um, $225 million for real restorative justice, uh, $177 million uh, for social and emotional supports, which includes, as many people have said today, hiring more social workers and more counselors. Um, I also want to uplift the many brilliant youth leaders from organizations like the Urban Youth Collaborative who spoke today about their lived experiences of being policed inside their school buildings. Uh, there was a, a child today, uh, for those of you who, who may not have been here, who shared an experience uh, of being harassed when he was 11 years old, uh, walking into his school building. And he compared walking into his school as a child to visiting a family member in Rikers. So I really urge you to remember that and to listen to our kids because these policies, this budget that you're about to finalize impacts them the most. And so we should hear them when they speak and what they are demanding is police free schools. Um, you know, we have a really amazing- Time expired. I just, two more seconds. We have a really amazing opportunity to put this money to work for people, uh, for our kids. And I hope I don't have to explain to my kids 10 years from now that we squandered this moment. Many of the council members that are here today will be moving on in a few months. So let this budget be your opportunity to cement your legacies as real champions for equity. Thank you so much. Thanks. And, you know, I've heard so many stories about inappropriate behavior on the part of um, school safety agents. Uh, I had one student that came in one time and he was, he told me that he was told to take off a rainbow, one of those rainbow wrist, wrist brands that, you know, rubber wristbands that they have. And he refused to do it because he identified as LGBTQ. And, uh, and then was, um, you know, there was an altercation with the school safety agent over a rainbow wristband. <laughs> You know, just so crazy, but I hear what you're saying and I want to just continue fighting for what we think is right. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now hear from Liz Ackley's followed by Pam Koch. Time starts now. Hi. Hi, Liz. Hi. Hi, Chair Drum. Um, members of the committee, thanks so much for um, the opportunity to testify today. I'm here, I'm Liz Ackles, and I'm here on behalf of Community Food Advocates and the Lunch for Learning campaign to talk about um, the capital budget asked for um, cafeteria redesign um, in the amount of $150, 000, $150 million uh, that we'd like to be invested over the next five years to modernize, scale up and modernize um, uh, school cafeterias. Um, I, you know, first of all, I want to say, um, Council Mindrum, and to and to the council, thank you for your incredible partnership with us over the years to our joint success to get universal free school lunch, which shouldn't have been a hard fight, but was. Um, and um, you know, our continuing work together to make the school meals program the best that it could be for all students and you know certainly knowing that a councilwoman Rosenthal certainly knowing that in um, you know the pandemic what we've always known the pandemic has made even more clear about how important school food programs are to um, students and their families so um, uh, you know just to kind of reiterate what what you all know is um, the uh, Department of Education Office of Food and Nutrition Services has an innovative model, you'll see in my background, that's what I'm not actually sitting there, um, of cafeteria redesign that addresses two of the biggest barriers to student participation, and that is cafeteria environment and food appeal. Um, it's highly cost effective um, and very quickly done. It's a $500,000 capital item per school and although there's pre-planning, the work is done over a weekend. So we are, when we saw this model, we were so excited about this and we were like, building on the foundation of universal. This is the thing to do. 
it's highly successful. High school students participate 35% more. We anticipate 30,000 additional high school students would participate if we expanded this out. And I'm gonna leave it at that um, because I'm over time. I know that Council Member Rosenthal has a question, but before I just have a comment and I wanna uh, thank you. Yeah, it looks like you're sitting in a diner and uh, waiting for uh, to go to the salad bar, uh, which is the purpose of the work that you're doing. And I've seen it in my schools uh, here in Jackson Heights, uh, where it has really worked and it's very inviting to the students where they can come and select their own good, healthy food. Yeah. And they go for the healthy options yeah. just by the, the environment. So um, I'll have a surprise for you a little bit later down the road about what's in my allocations. And, okay. <laughs> um, and I look forward to speaking with you when the budget process is done. Thank you. Rosa. Okay. Thank you, Councilman. Well, as usual, Chair Drum, I'm going to say the exact same thing that you said. Um, every single aspect of it. I wish, um, I have, I will say that your group, Liz, is extraordinary. Everyone who is a member is extraordinary, true food justice advocates for life. And uh, I, I regret not moving faster, but um, I'm, I'm excited that, that I'll be adding funding for a kitchen um, in my district. And um, I know there are a couple of schools that already have one, but it's just extraordinary what you've done and what you're devoting your time to doing. I know how hard it is to work with DOA, DOE slash SDA, but you've mastered it and you've also converted them. They're very excited to do this work as well. So I'm glad to now be a part of it and thank you, and thank you for your service. Yeah, no, th thank, thank you very much. And, and we appreciate you being a champion on this and helping us um, move this forward, both in your district and on a big scale. So thank you, it means a whole lot. All right. Back to you, Chair Brown. Or back to the committee council. council. Back to council, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. We will now hear testimony from Pam Koch, followed by Jacqueline Baum. Time starts now. Hi, everyone. Oh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, thanks everyone. And I work very closely with Liz. Um, so I am very happy to also be here to talk about cafeteria redesigns. My name is Pam Cook and I'm from Teachers College Columbia University. And we did some research on why this is so important. As you all know, school meals are critical to the well-being of our children. Studies have shown that many children rely on school meals for a large portion of their daily food intake often eating breakfast, lunch, and snacks at school. So these cafeterias can make a big difference to not just lunch, but many meals. Children from food insecure households compared with those from more food secure ones also rely more heavily on school meals. We also know that foods that students get from school are not only healthier than what they get from other places, but also improve academic achievement and reduce food insecurity. Yet we know that most Americans, including children, are not eating as healthy as they should or could. Our research in three of the cafeterias that got redesigned um, showed that these more attractive cafeterias for those three schools actually increased participation one year later by 50%, which is a little bit higher than Liz said was overall. And it also increased the students' attitudes towards eating school meals. They said they liked school meals better. They wanted to be in the cafeteria. Crucially, we found that the results were more positive when healthier items were more regularly featured, such as salad bars, and that they were in really accessible locations, um, as well as the grab and go salads when those were made central, which is what happens, what can happen in these cafeteria redesigns. Our findings also suggest that it would be great to complement this with ensuring training of the staff in the cafeteria to present these meals, providing food and nutrition education that helps to support school meals, and to keep maintaining fidelity of the program years after the cafeterias get redesigned. Being able to provide funding for continued cafeteria improvements drives health directly. 
currently, I, and I believe that these numbers are right, out of the thousand, thousand school cafeterias in New York City, about 25 have received these improvements so far. Um, and so I'm we expired. believe that all students deserve this. So please consider to continue funding this as Liz talked about too. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Jacqueline Baum, followed by Lee Hebuelka. Time starts now. Hi, everyone. Thank you to Chair Drom and the members of the Committee on Finance. My name is Jacqueline Baum. I'm a student at the City College of New York, and I'm here to represent UHAB, the Urban Homesteading Assistance Board. UHAB was founded with the mission to empower low-income communities that have historically faced abandonment and disinvestment with the tools to rehabilitate and maintain their own affordable housing co-ops. These same communities have been hit the hardest by the COVID-19 pandemic. HGFC residents and other low-income New Yorkers need the city to invest in ambitious green infrastructure projects to recover in the wake of COVID-19 and address the disproportionate environmental hazards in their neighborhoods, including those in their public schools. We are pleased to see funding for organics, commercial waste zones, and electric school buses in the executive budget, and we hope to see these items funded in the adopted budget. However, I'm here now to urge that the council also commit to funding retrofits and installing solar specifically in our public schools. We are asking for 80 million annually until 2035 in retrofitting public schools and 100 million annually until 2025 in solar. This is a total of 1.5 billion that can be allocated from the $3.8 billion DCAS public building energy efficiency funds. The city needs to make this commitment and as a result, improve the environmental health of our schools, make our children safer, create thousands of good union jobs, move us towards climate goals and invest in New York City's low income and black and brown communities. It is an honor to testify among so many other students committed to building a more equitable and just city. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you. We will now hear from Lija Kualpa followed by Diana Moreno. Time starts now. Ms. Kualpa, you may proceed when ready. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I wasn't sure if I heard my name or where somebody else. Uh, oops, sorry. So um, I'm gonna start. my name is uh, Ligia Walpa. I'm gonna show my face. Uh, there you go. <laughs> um, so my name is Ligia Walpa. I am the executive director of the Workers' Justice Project, a um, worker-led organization that it's um, led by work, mostly day laborers, domestic workers and now um, construct, I mean, food delivery workers. Um, it's a workers' rights organization that it's fighting for better working conditions throughout New York City. And it is an honor to be here testifying today. Um, not alone, I'm here with one of the member leaders whose name is Anita, um, who came not only to share her story, but to make a specific call on why it's so essential for New York City to continue to invest in day labor centers um, throughout New York City who have been playing one of the most essential and vital roles in New York City's recovery. Um, and we hope, and first of all, we're so thankful to um, the chairman, Daniel Drum, for being, uh, for making a historical investment for the first time in New York City in maintaining and sustaining um, institutions like day labor centers, um, it's like a historic step to making sure we build an economy that works for all. So I'm gonna pass it on the rest of my time to Anita, who's uh, it's one of our member leaders of Workers Justice Project. Hola, buenas tardes a todos. Mi nombre es Ana Lilia León. Eh, soy una trabajadora esencial. Soy miembro del proyecto de justicia laboral. Y estamos aquí, verdad, Estamos aquí, estoy aquí para pedirles que nos ayuden con su apoyo a todos, ya que somos un, somos este, esenciales aquí, trabajadores, que hemos estado aquí trabajando en tiempos de pandemia, muy duro, la verdad, y el, la organización 
fue un apoyo para nosotros en ese tiempo, ya que nosotros, en mi historia personal, yo y mi esposo nos quedamos sin trabajo por seis meses. Eh, estuvimos aquí y es, como miembro del proyecto de justicia laboral, nos ayudó con comida, veníamos a ayudar también a entregarles comida a, la, a otras personas de la comunidad y otro grupo de mujeres de limpieza estuvimos haciendo mascarillas, aprendiendo a hacer mascarillas y ayudando a otras personas que lo necesitaban porque en ese tiempo no había mascarillas, estaban muy este, escasas. So, el grupo de mujeres y yo y la organización nos buscamos unas máquinas y la organización también nos mandó a pedir unas máquinas y estuvimos cosiendo más de 5 mil mascarillas para los jornaleros de las calles. Y este, pues fue un apoyo muy grande económico, moralmente para nosotros y por eso es que yo estoy aquí pidiéndoles a todos ustedes que por favor nos den su ayuda para todos los centros, todos los centros, porque en realidad sí es una gran ayuda para nosotros los jornaderos, ya que nosotros somos esenciales, trabajamos aquí para ayudar a la economía del país y este, pues este, estamos aquí, ¿verdad? Eh, le pido yo al señor Daniel Drón, buenas tardes. Eh, estuve el gusto de conocerlo en la, en la caída, en el, la marcha caída por las personas de los COVID. Muchas gracias, fue un placer conocerlo, ¿verdad? Y este, pues estamos aquí pidiendo la ayuda para nuestros centros porque es... Muy, es una ayuda y este, económicamente, una ayuda moralmente también, porque somos trabajadores esenciales, trabajamos eh, muy duro, aportamos mucho a la economía, pagamos renta, compramos comida eh, y aquí gastamos el mismo dinero. Aquí lo invertimos pagando rentas, las rentas en este tiempo. Usted puede continuar. Se corte. En este tiempo, ¿verdad? Las rentas están muy caras. En el tiempo de la pandemia, nos, los centros, todos los centros de las comunidades, de los jornaderos, estuvieron apoyándonos. Este centro apoyó a muchos trabajadores. Yo puedo dar testimonio porque fui una persona de las que me he beneficiado mucho, ya que me quedé sin trabajo y otras compañeras de limpieza Hicimos un grupo de mujeres, eh, estuvimos cosiendo más de 5 mil mascarillas para entregar a los jornaleros en la calle. Eh, otras personas nos donaban comida caliente. Íbamos todos los días, eh, los miércoles y los días, a dejarle comida. En tiempo de pandemia, nosotros y el centro no paramos. Estuvimos ahí trabajando con ellos. Todo el mundo estaba con miedo y todo. Y aún así salíamos a dejar comida aquí al frente, no es por, me, nos daba miedo porque aquí al frente está una funeraria y veíamos cómo las personas bajaban eh, difuntos y difuntos y nosotros aquí, verdad, está la, la oficina, hay puros cristales, entonces eh, veíamos cómo bajaban las personas en bolsas y para nosotros no era fácil porque nos daba miedo pero queríamos seguir adelante y este, hay días que no queríamos ni salir, pero pues la organización a veces hasta nos decía, no, pues vénganse y nos daba apoyo y yo fui una que el momento, un, un día me tuve que regresar a mi casa porque no quería agarrar el tren. Eso era un shock terrible eso, pero gracias a todas las compañeras y a las personas que estuvieron aquí, nos dieron mucho apoyo y este, también mentalmente eso fue una ayuda porque nos metíamos a coser mascarillas y estábamos ahí todo el día cosiendo y salíamos a las calles a entregar comida. Y yo pienso que sí, somos unos trabajadores que sí necesitamos que nos ayuden y que tengamos un centro donde venir y donde tener un apoyo. Gracias, señora, para, tu, para su testimonio. Es uh, algo muy importante. 
uh, yo fui um, muy contento para estar con ustedes uh, algunas semanas pasadas marchando para los derechos de los bibliotecas y también de los trabajadores y los y los honoreros. Uh, desde el primer año que yo fui un miembro del Consejo Municipal, yo fui al centro de Ligia para ver lo que ustedes están haciendo para la comunidad. Y yo fui muy impresionado por el trabajo que ustedes están haciendo. Y yo creo que es muy importante que nosotros apoyamos a uh, todo el trabajo que ustedes están haciendo para los deliveristas y para los trabajadores esenciales. Porque como usted ha dicho, uh, ellos fueron en el front line de la pandemia y, y nosotros um, queremos apoyarse y ustedes merecen uh, el apoyo del de, uh, Consejo Municipal. Muchas gracias por su ayuda y por su cooperación. Me les estoy muy agradecidos a todos de parte de todos los jornaleros y las jornaleras. Eh, yo estoy dando el voz por ellas, ¿verdad? Porque pues no podemos estar todos juntos aquí pero a través de mí les dan las gracias todos por su apoyo y este pues es una ayuda y una lucha que tenemos que seguir y espero que nos sigan apoyando a todos porque la verdad pues no es fácil ser jornalero, son muchas horas de trabajo y, y cuando nadie, no sabemos hasta que pasamos las cosas porque no es fácil trabajar duro más de 12, 14 horas y a veces pues no tenemos ni horas de comida ni y estamos ahí duro trabajando. Sí, Muchas yo sé. A todos. Yo voy a traducir un poquito. What she was saying is that the day laborers and the deliverers, the delivery people that we relied on so heavily in the pandemic, uh, were vital service workers to all of us, and they don't have their rights. Uh, we participated in the march about two or three weeks ago here in Elmhurst, in my district, uh, supporting the rights of delivery workers. And one of them had just been killed um, in an accident, hit by a car. Uh, and we were there, they had a, a coffin and to um, shine a light on the, the plight of the day laborers. Uh, she's a member of the day laborer center with Ligia, with Ligia Guapa in Brooklyn. And Ligia has done tremendous work uh, with the day laborers there. And the day laborers um, deserve dignity and respect and uh, they want the support of the city council moving forward as well for the work that they're doing with the day laborers and with the delivery people and all of the essential workers uh, that uh, we learned, that we learned were essential during the pandemic. So thank you for your testimony. Ligia, ¿está con usted? Sí, ahora. Thank you. Uh, Ligia, ¿quiere decir algo? I just want to say uh, thank you to all the city council members, to you, Danny. And every, I, I feel like you guys are leaving not only a legacy, but powerful spaces that are gonna transform uh, the entire city of New York. Um, and that's what day labor centers are doing in every corner of our city. And we're so proud to be building institutions that are led by workers, for workers, uh, so we can keep on creating economy that works for all. Thank you so much. And we continue to counting with your support for fiscal, for the next fiscal year. Yeah, and Ligia, you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, I said also from day one when I was first elected in, in my first year in the city council, I went to visit your center out in Coney Island there and um, saw how the, the day laborers buy into um, the program and, and, and invest in um, bettering themselves and building their own organization. And it's run by them, it's, you know, it's, it's led by them. And uh, that's a really wonderful model that you've established up there. So, uh, and as you know, I have day laborers here in Jackson Heights as well, um, who I try to support um, as much as I possibly can. And, uh, and you're doing tremendous work. So thank you, thank you Lee Hea, for thank everything you. that you've done. And you do, it, you do it for pennies, for hardly anything. You deserve more money. Thank you, Danny. And you know, we're so proud, you know, to be a model for other worker centers. Um, and our model, it, we're so proud that, you know, WJP's model has expanded to Queens, uh, Staten Island, Brooklyn, and you can see it now all over the place, uh, led by also amazing organizations that are, will be testifying today. Thank you, Danny. We love you. <laughs> Thank you, Carlo. Cualquier cosa. <laughs>
We'll now hear Council, you want to call yes, Chair. We will now hear from Diana Moreno, followed by Yasina Mata. Starting time. Hi, everyone. Good good evening, uh, Councilman Drum. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for having us. My name is Diana Moreno. I am the Chief of Staff of New Immigrant Community Empowerment uh, right there in Danny Drum's district in the, in the heart of, of Jackson Heights. Uh, we're here to testify about the work that NICE has done uh, over the past year and to really ask for your continued support to invest in our immigrant workers who are the heart of the city. And I think this past year, I don't have to tell you, uh, being a few blocks from Elmhurst Hospital, the impact that the pandemic has had on our community. Um, it has been a tremendous challenge for, for day labor and worker centers throughout the city to not only be the center for safe and dignified jobs for our community, but also for emergency relief, for food, for, for basic information about the pandemic. And it has truly been through the investment of the city council in our centers that we have been able to dispatch over 1,200 safe and better paying jobs for day laborers over the past year. We have also been able, been able to disperse nearly $3 million in cash assistance to a community that has been largely left out of state and federal benefits. We have also been able to distribute hundreds of meals and, and hundreds of pounds of groceries to our food insecure New Yorkers who were deeply impacted by this pandemic economically. And more than that, in recent months, we have been able to connect over a thousand workers to the COVID vaccine. We are so thankful for the support of Councilman Drum and the council members here that have made this possible. It is through our existence that immigrant workers who in, in other circumstances would have had no one to turn to during this past year, that they, we have been able to provide emergency cash assistance, emergency food relief, and of course, continue to connect them to safe and dignified work. It is our immigrant who, who, who want to work, want to continue moving the city. And we know, we know more than, more than at any other time that the past year has proven the, the way that they are a basis for our economy and how they keep us moving as essential workers. Now the challenges we face are getting them back to work and getting a long-term economic recovery plan on the ground for our immigrant workers. We wanna train them in health and safety and to prevent injuries and death, which are unfortunately way too common in the construction industry. Two workers died just in the past week in construction. We must stop this pandemic of, of, of health and safety inadequacies in the construction industry. Finally, we also have to help day laborers connect workers to the excluded workers fund that was recently, recently created. That is something that we're working on and we need to have the resources to be able to connect our members to this funds. Finally, I just wanna share that yesterday we, we went up to Albany to advocate at the state level. And on our way back on the bus, I remember hearing from one of our members, Monica, whenever we were debriefing on that trip. She said, you know, I used to really back away from being part of this advocacy actions because I was afraid, because I was afraid of being deported. I was afraid of being watched. I was afraid of speaking up about my rights, but I am no longer afraid. I am here because I am no longer afraid to speak up. That is invaluable. That is the kind of connection, not just to safe and better and dignified paying jobs, but the kind of connection to a civically engaged life that we give to immigrant workers. This investment, your continued support, your increased support will allow us to continue engaging immigrant workers in this beautiful city. And we thank you so much for your support. The next person. You know, Diana, thank you so much. And thank you to Manny also for everything that you've done in this community for the last 15 months. You know, you have um, sustained people and gotten us through this. And you work with the most vulnerable people who work for the most vulnerable people. You know, it's just amazing to watch what you've done. I've seen the videos. I saw the food distribution myself personally along Roosevelt Avenue. Thank you so much. And, um, you know, if we fight for anything and if the city council is worth anything, it's making sure that folks like you and the people that you work with uh, get the funding that you need. So thank you for coming in and giving testimony. We so appreciate your continued support, Danny. It has really been an honor. Thank you so much. Thanks, Diana. We'll now hear from Yasina Mata, followed by Lucy Sexton. Starting time. 
My name is Isenia Mata. I am the executive director of La Colmena, the only immigrant rights and day labor organization that kept its doors open on Staten Island during the entire pandemic. Thank you, Chair Drum and Immigration Committee, Chair Carlos Menchaca for supporting us. La Culmena is also part of the Day Labor Coalition. And since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, immigrant workers and day labor organizations were in the front lines, keeping our city running. Our center served as a critical tool in the city's response. For example, La Colmena delivered food and emergency cash assistance to immigrant families were provided, trained workers in site safety trainings and uh, emergency preparedness and helped immigrant workers achieve job security through dispatching. Our centers also provided legal services as it relates to wage theft and provided COVID-19 testing and vaccination in partnership with health and health and hospitals. We actually had the first here on Staten Island, the first uh, vaccination bus uh, arrived here on Staten Island. It arrived at La Colmena. And here as well in Staten Island, La Colmena, instead of falling, it didn't, it grew. This is why last week we opened up our second center and we came back stronger than ever. We will be now able to serve more workers throughout Stein Island. And we, we knew how to handle this pandemic and we have a lot more to offer. Uh, therefore, we, we can't have an equitable recovery if we do not support immigrant workers on Stein Island, Queens, Brooklyn, Manhattan, and the Bronx. So I urge you to fully fund the day labor initiative. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from Lucy Sexton, followed by Madaha Kinsey Lamb. Starting time. Thank you, Chair Drum and members of the City Council. My name is Lucy Sexton, and I lead the Cultural Advocacy Coalition, New Yorkers for Culture and Arts. In recent months, we have heard the governor, the mayor, many elected officials rightly state that arts and culture are the hardest hit sector and that our city and state depends on culture to revitalize and recover. Culture drives local economies, bringing people to the street and into restaurants and small businesses. We're the main driver of tourism, critical to bringing visitors from across the country and the world to our city. And yet, relief to culture in New York City has been lagging. I implore you to act now. Save culture so we can save our city and help the economy rebound, so we won't be facing another budget crisis when the federal relief runs out. I have testified. I have testified at council hearings all year, reminding you that the most fragile parts of our sector are having the hardest time. And I have repeatedly said that we cannot emerge from this crisis with a more centralized and more white cultural ecosystem. Now the time has arrived when we can take action to ensure the city comes back, that comes back is led by arts and culture supported in every community, helping every neighborhood and our entire city reco recover economically and emotionally. The cultural plan for recovery provides direct relief to the most hurt parts of our sector, to communities hardest hit by COVID where families are in dire need of the healing that arts can bring, to the performing arts, which we need immediate relief as we ramp up over the next year. It calls for a cultural equity fund, centering organizations of color and beginning to build a more equitable, more stable, more anti-racist arts and culture ecosystem. CPR asks the city council for $30 million for the DCLA, supporting both CIGs and program groups to get us back where we were pre-COVID. It asks you to restore invaluable initiatives like the Immigrant Cultural Initiative and asks that we at long last baseline support for the Coalition of Theaters of Color. The details of the cultural plan for recovery are attached. Cease Time expired. Support the heart, soul, and economic engine of our city with this bold and groundbreaking plan so New York City can set the standard for the world on how to heal, recover, and thrive with arts and culture for every citizen. Thank you for all your work, Chair Drum. Your care and attention in hearing after hearing is deeply appreciated. We will really miss you as finance chair. Thank you. We will now hear from Madaha Kinsey Lamb, followed by Sophia Harrison. Starting time. I am Madaha Kinsey Lamb, Executive Director and Founder of Mind Builders Creative Arts Center. Thank you all, you dedicated public officials, for your service and for this opportunity to share the work of Mind Builders and other community based organizations 
who are continuing to train the next generation of New York City civic leaders and cultural contributors. And on behalf of the incredible youth, families, and neighborhoods we are so honored to serve. Since 1978, Mind Builders has been located in the underserved Northeast Bronx. There were weeks and months over the past year when our community has had the highest infection rate in all of New York City. In March, 2020, we transferred all of our music, dance, theater, and community folk culture research classes over to online platforms, still serving hundreds of young people and families every week, reopening with our pre-K program in September and launching additional hybrid classes on site last month. Our students come from every zip code in the Bronx and beyond. Currently, we have summer applications available on our website for more than 200 classes, including free spaces for teens to participate in visual arts, dance, spoken word, and writing offered remotely and in person, including young people from African-American, Caribbean, Latinx, African, Middle Eastern, and many immigrant families. Much needed professional counseling by a certified therapist is also provided for youth and families. We employ 52 dedicated staff coming from the five boroughs, instructors, support, and admin staff. Our work is woven into the fabric of our neighborhood and our staff continue to make transformation in the lives of our young people possible. Mind Builders Creative Arts Center is also one of 42 grateful recipients of funding through CTC, the Coalition I'm of expired. Peoples of Color. Artistic productions and cultural organizations like ours are vital engines in our community. Without the arts, there is no recovery. Thank you. We'll now hear from Sophia Harrison, followed by Taryn Sacramone. Starting time. Good, after, good day, Chair and Council. I am Sophia Harrison, a resident of the 47th District in Coney Island, Brooklyn. I am the founder and executive director of Arts House Schools of Music, Dance, and Fine Art in Coney Island, serving children aged 3 to 17 and senior citizens. I am also the president of Arts House Inc., a WMBE company that provides art services to private and public schools throughout New York City. And I am a teacher in the DOE. As the only non-for-profit cultural institution in Coney Island that serves children year round, we boast that the last three graduating classes have entered college. Students before them have gone to college and come back to our communities as nurses, educators, social workers, and one is currently working on her law degree. While they decided to pursue careers outside the arts, it was the arts that insisted and assisted in strengthening their self-confidence, motivating them to effectively communicate skills and discipline. Council, Please remember that arts are more than the theaters on Broadway and the museums on Fifth Avenue. Arts and culture is the child receiving flowers at their first performance. It is the teenager that plays the piano to help clear their minds. It is the pride of having your artwork exhibited at the age of 10. I speak to the council today as citizens of New York City from whom I have one request. Put substantial support behind arts and culture and arts education. Arts Health Schools, like so many non-for-profit cultural institutions, is severely devastated by the pandemic. However, we have committed ourselves to continue to serve our communities by operating on prayers and hope. Today, it is my hope that the council will decide to continue to strengthen the self-confidence, self-esteem of New York City's children, especially in culturally underserved and traditionally underfunded neighborhoods. By passing a budget that includes 70 million or more in funding for the Department of Cultural Affairs, as detailed in the Cultural Plan for Recovery. These funds will help line the path to the future of the city. Confident, well-rounded, tolerant, and talented children become awesome adults. I am proud. 70 million for DCLA. I will also like to uh, show some of my kids that we're actually in class right now working. Thank you for your time. Have a good day. We'll now hear from Taryn Sacramone, followed by Fran Garber-Cohen. Starting time. Thank you. I'm Taryn Sacramone, Executive Director of Queens Theater and Chair of the Cultural Institutions Group. We are grateful for the Council's vital support, especially in this past year. 
Regardless of where we were in the COVID-19 crisis, culture never closed. Despite staggering losses, the CIG alone collectively lost 410 million in earned income. We work to advance our missions and serve New Yorkers, even while many of our doors remained closed or our capacity was restricted. While shut down, 10 million New Yorkers were able to continue to access quality education and arts programming online or find sanctuary in a garden or zoo. CIG members transformed stations for food distribution, COVID testing, blood drive, census outreach, COVID vaccination sites, and are now offering free tickets to incentivize vaccination. With your support, the CIG will have a major role in galvanizing the full recovery of New York as it did in 2008 and after 9-11. Investments are critical not only for New York to reemerge as the cultural and financial capital of the world, but for the cultural community to lead the way in reflecting and creating a more equitable city. The CIG leverages its significant reach to advance the strength and growth of the larger cultural sector. Last year, we were honored to welcome our colleague institution, Weeksville Heritage Center, as the newest member of the CIG, following incredible efforts of the Brooklyn Council, City Council members and a broad coalition of cultural organizations. Unfortunately, there currently is no formal process for a cultural organization to be added to the CIG. We would like to work with the council and administration to establish a transparent and inclusive process to ensure that the CIG continues to evolve and reflect the broad diversity of New York City. I also join my colleagues across the cultural sector in respectfully asking your support of the cultural plan for recovery and add $70 million to the cultural budget in fiscal 22. Including with the, just the details real quick. Included is a request that the council restore the 20.2 million uh, for culture that was added in fiscal 21 with an addition of 9.8 million for a total request of 30 million divided equally between the CIGs and program groups, restore all cultural council initiatives to fiscal 20 levels and baseline the coalition of theaters of color. The health and strength of the cultural sector is foundational to the health and strength of New York City. And it calls for equity to be structurally incorporated as outlined in the cultural plan for recovery. Thank you. We'll now hear from Fran Garber Cohen followed by Dominic Cuevas. Starting time. I'm Fran Garber Cohen, president of Regina Opera. For 51 years, each year Regina Opera has offered fully staged operas with a full orchestra and ticketed concerts. We provide affordable entertainment in accessible venues for audience members who might not otherwise attend live performances, especially for senior citizens who make up at least 65% of our audience. We perform three full operas each season, each featuring four ticketed and one totally free opera performance and many free concerts in parks, libraries, and festivals and ticketed concerts in our theater in Sunset Park, an underserved and low income community. All these bring foot traffic to local restaurants and shops, assisting them financially. Due to COVID-19, Regina Opera lost the ticket income and private sponsorship from 16 months of live pr productions. As we pivoted to posting archived operas and new recorded concerts on our YouTube page, Regina Opera, as well as huge number of arts and cultural organizations have relied upon Department of Cultural Affairs and city council members funding, such as that of council members Menchaca and Brannon to stay afloat, paying for rent, insurance, phone, phone answering services and other necessities. We at Regina Opera make the following requests that will help to ensure that all arts and culture can reopen in the fall. $30 million to be allocated to the Department of Cultural Affairs to go to the arts groups, funding for initiatives such as CASA and SUCASA be restored, baselining for funding coalition of theaters of color, and the support of the cultural plan for recovery, which asks for $40 million to support New York City culture as we try to recover from this pandemic. Thank you. 
Thank you for your testimony. We will now hear from Dominic Cuevas, followed by Chantal Fernandez. Starting time. Dominic Cuevas, are you able to accept the unmute request? Okay, we'll move to Chantal Fernandez, followed by Holly Smeltzer. Starting time. Good afternoon to all. My name is Chantal Fernandez, and as many, I'm here trying to ensure funding for Fair Futures. I'm one of the fortunate foster care children that has a coach to guide me through life's toughest obstacles. I can list so many examples where Fair Futures has been there supporting me, but I really want to share this strong, meaningful moment that happened a few days ago. In the moment, I was broken down and upset. I was crying uncontrollably and mourning past events, and Holly Fair Futures program director sent me a message and drew a wild smile across my face. Yes, one message made a huge difference. With that one message that she sent, she gave me the motivation to get up and keep moving forward. I need her support and Catalyns, the young, young adult success specialist to keep moving forward with me. I don't have parent figures to help me and guide me through life topic obstacles, but I do have them and their support is fundamental. Please fulfill your promise to young people and care and baseline funding for Fair Futures to ensure no young person will lose their coach, Fair Futures coach, tutor, or specialist. Thank you. Thank you so much. I will now hear from Holly Smeltzer followed by Caitlin Chavez. Starting time. A mentor once reminded me that any one person can be a change maker in any other person's life. The more positive role models a young person has in their corner, the greater the opportunity the young person has to meet a change maker. Fair Futures coaches, tutors, and specialists have been these change makers for young people in foster care in New York City. They have helped youth stay on track with academic and career goals, secure safe housing, and much more. Good evening, my name is Holly Smeltzer. I am a New York City foster parent. I am also the Fair Futures Program Director at the Coalition for Hispanic Family Services and I work with Chantel. Just over a year ago, we launched our coaching program. Throughout the year, we have witnessed young people making enormous strides towards accomplishing their goals. Our young people have invested in themselves, their communities and our city. Fair Futures staff have celebrated our young people as they have received college acceptances, academic and athletic scholarships, taken on leadership roles, amplified their voices to advocate for themselves and their peers and much more. Let us show our young people we are here to support them and getting not only to a better place, but a great and self-sustaining and independent place. We are calling on the mayor to stand behind his words that New York must do more to support kids in foster care by working collaboratively with the city council to baseline $20 million to save fair futures so we can continue to provide foster youth with the supports they need and deserve to be successful adults. As a member of the fair futures community and as a foster parent, I have witnessed firsthand the impact of fair futures programming on young people. We must invest in our youth now to ensure they have a fair shot at success later. We must allow Fair Futures coaches, tutors, and support staff to continue being the change makers in the lives of our young people so they themselves can become change makers for the next generation. Thank you so much to the committee and Chair Drum for the opportunity to speak and have a great night. We will now hear from Caitlin Chavez, followed by Xenia Sinclair. Starting time. Good evening. Thank you to the committee and chair for listening today. Thomas Edison once said, many of life's failures are people who did not realize how close they were to success when they gave up. In only two years of serving, Fair Futures has helped pave the way and uncover a bright future that is often lost in the experience of being in foster care. Our kids have come such a long way. With success finally at reach, we cannot give up now. My name is Caitlin Chavez. I am a young adult success specialist at Coalition for Hispanic Family Services and just one of many advocates fighting to give our youth a fair chance at having a fair future. Besides providing basic supports and resources, Fair Futures has allowed youth to identify with and become comfortable in a system that so often feels negligent. The harsh reality 
is that there's an abundance of youth who see ACS as the enemy, hate their agencies, and roll their eyes at the mention of help, support, or social worker. These kids have been through it all already, but they've never been through it all with Fair Futures by their side. As they begin letting their guards down and welcoming help, a sense of pride eventually develops, which inspires them to join youth advisory boards and understand how crucial this program and funding for it is. Not guaranteeing this funding would be taking away their sense of stability, almost like putting them back in the system for the first time. No check-ins for Chantel when she's fighting with depression and has no will to respond. No tutoring for Steph when she's been an A plus student, but the stressors of a global pandemic have made keeping up unbearable. No job placement support for Michelle when she already has to debunk the stereotypes attached to her by having a learning disability. Our youth are not defined by their current situations, but their futures are dependent on whether or not they receive the supports they need from Fair Futures to even visualize the success that lies ahead of them, which myself and all of my colleagues already see in our youth before we've even begun the work. From re-engaging this disconnected youth to providing a safe space for them to have a voice, Fair Futures is an absolute necessity in the foster care system and not baselining the funding for basic needs will be a disservice not only to our youth, but New York City as a whole. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Thank you. We will now hear from Xenia Sinclair followed by Destiny Kelly. Starting time. Thank you, honorable council, staff, and esteemed guests. My name is Zenia Sinclair, and I'm the Educational Supervisor of Youth Development at Forestdale. It's a youth family services agency headquartered in Queens. I'm asking for your support of the Fair Futures Initiative, as well as many other people here are, which I'm excited about. Um, the people that we're serving are young people in foster care who are given the foundation they need to succeed, and Fair Futures continues to be a phenomenal success. The initiative helps thousands of New York City young people find jobs, advance in school, obtain stable housing, and develop healthy relationships as they prepare to exit care. We are asking that you allocate at least 20 million for the coming year to ensure that these vital services are not cut. Right now, I'm thinking of a young woman I will call Raina. She came into care not knowing what the future would hold for her, and she grew up in an environment where she witnessed ongoing violence and drug abuse. With all the support that Fair Futures has, she was able to create a new life for herself with a, with a life coach. Um, and she worked with her on truly envisioning her future, setting goals, getting a driver's license so that she could access jobs and services and to also recommit to her education. We, we also provided her with tutoring through the Fair Futures funding and we, we advocated with her uh, for her through her first year of college to help her pass all her classes. And this, I just wanna say, this is all during the pandemic, which many of you have said, so many of our youth have been resilient in that way. And Fair Futures helps us to provide them the services to do that. So facing the, the pandemic alone in her dorm could have derailed her, uh, but with the Fair Futures staff and all the funding provided through that, she was successful and she was able to complete her first year of college. And she is planning a career in social work. We want to make sure that every young person exiting foster care across New York City has the same opportunity as Raina. Why? Because the national statistics for these youth are frightening. Only about 50% of older foster youth will have been employed by the age of 24. After Time expired. Okay, just a few, few more minutes, I promise, guys. I know we're at the end here. Still, there is good news. There are only about 8,000 New York City young people ages um, 15 through 26 who've been in care. And we can make sure that they, they get the supports through their coach, through academic help and career services. And this is what Fair Futures is about with the intense academic support that Fair Futures provide, uh, provide such as middle school tutoring, coaching, all the wonderful things that help these young people have great futures. We cannot give up on them. We must baseline the $20 million. This is what we're asking for the New York City Council to do for us. And the New York City Council has taken the lead on this and we are grateful. Um, we are extremely, extremely thrilled that you're understanding how important this is. And most important, thank you so much for, for all the efforts again, because they, our youth are thriving because of this program. And I'm a for, former foster youth myself. So when I was around, we didn't have fair futures and it was a tough road. So again, I, I'm just bringing to the table what we're asking for. Please baseline the $20 million. Thank you so much, all of you for your time and, and support. Thank you so much. 
I will now hear from Destiny Kelly and then I will try Dominic Cuevas one more time. Talk is ready. Good evening. Thank you to the council for holding this important hearing and for allowing me to speak. My name is Destiny Kelly and I'm a junior in high school. I have been in foster care for three years and I have came into care because my mom had caught a DUI. I'm here to, today to share my story and ask for your support in saving Fair Futures. Fair Futures staff have helped me to provide me with resources, um, connecting me with others and giving me their time among others. When I need assistance in any type of situation, I know that I can count on my team Agnac to help me at any time. For example, Shalanthia, my education specialist has not only provided me with academic support, such as, such as getting tutoring for SAT prep through the New York Foundling and helping me pre prepare for college, but also with career development support by helping me apply to summer youth employment. She has also provided me with support that I wouldn't have been able to get without Fair Futures. And she is also available anytime I need her. And for that alone, I am very grateful to have someone like Shalanthia that I can count on. I joined NAC's team group Hopes to Buy Kamal, my Fair Futures coach, and Shalanthia October. What I like about team group is the welcoming community feeling I gain from it. Although it is virtual, I still gain the in-person feeling um, when participating. Kamal and Shalanthia are very helpful in building this type of community because not only is it fun, but informational. So we learn about things and get the chance to hear um, others' opinions on important issues such as social justice and mental health. And also I like that Kamal and Shalanthia are basically like mentors because they let us take the lead on things. And I'm very grateful for the support that Fair Futures have provided me in order to achieve my academic and career development goals. All foster youth deserve this support in order to be successful adults and which is why Fair Future needs 20 million baseline. Thank you for again for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you for your testimony. Um, we will now hear from Dominique Cuevas, followed by Tamika Mapp. Clock is ready. Okay, we'll move on to Tamika Mapp, followed by Paula Jordan. Time begins. All right, thank you so much, Chairman Drum and the city council members for allowing me to testify today. My name is Tamika Mapp, state committee woman for the 68th Assembly District and a parent. I'm testifying as a parent, a community activist with AQE in East Harlem in the South Bronx and elected official for East Harlem. Our city government has a responsibility to invest in our children and seniors by allocating funds for oversaturated organizations such as the NYPD. Please consider reallocating the funds, following funds to help ensure our black and brown students and seniors do not get the short end of the stick. We need to invest 705 million to ensure each school has a nurse early screening for dyslexia. Invest in 445 million in infrastructure and tech, universal broadband and access to technology, ensuring we have a library and a librarian in each school so our students can understand how to thoroughly research fact from fiction and reduce class size. Invest in 1 billion for real investment in culture responsive school programming and give teachers the opportunity to adapt the curriculum to help each child. Invest in 1 million to support students who are differently able, support our students in foster care and the shelter system, and to ensure our oh goodness. English language learners and immigrant families have access to translation to ensure they can advocate for their children as well. Invest $1 million for universal child care and bring the current subsidy for family child care providers up to a living wage. Invest $2 million for our seniors to open our seniors and to ensure we have staff that will not abuse our seniors. Increase funding for older New Yorkers and direct home care service. The last point I will make today is we must end the school to prison pipeline by removing police officers Offices in our schools and ensuring we have trauma related mental health providers for each school, STEAM opportunities and civic engagement throughout the schools. I will be submitting a written testimony and I thank you for your time and I will leave you with this quote from Nelson Mendel. 
Our children are the rock on which our future will be built, our greatest asset as a nation. They will be the leaders of our country and the creators of our national wealth who will care for and protect our people and let's do right by our children. Thank you. We'll now hear from Paola Jordan, followed by Bella Week. Ak is ready. Thank you very much for the opportunity for being here today. My name is Paola Jordan, and I'm the co-director of the Metropolitan Parent Center at Synergia, one of the three federal funded parent training and information centers in our city. We provide training and information to families of children with disabilities, as well as the professionals that work with them. Our parent center is also a proud member of the Arise Coalition. I am also the parent of 13-year-old twins, both are in seventh grade and are attending a community school in District 3. My daughter is autistic and my son has a learning disability. However, I am here speaking on behalf of the Parent Center and the families it serves. I would like to discuss the need to invest in effective reading curricula and a small group reading supports for New York, New York City schools. Our public schools struggle to meet the academic needs of our students long before the coronavirus pandemic, where less than 50% of the students were reading professionally. During the last fiscal year, all the families who have contact our, our, who have contact our parent center looking for guidance include school age kids who are struggling in school. We observe that the students are on average at least two grades behind academically their, and their IEPs do not have clear language about evidence-based reading curriculum. And there is no additional support offered to the families. The only option they have to access additional services that will help their kids to close the academic gap is to pursue an impartial hearing, something that is difficult, especially if the family does not speak English or does not have representation. We would like to thank City Council for recommending $50 million for the new reading curricula in your response to the budget. The mayor's budget proposal has 500 million for academic recovery and student support, but has no information about how this money will be used. Please make sure that the final budget includes at least $50 million for evidence-based reading curriculum so that the teachers have the materials they need to teach students to read in the first place and at least $150 million to provide one-on-one -on -one small group interventions to students who need more help learning to read from, from staff who have the training and approaches that work. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for your testimony. We will now hear from Bella Week, followed by Tazin Azad. Clark is ready. Ms. Week, are you able to accept the unmute request? Okay, we'll move on to Tazin Azad, followed by Man Yak Yu. Time begins. Thank you so much, Chairman Drum and Council members for this opportunity to share my testimony. I am, uh, um, my name is Tazin Azad and I am a mother of three children as well as a selected parent leader. Um, I'm not going to waste um, your time, but I want to reiterate um, and reemphasize the importance of the budgetary lines and suggestions that uh, equity-centered advocacy groups such as CEJ, AQE, um, CACF, RJ, R, RJPS, um, and many other um, organizations have uplifted. Um, everything that they have said is vetted and, and um, uplifted and, and um, sort of advised by parents and students. And so that I am fully in support of those, uh, those recommendations. Um, I, we know that the budgets are moral documents. And so if not, we, sh we should also consider what it should, as, as we consider what it should include, we should also consider what it should not. Um, we have heard from our students as they explained how they do not want schools to um, include police. Um, consider that uh, as an, ad an adult New Yorker, we may or may not um, encounter a person in uniform, but as a, but our youngest learners, some as young as three, will, will go see uh, police officers at the beginning of um, at, at the beginning of their school entrances almost every day, um, as long as they enter a public school building. Um, and that should and that should um, really uh, make us guess, um, sort of reconsider what our moral compass is and where it is lies. Um, in addition, for folks like me, who is visibly Muslim, or folks who are undocumented, or folks who do not feel comfortable in presence of um, uniform, 
um, uh, how we could also consider where they, uh, how we consider them as part of uh, as part of our school system if we continue to uphold um, policing in school. Furthermore, um, I'm also offended by the tokenization. Let me explain. Thank you. Uh, we'll try again with Bella Week, and then we will go to Man Yakyu. Talk is ready. Okay, we will hear from Man Yakyu, followed by Robin Vital. I begin. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Manyak Yu, Executive Vice President and Chief of Staff at the Academy of Medical and Public Health Services, or AMPS. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. AMPS is a non profit healthcare organization in Sunset Park that works to bridge a health equity gap among communities of color by providing direct health services like clinical screenings and bilingual mental health therapy, health education, and social services to Latino and Chinese immigrant populations free of cost and regardless of immigration status. We are also a member of the 15% and growing campaign. Ms. Wong is an ESL student who initially came to us for help with her daughter's behavioral issues. She was undocumented and unemployed, did not speak English, and did not qualify for insurance. Because of a tenuous relationship with her daughter and the isolation experience from being undocumented, she laid in bed every night contemplating ending her life. COVID-19 aggravated the stress. Our team counseled her, helped her get connected to in-language family therapy services in Chinese, as well as NYC Well. Since the beginning of the pandemic, we have provided Ms. Wong's family with weekly food deliveries, and she is one of the 250 families that received cash assistance from the $150,000 that we have distributed to date. She is attending our adult literacy classes weekly, which besides serving as an educational space, has become a space for solidarity and support. And our Chinese-speaking community health worker checks in and offers regular health coaching to her. Today, I would like to urge the City Council to restore and baseline $12 million for adult for the Adult Literacy Initiative, which is cut by 15% in FY21, and advocate for restoring Article 6 funds for the Immigrant Health Initiative, which have also been cut from 20% to 10%, and has helped us offer these services for Ms. Wong. I'm also here to request your support for a $4 million investment in the Recovery and Healing for Asian American New Yorker Citywide Initiative to support social services by Asian American led and serving community-based organizations to address the rise in anti-Asian hate crimes and the disproportionate impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic um, and lay the groundwork for long-term healing for the Asian community. What has been a mental stressor in the past has now been exacerbated. Later upon fears and anxieties of COVID-19, our Asian community members are now faced with the fear of being attacked, brutalized, and spat on simply because of our race. And hate crimes against Asians have increased 1,900% across the city, with over 3,800 incidents of anti-Asian violence in the past year. And our members are feeling the stress and racism and harassment every day when they ride the subway or walk the streets. And anxieties are increasing. We have a waiting list of nearly 100 individuals seeking support from our free mental health therapy services, which we cannot meet by our current funding levels. We are one of few organizations offering bilingual therapy services and the need is high. And funding cuts this past year has meant that we were, able, we were not able to fund two of our, ther our therapist positions. We also need to institute measures to protect our most vulnerable community members from these recurring attacks. And the Recover and Healing Initiative will not only provide critical mental health services, but also provide funding to help expand social services for this population, offer bystander intervention self-defense workshops, provide support for services for vulnerable seniors and women who are impacted by the increased violence, and create community business safe haven program to protect communities from attacks. We are here for our communities, and we ask that you be here to make our work possible. And I humbly thank the City Council for supporting organizations like AMPS for making this work possible. And I will provide further testimony um, to expand upon, um, upon our request. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll now hear from Robin Vital, followed by Greg Mihalovich. Clock is ready. 
Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Chair Drum and the members of the City Council. Um, I regret that I'm at home right now without childcare, so you might hear some baby noises in the background, um, but greatly appreciate the opportunity to share the support of the American Heart Association for a few of our budget priorities. My colleague, Greg Mihalovich, is going to uh, come in behind us and cover the rest of our remaining list. Um, I am the chair, I'm sorry, the vice president of health for the American Heart Association here in New York City. Um, I'm going to spend my time talking about two key priorities, um, both of which have been key factors in the city's experience with the pandemic and particularly patient outcomes um, for New Yorkers that suffer from both hypertension as well as tobacco addiction. On the first issue, we are asking the city to invest an additional $1 million in support of the health department's work to help um, New Yorkers access necessary resources um, particularly as our city has pivoted to a telehealth model for accessing healthcare, we want to make sure that New Yorkers, particularly those that are uninsured or underinsured, are able to access blood pressure cuffs and needed support to help manage their, um, their hypertension. And this obviously is a key issue for us. Um, disparities were obvious and persistent before the pandemic, but became even more obvious um, during this past year's experience. Um, secondly, I want to focus on the tobacco control effort. Again, we asked the city to invest an additional $1 million to the Bureau of Tobacco Control. We know that uh, there's been a significant decrease in the Bureau of Tobacco Control's funding over the years. Um, both the experience that we've heard anecdotally over the last year with many New Yorkers um, turning to tobacco, um, as well as e-cigarettes. Um, plus the, uh, the burden that we knew existed before the pandemic with the implementation of the HUD rule, which created smoke-free housing for our low-income communities, as well as the expectation that uh, further tobacco control measures will be implemented um, in the months to come. We want to make sure that the Bureau of Tobacco Control is prepared to help low-income communities really access the necessary tobacco cessation services. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll now hear from Greg Mahanovich, followed by Laura Jean Hawkins. Time begins. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair Drum, members of the Council Committee. Uh, my name is Greg Mihailovich. I'm the Community Advocacy Director for the American Heart Association here in New York City. Uh, you know, at AHA, AHA, we believe that every person deserves the opportunity for a full and healthy life. And that's why we advocate for identifying and removing barriers to good health. And the written testimony is going to go into a little more detail. But I want to touch on a significant barrier, which is food insecurity. Uh, every family should have access to food that helps support a balanced diet and a healthier life. Uh, but unfortunately, as many as one in five New Yorkers are facing food insecurity. So uh, SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, helps reduce that food insecurity. But when SNAP recipients are given incentives to buy more fruit and vegetables, they actually spend more of their benefits on healthy foods and increase the quality of their diet. Uh, families buy the healthier options and it helps establish lifelong habits that support overall health and wellness. And it's important because higher intake of fruit and vegetables have been associated with uh, lower mortality rates. So we were very excited to hear that the city was matching a $5.5 million federal grant for a total $11 million investment in New York City SNAP and Center programs, uh, namely Health Bucks and Get the Good Stuff. Uh, but that's only a small step in, the, in meeting the overall need. To put it in perspective, uh, $11 million would just be an additional $5 a month for 185, 100,000 SNAP recipients. Uh, additionally, there's a New York City program called Get the Good Stuff, which offers, uh, sorry, uh, Pharmacy to Farm, which offers $30 in health bucks each month to SNAP recipients who fill a prescription for high blood pressure medication at select pharmacies. So not only are you getting your, high, your blood pressure meds, but you're also being prescribed healthy food to increase the, increase the quality of your diet to treat your hypertension. So our ask is, is the city actually double its match. So we're getting $5.5 million from the federal government. We're asking New York City to put in $11 million of city money for a, a total $16.5 million investment in these programs. Let's expand the reach and the effectiveness of uh, health bucks and get the good stuff. And uh, let's keep uh, pharmacy to farm rolling so New Yorkers who need it can get the food they need to live longer and healthier lives. Uh, thanks for your time. Have a great evening. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll now hear from Laura Jean Hawkins, followed by Chris Hartman. Good evening, uh, Chair yeah. Drum and members of the committee. My name is Laura Jean Hawkins, and I serve as advisory board chair of Astoria Queen Sharing and Caring, known to many of you as Sharing and Caring. Uh, it's been a long day, and I know you have more people that will follow me, 
So thank you all for staying the course. Um, I'm here today to urge the council to increase funding to the council's cancer services initiative and to support Sharing and Caring's FY22 funding request of $250,000. Last year, the world changed, uh, especially for our city's most vulnerable populations, including cancer survivors. At Sharing and Caring, we have experienced an increased demand for our services, over 25% from 2019, specifically for counseling and support and for emergent needs assistance. People who pre-COVID would have been considered housing, employment, and food secure are now reaching out to us for assistance with medical bills, transportation costs to and from treatment, rent, utilities, and food. This increased demand for our services continues to this day. In fact, yesterday I participated in a support group meeting and I heard firsthand the continuing fears and concerns by cancer survivors and the needs that they still need us to help them address. Increased funding from the council in FY2 for sharing and caring and other community-based cancer support organizations will enable groups like us to continue to serve our city's most vulnerable populations. On behalf of our board, staff, and those we serve, I thank you. We will now hear from Chris Hartman, followed by Rhonda Kaiser. Clock is ready. Hi, good evening. My name is Chris Hartman. I'm the board chair of the board of directors of Sure We Can, which is located in Hayden. Uh, today, I'm asking that uh, you, uh, Chair Drum, and any members, uh, that you ask Speaker Corey Johnson to pursue an economic development exemption at OMB Sure We Can's capital application. As you are aware, there are many members of the council that uh, do support Sure We Can's capital application, but the economic development exemption uh, stands in power. For those of you who are not familiar with can, it is the only organization that works in here. production, site, and individual economic empowerment uh, across the spectrum. Um, we advocate on behalf of an estimated 10,000 canners. These are people who pick up cans and bottles by the hood five cents at a time. Uh, sure, we can have buy canners. It continues to buy canners at all levels of the organization. Um, to me, sure we can, it's much more than a bottle reduction center. Um, it generates green jobs, it hosts educational business case across the college, uh, college students as well as all of here. Community space, public safe space. As you know, canners, uh, there are several cases last couple of weeks, canners being fast, uh, they eat. Um, so sure we can, it's a safe space where canners can do their work. Um, really, this is just a wonderful community. Over the last year, sure we can has been instrumental in helping canners uh, survive throughout the pandemic. We have distributed over 100,000 face masks to community members. We uh, have set up a uh, testing and vaccine type team, and we've also distributed multi level education materials. For these reasons and many, many more, I ask that you please support sure we can request capital funding and also that you. Uh, send Speaker Corey Johnson a special message to pursue economic development exemption at OMB so that sure we can, can receive the capital application, capital fund, so that we can purchase a lot in Bushwick uh, where we have been for more than 10 years. I thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. We will now hear from Rhonda Kaiser, followed by Ryan Castalia. Clock is ready. Hi, uh, I want to thank the City Council and Chair Chair Drum for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Rhonda Kaiser, and I proudly sit on the board of Sure We Can. And uh, as Chris said, it's New York's only nonprofit redemption center. Um, we're asking the council today to stand up on behalf of our often excluded waste management workers, um, our unique. Uh, 
organization has applied for a $2.3 million in capital funds to purchase a lot, our lot and to avoid eviction and protect our physical site from gentrification. If Sure We Can isn't able to continue its work, New York City will lose an integral partner in waste diversion and in community outreach with a proven uh, record of success a in both areas. No. So sure we can needs an economic development exemption from OMB to the capital funding requirement of three consecutive years of $50,000 or more in city contracts. There are currently no existing city contracts for community based management of metal glass plastic waste in New York City. This red tape and capital funding process is currently locking sure we can out of receiving city funding. As an organization who in our, in our 10 plus years of existence has clearly demonstrated proof of concept, as a chair drum has said in the past, we not only provide a fair and safe redemption center for people who redeem bottles and cans, but our low income entrepreneurs also contribute robustly to a 70% return rate for these materials. Surely the closest and longest working diversion rate of any materials in the city the, the city comes to and its stated goal of sending, sending zero waste to landfills by 2030. And if we're not able to raise the capital to purchase our lot because of these bureaucratic technicalities, we'll be forced to close our doors. So the board of Sure We Can is made up of 50% canners and we're committed to self-determination as a key to empowering our marginalized, our most marginalized in our community. Um, I'm sure that this capital funding process is not meant to undermine a grassroots organization like Sure We Can, who work on the ground every day, providing community and civic connection for our often marginalized members. Um, our members are, okay, our members, just, just so you know, we just wanna thank Chairman Drum for your support, your letter of support to OMB, um, asking to, them to honor our capital funding request. And we also wanna thank the co-signers of your letter, uh, Council members Reynoso, Rivera, Van Bramer, Riley, Ayala, Rosenthal, and Levine. More co-signers are coming in every day. As the most progressive New York City Council, we ask you to please help our remarkable organization to continue our proven grassroots waste diversion, community outreach, and economic self-empowerment, and allow us to continue to do this work with our community. Thank you very much today for listening for such a long time. Thank you. We'll now hear from Ryan Castalia, fo followed by Lee Goff. Clock is ready. Can I make rice? You guys want rice? Thank you so much to the council, to Chair Drum, and to all who are here for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Ryan Castalia. I serve as the executive director of Sure We Can, which you've already heard a lot about, which operates New York City's only nonprofit redemption center, serving canners, those who collect bottles and cans to earn income, who are freelance community level recyclers, pioneers in the circular economy and climate change resiliency, whose indefatigable work makes our lives measurably better. Canning reduces street litter by over 70%. It results in the diversion of over 200,000 tons of recyclables annually across the state at no cost to taxpayers. And in the case of our organization, supports the livelihoods of 950 low-income families through the distribution of over $700,000 annually into the community. Despite these undeniable contributions, New York City seems to prefer that canners work in the shadows. Canners represent an intersection of many severely underserved demographics, undocumented immigrants, non-English speakers, people of color, as well as those experiencing physical or mental disabilities or homelessness. Many are elderly, and everyone in New York City knows what the canners do. Most recognize the canners that work in their neighborhood. And yet these same canners we know to be integral to our communities work in the face of constant stigma, including racism and fear of assault, lack of basic labor protections, including unemployment insurance or access to pandemic relief and indifference to their humanity, dignity and agency through the faceless advance of gentrification that pushes them even further toward the margins. Today, that force takes the form of our community living under the threat of eviction from the space we've called home for over a decade. I'm here today to ask from the bottom of my heart that the city recognize the value of the Canner community by supporting our request for $2.3 million in capital funding to purchase our property and protect our community from dispersal and destruction. We've heard that our application cannot continue because we lack three consecutive years of direct city contracts of over $50,000. And this despite the fact that no such contracts, contracts exist for the work that canners and sure we can perform. This logic, even as many in the city government proclaim the need to invest in communities, in the marginalized, in sustainability and the circular economy, 
is self-defeating and absurd. We want to believe our leaders are serious about transforming the status quo and building a more supportive and sustainable city for all New Yorkers. I want to thank Chair Drum. I want to thank the sanitation chair, Antonio Reynoso, our local council member, for their support, and all the council members who have signed on to the letter that's currently circulating. In that spirit, we call upon the speaker and the rest of the council to do the right thing and aggressively push for an economic development exemption for sure we can to the city contracting requirement for capital funding. Please help us secure our future and the future of this very, very important work. And thank you so much for your time today. We'll now hear from Lee Goff, followed by Oliver Wright. Clock is ready. Hi, uh, I am Lee Goff, and um, I am here today speaking personally as a member of 350 Brooklyn. Um, and I just want to note that 350 is a grassroots, all grass, uh, all volunteer organization that works locally to address the climate crisis. And um, our organization has submitted um, written testimony as an organization. I just want to note that. Um, this is my personal testimony as a member of 350.org um, because I live in the neighborhood of Shore We Can. And I am today urging Speaker Johnson and the council to aggressively advocate for the Office of Management and Budget to grant an economic development exemption for the application of Shore We Can to purchase their headquarters site on 219 McKibben Street in Brooklyn. Because Shore We Can's landlord has given them an ultimatum to purchase or vacate, and because without the capital to purchase and no current avenue to raise capital under city regulations, the only way they could currently overcome this obstacle to their existence is for city council to waive the three-year city contract condition requisite to their ability to raise capital and continue to thrive. So I just wanna say about Sure We Can that they are a visionary organization of canners and they do extraordinarily valuable and um, almost unspeakably unrecognized environmental work. And um, at, they do this work at manifest occupational risk to themselves all throughout the pandemic. You hear canners every morning when you wake up. A lot of them are from Sure We Can. Um, these are brave workers performing vital green services for our community, indeed filling in where our city services fail us. They are essential workers diverting tens of millions of containers annually and distributing a most dignified income for hundreds of people who may not have um, other ways to live and thrive with dignity. Right that now, is this correct. is a free low carbon service to the city and they do not get paid salaries except for the worth of containers. They are the most vulnerable of the, the vulnerable. And um, they, I am asking you to um, waive the three-year city contract condition for sure we can. And not only that, but consider subsidizing this essential work. It should be subsidized and the humans that perform it should be recognized. Thank you very much. We will now hear from Oliver Wright, followed by Sean Bazinski. Time starts now. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. Uh, my name is Oliver Wright, and I'm uh, the chair of the Brooklyn Solid Waste Advisory Board, and our testimony relates principally to the budget for the Department of Sanitation. We welcome the financial commitment to improving waste management, and we do support the intent behind the initiatives outlined in the recent budget. However, we believe that as presented, the budget does little to establish the initiatives in a manner that's equitable and financially sustainable. And it also does not seek to promote the reduction of waste as the primary means of bringing cost and environmental benefits to the city. We have four key points to make around this. The first relates um, to the proposed reintroduction of curbside organic waste collections. The Brown Bin program previously struggled with participation, which made it a cost burden to the city, while its deployment only in selected neighborhoods led to issues of equity and access. Its proposed reintroduction will see the Brown Bins return in exactly the same neighborhoods on an opt-in basis, and therefore will leave the program vulnerable to failure on exactly the same terms as before. Secondly, the additional $33 million for waste export is a reflection of the increasing quantities of domestic waste as a result of COVID-19. 
And while this is understandable, there's an opportunity to offset this through initiatives around waste reduction and increasing recycling. There should be a budget for a concerted effort to make progress on both these fronts instead of sending valuable resources through environmental justice corridors by truck to landfill or incineration. Thirdly, the commitment to employ 10,000 staff for the Precision Street Cleaning Initiative offers a clear opportunity to work directly with redemption centres, such as Sure We Can, who we've just heard from at length, and who already employ a network of street teams throughout the city. In this way, the work of the informal economy can be recognised and compensated. And finally, the 4 million provision to implement commercial waste zones also offers the potential to embed equity by ensuring the inclusion and engagement of local family run haulers and micro haulers. This will ensure revenues from this program are not, are not funneled exclusively to a few large companies and will thereby retain money and jobs within the city and bolster the resilience of the program. In summary, we believe the initiatives outlined in this budget should be supported by appropriate resourcing of planning to ensure equity and financial sustainability in their implementation. Thank you very much. We'll now hear from Sean Bazinski, followed by Shane Coria. Thank you. Can Time you hear starts me? now. Well, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, so thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair Drum and, and other council members. Uh, my name is Sean Bozinski. I'm also on the board at Sure We Can, uh, who some other folks have discussed here today. And I'll send over some, uh, uh, some written testimony that I have. Uh, uh, what I wanted to focus on is a, a little bit on this community of people that we see out there every day, uh, picking up bottles and cans on our streets and who off, uh, so often go unrecognized. And they've never, uh, this community of, of five or maybe 10,000 people in New York City, we're not sure, has never really been organized and never, has never made a request, uh, certainly, uh, to city council for legislation or for funding. Uh, there's never been any ask. This, uh, this population has never asked for a thing. In fact, they survive as best they can, eking out a livelihood, right, five cents at a time. Uh, by virtue of the state bottle bill that enables them to make a livelihood. Uh, now, some people say, well, why don't they, why do they need a home? Why do they need a place to go and redeem their cans? Why can't they just go to the supermarkets where they have the machines? And the answer is there are limits that are imposed at those supermarkets, such that if you're just doing it a few bottles or cans, you're fine. But if you're doing it as a livelihood, you need a place to go. And so sure we can, uh, is that place to go, the only nonprofit center where this happens in the city. And we have a lot in, in, in Brooklyn, a big space where every day canners go and sort and pick up their five cents per, uh, per can or bottle. And you can see them every day going there if you want to. I've been there many times and it's an active place of, 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 of work, of, of organizing, where services are also done, where education, environmental education is also done. And so we're asking simply, uh, in this case, it was said uh, 2.3 million. We've, uh, we've raised most of that. It's, it's really a $1.2 million ask uh, of city council, a capital ask. Time uh, expired. We've raised, we've raised most of the money for the lot already. And we would greatly, this one time, I think this will be the only time that canners have asked or will ask for council funding, and we'd greatly appreciate it to save this space and to save this community. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear from Shane Coria, followed by Felicia Smith. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you, members of the New York City Council, for allowing me to testify today. My name is Shane Coria, and I'm the Deputy Director of Government Partnerships at the Center for Court Innovation. I wanna focus this testimony on the most time sensitive issues impacting our programming and cuts in funding that were made during the pandemic. During the fiscal year 21 budget, our funding under the Innovative Criminal Justice Initiative was halved. This funding permits us to flexibly respond to the immediate needs we see in our communities, pilot solutions and evaluate their impact. Due to COVID, we focused on housing stability, mental health responses and domestic violence programming. For example, in the Midtown area, the available funding supported our community first model where credible messengers do outreach to individuals experiencing street homelessness. We eventually build up the trust with them so that they can connect with the social worker back at the Midtown Community Court. If any of these individuals end up arrested for low level crimes, their mandates are tied to their social service needs and the same social service team that we built a relationship with them through. 
This kind of integration between social services and justice involvement is something we want to explore in more of the sites throughout New York City on other pressing issues. But because of the cuts we experienced last year, we had to make hard choices. Specifically, there was a reduction in support for anti-gun violence programming, child trauma uh, support, and DWI screenings and assessments, while traffic safety deaths reached some of the highest levels since the start of Vision Zero. We asked council to support a return to pre-pandemic levels, or more so, so that we can continue to pilot solutions, evaluate their impact, and inform public, pol public safety policy uh, with evidence of what works. Separately, the future of Project Reset remains uncertain. Briefly, Project Reset is a program that takes low-level arrest out of the court process if a person completes voluntary programming before their arraignment. Due to the pandemic, funding was cut by the administration with services stopping in Brooklyn, Queens, and Staten Island. While there is a short-term plan to leverage funding from the points of agreement, which is intended for a broader array of diversion, we're still uncertain whether Reset will relaunch at the start of the new fiscal year or due to delays much later, which would impact what we I'm have expired. to show uh, when we report back next March. Um, very quickly, we, we've already had to let staff go at multiple sites once during the pandemic, and the lack of clarity will impact access to this diversion for New Yorkers as we wait to find out when we restart the process of rebuilding back in that program infrastructure. Thank you so much for the time. We'll now hear from Felicia Smith, followed by Kathy Price Park, uh, Kathy Park Price. Time starts now. Thank you. On behalf of Youth Justice Network, I thank the Committee on Finance for the opportunity to speak. My name is Felicia Mosley Smith, and I am the Associate Executive Director at Youth Justice Network. We were founded over 30 years ago as Friends of Island Academy at the Alternative High School on Rikers Island. We recently changed our name to Youth Justice Network to better reflect who we are and to dissociate from the legacy of Rikers Island. I came to our organization four years ago to help lead our youth reentry network, an innovative four year New York City pilot demonstration, which became a model for transitional and neighborhood based post release services. In partnership with over 30 youth based organizations, Youth Justice Network engaged 3,600 young people in jail upon their admission, of whom 2,900 were discharged to neighborhoods across New York City and supported by our small army of neighborhood-based youth advocates. The power of those lifelines is clear. Nearly 60% of our youth voluntarily connected with their advocates after their release from custody. The Nunez Monitor's 11th report points to DOC's structural inability to keep young people safe while in custody at Rikers. Hiring more correction officers won't make young people or community safer or provide them the services and tools they need to be successful once they leave jail, nor will it reduce the likelihood of recidivism. The way to make people and community safer is to start shifting the balance of the financial investment away from custody and into community. As just one example, the average annual cost of the youth reentry pilot represents one third of 1% of the DOC's proposed 2022 budget. Today, there are fewer than 50 18-year-olds held on Rikers Island. It is a group small enough and young enough to create alternative settings to long-term detention, not to advance further violence and indignity. We ask City Council, we ask City Council to redirect I'm and commit intentional investment to support young people involved in the correctional system in ways that allow them to grow, learn, and thrive. This is how to ensure public safety. Thank you for the opportunity to address this committee. We'll now hear from Kathy Park Price, followed by Gabby Torres. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Drum, the Finance Committee, and extra credit for anyone who's been on the call since it began nine hours ago. Um, my name is Kathy Park Price, and I'm a public schools advocate. Um, as a member of the Panel for Educational Policy, but I'm here today as the founder and administrator of Garden Train, the Public School Gardens Consortium, and a member of the Playfair Coalition. One of the reasons I'm testifying is to advocate for the full funding of our parks, um, and it serves our students too. This
I think we lost we lost her. Mark Price. So we'll move on to Gabby Torres, followed by Josefa Marin. Time starts now. Hello, hola, my name is Gabby Torres. I've worked at Sure We Can for almost a year and a half now. Over this past year during the pandemic, we, I have personally led me weekly mass distributions in our neighborhood, taking community members to go get tested for COVID and taking community members to go get the vaccine. Um, I've seen our community really survive this pandemic and working at the desk at Sure We Can every day, I've seen people who have found themselves out of work turn to canning and turn to recycling as a way to put food on the table. But even before the pandemic, Sure We Can has been facing a crisis. For the past few years, we have been trying to evade eviction by acquiring capital funding in order to purchase our lot. This constant fear of moving has really kept us in a state of limbo, which prevents us from doing our important work to the greatest capacity. We need an economic development exception to the capital funding requirement for three consecutive uh -oh. years. Come here. Um, Informal waste picking is leading currently a global movement to reorganize and redesign waste management systems around the world because waste management systems around the world as the one in this city are failing at an astronomical pace. And canners pay a huge role in keeping informal waste pickers in general and canners in, in New York City play a huge role in keeping single use plastics and aluminum within our waste system. As a city, we need to be exploring how we can improve our waste management systems and canners have been exploring this for decades now. If our mission resonates you, if the work that we are doing here at Sure We Can to support, represent, and empower canners, informal workers, recycling, and recyclers to be at the center of this conversation of redesigning the way our city deals with our waste, please use your voice and your position of power to speak up and grant us this much needed exception. I hope it goes without saying, but I feel obliged to mention that in 2021, we are experiencing a global climate crisis currently, and this is only the beginning. The actions we take this year have impact on this climate crisis, every action, and we must take actions with prioritized environmental justice movements and spaces and share with environmental justice. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now hear from Josefa Marin, followed by Camila Silvano. Time starts now. Hola, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Josefa Marin. Uh, soy miembro de la Junta Directiva. Oh, lo siento, parece que mi audio no está sirviendo muy bien. No sé. Uh, please continue, Ms. Marin. Continúa, por favor, si puede. Hola, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Josefa Marín. Soy miembro de la Junta Directiva de Iglesias de Sur Weekend. Y soy una recicladora también. Y me dirijo a ustedes, el portavoz Johnson y el concejal municipal, quienes pueden darnos un apoyo que necesitamos para, para el lote de Sur Weekend. El Sur Weekend es un lugar único especial para nuestra comunidad aquí en Brooklyn, en Bushwick. Es como una segunda casa para todos nosotros, para la comunidad. Y pues es un lugar especial, lo hace especial por, para nuestra gente de la tercera edad y quisiéramos conservarlo, quisiéramos tenerlo porque pues para todos es, es un lugar muy especial para nuestra gente de la tercera edad mayormente que que se reúnen ahí, estamos ahí, los hacemos pasar un, un, este, unos momentos agradables. Y si este lugar se desaparece, pues, ¿qué haríamos? ¿Qué haría nuestra gente de la tercera edad sin ese espacio? Ese espacio para nosotros es muy valioso. Es un lugar que donde todos nos sentimos como que en casa, compartimos todo ese espacio y ojalá y que que nos escuchen y que nos apoyen para ese espacio. Muchas gracias y por su atención. Josefa is a member of Sure We Can. She was here today to advocate on behalf of the canners. Uh, she would like us to make sure that we work with them to uh, be able to secure the space in Brooklyn and uh, she uh, is very much in support of that. And she hopes that the city council will be able to support the request for the canners at Sure We Can.
Muchísimas gracias, José. Let's go to our next person. Yes, Chair. Um, we will now hear from Camila Salvano, followed by Renee Del Carmen. Hello, everyone. Time starts now. Hello, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Camila Salvano. I am the Community Development Program Coordinator at Sure We Can. We are, like my colleagues have said, we are a not-for-profit redemption center, a place where folks who collect bottles and cans are able to exchange these recyclable materials for money. We serve a large population of majority full-time independent expert recyclers known as canners and also folks doing this work part-time that have discovered a spontaneous source of income in New York City. Sure We Can offers two vital services. First, we provide canners with an economic possibility of life in a city where so many are excluded from secure work. Second, our canners provide a service to the city by reducing litter, contributing to current sustainability efforts and ultimately beautifying the cityscape. Sure We Can provides to all the possibility of survival. If you were to step foot onto our lot, you would see an efficient and highly productive recycling operation built and run by canners without any assistance from the city's legislation. You would feel a tight-knit community that operates under the ethos of acceptance and protection. And you would witness the outcome of over a decade's worth of irreplaceable community outreach that is threatened to be displaced due to the circumstances we are here to discuss. Today, over 900 canners bring their recyclable materials to Sure We Can annually. Thanks to their hard work, over 10 million bottles and cans are redeemed annually that otherwise could have ended up in the landfill or in our water. Canners spend their days on foot. We all see them navigating the bumpy terrain of the city with their carts full of containers. I personally feel a great sense of relief knowing that after a long day of this hard work, canners can arrive at Sure We Can and be met with a welcoming environment. I'm Stay expired. Am I, can I finish please? Yes, please. I, I'm glad, I, I feel comfortable, I feel a great sense of relief knowing that after a long day of this hard work, canners can arrive at Sure We Can and be met with a welcoming environment, space to comfortably sort their materials and access donations of food, clothing, and PPE. We are asking for the New York City Council to support us to keep Sure We Can intact. We need an economic development exemption to the city contract requirement in order to continue our pursuits of capital funding. The ability to purchase our lot would quell the anxiety of our community. It is time that New York City recognize the Canner community by protecting sure we can from destruction. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we're gonna go back to Kathy Park Price who was cut off mid testimony before and then move on to Alan LaForest. Time starts now. Hi there. Hi there, can you hear me? Hello? Yes. Hi. Oh, okay. Sorry, I was cut off earlier. I moved today and I don't have Wi Fi, and, but I really wanted to participate in today's hearing. Um, thank you again so much, Chair Drum and the Finance Committee members. I was saying earlier that I'm a public schools advocate as a pet member, but I'm here as the founder and administrator of Garden Train, the public school gardens consortium. Um, this year, Garden Train advocated for the implementation of outdoor learning for our students to provide a healthier environment because as we learned, it was healthier um, to be outside. It was a successful initiative that involved several agencies, including the DOE, the NYPD, DOT, parks. Um, the chancellor has said recently that she would commit um, to commit to continuing to explore outdoor learning and to um, keep it as part of the school's um, reopening plan. So when we look at the largest school district in the country with its 1.1 million students, we that's one example of how we are expecting more from our parks. And um, I respectfully request that 
the funding is restored to our parks because as we have learned during COVID, parks are critical infrastructure, not only for our students, but for all New Yorkers. And the other reason I'm here today is to advocate for the funding of the allocation of funding to reduce class sizes. Um, As Chair Drum said much earlier in today's hearing, one thing that we know that works is that that the DOE hasn't tried is the reduction of class sizes. I would add that we have yet to have a meaningful conversation about this, a serious conversation. And when we talk about important and ambitious programs, we find the funding, we find the space. And that is one of the initiatives um, that will, that where now is the time to, um, to address. You know, even in normal times, the research shows that smaller class sizes lead to better outcomes for all kids. So I thank you for your attention on these matters. And um, that's my testimony. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathy. And I can't believe that you got to give testimony on the day of your moving. That's very dedicated. Thank you so <laughs> I'm much. committed. Thank you. You are committed. Drum. Thank you, Kathy. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, actually, we're going to go back now to Renee Del Carmen, who I called before and then inadvertently missed before continuing on with Alan LaForest. Time starts now. Uh, one second. Mm -hmm. uh, I speak in Spanish. Consejo Municipal, expreso mis más sinceros saludos. Mi nombre es René del Carmen. Hace más de siete años que trabajo en Short Weekend como representante del centro de Canje. Antes de este rol, yo era un reciclador por muchos años trabajando en Manhattan. Paso a lo siguiente. Como ser humano, la vida que tengo en New York me ha hecho conocer las muchas necesidades de nuestra comunidad neoyorquina. Conozco las calles y a diferentes personas, todos buscando cómo sobrevivir. Recuerdo casi más de una década nació Short Weekend, el único centro de canjeo sin ánimos de lucro en la ciudad de Nueva York. Además de ser un centro de canje, ofrecemos actividades de jardinería, compost y proyectos para estudiantes que impulsan el desarrollo comunitario. Asimismo, ayudamos a más de 900 personas a vender sus materiales reciclados, desarrollando una economía para ellos para que puedan cumplir sus gastos de vivencia. Y claro, desviamos el plástico del mar y los ríos, que por último, por último ayuda a aliviar la crisis medioambiental. También con esta manera, reciclar de esta, estamos ahorrando el gasto de un tanto por ciento en barriles de petróleo. Soy testigos de poder de nuestros líderes. Hoy aquí, hoy estoy aquí para que todos ustedes puedan escucharme. Yo no soy poderoso ni de corbata, pero sí un ciudadano como muchos de, de mis compañeros. Hemos visto miles de toneladas de plástico y vidrio, aluminio, todo reciclado. Miramos la enorme fuerza hecha por Short Weekend para ayudar al medio ambiente, así como me apoyan a la comunidad de Brooklyn. Muchos de nosotros, como muchos en la vida, tenemos problemas que ningún doctor podría curar por el hecho de reciclar en las calles. Se ha vuelto como una terapia psicológica. Se siente uno más útil para nuestra sociedad. Nosotros fabricamos, no fabricamos dinero ni oro, pero el trabajo que hacemos, sin embargo, es muy importante. Ayudamos a mantener la ciudad limpia y a, redu a reducir la contaminación. Eh, Tiempo, hoy estoy aquí. Time. Ok. Hoy es, pues gracias por su fina atención y muchas gracias. Okay. Muchísimas gracias uh, por, por venir. Es un placer oír su historia. René said that he is a candidate also, that he's come to the city council to give his greetings and to ask for support. For the canners in Brooklyn, uh, not only do the canners uh, make a living out of uh, collecting the uh, the bottles and the plastic and helping to recycle it, um, but it also helps to keep New York City clean. And he's come today to basically ask us for support for the organization and for the work that they do. They're not rich. They don't wear suits. They don't wear ties. But they're important people, and they deserve uh, the opportunity to uh, have this organization and to. Uh, support uh, the canners and sure we can. Gracias, Rene. Thanks so much for everything. Thanks for help. 
We'll now hear from Alan LaForest, followed by Lauren Bradley. Time starts now. Thank you, Speaker, um, Chair Pearson, Drum, and the Finance Committee members for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Alan LaForest, and I'm a Master of Science and Library and Information Science candidate at Pratt Institute. Prior to Pratt, I received my Bachelor of Arts in <coughs> Language and Literature from Brown University. I was awarded as a Social Innovation Fellow for founding the Science Bowl Pilot Program, a summer program to promote a STEM-based academic tournament for Rhode Island High School students. More recently, I volunteered as an individualized literacy tutor and mentor with the Reed 718 program in Bedford-Stuyvesant, a nonprofit that serves students in grades three through eight. The experience reminded me of going to the library on weekends with my father. My father is a clerk with the New York Public Library who'd take me to work with him. This ultimately led to me pursuing a career as a librarian. As a librarian, I'm passionate about developing young adult services through collection and program development that holistically serves the needs of all teens in the community. Librarians are essential workers who supplement the efforts of educators throughout the city. Funding for libraries is important to maintaining the pipeline of talented individuals who wish to enter the profession. Many of my fellow upperclassmen have been furloughed from positions in the New York, Brooklyn, and Queens public libraries. Without funding, many talented librarians who hope to serve the city are seeking opportunities elsewhere. On behalf of Urban Librarians Unite, I ask that you commit to funding our city's libraries. Thank you so much, Speaker, Chairperson Drum, and the Finance Committee members for both your time and consideration. Thank you so much, Alon. We will now hear from Lauren Bradley, followed by Lauren Comito. Time starts now. Hello, my name is Lauren Bradley and I'm testifying today with Urban Librarians Unite. I want to thank the committee chair, committee members, and Speaker Johnson for the opportunity to testify today. Unlike my library colleagues who will also testify, I personally do not work in a public library. I am an academic librarian working at a small private college in Manhattan. I'm very proud of this college library, but I'm equally proud to be an unofficial New York City Public Libraries ambassador for my college community. As a college library, we only provide services that directly support our curriculum. However, our students, faculty, and staff are dynamic, holistic people with interests and needs that go beyond our scope. The public libraries are key for providing the services and materials that we as a college library cannot possibly cover. I constantly make referrals to the public libraries, which is why I am here tonight to lend my support to them. A few examples of these referrals from the past month, I helped an adjunct instructor sign up for NYPL's interlibrary loan service so she could continue working on a book project in her quest for full-time employment. I introduced a new graduate and budding entrepreneur to the extensive resources available through the Thomas Yosseloff Business Center at the brand new Mid-Manhattan location. I also emailed a student instructions on how to download and use the public library's e-reader app, Simply E, so she could continue reading her way through the tedious boredom of staying home, the responsible thing to do during a global pandemic. These are the types of services that make our public libraries incredible world-class institutions of learning and access available to everyone in New York City. I urge this committee to continue to invest in our public libraries. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And we're big believers in libraries, so thank you. We will now hear from Lauren Comito, followed by Jazz Lita. Time starts now. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Lauren Comito. I'm the board chair of Urban Librarians Unite, a nonprofit dedicated to supporting and advocating for library workers in urban areas and libraries in urban areas. Um, I wanna thank the committee chair, members and Speaker Johnson for the opportunity to testify today, but also thank you for your vital support in past years. It's been deeply appreciated. 
Libraries are a space and a service that works to amplify the potential of our neighbors. And library workers in our city have worked tirelessly during this pandemic to maintain connections in our neighborhoods through virtual programs like story times, employment help, and grab and go book lending. That support goes both ways though. And sometimes the community comes out to reciprocate and help build connections with the library. Uh, just a few weeks ago, over 25 neighbors came out to volunteer to clean up and beautify the backyard at the Leonard Library in Williamsburg and turn it into an outdoor reading room. Uh, because of the work of these neighbors, the mutual aid, the friends group, and all these volunteers, we're now able to provide a space for patrons to safely use Wi-Fi and plug in their laptops, for parents to sit with their kids and read, and for people to, for us to start to do story times at outdoor ukulele meetups. Um, this green sort of bird filled and God, the birds are so loud, oasis in the middle of Williamsburg wouldn't be available without their help. And libraries won't be as available to the public without your help. Uh, providing library service in a pandemic is hard work, but we are up to it. And by pushing back on the mayor's budget cuts, you can help us continue to create these oases in our communities. And I hope you will. Uh, please invest in our neighborhoods, in our neighbors, in our communities by investing in the heart of those communities, our libraries. Thank you. We'll now hear from Jazz Zulita, followed by Juana Flores. Time starts now. That background didn't work out for me. Uh, thank you uh, to everyone uh, for allowing me to speak today. Uh, my name is Jazz Frederick Zulita. I am a transgender librarian at the Brooklyn in public library and I'm also a member of the Urban Librarians Unite board. Um, I in my daily work uh, and throughout the pandemic have uh, thought to bring uh, resume and career help services to our library patrons. Normally we would travel to them in various neighborhood locations to help folks create a, a new resume to apply to jobs, to find other training opportunities to help advance their careers. Um, during the pandemic, we had to pivot to virtual. Although it's not the same uh, and our capacity is much reduced uh, and there are technical barriers, we still have reached over 500 people during the pandemic to help them with resume revisions, cover letters, and to really help them target their uh, career search during a really difficult time. Um, we also are doing a lot of work uh, right now to um, make sure our libraries are truly welcoming, open and uh, valid and safe places for transgender people. And um, we need library funding in order to be able to help career seekers, to uh, help queer members of the community and to support the librarians who are doing this work. Uh, thank you so much for your time, and I'm done. Oh, I just want to say I love Transgender Library, so <laughs> thank you for being here. I'm waiting for the musical performance. <laughs> I see some ukuleles and some people waiting all day, and I'm waiting. Council, can you call up the uh, next witnesses? Yes. So we will now hear from Juana Flores, followed by Kat Savage. Time starts now. So good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Juana Flores, and I'm a children librarian, as well as a ukester, a ukulele player for the Brooklyn Public Library and other public library in New York City. I testify today with the Urban Librarian Unite. I want to thank the committee's chair committee members and Speaker Johnson for the opportunity to testify today. After viewing a man get lynched a year ago to this day, actually it happened May 25th, many of us children librarians felt the need to combat systemic racism in every aspect of our, li our librarianship. We developed and created the anti-racism story time and stream it to our patron via Facebook and Zoom. Many may not be aware, but children see race as early as six months. Therefore, we believe that we need to overturn 
the impl implicit biases we adults instill in our children by our own behavior. Therefore, our st story time focuses on social equity and justice, teaching about empathy, self-actualization, -act and that each person matters regardless of gender preference, body types, ethnicity, or race. Librarians across New York City are using their skills to help build a better community, and you can help us by providing the funding that allows us to do that. Uh, also taking the time to learn an instrument while we was quarantined, and I'm gonna leave you with this song. Thank you so much. Uh, we will now hear from Kat Savage, followed by Lisa Marie Vargas. Time starts. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Kat, and I'm testifying with the Urban Librarians Unite. I want to thank committee chair Drum and the committee members for the opportunity to testify today. I'm a children's librarian at a public library in New York City. And in 2020, I learned how to do my job all over again quickly learning digital tools and ways to present my story times to children and their families, whether on Facebook Live or Zoom. Story times are a cornerstone of early learning, and we are grateful also for the support of the City Council's City's First Readers Initiatives, which supports New York City families. That said, broad support for libraries, including operating funds and capital budgeting, is necessary for us to provide consistent and high quality services to all kinds of New Yorkers. Children introduced to reading and books early on do better in school than their peers who have less access. We know that by doing five simple things every day, reading, talking, singing, writing, and playing, will enable parents and caregivers to prepare their children to get ready to read. I spent over a year sharing my story time from home as well as the library. Uh, I saw a patron recently who was so grateful to have the consistency um, uh, when we took it first on Zoom and uh, was, it was really nice to hear that from, from somebody. Um, I wanted to take 30 seconds and also share with you a favorite song of uh, the kids and one that you might know too. So here we go. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands, clap them. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands, I see ya. If you're happy and you know it, and you really want to show it. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands and say, library. I yield the rest of my time with tremendous gratitude. Thank you. Well, you have really livened up this hearing. I got to tell you, what time is it now? 7.43, I wish I could keep you for another hour. <laughs> But uh, yes, you have made an impression that uh, it's a lasting impression and one that I'll remember. Thank you so much. If both of you, those are both ukuleles? Yes, sir. Oh boy, we gotta have ukulele library time and uh, in Jackson. Um, yes, it is a ukulele and we doing um, a pandemic our librarians. We got very creative and uh, we all decided to learn how to play a ukulele as well. And in our, our own time, uh, we volunteer our own time on Sunday and we meet up to practice various children's songs. So, yeah. Well, you know, one of my favorite uh, singers is Bette Midler and she plays the ukulele too. So you got to my heart, believe me. <laughs> so since you say that, I'm gonna play the Rose. I think she's the Rose, the song, right? She sings. Oh yeah, yeah, yep. Thank you so much. I really appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Thanks for coming in, okay. Thank you. We will now hear from Lisa Marie Vargas, followed by Cheyenne Depersot. Time starts. 
Hello, good evening, everyone. That's definitely a hard act to follow. That music was excellent. <laughs> um, my name is Lisa Marie Vargas. I'm the Director of Family Foster Care at Lutheran Social Services of New York, and I'm here today to advocate for the Fair Futures Program, which we've heard much of throughout the day. Um, as this council is aware, we are calling on the city to baseline 20 million to save fair futures and to continue to provide foster youth with the supports that they need to be successful adults. Out of the approximately 125 children and youth that are placed with Lutheran Social Services, the average length of time in foster care is three and a quarter years, with 18 of our children being placed in foster care for five or more years and four that have been in foster care for over 10 years. Of the 18 youth that have been in foster care for five or more years, eight of those youth have a goal of what we call independent living. Those eight children have spent most of their life in foster care. So the idea of aging out often brings anxiety and fear over the sudden lack of consistent support. Having a coach who will work with them to ensure their successful transition to adulthood would have lasting benefits for these young adults. In recent communication with former foster youth, our agency has identified several key areas where youth struggle once they leave foster care. This includes financial literacy and budgeting, housing support, and educational and vocational achievement. Youth with these struggles would benefit from the assistance of a coach who can provide emotional support, guidance, and direction both before and after their 21st birthday or that aging out date. One young adult the agency spoke to said that since leaving foster care, her life has gone off course. Another said that she's felt lost since leaving our residential program because there was nobody to help her navigate adulthood. Many young adults have expressed an interest in working with a coach to help them circumvent the challenges they have faced since leaving foster care. In 2019, Lutheran launched the Dreamers Program, a Fair Futures funded program named by the young adults currently in our program. A young adult also designed our program logo that we are proud to prominently display on all of our flyers and letterhead. The funding provided in the New York City budget allowed the time expired to hire ooh, just a little bit longer, two full-time coaches. Um, one of them was spoken about earlier, Egypt, who has done amazing things with our young adults. Just last week, three of them were escorted to the DMV to test for their permit after just a little bit of study time and all three passed, which is a valuable tool for future growth. In conclusion, Lutheran is dedicated to the continued building of the Dreamers program, but this building will not be possible without appropriate funding through the annual budget. Young adults have been an integral part of the structure, design, and implementation process, and their voice must be heard. Lutheran is committed to this model and has seen the clear effects on young adults who receive coaching and other services through the Fair Futures program. The program provides opportunities for youth to practice skills and gain valuable life experience. With active participation of young adults and the straightforward inclusion of their thoughts, opinions, and feedback, Fair Futures aims to create healthy, independent and confident young adults who meet their educational and vocational goals, both while in foster care and long after leaving placement. This should be the ultimate goal of all social service activities and the goal of this council, to better the lives of the most vulnerable young adults in New York City. Fully funding the Fair Futures program is a significant and important step in achieving that goal. Again, we are calling on the city to baseline 20 million to save Fair Futures and continue to provide foster youth with the support that they need to be successful young adults. Show them that they matter because they do. Thank you. Thank you so much. We will now hear from Cheyenne DePerso, followed by Demetrius Napolitano. Time starts now. Um, thank you, Chair Drum. Thank you for um, listening to us today. I sat on this call since 10 a.m. so I know exactly how you feel. Uh, I've been here since 10 a.m. with you, right here with you. I just wanted to say that I have been in the system for about, since I was 15 years old. Right now, I'm 19 years old. I go to John Jay. I'm a freshman there. And when I first came into the system, I could tell you the horror stories of my whole entire life. I could tell you about my past. I could tell you that my mom died when I was two years old, that my dad abused me physically, mentally, emotionally, whatever, you name it, since till I was 15 years old. I went into the foster care system at 15 and I think it was one of the best decisions I've ever made because when I got into there, I got a Fair Futures coach and she definitely was there for me as that mother figure. She showed me how to be, how to do everything from like my first period to schoolwork to sobbing to her crying at 12 a.m. about my boy problems. And this is not the first 
you know, instance that this has happened. I feel truly blessed that I have a Fair Futures coach to this day. And I feel like that I wouldn't know what to do without my Fair Futures coach. I think that this organization and me just sitting here since 10 a.m., you know, willingly, I didn't even go to work today. I, I didn't go to work today because I wanted to come and share with you how important this organization and this is for all the other thousands of <clears throat> youth in foster care in New York, how important this is to us. I know that I could definitely not have survived this pandemic in uh, a foster home without my coach. Even though everything is virtual, she still means the world to me. And I know that she's one of those people that's gonna be there through thick and thin because I haven't had that, you know, motherly support. I haven't had that family figure. I haven't had anything to, you know, say that this is mine and this person is here to truly help me. And I don't want other kids to go without a coach or how to say that they never have had one. And I wanted to say, the last thing I wanted to say was that please help other youth in foster care because this organization, this this is really important to me and other youth in the system. And I know that baseline this will help every other youth, every single youth in the system and it'll make a big difference. And investing in us will definitely, will show you. Thank you, Cheyenne. You know, um, it's, it's people like you who give me hope for the world and for the future. And uh, the fact that you've been here since 10 o'clock in the morning is just amazing. And I um, mean, I don't know, I, I, I didn't think anybody could beat the ukuleles, but uh, your testimony certainly has put a smile on my face and hope in my heart. And I just thank you for staying, you know, all this time because hearing your story, um, it, it, it'll make us very hard not to do what you asked us to do. <laughs> thank you thank so you much. Thank you. Thank and you. I know, I. I know Councilmember Adams is here and she wants to say a few words also to you. Thank you, Cheyenne. Definitely. Time starts now. Hello, my love. How are you? Doing so well. <laughs> Doing what I do best. <laughs> Cheyenne, um, I, I just can't tell you how proud I am of you um, to know you. And like I said to you on our one-on-one -on, -one on Instagram a couple of weeks ago, we got to hang out because you are mine. And um, a daughter of Richmond Hill, you and I are going to hang out um, very, very soon. Um, I got to get your information, though, so that we can um, get together. And I mean that. Um, I want you to come to my house. I want, I want a lot of stuff for you and me. So I already told you this. <laughs> you are mine, and I am yours. And I just wanted to make sure to reinforce that. Um, I am going to be fighting with everything in me. You already know that to baseline. Uh, Fair Futures, um, one of the best organization for our youth out there. So um, keep on looking up, my darling, and uh, we're going to do everything that we can to make sure that you're taken care of, that your colleagues are taken care of, your coaches, because you so, so deserve it. And we're so proud of you, Cheyenne. So, so proud of you for hanging out and hanging on all day long. I'm on three different devices. I saw you pop up and I said, there's my baby. Let me get on here and let me just let her know <laughs> how much I, I appreciate you and uh, you're doing such a great job. All right. Thank you so much. That means the world to me. I just hope that we can get this baseline. Me too. Me too. We're going to do everything that we can to do that. Take Thank care. Thank you guys so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> we'll now hear from Demetrius Napolitano, followed by Catherine DeLeon. Time starts now. Um, hi. Uh, just real fast, I'm going to read my testimony and then uh, Angel, uh, his last name is Villamere, I believe. Uh, he's in a hospital after he attempted suicide, so he's not here. Uh, if that's okay, speaker, it'll just be an extra 30 seconds. So my name is Demetrius Napolitano, and I am testifying today to ask the mayor and the city to baseline 20 million in support of Fair Future so young people in foster care can have the one-on-one -on -one supports they need to thrive. When I was two months old, I was placed into the New York City's foster care system where I spent the next 21 years of my life I lived in nearly 30 different homes, experienced a failed adoption, experienced all forms of trauma and abuse, and then aged out of the system. However, the system did give me one support that forever changed my life's trajectory. Someone who believed in me, someone who never gave up on me. At the time, we didn't have Fair Futures funding for coaches, but this one agency staff 
embodied exactly what a Fair Futures coach does today. She met me on my level, provided me with the emotional support, and was the first person to believe in me and my goals and dreams and help me see them through. Today, because of that one-on-one -on -one support I received from my coaches and mentors over the years, and because of my innate re resilience and the potential that my Myself and the foster youth have. I am proud to say that I represent the 20% of foster youth with a high school degree and 3% with a bachelor's degree. I received my BA from NYU and have been a professional speaker, mentor, and advocate for over 10 years, including on Capitol Hill. I recently launched my own nonprofit called Fostering Meditation and traveled to India to receive deep training and certification in yoga, meditation, and mindfulness and have brought the work to the New York City's foster care system. I currently give meditation classes to nearly 400 Fair Future staff each month through the Fair Future system-wide learning communities. I have met nearly 150 coaches across all 26 agencies, seen their faces and felt their authenticity and their dedication to supporting the young people they coach in foster care. My story is not unique in that hundreds of young people with fair futures coaches have been able to change their life trajectories. I'm here today to serve as the voice for the 3,000 young people that fair future serves. I'm here today to, all, to also ask the city to not tear away the time. 30 more seconds, please. Um, I'm here today to ask the city to not tear away from the Fair Futures coaches and staff from these young people. These staff work so hard to build trusting relationships with the young people, and they are deeply trained on how to help them with, the go with their goals and dreams. Please do not be the cause of more trauma and disruption in their lives. In my work with Fair Futures staff, I can honestly say that this is the most authentic, impactful program that Foster Care has ever seen. This is be and that is because it is truly a community and family. And just another 25 more seconds, please. If I can read Angels, um, like I said, he recently attempted suicide because he was having his own mental challenges. But before he did so, he did send me this, uh, his, his speech for today. Uh, so he, he goes, I have had my fair shares of negative experiences with the law. I was young, reckless, and misguided until I came across great coaches, mentors, and genuine human beings who helped change my perspective on a possible success. It takes a village to raise a boy into a man. It is safe to say that my mentors have helped enlighten me from the dark places I was in. At a point in time, I was homeless. However, I was able to secure housing through the assistance of one of my coaches who continues to provide unconditional support to my well-being. I don't have a close bond with my parents as, my tip as your typical 19-year-old would, namely because of the lack of trust between them and I. Honestly, I feel more comfortable sharing confidential things and certain ideas with my mentor rather than family, given I don't, I don't feel judged by him. I'm personally asking for more funding for Fair Future so youth like myself can prosper out of the dark abyss we're often placed within. Thanks to my mentors, I have graduated high school and have six amazing jobs on my resume already. I'm blessed to be in a position I, I'm in today. More importantly, however, are my brothers and sisters still within the system who need the same guidance I was given and am still receiving by my coaches. No one can do it alone. For surely Bill Cates, nor did Martin Luther King Jr. make it without a strong support system. Please don't underappreciate our heroes who wear who don't wear a cape, but help us ele elevate mentally every day. Thank you so much, speaker. And like the young lady before me, I was on here as well since 10 a.m. just because this is extremely important to myself and all of my brothers and sisters in the foster care system. Thank you once again, speaker. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Demetrius. Um, you brought to mind a song. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's called If My Friends Could See Me Now. Uh, look at you, look how sharp you look. You got dressed, you've been on this call, you know, since 10 o'clock in the morning and you're representing and supporting your friend Angel. Uh, stick by him, he needs help. And uh, you're probably someone who's brought a lot of stability to his life as well. And uh, don't have, worry about taking the burden. I'm not saying, you know, carry his burden, but they'd be there for him for support because he needs you and we need you. We need you to keep advocating for fair futures as we fight. But uh, just say, look at me now. <laughs> look at me now. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Demetrius. We will now hear from Catherine DeLeon, followed by Cal Hedigan. Time starts now. Thank you. Uh, my name is Catherine DeLeon. I am a member of the Legal Services Team on Makeville, New York. I will highlight programs funded by the Council that play a key role in supporting immigrant New Yorkers. We respectfully request that the Council restore and baseline the 12 million, invest 10.5 million in the Adult Literacy Pilot Project that the NYC Coalition for Adult Literacy have proposed, and ensure that every adult has the necessary hardware and free internet to be able to learn online. To enable us to, 
to continue to provide Know Your Rights and other trainings for our community. We request that the council restore funding for the Consortium for Welfare Education and its network. We request renewed and expanded funding for the low wage worker support services in the amount of 500,000 in legal services funding through the low wage worker initiative and 300,000 in outreach and organizing funding under the low wage worker support initiative. We strongly urge this delegation to baseline 4 million for the low wage worker initiative and 1 million for the low wage worker support initiative. We request continued funding in the amount of 1 million for the rapid response legal collaborative and an additional 250,000 in discretionary funding for Make the Road New York's deportation defense project so we can uh, support immigrants who are detained or at risk for being deported. We ask that the city council allocate 150,000 in funding under the legal services for the working for initiative to support our legal department in handling over 10,000 cases annually. We ask the Brooklyn delegation to support our recent initiative for community health workers and increase funding for the 22 million for the emergency food assistance program to support more than 500 pantries and soup kitchens in the city to support youth and hate violence and increase the safety of our community, we request the following. Restore the hate violence prevention initiative, defund the NYPD by reallocating public funds for policing and redirecting those funds to expand services in marginalized communities and put 53 million towards expanding restorative practices in uh, citywide. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Appreciate you coming in. Thank you. We'll now hear from Cal Hedigan, followed by Joyce Ma. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Drum and members of the Finance Committee for your sustained attention today. I'm Cal Hedigan, CEO of Community Access, an organization that has been supporting the self-determination of people living with mental health concerns since 1974. Our 350 staff work daily to support thousands of New Yorkers through supportive housing training, advocacy, and other healing focused services. I direct your attention to my written testimony, which goes into greater detail on a number of budget issues. I will focus on just a few. Community Access is a founding member of the Correct Crisis Intervention Today in New York City Coalition, or CCIT NYC. While the mayor's proposal to invest $112 million in a rollout of mental health response teams for people experiencing mental health crises is a step in the right direction, CCIT NYC has a number of concerns with the proposed plan, two of which I highlight here. The city estimates that more than 30% of calls will still be answered by law enforcement. This could lead to more people in crisis being killed in police encounters, adding to the 18 New Yorkers who have been killed since 2015. We must completely eliminate the police as responders. And secondly, response teams must consist of a trained peer, someone with lived mental health experience, and an independent EMT, critical to transforming the current coercive system into a compassionate and person-centered approach. CCIT NYC urges the city council to dig into the details of the mayor's proposed plans and push for changes such as those uh, I have highlighted. Failing to do so places the city at risk of replacing one flawed system with another. I would also like to thank the city council for its budget advocacy on behalf of the nonprofit sector. Time. The restitution of ICR funding, there is much more to be done. City contracts for human service organizations are structured in such a way that nonprofits cannot pay our workforce, 80% of whom are women of color, a living wage. Last year, the city allowed the COLA for human services workers to expire. A 3% COLA must be restored. In addition, city funding levels must increase to address the inequitable salary structure in this sector. And lastly, we need to reimagine public safety in our city. Increasing investment in community services that address people's real needs, 
access to affordable housing, equitable educational opportunities, quality health care for all, living wage jobs. These are all elements of public safety. A militarized police force and bloated carceral system are not the answer. We spend over $400,000 per year to imprison one person in a city jail. With equivalent funds, we could house 60 New Yorkers in supportive housing. Our budget priorities must shift to reflect our values. We must make it a priority to stand for racial justice and a just recovery, one that strengthens communities and furthers equity, rather than pouring money into broken and racist structures. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. And thank you to the librarians and the canners and the fair future people for inspiring me this evening. Thanks, Cal. And as someone who um, had a father who had mental health issues, I appreciate you coming in and giving testimony very much. Thank you. Thank you. So it looks like Joyce has hopped off. So we'll move on to Dr. Cynthia Morer, followed by Bay Chen. Time starts now. Hello, I wanna thank you uh, for allowing me to speak on behalf of a population that is often overlooked and certainly amongst the hardest hit during this pandemic, the elderly, and mostly the oldest old, 85 plus. Visiting Neighbors is the agency that I work with, and they were open and active throughout the entire pandemic, coming into the office and basically being there to be able to meet new people who wanted to volunteer, but we needed to make sure their IDs matched who they said they were, and coordinating activities. We did um, contactless shopping because food, getting access to food and supplies was utmost of importance to us. Um, once medical procedures started to happen again, we got our seniors to their doctors, helped them communicate with their medical professionals, got them the shot, helped them go voting, um, and telephone reassurance, which was a small program, exploded in the course of since the part, uh, point of the beginning of the pandemic. We literally um, made 13,000 hours of phone calling to people just to be supportive. This pandemic um, made people feel very scared, frightened. We all felt it, but our volunteers were just as upset as our seniors were. We had people who survived, we had people who didn't, but we needed to be here for all of our clients. I know the council gets it. They support us. Thank God for you. You kept our doors open. We help people outside of our own area that we served. We took every phone call. We listened to every story. We were there and we were there because of the city council. We were there because you support us. Please continue to support the initiatives. Please continue to help the, each of the council members have their discretionary funds. We need that money to keep doing what we do. We all wanna be treated with compassion and dignity as we grow old. We Time. are 16 soon who will be turning 100 years old and may we all get there. Our eldest 107 died in December, but not of COVID, of natural causes and surrounded by visiting neighbors, people who are there to let her know she is not alone. Together, we will make sure our seniors know that they are not alone. Please continue to support programs that are not senior center programs. These are the small but mighty groups that are hanging in there like the little engine that could, getting up those hills and helping our people. Thank you so much for all of your support because we love our council. Our city council is our, you guys are angels. The chair of our aging committee, Margaret Chin, we love you. She's been amazing in support of us because if we're all lucky, we'll become one one day surrounded by loved ones. And if we don't have loved ones, hopefully we'll have a visiting neighbors. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I want to recognize uh, our beloved uh, council member, Margaret Chin. Thank you, Chair Drum. I, I just wanted to thank Cynthia for visiting neighbors uh, for testifying. She's, she comes every year, 
And like, I don't know why the Department for the Aging don't fund you guys. I mean, it's like they have these friendly visit programs, but they don't really do what the visiting neighbors do. And definitely you serve the most vulnerable, the frail elderly, the 85 and above. I mean, we got to take care of these seniors who's been around for so long. We want to make, make sure they stay healthy and strong. And we will continue to support the work that you do uh, because it's, it's amazing. And a lot of my colleagues, a lot of the council member also you know, support and you can count on us for that. And thank you to all the volunteers and the staff for like staying strong during the pandemic. And I just really want to say one it. thing mm -hmm. that our volunteers represent the absolute best of New York City, a city that cares that really does care and seniors who are very appreciative. Some a little more than others, <laughs> but, but nevertheless, they all were able to get toilet paper and PPP, uh, PPE, sorry, stuck with that, or uh, PPE and the supplies they needed and food and volunteers stood for hours on food lines and negotiated with restaurants who weren't using food and got managed to get smoothies and yogurts and I mean the most creative group of people I have ever met that really just care and thank you from the bottom of our heart because we intend this is going to be our 49th year you are part of our 50th soon to be coming history and we're still here and that's what we tell our seniors and that's the theme of our 50th anniversary and we expect our council to be right alongside us to say we're still here <laughs> thank you thank you thank so you. much mwah, mwah. and thank you chair drum he's also our strong advocate for our elderly thank we you. need you all thank you. we need you all thank you thank you very much all right, let's go to our next uh, witness. We will now hear from Bei Chen, followed by Fatima Shama. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Bei Chen. I live in Brooklyn with my husband and my three-year-old son, um, Aaron. I'm so nervous in front of you, but I'm doing it because this is really important. Um, when Aaron turned three, I learned that he has autism. Aaron's doctor told me to ask the DOE for preschool, special education services. At a meeting, the DOE said that Aaron needs a small special education class and the services like speech therapy to help him speak. I tried right away to get Aaron the things that he need. Um, the DOE did not have a seat for Aaron in a small class with speech. So I had to place Aaron in a, uh, in a preschool class that I does not have speech therapy. I'm glad that I found a class for Aaron because I know how important it is for children with autism to get services when they are young. Aaron feels happy in the school and is learning so much from his teacher, Miss Angelina. I know many families still do not have a preschool special education class for their children since the city does not have enough seats and they are very scared. Thank you to the city council for saying that the city should have preschool special education classes for all children who need them and should pay teachers in these classes the same as pre-K teachers. And Miss Angelina does a great job with Erin. She should be paid the same as other teachers so she can keep working with the students like my, um, my son, Erin, who needs more help. Preschool $85 million in the budget for preschool special education um, this year and pay preschool special education teachers the same as other preschool teachers. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And we will now hear from Fatima Shama, followed by Matthew Shapiro. Time starts now. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Chair Drum, and to all of you that have been here all day long. It's great to see you. It's been a really long time. Um, to all the distinguished members of the City Council, thank you for the opportunity to testify during this virtual hearing. I want to applaud you, uh, the Council, um, and the City at large for prioritizing summer programming for youth. My name is Fatima Shama, and I have the privilege of being the executive director of the Fresh Air Fund. 
Um, for 145 years, the Fresh Air Fund has provided the city's children with summer experiences that help them thrive and succeed emotionally, academically, and socially. The realities of last summer, as you know, and a global health pandemic plaguing our communities, the Fresh Air Fund suspended our traditional summer programming. However, our team was determined to provide New York City children with the summer experiences we know and we knew that they needed and deserved in particular in the communities most hard hit by the pandemic. Recognizing and knowing the needs of the children and their families, we created four programs to engage and support New York City's youth. My testimony outlines the four programs, but what I'm here to talk to you, to you today about was actually a program called uh, Fresh Air Summer Spaces, which basically turned the 10 open streets across four boroughs into safe places for children to play. We serve children ages five to 13. The Department of Transportation was a critical partner last year in helping us identify open streets for the Fresh Air Funds programming. I'm delighted to say that we were in several of your neighborhoods, uh, Chairman uh, Drum, we were right in Jackson Heights. You might've seen us on 34th Avenue um, on the open street serving children. It was um, an extraordinary opportunity last summer in particular. I wanna thank many of you because your assistance and support in working with the city agencies was what made the program a great success last year. We recognize and continue to work towards elevating the safety Time. and wellness for the children that we're serving. Um, we are aiming to do it again this summer and we want um, to be in the very neighborhoods that are most affected. We are asking for your support of only $50,000 from the council to subsidize in particular the summer youth employment model that we employ. The program is free to all the children in the neighborhood. We think it's a community development strategy in particular because we employ young people from the community where young people can see perhaps their siblings um, playing and where parents can walk by and see their children enjoying fun activities that are enriching and engaging. Um, we're excited we have great partners like the American Ballet Theater and the Queens Public Library and Biobus all returning to partner with us again so that we can in introduce dance, music, and books and literacy to all our children, in particular during a year where learning loss has been critical and where we need to sort of um, not, we need to focus on um, enriching and providing opportunities. We hope to serve over, um, to provide 19,000 slots for children over 27 days. Um, thank you for listening and thank you for being so extraordinary in um, being here all day. And I just want to say, um, listening to all of the amazing work happening across the city, as I know, um, given my chapters, um, I was really moved by Cheyenne and her, her colleagues from um, the Fair Futures um, New York program. So um, I will be doing my own research to support them as well. Great to see you, Council Member Drum. Uh, great to see you, uh, Commissioner, if I may call you Commissioner. <laughs> That's very <laughs> oh, kind, thank you. As, as my days of um, uh, chair of the Immigration Committee and some of the great work that we did together, uh, it's you. wonderful and wonderful to know that you're uh, at the Fresh Air Fund. And I do appreciate uh, the work that you did on 34th Avenue uh, last summer. It was very successful and really important and contributed, you know, not only to the kids who got the programming, but also to the vitality of our open street. And that was important. Uh, you were one of the first programming pieces that we actually had on 34th Avenue. So thank you, uh, Commissioner Sharma, and uh, continued good luck in your career. Uh, it's always good to see you. Stay in touch, don't go far. I won't, you know I won't. I do, I do, and I will be in touch. And I can't wait to see you and other members of the council visiting us again um, on streets across New York City, where like on, on like on 34th Avenue, it really is an opportunity to bring the community together and we're honored to be a part of it. It's really community leadership and they invited us back as as, as many other community partners. And so um, it's, it's about our young people, it's about our communities and it's about seeding that brilliance that happens so richly, so thank you. Okay, Good looking to forward you. to seeing you. Okay, okay. we'll do. Be well. Thanks, Thank everyone. you. Thank you. Bye bye. We will now hear from Matthew Shapiro, followed by Prakash Churama. Time starts now. Uh, Mr. Shapiro, we can't hear you.
Nope, we still can't hear you. It seems we're having you're having issues with your audio. Now we'll move on to the next person and then we'll circle back with you. Perhaps it's something um, with your headphones. So we will hear next from Prakash Churaman. Time starts now. Um, hello, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Prakash Sherman. I was arrested at the age of 15 in Queens, New York and coerced into falsely confessing to a crime I did not commit. I was thrown in jail on Rikers Island for nearly four years before I was afforded my first trial. I was given my first, my first trial and my first trial was unfair. I was, con I was wrongfully convicted and sentenced to a term of nine years to life in prison. My conviction was overturned in, in June of last year. I was recently released from Rikers Island in January of this year um, on bail with, with the conditions of electronic monitoring. I am now at home, confined to my home, awaiting a new trial. And I'm here today to demand that city council please defund NYPD by at least $1 billion. And for those funds to go towards resources such as mental health, substance abuse, permanent affordable housing, and endless equal employment opportunity. And I ask that you please contribute to anything that will fix this miscarriage of justice. Once again, my name is Prakash Chairman, and as of right now, I'm fighting for my life from my home in Queens, New York. And I'm demanding that Queens DA drop these charges. I spent the last six years incarcerated for a crime I did not commit. Time. And Thank you. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you, Prakash. Uh, I've been a strong advocate of criminal justice reform. Um, I uh, hear the emotion in your voice. I don't know your case in particular, uh, but you have given um, a very strong testimony. And uh, you can always reach out to my office uh, and we'll see a little bit more and get a little more information from you. Uh, and I just wish you the best of luck moving forward with your case. And thank you for being here and for speaking out. It's very important to hear. And, um, you know, you must have suffered on Rikers Island a lot. So um, my, my heart goes out to you. And I, I wish the best for you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I will now go back to Matthew Shapiro, file, followed by Maya Williams. Time starts now. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you now. Great. Uh, good evening. My name is Matthew Shapiro, and I'm the legal director of the Street Vendor Project at the Urban Justice Center and also a resident of Jackson Heights. With a staff of eight, SVP is the only organization that works solely with street vendors in New York City through direct legal representation, small business development and training, organizing support, leadership development, and strategic legislative advocacy. We have connected nearly 3,000 street vendors to resources and information about housing, food access, and loan and grant opportunities in the past year alone. With the New York City Council's support, we hope to continue providing critical COVID-19 relief resources to our members across the five boroughs. We need your support to help us expand our organizational capacity to meet the increased demand for our services during the COVID-19 pandemic and subsequent recovery. Throughout this year, SVP's staff and leadership board have pivoted to meet the needs of the members, some of the most vulnerable workers in New York City, while engaging in deep community and base building efforts. 
Our pandemic response has directly supported excluded and underserved workers and small business owners by connecting them to the resources that meet their immediate needs. As part of our emergency response, we supported over 1,000 families with cash assistance, ranging from $300 to $1,000, distributed over 28,000 culturally relevant meals made by 80 street vendors at 51 individual, individual distribution sites. We connected 2,000 vendors to housing, food, and mental health resources, and created and distributed multilingual COVID safe business operating guidelines, as well as 7,000 masks to our vendors and consulted with over 400 street vendors on legal services, small business grants and loans, as well as making almost 1,000 calls to check in on our members. Beginning in May, our team launched food distribution programs that both supplied income to street vendors and supported food insecure communities in Sunset Park in Brooklyn, in Corona, Queens, and across the Bronx in Highbridge, Morrisania, Melrose, and Mott Haven. Through the program, street vendors were employed for the first time since the outset of the pandemic, allowing them the opportunity to return to the work of feeding their neighbors. Time. Additionally, in coordination with the New York City's Office on Immigrant Affairs, we have been assisting vendors by providing multicultural and linguistic outreach to educate them about vaccination appointments. Our work during the pandemic has been critical in providing health and financial resources to vendors across the city. Thank you for your consideration of our proposal to continue this vital programming. <laughs> We will now hear from Maya Williams, followed by Christine Henson. Time starts now. Good evening. My name is Maya Williams, and I am testifying on behalf of Communities United for Police Reform, a multi-sector campaign working to end discriminatory and abusive policing and practices in New York. Thank you, Chair Drum, for hosting this hearing today. I'm a Black mother raised in Bethlehem-Stuyvesant and currently residing in East New York, some of the most over-policed and burdened neighborhoods in our city. I'm here to speak to the critical changes that need to be made in budget priorities for the livelihood of Black, Latinx, and other communities of color. Although the mayor has claimed his proposed executive budget for fiscal year 22 is a recovery budget that makes massive investments in working families, when looking at the actual numbers, it's clear the mayor is out of touch with what it will take for communities of color to recover from COVID-19. For example, he's proposing an ill-conceived plan to deploy alternative mental health response teams across the city at a cost of $112 million, even though the pilot program hasn't even begun. While we think it is positive to consider alternative mental health response, the Be Heard program design does little to pre or post crisis mental health care and does not make significant investments in the community based mental health care services that are desperately needed in our communities. Our communities need more than a, a band aid. We need quality, accessible mental health care from culturally competent providers in community based settings. We don't need more trips to the hospital, more wait lists, and more clinicians that are out of touch with our communities. We're calling on the council to make this happen. We're calling on the council to end NYPD's youth initiatives, which pays over 300 officers to interact with young people in the neighborhood. We're calling on the council to stop investing more money in the NYPD under the geese of reinvention and, re and reforms. It's unacceptable that the NYPD is potentially going to receive an additional $14 million to hire community assistants and ambassadors to do things like fix basketball hoops. If neighborhoods do need these kinds of services, non-NYPD jobs should be created to fill this need and community-based organizations should be receiving these funds. Time. <laughs> um, a few more seconds, please. We don't need more police officers. We need more counselors, teachers, nurses, and youth workers. These are the kind of jobs that we needed this past year and didn't have enough of, but we had plenty of offices in our streets on an exceeding overtime budget. Black, Latinx, and other communities of color deserve a real recovery budget. We deserve quality public services. We deserve to be invested in, and children's future deserves to be invested in. We need a council who will stop increasing the NYPD's budget year after year, who will take a bold new approach to city budgeting and invest in services that actually keep our communities safe. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We will now hear from Christine Henson, followed by Scott Daly. Time starts now. Good evening, Chair um, Drum and members of the Committee on Finance. Um, it's been a pleasure. I've been here since this morning. But, um, I wish I could have met you sooner, Chair Drum. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Christine Henson and I'm a member of the Justice Committee. 
I'm here to ask the council to make cuts that were promised last year in order to defund NYPD. I personally know what it's like to be victimized and wrongfully accused of um, an act. And I also witnessed my son that is affected by autism and um, he is severe. And he also is a District 75 student, you know, be victimized by police officers. And, and NYPD could have killed my son right before my eyes. And I still don't know why, you know, our intentions were to receive a speech evaluation. However, he was brutalized. And to this day, I haven't been told why. Based on that experience, I, I extremely don't feel safe. I'm frightened for him because his speech is extremely limited. And I gave up my career and my education, which I put on hold, but I will continue what I started in order to just follow my, my process. Sorry, my connection. Um, you know, he's is severe, he's regressed a lot. And unfortunately, I, I look at the changes and with limited speech, he's just always been a victim for discrimination because someone doesn't like him because he doesn't speak, even staff members at the school. So, you know, that he experienced that brutal incident that he exhibits fear when we see officers on television. You know, he cries and he frowns and, you know, he does other things that exhibit fear. I live, I live in fear and I'm uncomfortable. My, dream, my dreams and passions were put on hold. So I ask that the, the budget for NYPD can be decreased and put into areas for better mental health services, especially for people that aren't able to vocalize their needs or wants or feelings, better jobs and affordable housing, and especially resources for education, public education. And a lot of people need to be educated on treating people with respect and honor that, you know, because they deserve to be respected. The city didn't move forward with firing any police officers that killed many loved ones and either brutalized people. You know, those officers are still on the force while loved ones and people such as myself are left to gather pieces or gather strength in order to live in a city that is supposed to be the greatest city with peace and opportunities. I'm a native of the city. I've done everything I was supposed to do. I don't know why it happened to me, why we were selected from young, from a youth. I enjoy every experience that I was presented or obtained on my own. So I asked the city council to please think of what it feels like if you don't have a voice, you don't have speech the ability to vocalize anything, how you feel, but just to say hello. So I ask that you please definitely make the cuts from NYPD and provide funds so there can be med mental health services that are phenomenal to better assist people and keep them safe and preserve lives. I'd ask you again, please make the cuts that were promised last year in order to defund the NYPD and I ask on behalf of my son that isn't able to say much. Please thank you for this opportunity. I hope you can help. I've been asking for help since Betsy Gottbaum has been office, since Mayor de Blasio was a public advocate. I just want my son to be able to thrive and excel and even smile again, or even enjoy the parks, everything that was discussed in this meeting today, the parks and just nature and just safety. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Henson. We will now hear from Scott Daly, followed by Annie Garniva. Time starts now. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, Chair Drum, I don't know how you've done it this long. Other members of the council um, who are here and part of this committee, I applaud all who are still here, who like me got on at 10 o'clock this morning, 
got up and down and did some things and actually ran away for about an hour to go visit uh, one of my locations. Let me tell you what we do, NYJTL, we provide free tennis to all kids throughout the entire city of New York, all five boroughs. And we're able to do this because of the council funding. That's where we get this opportunity to do it. We bring tennis to each and every council member's district throughout the year. We operate all four seasons, three outdoors in the spring, summer, fall. We have a 20 week indoor program, the cost of which is, gets astronomical. We are asking, we are seeking, we need the $1.2 million that we have applied for this year to continue our programming. Everything is free. In addition to the tennis, during the summer, we bring in, if it's not a COVID year like last year, but every summer before that, just D75 schools come to our program, over a thousand each year come to it. We provide teacher training. We teach gym teachers to bring tennis into the school to provide an opportunity for these kids who would never have a tennis racket in their hand. We give them rackets, we give them balls, we give them support staff. The ethnicity that we serve, boy, you speak about a melting pot. Throughout the year, 9,000 kids will participate. We almost have an even breakdown between Asian, Hispanic, African-Americans, 25% each, and the other 25% is a potpourri made up of everything else. The ages, the 10 and under group, the youngest group, two out of every three kids Time. participate. We're open from five to 18 years of age. Two out of every three are 10 years old and younger. There are health benefits, the character development through sport. I just can't say enough. Now that we're coming out of COVID, our registration numbers this spring are up over the past years where we've run spring programming over a hundred percent. The attendance is likewise. I just want to say thank you so very much to the council who's always provided this opportunity. And I want to particularly thank Chair Drum, Council Member Grudencheck, and others who are leaving. It's been my pleasure, my honor to be part and to be able to serve your districts and this council. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Scott, for coming in. I know you've been here since early this morning. I uh, really appreciate it. Really love New York Junior Tennis League. We've done so much with the kids, particularly in my district and throughout everybody's district in the city council. Uh, we look forward to continuing to work with you and to support your organization. I know that uh, Councilmember Grudenchik has uh, his hand up as well, and he may <laughs> want to say a word. Time starts. And um, I just want to out Scott because he was with me this afternoon at PS205 <laughs> on Bell Boulevard uh, in the heart uh... of my district. Um, and that's where he was. And uh, there's an overflow crowd there every day. There were over 50 young people there today, uh, very young children, but um, there's no better program um, than the New York Junior Tennis League. Okay, so I want to thank I want to thank the chair for his support, um, and I want to thank Scott and everybody at the uh, New York Junior Tennis League for the work that they do with our young people. Thank you Margaret very Chen's much. Been here a long time, but she's shaking her head. She knows. So thank uh, you, Scott. Council Member Chen. Absolutely, to your district also. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I think every council member knows about New York Junior, junior Tennis League. So thanks a lot, Scott. Anytime. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Bye now. Bye-bye. We will now hear from Annie Garniva, followed by Liliana Polo McKenna. Time starts now. Hello. You caught me a little off guard, so give me one second. <clears throat> Thank you. My name is Annie Garniva. I am the Vice President of Policy and Special Initiatives at the New York City Employment and Training Coalition, which supports the workforce development community and our 180 member organizations. Workforce development programs are the critical beginning of a cycle that connects New Yorkers who have been historically marginalized and now hardest hit by the pandemic to economic opportunities that exist within all of the industries that call New York home. 
In order to ensure an equitable and inclusive economic recovery, city leadership needs to fundamentally shift and align systems, investments, and decision-making processes that fuel our economy towards a talent-centric economic development model that recognizes human capital as the primary pillar and source of prosperity and growth within our communities. Within the proposed budget, this means bringing back workforce programs that were severely cut last year. I'll cover three initiatives today, um, but of course there's a wide number of them that we would love to be um, brought back. So the first is Bridge Program for Workforce Development, which was funded as a pilot program at $850,000 through a council initiative with limited contribution from the administration. Bridge programs provide New Yorkers with basic skill deficits or barriers to employment, the education and training required to skill up to enter an industry training program and begin a career. Within the FY22 budget, we urge administration to make good on the 2014 Career Pathways Blueprint, which promised a 60 million per year uh, for bridge programs allocation by 2020. Uh, so this year we are asking for at least 20 million in investment. The Digital Inclusion and Literacy Initiative is the second one we'd like to highlight, which should be brought back to FY20 numbers of 3 million and expanded past that to respond to the urgent digital poverty gaps highlighted by the pandemic which have exacerbated many New Yorkers' ability to look for and participate in work. Uh, and last, the Job Training and Placement Initiative, which faced over 2 million cuts last year, must be brought back to um, the 7.9 million level at minimum and expanded to provide the over 1 million unemployed and underemployed New Yorkers with industry training and upskilling. Time. Um, those are the initiatives we want to highlight. And overall, uh, we just want to comment on the fact that Returning these council initiatives to the FY20 levels is the bare minimum. The city must develop and invest in a serious workforce and economic recovery plan to tackle the scale of unemployment and business loss that New York City is facing. With resources allocated for workforce development on their way from the American Jobs Plan, now is the time for this administration and the council to seriously expand investments and collaborations in education, job training, employment services, and economic development to best position us to re-enter the workforce. We need a Marshall Plan for training and jobs aligned to industries projected to have significant growth over the next 10 years and shovel-ready infrastructure projects that grow the economy and provide career pathways rather than low-wage jobs. We need to map the workforce system to provide a skills bank and database for workers, training providers, and employers to increase effectiveness and access to programming. And the current budget uh, does not reflect the scale of workforce needs that millions of New Yorkers have and does not provide us with an adequate and visionary jobs plan that would help propel us out of the recession that we're in. Uh, so I thank you for the very long hearing. I thank you for being um, so arduously on top of things and really listening to every element of the community has come before you today. Uh, and we want to make sure that we're working together, particularly on the jobs and skills needs of New Yorkers. Thank you, and I look forward to hearing from some of our members, such as OBT. Thank you very much. I will now hear from Liliana Polo McKenna, followed by Carolyn Ioso. Time starts now. Good evening. My name is Liliana Polo McKenna, and I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Opportunities for a Better Tomorrow, uh, one of the member organizations of the New York City Employment and Training Coalition. Thank you to the members of the council uh, for the opportunity to speak today and for sticking through in this marathon uh, session. I'm here to really talk about the crisis facing New York City's young adults and the opportunities we must act on now to support them and just underscore the sense of urgency that, that Annie Garneva was, was expressing in her testimony. Founded in 1983, OBT is one of New York City's largest providers of workforce development and education services for opportunity youth ages 17 to 24 and adults who are disconnected from education or employment. We exist to break the cycle of poverty and inequity through education, job training, and employment. Um, we know that COVID-19 and this ensuing economic hardship have really had a disproportionate impact on low-income black and brown communities. As we have been rooted in these communities for decades, we know that our services would be more critical than ever. There was no lapse in OBT's programming um, as we shifted to remote programming literally overnight. And despite the resilience and hard work of organizations like OBT, um, New York City's young people are in crisis. Since the pandemic started, the number of out of school and out of work young adults has more than doubled. The most recent research estimates that there are now between 257,000 and 310,000 young adults that fit this criteria compared to 110,000 in 2019. So we must support young people now 
um, there's a real sense of urgency to ensure that they can flourish and that our, our economy can recover. In the short term, we must increase funding for what works. So expanding training programs in high growth sectors like technology, healthcare, and the green economy. We know where the opportunities are and will be, and we need the funding to innovate training programs alongside employer partners that can upskill New Yorkers into those uh, opportunities now. Expand bridge programming so that advanced training programs in those high growth sectors are accessible to New Yorkers um, who are seeking to enter those careers. This includes contextualized high school equivalency programming and a focus on digital literacy. It also includes baselining the $12 million for adult literacy that we've heard um, over the course Time. of the day today. It also means supporting work-based learning opportunities. We know that um, the research shows and, and we know and we've seen it, internships and apprenticeships help young people to build those technical skills, but also learn the essential skills of how to navigate the workplace. And finally, ensuring that all programming includes wraparound supports, which is needed now more than ever. And I can't underscore this enough. None of these programs work if our participants don't have the support for food stipends, childcare vouchers, transportation, mental health services that not only keep our students engaged, but makes it possible for people to participate and to effectively transition into whether it's higher education, employment, or, or further advanced training. In the long term, we have to look at some of the system-wide opportunities that were referenced in, in earlier testimonies. The solutions have to be sustainable and the time to start those is now. Uh, we can't wait two, three years down the line as we see the economic development opportunities that are, that are emerging in different parts of the city. Now's the time to start the training. Now's the time to, to fund and support partnerships to ensure that every New Yorker can have an access to, to living wage jobs. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we'll now hear from Carolyn Ioso, followed by Michael Pope. Time starts now. Good evening. My name is Caroline Ioso. I am the Director of Advocacy and Strategic Communication at OBT. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. As Liliana laid out, young adults have borne the brunt of the economic fallout and are now facing a steep uphill battle towards economic stability. With tens of thousands more young people now disconnected from employment and education, with increased competition for jobs and new requirements for jobs, building pathways to living wage employment is even more important. And if this city cares about equity, we have an obligation to support young people out of this crisis. At OBT, we're focused on three different solutions. First, expanding training programs in high growth sectors. We offer advanced programs in healthcare and technology where well-paying job opportunities continue to grow. These programs offer a critical next step for those who earn their high school diploma to build experience and paid internships, network with employers and hone their skills. OBT's medical administrative assistant program had a 200% increase in applications and we are hoping to meet this need. Um, we're also seeking support for OBT's cloud support engineering program, which now we're very excited has a pathway in through a bridge program and a pathway out. Graduates now earn a semester of college credits at CUNY SPS for free. This program is making tech jobs more accessible for New Yorkers. Number two, supporting students with work-based learning and wraparound supports as they work towards high school equivalency. A high school diploma remains the gatekeeper to living wage and stable employment. OBT's programs provide professional certifications, paid internship experiences, and individual case management. In addition to adding seats for young adults, we want to support more New Yorkers in achieving their HSEs through an adult Spanish language high school equivalency program. And finally, building digital literacy into all educational and workforce programming. Basic technological skills are essential for all workers. We know that so clearly now, and we must address the digital divide through ensuring that all ESOL and high school equivalency classes include digital literacy. Time. OBT and other workforce organizations need your support in this budget so that we can help young people thrive. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Michael Pope. Time starts now. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I also just want to uplift OBT Opportunities for Better Tomorrow, an amazing organization. Um, excited to see you all here. My name is Michael Pope. I'm the Executive Director of Youth Represent. Uh, we are a uh, legal nonprofit in New York City dedicated to improving the lives and futures of young people impacted by the criminal legal system. Uh, we deeply appreciate the support that the Council has given us so far. 
um, just to highlight, we're requesting a restoration of the $75,000 that we received through the Criminal Justice Initiative, um, and also an enhancement of $10,000 to be allocated directly into our emergency fund. I wanna take this opportunity to say, you know, I've highlighted and talked about our, the impact that we've had through the criminal justice work, but I wanna talk for just a second about this emergency fund because it is an enhancement. Uh, essentially what it is, is it's a pass-through. It's hundred percent of the $10,000 request increase goes into Youth Represent and goes out to solve the emergency needs that our clients have through our emergency client fund. What we found when COVID hit was that, you know, sometimes there's problems that need to be solved by innovative policy and collaboration and work. And sometimes there's problems that can be solved by cash. And we want to solve those cash problems for our clients. So this is everything from we had a, a client who was pregnant and who didn't want to get on the subway because she was afraid during COVID. Uh, we paid for the cabs, right? And uh, emergency cash food that wasn't coming through, we gave the funds to get the food back into that house. And so uh, we've used $15,000, supported about 42 youth uh, over the past year, and our fund is out. Uh, so that is the little bit of context about the expansion of the request that we have, or rather enhancement. Lastly, Councilmember Chen, I had a really good joke about how you can see your district in the background. The sun has set. You cannot see your district anymore. So you'll just have to trust me that the joke was pretty good. Uh, I apologize that it, the sun has set. And thank you, everybody, so much for your time. Which council member are you talking about? Sure. Michael, sure. I can't hear you. There we go. It's it's uh, so you can <laughs> it's council member Chid district is very far in the background, but you cannot see. Um, unfortunately, the sun has set, um, but it is, is there. Is that my district you're talking about? District one? <laughs> yes, very, very far in the distance. It is there. I promise you. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Thank you. So I believe we've heard from everybody who has signed into the Zoom, but just to be sure, um, if there is anyone who has not had the opportunity to testify who would like to do so, please use the Zoom raise hand function and we can call on you. Uh, seeing none, Chair Drum, we'll turn it back to you. Well, thank you so much. This has been an amazing day of testimony, so many stories, so many important causes. Uh, it's just been very moving to me, very emotional to know the needs and uh, wants of, uh, of, our, of our New York City uh, folks. Uh, you know, so we have a lot of work to do. Um, I wanna thank Margaret Chin though. She hangs in there with us throughout every budget hearing. Uh, she's just so wonderful. And I just feel so lucky to know her and to have shared these last 12 years in the council with her. Uh, she's a dedicated, dedicated person. And I don't know, you've made a difference in my life and I know that you've probably made a difference in a lot of your constituents' lives. So I wanna turn it over to council member Chin who wants to say a few words as well. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Danny. I mean, it's been a pleasure serving with you this past 12 years. This is our 12th budget. So I really wanted to make it the great one. Uh, and I always enjoy really listening to all the stories and all the testimony. I couldn't be here in the morning because I had a groundbreaking ceremony in my district. Uh, we're senior housing, affordable housing and community center. It's gonna be built in the Lower East Side. So, but I wanted to come back and I wanted to stay till the end because some of these stories, uh, especially the student who testify on fair future, it just really touched, I think, our heart that we really have to fight hard um, in this budget to make sure that those that funding is baseline. Because especially for the kids in foster care, I mean, all that they went through and the mentoring program and the, the coaches that they have, I mean, it's just wonderful. And I think that for the public, I always urge people to come and testify because by you telling us your needs and your story, it really helped us advocate. And there's been so many programs that we have started, right, Danny? Initiatives um, and funding because we heard from you. We heard from the public. And I'm just so proud that we're in this council that we're able to do that. And Danny, it's such a pleasure working with you. Um, but we're gonna stay in touch with you and I are gonna live the good life after, <laughs> after this year, right, Danny? We could be advisors, right? 
Thank you. Absolutely, Councilmember Chin. Um, you and know, thank you, you right. to the finance staff. I mean, like you guys are great with all the reports and all the information that we get. But in the next couple of weeks, Danny, it's gonna be really tough, right? We gotta have oh, to fight on everything. <laughs> you're not kidding. We have a, a real fight ahead of us. Uh, I hear you on your getting it over uh, half a percent of the budget for our seniors. You know, <laughs> we gotta make that your legacy here, Margaret. You know. Yeah, we uh, gotta make that make happen. Sure that, that happens. Yep. And uh, you're right. I I, I want to also just start off by thanking Robin Forst, who is my yes, finance uh, director. Yeah, she's been great. She's hung in there with us this whole time. Of course, Rebecca Chasen has been with us today. Thank you so much, Rebecca. And Stephanie Ruiz, who has also been with us here today. All of the sergeants who I uh, try yes. to make a point as I begin the hearings to say thank you to the sergeants as well. You got a lot of stamina and I'm very grateful to all of you. Um, let, me, let me read this uh, closing here and, um, and then we'll take it from there. Thank you to everyone who testified today. Before we conclude the hearing, I'd like to take a moment to give a well-deserved public thank you to the entire finance division of the city council. As in every other year, they have worked incredibly hard uh, to ensure that the executive budget hearings have been informative, thoughtful, and comprehensive. And it has been a pleasure to work with you all, both past and current council finance staff throughout my tenure as chair. I am so honored to have been able to have been the finance chair and to work with such a group of high, highly professional, competent, thorough individuals. You made me, you made me look good. Um, you know, you've informed me. I was not on the finance uh, committee, but um, you know, I am most grateful to each and every one of you. Let me start with the uh, director, Latanya McKenney, for her work, to all of the deputy directors, the assistant director, um, Regina, to the councils, the youth heads, the financial analysts, the economists, uh, and support staff. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Today, I would also like to give a special thank you to Monica people who will be leaving the finance division after two and a half years covering Mock J, the district attorneys, and the office to end gender biased, uh, gender based violence, as well as several very important council initiatives. We wish you the best of luck with your wedding and with your next oh, professional endeavor. Congrats. <laughs> Getting married. Wait, 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 wait. Do you have a ring? <laughs> uh, and I'd also like to thank all those. Oh, there you go. Let me see. You got to show us. All right. There you go. <laughs> I'd also like to thank all the sergeant in arms, the IT staff who kept these virtual hearings running smoothly. <laughs> And finally, thank you to my entire staff, Nick Rolison, who's my chief of staff, Kevin Yee, who's my deputy chief of staff, um, uh, Jacqueline Sanchez, uh, Jacqueline Cosme, Kelly Wu, Sebastian McGuire. Uh, I hope I got everybody, Robin, did I? I think I did. And Robin Forrest, of course, who I said before. Uh, they sustain me and they keep me going. We had our big pride celebration last night after a whole day of hearings. A whole day of hearings today, and we're going to go right into budget negotiations um, starting tomorrow and very soon and every almost every day thereafter. So thank you. Uh, with that, um, I guess the fiscal 2022 executive budget hearings are now concluded. Good night, everybody, and thank you. <laughs>